Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings, friend. Time again for Let George Do It. Oh, which reminds me. How would you like to sit in on a nice little card game? I happen to know four charming fellows who are just dying for a fifth. On the other hand, though, maybe you'd better forget about it, because these boys would not only take your bankroll, they'd just as soon take your life. But it's a pretty good game at that. So while we're waiting for George Valentine to show, let's take a look in on this happy foursome. Well, it's ten o'clock already, gentlemen. Shouldn't we... <laughs> I mean, my watch says ten. Chester has the cards and... Sure, what are we waiting for? We're going to do it, let's get... No! Going. No. Ames, Salto, this is crazy, it's insane. It was your idea, wasn't it, Norton? Yes, but a man's guilt is no more to be bandied about. Oh, him. get off the words. There's the good name of the man to be thought of afterwards. Let's get it over with now, now. It's all right. Need a piece of paper. Envelope here in your jacket, do you mind? Of course I do, if it's got my name on it. Valentine. George what? Valentine. What? Oh, your wife's letter from somebody named Valentine. Uh, if I'd know her friends. Here, here's a blank sheet, club stationery. Uh, couldn't we get on with the... Dear Mrs. Ames, I am so sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Naturally, I will do whatever I can to help Sincerely, George Valentine. You mean that? But... <laughs> Concern. How do you like... For heaven's sake, stop the stalling, both of you. Will you get... All right. Some... I draw one. Go on, draw a card. Me? Go on, Salto. All right. Nine of diamonds... Yeah. Norton. <laughs> Nine of clubs. Nine again? Give me one of those. Jack. Diamonds. All right, Chester. Chester. Huh? Your turn. Draw. Oh, I, I'm all right. Draw. Oh, yes. King. King of Hearts, look! Chester drew the King of Hearts! Shut up. You understand, Chester. High card. Yes. Yes, the paper. Here, here. You can use the pen there. Uh, I'm all right. <clears throat> I, Jeffrey Chester, hereby confess one year ago to this date it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Fullman. It's after ten o'clock now, Chester. I'd like to have a drink or two. I'll, I'll have to run down to my boarding house. There's a bill I should pay. Uh, the watchman's spare gun is in the locker room, and it would look better if you did it at the same place that... Leave him alone, Salto. I'm all right. I could run downtown first, then come back, have the drinks, if I could borrow your car, Mr. Ames. Sure, Chester. Let's go over and get you my car. Sure. Thank you. You can mail my confession of guilt to the police. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and let George do it. Where are you? 
you, Sylvia. It's the big idea, that letter in my coat pocket. Miss Valentine, who is he? Honey? Oh, there you are. So sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Of all the meddling... Please. Hello? This is Mr. Valentine. Miss Brooks, my husband, Mr. Ames. Oh, how how do you do, Mr. Ames? Huh. My foot in my mouth. Just who are you? Did you have a nice time, darling? Where have you been? Huh? Oh, over to the club. Yeah, they let me in. Just playing a little cards, that's all. Look, Mr. Rames, I had a letter from your wife. My wife is leaving me. What difference does it make? Go on, get out. She's hired snoopers before, my friend. You can't. Oh, shut up. Listen to me. You were beaten up the other night. Get them out of here. Get yourself out of here. Stop it. No, listen. What's the matter with you, friend? Victor, that was your car, wasn't it? Driving away? Yes. Yes, I loaned it to Somebody needs it for a while tonight. He's got some things to do. Mr. Rames, I know I'm butting in, but your wife has been worried. And Please. I'm, here. I'm going back over to the club. There's nothing anybody can do now except to make things worse. What? Darling! Send him home, Sylvia. I'll take care of myself. Oh. I put your letter in his pocket on purpose, Mr. Valentine. He'll never listen to me or believe me. It was certainly an understatement when you said he was upset. Yes. But you haven't said why yet. Now, just what's going on tonight, Mrs. Ames? Where's your husband really been? I don't know. Playing cards, I guess. He doesn't generally, but no harm could come out of that, could it? Maybe not. You said he'd been beaten up. Oh, yes, I know he's in danger. Go on, go on. Your husband's a lawyer, isn't he? He was until a year ago. His practice disappeared on him. What do you mean? Suspicion, distrust, whispers. This is a small town, Mr. Valentine. A very nice town. My husband used to be a very nice person. What happened? Have you ever heard of the Dorothy Fullman murder case? Well, yes, yes, I think so, only I don't remember the It was detail. never solved. She was murdered, beaten up. It was horrible. They never even found the weapon. Police, experts, everyone's been over it a million times. It was a whole year ago. They'll never get a confession from anyone. Mrs. Ames, was your husband... My husband was very nearly tried for that murder. Oh, I see. But then if he weren't tried, then... There uh... are people in this town who believe, who really believe that he killed her. Who will always believe it. There wasn't any actual evidence... But the circumstances, horrible, sordid, awful. Mrs. Ames, just tell me one thing, will you? Do, uh, do you think your husband killed this Dorothy Fullman? Mr. Valentine, I, I don't want anything worse to happen. I, that's all. <laughs> I say, excuse me. Mm. You're Mr. Valentine, aren't you? George Valentine? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was looking for the club doorman. My name is Norton. This is quite a pleasure. I've heard of you. Uh, Seen your name here and there? Oh, is that so? Uh, See here. Uh, Join me on the veranda for a cup of coffee, will you? Hospitality of our little club isn't I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. I'm looking for a man named Ames. Oh, yes. Victor Ames, splendid chap. Haven't seen him in some time. Might be here later... Uh, We can wait together. I said I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. (laughs) Well, I certainly don't intend to be pushy. Oh, wait a moment. Uh, Perhaps I should be a bit more honest and say there's a little matter I'd like your advice on. I'd still go looking for Mr. Rames. Even if I said the little matter concerned Mr. Rames? (laughs) You twist my arm. (laughs) Then we can do better than the veranda, I think. People there. There's a lounge in the locker room. All right. Through here? Uh, to your left. Generally closed at night. But, uh, there we are. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, what's the story? Uh, nothing so very important, but uh, sit down, sit down. How do you know who I was out there? Well, Ames had mentioned your coming. You said you haven't seen him lately. Try again. 
Really, Mr. Allen Dynash. Who's that? Hey, anybody in here? Walking up. Blue shirt. Private police? Oh, just a moment. Yes, yes, he is, uh, Mr. Valentine. Let go of me? Well, what are you doing here? Ah, what do you mean? Stop it. Who are you? Hey, hey, what is it? Jimmy, Jimmy, I, I found this man. Break it up, break it up. Break there. what up, John? I found him in here. I, I left my wallet in, in wallet my locker. All, the... all right, you... all right. Oh, it's you, Mr. Norton. He was snooping, Jimmy. Now my wallet's gone. He took it. He must have. Oh, brother. If what this am is... I supposed to do? Search him. Oh, but he won't have it, really. Uh, that, that's not the way they work. Uh, but uh, he's trespassing. You can lock him up for that. I'll see the steward for third charges. I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. But I said I'm sorry. You're not going to prefer anything. Good night. Jimmy, my father was the founder of this club. When I issue an order to one of the paid employees, I expect Yeah, that... yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Issue away. Only someplace else, huh? I'll handle this end. Good night, Mr. Norton. Jimmy, I have never in my life been so... Good night. Yes. Good night. <laughs> well, that was something. Okay, bud. Hand it over. What? Oh, now, wait a minute. You don't mean you believe that old school ties gag about... And still you put him out? The wallet, bud. Oh, sure. Mine. Here. Credentials, the works. Good enough. Oh. Well, I didn't exactly figure. Valentine, eh? Yeah, that's right. Only look, Buster. Why? Why'd you treat him like that? Will him like lettuce before you even know what he had because to say? Because I have no use for the high and mighty Mr. Norton. And don't worry, I won't get in trouble either. <laughs> he maybe don't know it, but he's being eased out the side door of this club anyway. All four of them are. All four? Will you clear that up? You ever hear the Dorothy Fullman murder? Well, that nice, dignified man there, that Norton. For my money, he's the one that killed her. All right, so you've got your opinions, Jimmy. It's just an opinion. I'll stick to it, Mr. Valentine. But there wasn't any concrete evidence against either him or Victor Ames. And what did you mean, all four of them? And why did Norton want to stall me like that? That's all he was trying to do, keep me away from something. You're the detective, mister. Oh, excuse me. Huh? <laughs> Hello, Mr. Chester. Oh, Jimmy, just standing here having a couple of drinks. I, I was downtown. Yes, that's done. Looks like you've had enough. Oh, no, 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 I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm all right. Sure, sure, Mr. Chester. See him? Hmm? Oh, that guy? He's one of them. Say it faster, will you? One of the four. Dorothy Fullman was murdered in her house just over the bluffs across the golf course. Yeah. They never got enough evidence. They never will. But the police did prove that it couldn't be anybody else. It had to be one of the four men mixed up with it. Who are they? Mr. Norton. Ames, big fool, always in trouble. Another man named Salto. He asked me he couldn't have got to first base with it. And Chester there. Oh, I get it. Not much left of Chester, is there? All of them have changed. But he don't even know what he's doing anymore. Hmm. Nobody will confess, no evidence. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, come here. Now, excuse me, steward, back to business. No, no, I'm right behind you. Huh? That's Victor Ames with him, isn't it? With the steward, sure it is. Valentine. Yeah, we catch up again, friend. It's a busy night. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, Jimmy, there's trouble in here. What? The card room, the one with the back entrance. I put those cards in there myself just this evening. Valentine, I've got to see no, you alone. Hold it, will you? Go on, Stuart. Uh, this deck of cards. Uh, some men have been playing in there, apparently, or drawing high man or something. Well, what is it? What's the matter? Uh, well, sir, it's uh, more puzzling than anything else. At a club like this, uh, someone was being dishonest. A rather hasty job, but uh, here you see, this deck has been marked... You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine. Nine of Diamonds. 
nine of clubs. Jack, diamonds. Your turn, Chester. Draw. Yes, I'm king of hearts. I hereby confess one year ago it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Foreman. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. Only if your name is George Valentine, all you know is that Dorothy Fullman murder case has never been solved. That there were four suspects, but the police have despaired of ever finding out who her murderer was. Yes, all you know is that Mrs. Ames was worried about the strange behavior of her husband... More recently, that four men have been playing cards in the back card room of the local club, and that the steward says the deck of cards is marked. No, no, they can't be given. Hey, hey, take it easy, Mister Ames. Let's see, steward. They're not marked. What's bothering you so much, Mister Ames? Kind of a crude job. Yes, Jimmy. Little ticks on the edges, like this. But the person who did it could tell the cards, all right. Get out of here, both of you, Jimmy Stewart. Hey, hey, slow down, Buster. Look, I've got to see you, Valentine. I've got to see you along. Have you been sampling some of that stuff Chester uses, Mr. Ames? What's so important about Chester? Chester. Uh, hey, uh, where are you going, Miss Ames? He was downtown. He's back now. Look, Buster, will the you please? He's here in the bar. He's having those last two drinks. Well, there you are. Oh, hello, Angela. Oh, Mr. Ames, I saw your wife to the station. She said to tell you... Yes, yes, uh, of course... Where is he? What? Little guy, Brooksy. He was in here a few minutes ago. He was having a couple of drinks. Yeah, he's gone now. Well, I did see somebody leaving just when I came in. He looked like he could use a little sleep. It's five minutes to twelve. Time for you to clear it up, friend. Where's Chester gone? What's happening tonight? Could have been any one of us. I mean, the cards marking them. But I didn't try to save my own skin. I would have gone through it if I'd been high, man. What on earth? I'm trying to remember. The watchman's spare gun, that was it. Quit pulling, Buster. What? Yeah, the closet, the back hall. Come on, hurry, will you? The watchman's gun, that was it. Only the cupboard was bare. He's taken it already. Chester. There's certainly no gun in here. We drew. High man. He had the king of hearts. Little Chester, the weakest one in the whole bunch. Didn't even seem to react. What do you look? I, you... I, I know I'm talking wildly. I'll explain later. We've got to find him first. Hurry. Well, we're with you, all right. But who's he going to use this gun on? Who's he? Oh, isn't it perfectly obvious, Mr. Valentine? On himself. Nice, yeah, just like Jimmy said. House over by the bluffs across the golf course. It's certainly deserted looking. For sale, for lease. Chester must be here. It's where he'd come. It's Dorothy Fullman's house, huh? Where she was killed? Yes. In the living room. Found her body there. Beaten to death. Doors open, you see. Chester? Chester! Well, he's not here. The fall guy. Well, we're a long way on the outside of that old crime now, aren't we? Perhaps we beat him here. Missed him in the dark. Chester! What do you mean, George? Ames here knows what I mean. This is where it happened. It wasn't a pleasant crime. And inside a man, a terrible thing like that can get bigger in a year. Huh? Mr. Valentine, I didn't kill her. Sure, sure, that's what they all say. But Buster, I'm just finally beginning to realize what a hopeless, crazy thing is happening tonight. Wait a minute, George, listen. Upstairs. Come on. Chester? Where are you, Chester? It's me, Victor Ames. Salto. Salto, what are you doing here? Mr. Valentine's all right, Salto. He knows the whole story now. But I didn't mark any cards. It wasn't me. Then what are you doing here, Salto? Hiding Leave him away. alone, Ames. Leave him alone. And never mind who marked the cards. But what do you think, Brooksy? Four men actually drawing to see which one would be a four guy. Which one would confess to a murder? I don't believe it. Oh, yes, it's very easy for the two of you to talk like that. I told them it was ridiculous. Same as Russian roulette. Spin the cartridge wheel. See who gets the bullet. Yeah, they couldn't stand to be pointed at. The suspicion, the shadow of guilt. The crime that would never be solved otherwise. Yes, I told them that, but Ames and Norton kept You were willing that. enough, Salter. You didn't have any solution anyway to keep yourself from going insane. Maybe you can't believe it, Miss Brooks. Why should you? You don't have a 
private hell to live in. I don't think that's exactly what she meant, Ames. Sure, I know it's not like in books where people just forget about murder. But to try to dig yourself out of a swamp by drawing, taking one chance in four of being tapped for guilt, just to lay all the ghosts for the others. If we did it, so what? We did it. We've nearly killed each other trying to make each other confess anyway. I was thinking about the second part of the bargain. Suicide for the elected guilty one. Yeah, to make sure the police would accept that confession. Mr. Ames, you might have gone through with it. You're that kind. But I just don't believe that most men Second, would... Angel. All right, how about it, Soldo? That's why you're here, isn't it? To see if Chester would go through with something that you wouldn't do yourself. That I... I'm sorry, Victor. I wouldn't have. I couldn't have. I went along with it. Of course I did. If I'd been high card, I don't know what I would have done, but... Okay, there's one down. Wet feet. By this time, Chester must be aboard the nearest freight train headed for parts unknown. Chester? He signed the confession. But he wouldn't do it. I know he'd been At drinking, the last but... moment, it's a little hard to pull the trigger. Is that so? You're so sure, aren't you? Huh? Moonlight out there. Window, come here. Look. It's him. It's Chester. But he's not coming toward the house. Just walking. That's the path runs up by the bluffs. Yes, and if anything happens to him, it's our fault, Salto. Come on, step on it. Run! Chester! Chester! What's the matter with him? He doesn't even listen. Oh, look out, George. Now, these bluffs are pretty steep, aren't they? Chester! I'm going to climb up this way, too. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. Huh? You what? just stay behind me with Miss Brooks. Valentine. There's another way this whole thing tonight can work. But I'm going to see that it doesn't. George, look, he's up on one of the edges. Stand yeah. still. Oh, what a... Norton. Get out of here. Leave him alone. Norton, wouldn't you know? Stand still. I'm warning you, I have a gun. Oh, yeah, sure. The one from the watchman's locker? He didn't take it. Chester didn't take hey, it. Hey, what's all this? So you did. Sure, sure. You guys wouldn't just make a deal for somebody to commit suicide. You'd get him to write a confession and then murder him. He killed her. He killed our different one. He confessed. George, he's up on the edge. Look at him. Leave him alone. He'll jump, I tell you. Look at the way he's acting. I just followed him. To give him the gun he didn't take. James, listen to me. It will all be over. For all of us. Oh, you inhuman old... Let it happen. If you don't, it'll be the same thing over and over George! and over again. Yeah, look. We can't stop him from here. And he does look like he wants to jump. Okay, so I've been wrong, so I... Valentine! Get out of the way with that gun! Okay, now you're all right, Martin. Stay there, all of you. Chester! Mr. Chester! I'm all right. Uh, Yes? Mr. Chester, now you listen to me. I can't reach you. But Uh, but get away now. There's something I'm going to do. Yeah, I know, I know. Kill yourself. But you were supposed to do it where she died, weren't you? Wasn't that the agreement, Chester, to make it look good? Can you understand me, Mr. Chester? I'm all right. That's it, that's it. Just keep looking at me. It should have been the living room, though. Or were they always wrong? She was beaten, bruised. I remember they said they never found a weapon. Was it really up here that she died? Was she thrown? It would have looked the same if somebody then carried her body back to her house. I'm going to jump, you know. Get back, get back. No, you're not. You're too curious, Chester. This year, since Dorothy Fullman died, must have been the worst for the one who really killed her. Don't you think so, Mr. Chester? What? What do you mean? But admitting it is worse. Some people can't ever do that. They'd rather die than do that. I'm going to jump. You can't stop me. But you don't even want your death to be a confession, do you? Well, they gave you a chance, the little card drawing. You know the masked deck, the marked one, would be found sooner or later. You deliberately left it behind. No, no, no. go away The world would say your confession was a fraud, you were a poor little patsy. Well, any of them could have marked the cards, Norton, Salto, and... The high man marked them. The guilty man, Chester. All I've said is built on that. When there's a drawing, a man can't make another man take a certain card. So if he marks them, he only marks them for himself. Check? Yes, yes, I understand, but... To pick his own card. But the lowest card picked tonight was a nine. If a man wanted a low card, that's not very safe, is it, with 52 cards in the deck? You know, it baffled me for a while, until I saw that you really did want to die. She was faithless. She was bad. Get out of my way! Oh, no, you don't. Now, just hang on. 
You're gonna live, Buster. You're gonna write a real confession. to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. George, it did work out that way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, Brooksy, they pieced it together again. That's why Chester went up to the bluffs instead of taking the gun. That's how he had killed Dorothy Fullman a year back. And if the first confession had gone through, if he'd shot himself, nobody ever would have believed it. Well, the other three would have always thought they railroaded the poor little punchy. Traded their private little hells for new ones. If Mrs. Ames weren't still in love with her husband and called you here. Mm-hmm. George, isn't it uh, remarkable what a woman will do for the man she loves? Remarkable. Forgive... Forget. Protect. I'll remember that. Darling. <laughs> the very next time I'm suspected of murder. Oh! Good night, Brooksy. You have just heard High Card. Another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began when I bumped into a little old man who claimed he was dead and proved it. Night Beats, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. My job is to prowl Chicago at night looking for that ever-loving story that's always out there in the darkness waiting for me. But, like most working stiffs, one day a week, I'm a free man. And this was that day. It was one of those hot spring days that come at you out of nowhere. Hot like only Chicago and one other place can get. I woke up late in the afternoon and went outside for a breath of humidity. I opened my collar and rolled up my sleeves. Man, it was sizzling. There was a little park ahead. I was just going to stretch out on the grass when I saw him. My first thought was, pass the salt tablets quick. The sun's got me and I'm seeing things. But no... He was real, all right. Sitting on a park bench on this boiling day, a fat old guy in a heavy overcoat with muffler, galoshes, and gloves. I went over to him. He looked up and smiled. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Sit down. Sit down. You look tired. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Nothing is worth getting tired for. Man is here for such a little while. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, forgive me for bringing this up, but I, uh, I think it's only fair to tell you, at this moment, the temperature in this city is pretty close to 100 degrees. Oh, is that so? Yeah. 
For two cents, I'd trade everything I'm wearing for one heart shafter in Mark's fig leaf. You are lucky, young man, to feel the good sun. Yes, that is something fine. As for me, I am chilled to the bone. In that overcoat and that muffler? Yes. <laughs> How could any living thing be cold on a day like this? Mm, I suppose that is just it. What? I'm not a living thing. No, I'm afraid I'm quite dead. I think I'll walk around a bit. Goodbye. Uh, I say, say. Hmm? I, uh, I suppose I'm just inquisitive, but uh, you see, that's my business. I'm a newspaper man. Oh, yes. An honorable profession. Oh, thank you. Uh, just, uh, why do you think you're dead? Think? So you don't believe me either. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's silly, isn't it? Uh, when did you die? I, the funeral was last week. A very nice funeral. I regret only that there were no plumed horses. Plumed horses? Uh -huh. In the old country, that was a requirement for the head of a family. But in America, of course, such customs seem foolish. Uh, yeah, yeah, foolish. Mm -hmm. yeah, you still don't believe me? Well, let's say that I'm just an old skeptic. All right, young man. To doubt everything in this life is to miss so much of life's true magnificence. You need a lesson. Hey, come with me. So I went with him, this strange man so comfortable in an overcoat on this oppressive day. We stopped at the first large office building and went into the lobby. The old man took me to the directory on the wall. Can you find the name of a doctor? A doctor? Why do you want a doctor? Oh, you will see. Uh-huh. Ah, uh, yes, yes, there's a Dr. E.M. Herrick, Suite 706. Is he good? I don't know. He's the only one listed. Uh, well, he doesn't have to be too good. Come on. The receptionist in the doctor's suite eyed us quite distastefully, but in a reasonable time, we were ushered into Dr. Herrick's presence. He was a nice little fella, but the sight of the old man seemed to confuse him. Now, uh... Just what seems to be the trouble, Mr. Uh, uh... Henry Kazarian. Yes. Well? I want you to examine me and tell the newspaper man what you find. Newspaper man? Well, I'm afraid I don't understand. And I'm afraid I can't help you, Doc. Why not uh, examine him and let it go, then? Yes. Please do. But uh, what seems to be the trouble with you? Uh, what are your symptoms? Uh, my symptoms were discovering the world no longer needed me. That can be very painful. Oh, but this isn't anything to... Oh, work. come on, Doc, will you? It's my day off. Let's get it over with, hmm? All right. Now, Mr. Kazarian, uh, take off your overcoat and shirt. The old guy undressed to the waist. His skin looked yellow and faded, but I figured that could happen to anyone his age. The doctor smiled, fastened his stethoscope to his ears, and began his examination. I put a cigarette in my mouth, but... I never lit that cigarette. I was watching the doctor. I was watching the color drain from his face. I was watching his fingers start shaking like he was trying to make nine the hard way. The doctor touched the stethoscope to a dozen parts of the old man's chest. Now he looked up and it seemed to me in those few seconds he'd aged ten years. Mr. Kazarian, I... I want you to wait in the next room. Uh -huh. Now, what did you find, doctor? I'm sure the newspaper men would be most interested. I told... I told you to wait in the next room. Take your coat and shirt. I'll be right with you. Yes, all right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I can't believe it. It's impossible. It's a trick, a hypnotic trick. No. No, no, that's not true. Oh, you're not going to tell me that that old man is really... Not the slightest heartbeat. What? No cardiovascular reaction whatsoever. That man is... He... Is... Oh, no, this is crazy. Maybe it's your stethoscope. Maybe it's on the bum or something. No, no, that's not the answer. Then what is the answer? Are you trying to tell me that that guy is really dead? Let's get him back in here. Let's talk to him. Yes, yes, by all means. He's gone. But how? This door leads into the hall... He's not in the hall. You're not going to print this in the paper, are you? Print it? How could I? The city editor would fire me so fast my head would spin. He'd say I was dead drunk. But... 
If you were to confront... No. What? Never. If you or your editor or anyone else ever calls me about this, I'll swear I never saw you or the old man before in all my life. I have to protect my reputation. Uh, you can understand that, can't you? Understand? At this point, I understand very little, Herr Doctor. After I left the doctor's office, I looked around the building for the old man. He was gone, all right, but his memory lingered on. Who was fooling who? I went into a phone booth and called the medical association to ask about the professional standing of Dr. Herrick. A nasal-voiced young woman informed me that Dr. Herrick was one of the most able physicians in the city. And her manner indicated that I should have had my mouth washed out with soap for even asking. After that, I looked up the name Kazarian in the phone book. It was there, Henry Kazarian, 612 Post Street. I telephoned, but the line was busy, so I hopped into a cab and took a ride out. It was a neat little white bungalow, but all the shades were down. I rang the bell for a long time before the door opened. Yes? What is... I'd like to talk to Henry Kazarian. Who? Henry Kazarian. Hen... Henry... <laughs> oh, what's wrong? You have... You have not heard about my Henry. Hmm? He is dead. Uh, but, lady... We buried uh... him. Two days ago. But that can't be. Oh, I can't believe it myself. It seemed like I suddenly wake up and there would be Henry saying, All right, Mama, get up. Get up, you're lazy enough for three wives. Uh, he was buried two days ago? Yeah, from Carell's Temple of Rest. A very wonderful service. All that was lacking was... The plumed horses. The plumed horses. Oh, yes. mm, Papa, you would have been so mad if he knew there was no plumed horses. Ah, uh, yes, he certainly was. Yeah. I mean that, uh... Mrs. Kazarian, I'd like to talk to you. May we go inside? No, or... but... We are in mourning. If you want to know about the funeral, talk to Mr. Carrell. <laughs> Yes. I buried Mr. Kazarian. Why do you ask? Why, uh, for the very trivial reason, Mr. Carell, that I spent the afternoon with him. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'm a very busy man, Mr. Stone. Very busy. You think I'm crazy, huh? Well, I never saw Kazarian in my life, but here's how he looked to me this afternoon. A short, fat guy, about 65. Looks like he ate too much good food all his life. A mustache that just about drooped down to his chin. You look a little pale, Mr. Carell. You uh, saw his picture somewhere? No. I tell you, he's alive. I even went with him to a doctor. Oh, really? Well, my goodness. And what did the doctor say? He, uh... Yes, <sighs> Mr. Stone? All right. Where is he buried? At a cemetery at the edge of the city. Uh, I've got to go there on, uh, Well, another matter, if you care to come along. Yes, indeed I would, Mr. Carell. Indeed I would. <laughs> Right here, Mr. Stone, this mound. You see, the earth is very fresh and the flowers have hardly wilted. But listen, Mr. Carell, it can't be him. Mr. Stone, the only reason I'm doing this is to avoid any stupid, sensational publicity. Carell's Temple of Rest is one of the most highly respected... Yes, yes, and Dr. Herrick is one of the most highly respected doctors, and Mrs. Kazarian is a grieving widow. There's got to be a logical answer to this. There's just got to be. You are listening to Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. When the undertaker brought me back to town, I called an insurance clearinghouse to find out if anyone had cashed in a policy on Mr. Kazarian. No, Mr. Kazarian didn't carry any insurance, so that wasn't the answer. I was beginning to get a little panicky. It was after six o'clock and I wasn't a bit hungry. I started walking home to see if I could figure out one thing in all that happened that made even a little sense. <laughs> Best I could come up with was that everybody was right, that Kazarian really was dead. I was too, and I didn't know it yet. I, uh, as I laughed a great deal at that, 
But just the same, I weighed myself on the first penny scale I passed, and I looked at my tongue in the little mirror. I was just a couple of blocks away from home, and I felt somebody tugging at my sleeve. Mister? Mm -hmm. What's the matter? You hot or something? What are you talking about? Somebody's following you. Following me? An old guy wearing an overcoat? No, a young fella. What? Don't look back yet, but he's wearing a blue sport jacket, and he's built like an aircraft carrier. How long has he been following me? For the last few blocks. All right. Here. Uh, take this and then get lost. Sure. Thanks, mister. Okay. I figured you ought to know. I kept walking along, and after a while I spotted his reflection. If only one quarter of those shoulders and that blue sport jacket were really his, I was in trouble. I stopped to light a cigarette. He stopped to tie his shoelace. I wiped the perspiration off my face. He smiled. No, he wasn't following me. It's just my imagination. I turned down a quiet street a few blocks from my rooming house. I looked back. Nobody. I found it was much easier to breathe. And then up ahead of me, somebody was waiting at the corner. Yup, shoulders. He'd circled around the other side of the block. Oh, great. I started walking past him like he wasn't even there. Mister. I'm... Let me say it just once. Uh, sure. Lay off. Fine. Goodbye now. I mean it. Lay off. Ah, uh, now you've said it twice. Leave it alone. It's none of your business. I presume we're both talking about the same thing. The little man who wasn't there, Kazarian. What's the story on this guy? What's the gimmick? How can he be dead and buried? Mister, I ask you real nice and polite. Yeah, I know. Emily Post couldn't have done it better. But still, I'm going to find You're out. You're not going to find anything. <laughs> You're not going to find a thing. <laughs> After a while, I started climbing out of the fog. And the way I felt, I wanted to climb right back in. All I had to worry about was history's most promising headache. It was after nine o'clock when I got to my room. I took a couple of aspirins, flopped across the bed, and tried to relax. Only the street lamp kept shining in my eyes. I got up to pull down the shade. Then I saw the gray sedan parked across the street. Three guys piled out, and they started toward the rooming house. And leading the way was my old pal Shoulders, back for an encore. I headed for the back stairs. I went across a couple of backyards, came out on the side street, and now I was starting to get sore. I found a taxi and headed back for Kazarian's house. The taxi let me out about half a block down the street. Kazarian's house was all dark, except for a tiny window in back. I went around to the window and looked in. And there was the old man. He was sitting in a leather chair, smoking a pipe. I tapped on the window. He turned, recognized me, and smiled. And someone out in front of the house spotted me. There he is! Where? Where? I started running toward the backyard. They were right on my tail. I came to a fence. I found the gate. It was locked. Shoulders, who was heading the pack, was the first to reach me. You just won't stop, William. No, I just not. I tore away from him. I ran down the length of the backyard fence, tried to find an opening. The others were coming up fast. I told myself I could never jump over that fence, but with those guys closing in, I was a hard man to convince. And the next thing I knew, I was crouching behind a couple of garbage cans in the alley. And I thought, what a fine way to die, behind a garbage can, my lifeblood draining out on some old melon rinds. He couldn't have gotten away. He must have. I told you to stop him. <laughs> And then the footsteps passed me. My heart decided it was okay to start beating again. And then I went back to the house, and I found the old man's window. It was dark now, like the rest of the house, but the window was open a few inches. I started pushing it up some more. Who is that? It's me, Randy Stone. I'm coming in. I not that wise, that young man. Really, it is quite foolish. Yeah, nobody knows that better than I. I'd appreciate it if you didn't call for help. Why should I? Mm -hmm. Where's the light switch? Oh, yeah. I see you're not wearing your overcoat now, nor your gloves. You're not so cold now, huh? No. Isn't that strange here in the house? I, I do not feel it nearly so much. Yeah, that is funny. Why, why are you coming toward me like that? I want to shake your hand, Mr. Kazarian, just a gesture of friendliness. Uh, but somehow you do not look at all friendly. Your hand. <laughs> Surely. I thought so. It's as warm as mine. Very nice pulse, too. What's the story, Mr. Kazarian? Oh, you are mistaken, young man. I am dead. How were you able to fool that doctor? 
Why did the undertaker swear he buried you? Why is your wife in mourning? Why was I slugged? But these are questions I cannot answer. I, I'm an old man and I'm very tired. Oh, would you say I was impolite if I asked you to leave? Sure, I'll leave. Would you say I was impolite if I asked you where I could find the nearest police station? Because that's where I'm going. You're not going anywhere, Stone. Papa, I told you to holler for us if he bought it. I knew there would be trouble. I just knew it. Dr. Herrick. Life is full of trouble. Death is endless peace. If this gets in the paper, it'll be the end of everything. Oh, and Mr. Carell of the Temple of Rest. What a spot for a chorus of all Lang Syne. You keep real quiet, Stone. Oh, that's a deal, Shoulders. Well, I wish you would all leave. In my lifetime, I saw none of you. Now that I am dead, you crowd around me like vultures. Yes, Papa, we leave just so you shouldn't get excited. Come, boys. Well, Come leave boys. me in peace, huh? Leave me in peace. Oh. Papa likes to sit by himself sometimes. George, you stop looking so tough. Nobody's afraid of you. Peter, why you just stand here and haul? Huh? Go to the kitchen, put up hot water for tea. Yes, Mama. Mama? Carell, you call her mama? Of course, sir. Uh... Go to the kitchen, Peter. All of you. Go. I I will explain to the young man. Perhaps I should do it, Mama. Mama again, you too, Dr. Herrick? Yes. No, I... no, I I explain, Armand. You only use big doctor words. Nobody understands. All of you, go. I said go to the kitchen. Uh... And uh, George, the bread box is some baklava. You serve with the tea. Yes, Mama. Mama, Mama, Mama. And you. Young man, you come in here, in the parlor. Uh, yes, Mama. And we will close the door. Now I... I will tell you everything. So they're your sons? Yeah. Well, fine, boys. Your papa and I, we would have liked at least one girl. The doctor and the undertaker. Now it begins to make sense, but... But their names... For their work. They said they need American names. The whole country, the name Caseria. Uh, young man, young man, that was a name. Meant something. But here it's got to be Carell and Herrick, hmm? Tell me uh, about Papa. Yeah, excuse me. 1910, Papa, me and the kids, we come to America. Even though an old country, Papa's head of whole Caserian clan, we come. So kids go to school. Become more than gold herders, rug merchants. And they do... Uh, my boys, too. But they marry, they drift away. Soon, Papa and I are alone. And if the kids come over once every two months to see Papa, we think we are lucky. Imagine that, Papa Kassarian head of whole family. <sighs> and then last week, Start with Papa. I heard alarm clock go off. I got up like I always do, sleepy thinking. All country exists for so many thousand years without alarm clocks. Why we need that? Eh? I shut alarm clock off. Papa, 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 where are you? I heard to the house, and I found him in the kitchen. Sitting at table in overcoat. Papa, so here you are. You feel all right. Mm -hmm. For dead men, I feel all right. For a dead man, you should not talk like that, Papa. You got many years mm -hmm. ahead of you. I got eternity ahead of me. You call my sons. You tell them Papa is dead. You feel sick. I call him and he's fine doctor. No, oh, woman, listen to me. I am not sick. Mm. I am dead. Do not call Armand the fine doctor. Call my son Peter the fine undertaker. Mm. Do as I say. Tell them Papa is dead. Papa, this is nonsense. I've given you a complete examination. You're not dead. You're in perfect health. You I do not need any more, Peter. You give me a good funeral, I want plumed horses. Papa, don't talk like that. You don't need any funeral. What am I to do? Just sit here? A dead man? Oh, you see, boys, you see how it is. Eh? Sometimes happens in a man of his age. Mm -hmm. Might be only temporary. 
I think we should put him in a sanitarium. No. Huh? Are you forgetting who Papa is, the head of whole family? But Mama, in his present condition... Also, the old country here in America, everywhere, the Acastarians, he's the head. Oh, just think what happened if they heard Papa had, had, had gone crazy. But we could keep it quiet, Mama. No, 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 news get out somewhere. It would be the end of everything. But Mama... No, wait, I, I'm on, uh, Mama's right. I've been thinking of something else. Yes? What about us, you and me? We've got our careers to think of. But I told you, these things are only temporary. All the more reason for not putting Papa away. If it's only temporary, then why can't we care for him here? Well, I, I suppose we could. Papa, where are you going? Where can the dead man go? To walk the streets? Uh, don't let him out. Uh, humor him. Do, do something, Mama. Papa, I, I don't think you'd better go out. After all, maybe... Maybe you really are dead, like you say. And in that case... Uh, Papa, I I I'll give you a wonderful funeral. Uh, You'll see the best in town. With plumed horses? Yes, Papa, plumed horses. If you'll only do what we tell you. And stay in the house. Mama Kazarian didn't have to tell me anymore. They humored Papa so that he'd stay in the house, hoping his madness would pass, and his family and the rest of the clan would not be disgraced. But one morning he escaped, and that's when I met him. When he took me to his son, Dr. Herrick, and told him I was a newspaper man, the doc thought everything was about to fall apart, so he went along with Papa's madness. And so did Carell and the others. That's why I was followed. That's why shoulders slugged me. That's why they all came to my room later to try to talk to me. I promised to keep their confidence... Ate some of Mama's cookies, shook hands all around, and left. But as I was walking through the yard toward the street, a window opened. Young man. Hmm? Come over here, over to the window. Oh, Mr. Kazarian. Okay, sure. If you keep your voice down, I don't want them to hear. Hmm? Hmm? But you are a nice young man. I feel in you uh, an understanding. That is why I talked to you in the park. That is why I talk to you now. What do you mean? They tell you now, huh? How you say I am uh, cracked in the head, hmm? Insane. Because I say I am dead. Uh, maybe, but let me tell you this. For 22 years, while I was not dead, and while I was sane, I worked 12, 14 hours a day. I never saw the sun. I never had time to think to remember the old days. Only work and work. Work. Then, then my boys left me. And even my name they don't want. The name Kazarian. And then Mama and me was, was left alone. Yeah, that, that was the way it was when I was sane and alive. So... So, one morning I wake up and I say, Okay, if that is how it is when I'm alive, I no longer wish to be alive. I am dead. Now, my sons come fast, I tell you. They say, No, no, he is not dead. He is insane. All right, eh? I am too old to argue. Hmm? But now that I am insane, I no longer lift even this little finger. No work. <laughs> no worry. And my boys stay with us constantly, like like the old days. <laughs> I, I, I snap my fingers and, and they shiver. Now, today, I think maybe Armand is getting too smart again, so I bring you to his office. Did you see what happens? <laughs> Did you see what happens? <laughs> Well, you old faker. <laughs> so, uh, what do you say I should do? Huh? Should I call the bin and say, Okay, I am not dead. I am alive. And give up everything I got now. So they can say I am sane again. Well, should I, young man? Eh? Hmm? Should I? <laughs> oh, Papa, if you did that, that would only prove one thing. Mm. And what is that? Well, if you called them in and told them the truth, you'd be the craziest man alive. All 
promise and a moral, too, huh? All right, I'll give you a moral. All Papa Kazarian wanted was not to be left out in the cold. I guess maybe that's just about what all of us want. To be needed by somebody, to be loved by somebody. And why not? Is that such a big deal? In all this cockeyed, crazy world, what else do any of us ever really have? Except each other. Copy boy... Oh, no, what am I saying? Copy boy. This was my day off. Remember? Night Beats, a new dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is written and edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music is by Frank Worth. Papa was played by Ben Wright. Betty Lou Gerson played Mama. Others in tonight's cast were Jeff Corey, Lou Krugman, and Paul Duboff. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. March is Red Cross Month. One of the most important of the many services performed by the Red Cross is its aid to our armed forces. In this country and overseas, in military hospitals, Red Cross workers, aided by thousands of volunteers, play an increasingly vital part in meeting the needs of the patient. Remember, your contribution to the Cross will help the men in whose hands our nation's security may rest. So... Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? No, he isn't. Huh? Oh, well, for you, maybe he is. I'm not here. Oh, yes, yeah. He's always here. I've gone out. No, no. He seldom ever goes out. I won't start on anything tonight. Oh, sure. He'd love to start on a case tonight. What's your name? Oh, that's a beautiful name. Address? Ah, gee, it's another woman. Hang up. No, no, no. Honest, I'm not Mr. Wolf, but I'm his agent. Yeah, I'll be right over, miss. Goodbye. What's her trouble? Where are you going? Well, she said she's received some threatening notes and she's afraid to leave her hotel. So long, boss. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> to call tonight's story The Case of the Vanishing Shells. It didn't seem to be difficult at first, but, well, I'm not a stupid individual, but so often, ooh, so often, I allow myself to become mesmerized by beautiful women. <laughs> Heaven bless them. Doris Murray was such a woman. She phoned us first late one afternoon about 5 o'clock, then again at 5.30. Very well, Mr. Goodwin, but I, I would prefer to see Mr. Wolf. Well, I said I'd be there at 6, Miss Murray. I don't want to talk any longer on the phone. Please hurry. There, there's someone at the door. I'll see you in the cocktail lounge at your hotel. At six o'clock. That's half an hour. Don't fail. Who is it? Emil Stoner. Oh, come in, Emil. You got my call, darling. Here, let me take your briefcase. I, I, I'll just put it here on the piano, Doris. Oh, I'm terribly upset about those... Threatening notes, darling. I, I know it's upset you, too, but I'm determined to find out who it is. 
I'm not going to let them bluff me out of my first chance to play the star part in one of your shows. But look, Doris, there's that other part. Other? Is that all I mean to you? Well, what can they divulge that'll harm us? What? Several things. And I can't afford... A, I mean, at this time... You're frightened, Emil. Doris, I'm going to give the star part to Paula. Paula! You've been divorced for four years. Why? Because I feel she and can... And play it better. Is that what you're going to say? Well, I can act rings around her. Now, 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 look, Doris. I know it's a big disappointment to you, but that's the way it is. Get out. Get out. Go on across the hall to Paula. Give her the part. Louse up your show. She and that playwright of hers. Get out, Emil. But, Doris... You I... frightened little... Get out! <laughs> I believe, Mr. Wolf, you're making a great mistake in not coming along. Indeed. I'm sure that what attracts you could not possibly be of interest to me. A gal needs help. Money is money. Girls, money, phooey. Yeah, well, we could have dinner out for a change. They have one of the finest chefs in town at that hotel. You're most impolite. I'm trying to read this book. Poetry. Archie. Uh, yes, sir? Shut up. Uh, yes. But we need money. That filthy green cabbage is necessary to our existence. This may be a tough case, you know. I... You're sufficiently intelligent. Sometimes. Mm. If I sat around like you do, I'd weigh 500 pounds, too. How'd you leave the room besides it's only 300? What a way to run a business. Orchids, beer, books. <laughs> Don't keep the charming client waiting. Okay, I'm going, I'm going. And always remember, that is a telephone. <laughs> Thank you, waiter. <clears throat> oh, good evening, Miss Moray. I'm Archie Goodwin. Well, I didn't expect... Uh, I mean, please sit down. Well, I think I should explain the absence of Nero Wolf. <laughs> there's, uh, there's so much of him that it's not too convenient to transport it about. I do all the outside work. And I'm sure you do it well. Uh, Mr. Well, you know, some women call me Goodwin and some call me Mr. Goodwin. And uh, yes. uh, the unattached call me Archie. Hello, Archie. Oh, splendid. I'm glad to hear it. Now we can get right down to the nasty old business that's troubling you, Doris. First, here's the 500 retainer fee. Well, oh, thank you. Now, what's the note about? Well, there are two notes, both printed by hand. Uh-huh. Oh, will you hand me my purse, please? Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh, I see. Doris Moray. If you fail to withdraw from the cast of Stoner's next production by start of rehearsals Monday, both you and Stoner will have a blasted reputation and perhaps other injuries from which you will be unable to recover. The other one is like it, only more vehement. Yeah, someone or a group of someones are intent on keeping you out of Stoner's shows, huh? It's too bad. His next one is said to be a sure smash hit and a star-making part for the leading woman. Yes, Amos Stoner wants me to play it. He's been planning on it ever since David Banning wrote the play. What does David Banning think of you playing the part? Well, I... I don't think he's too enthused about it. You see, Mr. Stoner and Paula Kenyon have been divorced for four years, but... She has continued to be his top leading woman. Now she's engaged to David Banning, who wrote this play. Oh. Makes things a bit difficult. Well, of course, Rick Hunter, Stoner's director, is... Hunter's somewhat in favor of your playing the part. Well, Rick Hunter is very fond of my work. And very fond of you as well, huh? Yes, unfortunately. I... I like Rick Hunter tremendously, but... Amos Stoner has been of greater interest to me. In fact, we're more or less engaged, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, well, had any words lately with the ex-Mrs. Stoner, Paula Canyon, is that her name? Paula and I were great friends when I first joined the Stoner Productions, but I don't know, she... I, I don't think she appreciated the fact that Mr. Stoner and Rick Hunter, the director, took such an interest in me. Tell me, did you ever think you were in love with Rick Hunter? Yes, at first I was thrilled by his artistic imagination. And then as time went on, I realized that he was subject to melancholia. Mr. Stoner was more stable, and I needed someone older to advise me. Well, what's wrong with your reputation of Mr. Stoner's? Well, there's nothing I fear, but I'm afraid Mr. Stoner is somewhat disturbed by these threats. He, he feels there's something in his past of sufficient import to really harm him. I think it's nonsense. Well, then what we have to do is uncover this person or persons before you end up with ruined careers on Broadway. Where does the ex-Mrs. Stoner live? Well, as a matter of fact, she lives just down the hall from me. Lived here for years. Oh, well, I think it's advisable, honey, that you stay close to your room until we solve this thing. Oh, but I'm not afraid for my life, Archie. No? 
Well, I am. I'll see you into your room, Doris. Oh, now, please, Mr. Goodwin, if you... Oh, you don't trust the boy, huh? Well, I... Such beautiful eyes. Well, I... Lovely red hair. Yeah. You could have the lead in my new play. I never wrote one, but for you, I'll try anything. <laughs> Come along. Here's your bag. Well, hello, Doris. Oh, hello, Rick. Mr. Goodwin, this is Rick Hunter. Hiya, Hunter. Nice shows you've been putting on. I've just been admiring your work, Goodwin. Hey, oh, well, that's nice. I'm glad. Nothing like encouragement for a beginner, Mr. Hunter. You're ready for the big time from what I saw. Heard from Emil Stoner today, Doris? I talked to him once this morning. Uh, have you been sitting in the cocktail lounge all afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> that I have, honey. I want to see you play that lead, baby. And I think I just about got it all settled. Dreaming about it won't settle it. Flicker never accomplished anything in itself, Rick. Come on, Mr. Goodwin. He's a very jealous man, Doris. In fact, right now, I can feel his thoughts piercing me between the shoulder blades. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Here's a phone. Yes, Archie? How do you know it's Archie? I felt the time was exactly right for you to call. I wish you felt it was time to earn some money. Is this a worthwhile case? Well, she's a beautiful redhead, and... Uh... That, of course, makes it very worthwhile. Fooey, a pittance, and probably all you'll ever get. What do you mean by that? She's probably guilty. Now look, boss, she's the victim. Received notes threatening her reputation and her health if she plays the star part in Emil Stoner's new production. Also, they threaten Emil Stoner likewise. The playwright, Dave Banning, is engaged to Paula Kenyon. Incidentally, she lives here at the hotel, too, just down the hall from Doris. I remember her. And the playwright wants Paula Kenyon to play the part. Well, Archie, you have only the beginning. It is probably too late to prevent whatever is going to happen. Like what, for instance? Have you found a body yet? Call me after you find the body. What body? There's no body. But there will be, Archie. There's always a body where you are concerned. Either a body beautiful or a dead one. Bye. Thanks for seeing me to my room, Archie. Oh, I'm not stopping here, Doris. I'll take a look inside. But I'm not... Oh, I insist... Part of my job, you know. If I fail to take every precaution, Mr. Wolf would never... Well, look in that chair. Emil. Emil? Emil Stoner? Oh, three red dots on his shirt front. Ah, uh, Doris, Doris, hold on. I, I'm all right. Yes, I, I'm all right. All right, sit down. That's it. Oh. Now, let's see. The body's still warm. What's this crumpled in his left hand? A horoscope. Between the fingers of his right hand, an unlit cigarette. My grand PK. Paula Kenyon. This horoscope is from March. Something he picked up from your desk here? I don't believe in astrology. Where'd he get this cigarette with Paula Kenyon's monogram? Oh, poor Emil. Poor Emil. I, I didn't believe anyone would really harm us. Why was I so stubborn? When did you see him last? Please, shouldn't we do something? Call the police. No, 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 not yet. When did you see him? Why, I, I saw him this morning. I... Shocked, I can hardly think clearly. Doris. Yes? There's a briefcase here on the piano with a newspaper on top of it. What? Oh, it, it is, yes. It's it's Amos. He, he must have left it here this morning. That's strange. Emil Stoner was bald, but... But what? Well, I'm sure he's a man who always wore a hat, but I see no hat. He must have come up the elevator as I went down to meet you. Who would know he'd come up here? Your director, Rick Hunter, he said he'd been in a bar all afternoon. What else was it he said? Thought he had everything just about settled. Oh, no, Rick couldn't. He just... Oh, Mr. Goodwin, I, I couldn't believe that. I can believe anything about anybody. I learned that the hard way. In my book, everybody's guilty until proved otherwise. Even you, baby. What? Even you. Yeah. A Herald Tribune newspaper. Are you sure you haven't seen him since this morning, Doris? What are you doing? Absolutely nothing. Someone came in here and shot him. Call the police. I insist. Maybe... What? Maybe I did leave my door unlocked. Why did I do that? Well, they couldn't have opened the door otherwise, could he? No. Give me the check room, please. Oh, hello. Did you, uh... Do you know Mr. Emil Stoner, the producer? You do? 
Well, uh, tell me, did he check his hat with you this afternoon or this evening? He didn't, huh? All right, thanks. He must have carried it up here to this floor. Doris, do you have a gun? I own a gun. A small twenty-five automatic. But it's not here. Where is it? I had the handle repaired and it's been in my dressing room for a week or two. I hate to do this, Doris, but I'm going to move the body away from the back of that chair. Oh. There. Yeah, three wounds. One bullet went through the upper part of the chest, out the middle of the back. I'd say right through the heart. By the angle of the wound, he was shot while sitting down. Please, Mr. Goodwin, must we stay here? I, I want to give this room a thorough going over. We'll go down to the lobby. I want to use that phone booth again. And, Doris, I hope... I know what you're going to say. You hope that gun of mine... Is still in your dressing room at the theater. <laughs> Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh, Mr. Wolf, may I have your autograph? <laughs> I'm taking a correspondence course on how to be a detective, and I think you're a wizard. <laughs> so kind of you to say so. I would be just thrilled to have your autograph on the bottom of a paycheck. Why are you calling from a phone booth? What? Huh? Who said I was? It's obvious. There's no room tone reverberation. Uh, oh, well, you shouldn't have to ask. You know everything before it happens. You found the body then. It happened just before you got there. No weapon? No, no weapon. But Doris Murray says she owns a 25 caliber automatic and it's in her dressing room at the theater. Also, she claims she hadn't seen Stoner since this morning. You found no empty shells about the floor? None. What did you do with the bullet? What bullet? The one which passed through his chest and lodged in the back of the leather chair. Are you there? Boss, I'm a very stupid fella. Stop bragging. The bullet. Archie, let us pretend, only pretend, that you're very observant. Now proceed to Paula Kenyon's apartment, just down the hall, you said, and see what she knows without divulging the fact that Stoner is dead and look sharp. My gears must be slipping. Archie, do you know what great event will be celebrated tomorrow? Yeah, my birthday. What'd you get me? Cuthbert's Correspondence Detective Course in Four Easy Lessons. Bye. This is Paul's apartment. No answer. Let's see if it's open. Ah, there's no one in sight. Come on in. Now, look, if anyone walks in on us, we found the door open and we just came in to wait. Huh? Which is the truth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ah, here on the desk we have a stack of horoscope stars and a box of Paula's monogrammed cigarettes. Mr. Goodwin. Huh? This is Emil's grave fedora hat. And he was in this apartment this afternoon. What are you staring at? Oh, small pearl-handled automatic. Yes. Twenty-five caliber. Yeah, it's been fired very recently. We won't touch it now. Does it look like yours? Archie, it is mine. Yeah. Your initials? I found old Jenkins, the stage doorman at the theater, to look in my dressing room. And... Well, my gun isn't there. Did you leave the gun out in plain view in the dressing room? Yes, for several days anyway. Then I put it behind the mirror. I suppose many people have seen it. Then. I'm sure. I hope, Doris, that your fingerprints are not the only ones on that gun. If they use my gun to shoot him in my apartment, why would they bring the gun back here and leave it in plain well, sight? maybe they didn't do it just that way. No. His hat's here, the gun is here, and yet he's dead in your apartment. How can you answer that? Well, maybe he was sitting here waiting for Paula and someone called him out and over to your place and shot him. Ah, that's no good. Doesn't make sense. 
Now, if he was sitting in this chair here and someone entered that door, it'd be... Hey. What is it? Look in the chair back. Huh? Little round hole. Start looking for some empty shells around here. You find something? No, I want to make a call. He was shot with this automatic. Three shells were ejected. They certainly vanished. Here, yeah, Wolf speaking. Archie, I'm in Paula Kenyon's. She's not here. Found his hat, a stack of horoscopes on the desk, box of monogram cigarettes, a 25 automatic which belongs to Miss Moray, recently fired, but not an empty shell in sight. No blood, but a single small hole in the back of the chair near the desk. Doris Moray is with me. I will call in Inspector Kramer now about the body and have ballistics check the bullets with a gun. And the bullet in the chair back? Did you find anything of particular importance in Emil Stoner's briefcase? Yes, I found... Never mind, bring the girl here at once. Okay, boss. Say, don't you think I'd better wait for Paula Kenyon? Uh-oh, here she is. Bye. Bring her along, too, if you can. Goodbye. Hello, Paula. Well, Doris, what are you doing here? I wasn't aware that I left the door unlocked. Seems to be contagious this evening. I left mine unlocked, too. Hello, Dave. Uh, Miss Kenyon and Mr. Goodwin. Hello, Doris. Hello, Hello. Archie, this is Dave Banning, the playwright. How are you, Mr. Banning? How do you do? I've heard all about your new play, and I want to meet you. Doris thought you might be over here, and the door was ajar, so we, well... I just walked in. I hope you don't mind, Paula. Certainly not. I'm used to people just walking in. We were here a while ago and went down to the cocktail lounge for a while. When does the play open? I have you cast it yet. The Mr. Stoner handles that part of it. Are you a prospective investor, Goodwin? Oh, I've had a number of flings in the business. Matter of fact, I expect to see Mr. Stoner tonight. You do? Tonight? Here? I don't understand. What's this fencing all about? Doris, you're not just visiting me. We've hardly spoken for... Oh. Is that your gun, Miss Kenyon? It's yours, Doris. Yes, that's right, Paula. It was in my dressing room. When did you see Mr. Stoner last? But I haven't seen him today. I had lunch with him. Why? What hat did he wear at lunchtime, Mr. Banning? Why, the gray fedora. How did it get here? That's Amos. What is this? What are you two doing here? Where is Amos? Come on, cut out the melodramatics. Mr. Stoner is dead. He's what? Paula. And without any further explanation, I shall have to ask you to accompany me downtown. Police? If you will, please. They're still in the front room, boss. I'll bring them into your office when you're ready. Yes, R.G., I'm sure they're all anxious to talk. They've been sitting there for an hour and now. Maybe we ought to make some sort of explanation to them, huh? Why? This sort of technique should work very well in this particular instance. Yeah, but I don't know about that director, Rick Hunter. He may be difficult. Does anyone know that you found the completed and signed contract in the briefcase? No one. Mm -hmm. Good. Now we have the threat notes, the contract, the afternoon newspaper, the briefcase, the fedora hat, the gun, no ejected shells, the horoscope, the cigarette, and the two chairs. One with a small hole in it. Come in. Ah, Inspector Kramer at last. Uh, what have you? Well, we covered every inch of that place and didn't find a single empty shell. There were two bullets in the body and the one that passed through him into the chair back in Paula Kenyon's place. They were all three fired from Doris Moray's little automatic. Any fingerprints on the gun? None but Doris Moray's. Not unexpected, to say the least. The bullet that was lodged in the chair in Paula's place went through his heart. Now, he was apparently shot in her room, but, uh... But how did he get into Doris Murray's place? I'll be able to explain that when we locate those three empty shells, Inspector. Bring our guests in, Archie. Come in, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nero Wolf. Miss Paula Kenyon. Hello. Miss Doris Murray. Hello, Mr. Rick Hutter, the director. How do you do? David Banning, the playwright. How do you do? Won't you be seated, please? May I present Inspector Kramer of Homicide? How do you do, Inspector? Yeah. Mr. Wolf has asked you here to give such details as you recall, which might be of assistance to him in the solution of the murder of Emil Stoner. Mr. Hunter, as the director, whom did you favor as the star of your next production? Why, Doris Murray. You have been deeply interested in Miss Murray? Hasn't done me much good. But you do love her? I do. And you are deeply interested in the progress of her career. I am, most assuredly. Did you know that Mr. Stoner had made out and signed a contract for a certain woman to play the lead in the new show? No. You knew that Doris Murray had a gun in her dressing room? Yes. 
You were in the hotel cocktail lounge all afternoon until you met Doris and Mr. Goodwin. Yes. And you could have seen Emil Sterner into the lobby and go to the elevator. I could. Could you prove that you never left the cocktail lounge until you met Doris and Archie? Maybe not. Did you see Mr. Stoner going to the elevator? I did. Mr. Banning, you wrote the new play. Were you in favor of Miss Murray playing the part? I know. I felt Paula Kenyon was better suited for it. You and Miss Kenyon are engaged to be married? Yes. Anything happened to Mr. Stoner, you as next in line could assign the role as you saw fit? That's correct. Did you know that Mr. Stoner had made a final decision on the part? I did not. He didn't tell you anything about it at lunch today? No, I made a strong plea for Paula. You know about the gun in Miss Murray's dressing room? Everyone did, apparently. Very well. Uh, Miss Kenyon, did Emma Stoner visit your apartment often? Not often. We were not on too friendly terms. Did you phone him to visit you this afternoon? No, who said I did? No one. <laughs> I merely asked. Were you, by any chance, still in love with Emil Stoner? Now, see here, I don't appreciate that kind Just of talk. relax, Mr. Banning. I was not in love with Mr. Stoner. That was over. You and Doris Murray were at one time very friendly. Yes. Well, I found out how two-faced she was. Emil was a fool to fall for her, but you couldn't tell him anything. All she's interested in is a career. You're not interested in your career, Miss Kenyon. Well... Well, yes, in a way. You wanted the star part. You phoned Stoner this morning. Yes, but he said he was going to give it to her. You knew about Doris's gun? No, I you didn't. You recognized it immediately, boss. Well, yes, I knew. What if I did? Then you wrote these threatening notes to Miss Murray. I did not. I did not. You didn't know the contract had already been signed? No. Then you still had a motive to kill him. I wrote those notes. She had nothing to do with it. You can check them on my typewriter. We know, Mr. Banning. We've already done it. I know how it looks, but but Paula didn't do it. I, I knew he was coming to her place. I called him. I, I knew Paula was out. I did it. If so, what did you do with the ejected shell? I threw them away. How many? Three. Oh, no, David, please don't. I don't believe you, Mr. Banning. Miss Murray, did you know the contract had been made out and signed? No. You're lying, Miss Murray. You said you didn't see Stoner this afternoon. I didn't. You called him and asked him to visit you. You did get the threat notes and they frightened you. But you didn't know they would frighten Stoner. I did not phone him, nor did I see him. Yes, you did. His briefcase was on the piano. And he was there in the late afternoon because he brought with him a four o'clock edition of the Herald Tribune. What if he was there? I didn't kill him. He told you then about his decision. He left hurriedly, forgot the briefcase, and went to Paula's apartment to wait for her. That's not true. That's not true. Filled with rage, you got your gun, which you said had disappeared from your dressing room, then calmly put it into your bag, walked across the hall, and shot him as he sat reading a horoscope. No, no, no. Archie, her handbag. Thank you. Notice. I run my finger through a hole in the corner. <sighs> She fired through the bag. And see, three empty shells. No! And here's a contract made out to Paula Kenyon. Too bad, Miss Murray. Well, that's a good day's work, boss. Then be out Right. Say, tell me, how did Stoner, if he was shot in Paula's room, get back to Doris's room? She couldn't carry him. Oh, now, Archie, that's not too difficult. He walked. Shot through the heart? Impossible. That's a fallacy, Archie. Official medical records show that people have walked a block in such instances. No wonder Doris was so shocked when she saw him back in her room. The shooting took place after she called us, and it seemed unbelievable that anyone would leave the gun and not the ejected shells. Ergo, the gun must have been concealed when fired. Yeah. Paula would have no reason to do that, because she was in her own apartment. And these men are not the type who would have fired through their coats. And Doris, before she started down the hall, would naturally conceal the gun, huh? In the handbag. Where else? Boss. Midnight. It's another day. <laughs> I'm a year older. Yes. Mm. Cuthbert's Correspondence Detective Course in Four Easy Lessons. <laughs> Happy birthday, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's 
transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Vic Perrin. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Party for Death. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, a beauty on the boulevard, a bear cat in the brush. Oh, now, really. Patty? I'm sorry I called. Well, I'm not Lieutenant Levinson. Your voice always reminds me of strained boulders. Look, Rick, you want a job? I refuse to clean up after Otis. You just got to quit feeding him in the office. I've got a guy down here in the tomb. Well, give him some embalming fluid, wrap him in 12 yards of first aid bandage, put a dog at his feet, and call the museum. What? They'll never know the difference. Just an old mummy you ran into when you were out trying to dig up a date. Oh, for Pete's sake. Ah, uh, what's on your mind? This is not exactly official, but I've got a guy down here that I'm holding with a team in. He's screaming that he wants a private detective. A con? Oh, come on, Walt. He's got money. Money? Well, why do you drag out these conversations? I could have been down there by now. Money. According to Webster, any particular form of denomination of coin or paper which is lawfully current. According to Diamond, that which makes his little heart go pity-pat and his landlord send voodoo death warnings. Actually, I have certain rules about the people I take money from. First, they've got to have it. Second, they've got to be people. I closed my office and headed to the 5th Precinct where Fatty Levinson, the guiding stomach of the homicide department, showed me down to the tombs where he introduced me to my potential client, a Mr. Charles Johnson, who was sitting in his cell looking very unhappy. Got a visitor, Mr. Johnson. The detective? Yes, this is Mr. Dunn. Go on in, Rick. Yell when you're done. Right. Thanks, Walt. Sure. Sit down, Mr. Diamond. What's your trouble, Johnson? I've been framed. Sure. I was convicted of passing counterfeit money. But you didn't pass it. Oh, certainly. I passed it all right. But I I, I didn't know I was passing it. No. Oh, then you better tell me the whole thing. Well, it's very simple. For some time, I had evidently been passing bad money. The merchants with whom my wife and I trade told the police that someone had given them counterfeit bills. According to the police, I was finally spotted as the passer. They followed me for several days. And they say I passed bad bills on six different occasions. And you think you've been framed? Mr. Diamond, I have no access to counterfeit money. I'm retired and I live more than comfortably. I have a great deal of money, Mr. Diamond. Why would I want to pass counterfeit bills? Maybe you hate spending the good stuff. Someone who could have replaced my spending money with the bad bills did so. They even found the counterfeit bills in my safe at home. What about your wife? She was arrested with me. She passed some of the bills, and if we hadn't had a good lawyer, she would have been convicted also. Well, how do you get her off? According to the officers, I was the one who gave her the counterfeit bills. There's some law about that. Mm -hmm. Didn't do it of her own free will. This, uh, this lawyer handled your case, too? He's my personal lawyer. Been with me for years. Well, uh, Mr. Johnson, I'd say you were in a tough spot. But I'm innocent. Where do you keep your personal cash? Mostly in the safe. How much? Two or three thousand at all times. Don't pay your bills by check? Never have. Like to pay everything in cash. I'm known for it. Will you try to help me? Mm, for a hundred a day in expenses. I have turned over all my money to my wife to be handled by my lawyer. Now, which one do I see? John Forbes, my lawyer. I've already conferred with him. He'll be expecting you. Just tell him you're the detective I hired. <laughs> The lawyer's address was across town, 554 East 52nd Street, a tall building in the middle of the block, office 511, blonde secretary 52, age 24. I was shown into a richly furnished room, complete with heavy wood paneling and something else in high heels that made me forget the blonde. 
You're the detective Mr. Johnson has hired? Uh, that's right. Richard P. Diamond, when you get around to writing it on a check. Uh, this is Mr. Johnson's wife. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Diamond. How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Uh, how do you do? Uh, what is your fee, Mr. Diamond? A hundred a day in expenses. Uh, do you think your husband is guilty, Mrs. Johnson? Of course not. He didn't know he was passing that money. How do you think he got the bad bills in his safe? I can't imagine. Mm, how about you, Mr. Forbes? Do you think that Mr. Johnson knew he was passing the counterfeit money? Oh, certainly not. Do you have any theories about it? You're the detective, Mr. Diamond. And quite an expensive one. Yeah, I'm a pig. <laughs> The kind of case you really love. No clues and no one knew anything. I spent the next hour throwing questions at Forbes and Mrs. Johnson. Result, zero. Forbes had been a member of the state bar for ten years, handled some big accounts. Mrs. Johnson had met her husband in Florida three years before. About 15 years younger, but completely happy. But there was one little thing that kept nagging at me. According to Forbes, Johnson had a cool million... And that took me right back to the reason I'd gotten interested. Why would a man like that pass phony bills? I got a substantial retainer and checked back with Walt. Rick, I got an idea. Maybe Johnson wanted his wife out of the way, so he tried to frame her by giving her the bad money, hoping she'd get caught. Instead, he got caught. The gag backfired. So he slipped a tour in plain sight of everyone. Well, it's possible. At this point, anything's possible. By the way, did you find out anything about those counterfeit bills? Yeah, I checked with the treasury men. They told me that during the trial, they identified the work. The engraving was done by Leon Fisher. Ooh, one of the best counterfeiters in the business a long time ago. Is he in or out of prison? He's out. You remember when we sent him up the last time? Oh, do I? I was playing stickball in Knickers the last time Fisher went up the river. It was only 15 years ago, Peter Pan. Okay, so I date myself. He's been out for ten years. I remember now. Happy Methuselah? <laughs> Say, wasn't Fisher picked up once after he got out for trying to pass some more of the stuff? Yeah, ten years ago, but got off. Not enough evidence then. But the Treasury Department's looking for him now. Oh, thanks, Walt. You still think you can do something for your client? I don't know, but I did just have a thought. If Johnson kept passing his stuff for a week or so, he must have been pretty stupid not to recognize it. You don't remember Fisher very well. He was a real artist. His stuff could fool the U.S. Treasury unless they examined the paper. Well, now I had one lead. An old-time counterfeiter named Leon Fisher. Swell lead. Even the Treasury Department didn't know where to find him. But in my business, I could use a couple of gimmicks the team men couldn't. I left the phone booth and headed for the Lower East Side, and a gentleman known for his dubious ability with a paintbrush and his gifts of underworld knowledge, providing the price was right. Yes, who is knocking, please? Vladimir? But there must be some mistake. The name is Mabel. Oh, stop making like a floor door girl. It's Diamond. The detective? Well, certainly. Open up. Who you are working for? It's not your landlord. Greenblatt, the butcher? You don't even know him. Know him, schmow him. Do I owe him? No. Comrade. Now, I need some information, Vladimir. I could paint your portrait while we talk. For you, a magnificent oil painting of your wonderful face. Only $50. I haven't got time. A quick charcoal, $25? No. Hand-painted ties? A small statue of a snowbound Cossack, stolen personally from the Tsar's private collection. No. Cheap. Where can I find Leon Fisher? You can't afford the snowbound Cossack and you are interested in Leon Fisher? Fisher fits my collection. Wasn't he somewhat of an artist himself? Twenty bucks. A fellow artist. Thirty. Probably starving, like myself. Forty. Such a talent not to be really appreciated. Fifty. Last price. Last price. You know me pretty well by now. Sixty. Goodbye, Vladimir. Wait. He's living in an old shack on 14 River Street. Goes under by the name Peters. Peters the artist? Uh, Peters the peasant. Fifty dollars, please. And I promise you no part of it will ever reach Northern Korea. <laughs> Headed for 14 River Street and to Mr. Leon Fisher, alias one Mr. Peters. The first lead in the whole mess, but very likely to have nothing at all to do with my client, Mr. Johnson. 14 River Street was just as Vladimir had described it, and a little more so. An old shack, all right. Very possibly the oldest, also the dirtiest on the river. Yeah? Your name Peters? Yeah. 
Mind if I come in? Yeah, you smell like a cop. Well, if I was, I'd have called you Fisher. Come on in. Sit down. Thanks. What's on your mind? Some money. Oh, you sure came to the right place, but we don't open until 10 o'clock in the morning. Got a time lock on the vault. The Treasury Department is looking for you. What? Some of your portraits of our presidents have found their way back into circulation. I don't know what you're talking about. They got the plates when they sent you up the last time 15 years ago, but they never got the money. Remember? I still don't know what you're talking about. 15 years might make a guy think the heat's off. Get out of here. You know a man named Johnson? I don't know anybody you know or anything about money or plates. Now, beat it. I can make a quick call to the team, man. You got the wrong boy. Beat it. Boy? Let me tell you something. I was playing stickball with... Oh, forget it. He was Fisher, all right. No doubt about it. But I didn't have enough information or the authority to sweat it out of him. It was getting dark when I left and headed for a phone, keeping an eye on the shack in case Fisher decided to skip. I was halfway down the block when I heard it. Oh, no. The shot had come from the direction of Fisher's shack, so I took off like an overstimulated cabbie. Suicide? Didn't figure. Fisher was lying in the middle of the floor. The slug had caught him high in the chest, and he was dying fast. Suicide? Not a bit. No time to wait around and get mixed up with a lot of questions about Fisher's death I couldn't answer anyway. So I called Walt and gave him the story. A fast cab and a buck eighty later, I was going through the morgue files in my favorite newspaper. Here's some more stuff on Lee and Fisher, Mr. Diamond. Thanks, Charlie, but I, uh, I think I found what I want. Yeah? Yeah, right here. The last time they picked him up, got off clean as a whistle. Yeah. Says they caught him passing a counterfeit bill. The witnesses say they saw another man giving it to him. According to this, the other man was a two-bit hood, wanted for everything in the books. He went to prison denying he ever gave Fisher the bills, but there were witnesses. Pretty smart lawyer to get Fisher off when he was a known counterfeiter. Even if witnesses did say they saw another hood slip in the money. Very smart lawyer. Fisher was shot with a thirty-two, Rick. The uh, slugs and ballistics now. The killer didn't leave any footprints because of that rocky shoreline behind the shack. Well, now we know from Fisher before he died that the killer was the one who took the counterfeit money. You said Fisher told you he was forced to give up the money. The killer must have had something on Fisher. I found something in newspaper morgue that might interest you, Walt. The last time Fisher was sent to trial for passing counterfeit money, he got off. That's right. You know how he got off? No, I can't remember exactly. Had a good lawyer. The lawyer used a loophole in the law. Had witnesses who swore someone else gave Fisher the bad bill. Hey, that's the same gimmick Johnson's lawyer used to get the wife off. Same gimmick, same lawyer. What? Now, the lawyer who represented Fisher ten years ago was a struggling criminal attorney named Forbes. John Forbes. Now, representing Johnson, the man you've got locked up downstairs. Well, I'll be... If he fixed that witness ten years ago for Fisher, that could be the club he used to make Fisher give him the old counterfeit money. Well, he could have followed me, seen me go in to see Fisher, listened outside, and killed him after I left. I'll have him picked up. No, no, wait a minute. Where's your motive? Well, he's now handling Johnson's money, a million bucks. That's motive enough to frame anyone. Yeah, but two things throw that out. Forbes is supposedly a very successful lawyer, and he only controls Johnson's money through his wife. Well, maybe she's in on it with him. That's a possibility. Either that or there's a way for Forbes to get the money without her knowing it. Could be. Now, first we've got to find out how he handles Mrs. Johnson's money. And then we've got to find out if he really is as successful as he appears. I still think we better have a talk with Mr. Johnson. You know, I think you're right. Have you found out anything, Mr. Diamond? Got some pretty good hunches, Johnson. Tell me, how does the arrangement work with your money concerning your lawyer and your wife? Uh, Mr. Forbes gives my wife whatever money he considers necessary, according to his judgment. Do you Hmm? trust his judgment, Mr. Johnson? Of course. Financially successful? Of course. Just my yearly retainer alone would help him to live quite comfortably. No bad investments? Not that I know of. When he gives your wife the money, can he just write a check or make a withdrawal? Not without my wife's counter-signature. Where did you meet your wife? 
in Florida, three years ago. Your wife and Forbes are very good friends? Well, the very best. I... Oh, now, wait a minute. You don't think... I don't know. I don't know. But I'll let you know if I come up with something. I was getting close. Forbes knew fish of the counterfeiter. Very possibly knew he had the counterfeit money stashed under the old shack. He'd gotten Fisher off ten years before, and he could have framed the case and forced Fisher to give him the counterfeit on the strength of it. The countersigned checks almost definitely showed the wife to be in on it, but I still needed a motive. The one thing I had to prove, that Forbes was not as successful as he was supposed to have been, and that he needed cash, and also that Mrs. Johnson wanted to frame her husband and help Forbes. It was 8 o'clock when Walt and I piled into the squad car and headed for the home of John Forbes. At 8.30, we parked across the street a half a block away. At 9.15, we spotted Forbes leaving by his front door. We followed him east across town, where he pulled up in front of 705 East 46th Street and went in. Ten minutes to ten, he came out again. But this time, he wasn't alone. On his arm, still looking very interesting in high heels and topped off with a Nerman wrap. Mrs. Johnson. Yeah. A million bucks in that. Makes a guy wonder about that old adage, crime doesn't pay. Ten o'clock and on the outskirts of town heading across the river for Jersey. Walt, uncomfortable about leaving his territory, but interested enough to keep on tailing. Ten thirty and we pulled up in front of a big building in Jersey. They're going in. Yeah, Carlos Droka's country club. Dinner with a side order of roulette. Good place for any guy to lose his money. They're uh, taking a table in the supper room. There's a gambling room in the back. Maybe they just need some energy. Look, Forbes is getting up. Face the bar. He's headed this way. Yeah. Hey, he's headed for Droker's office. Yeah. I know Droker pretty well. Did him a favor once. When Forbes comes out, I think I'll go in. Well, it's good to see you again, Ricky. Would you come around and pay me a visit? How you been, huh? All right, Drucker. I haven't got much time. Oh, business, huh? I was hoping you'd stick around and play the wheel. Who knows you might win something? On your wheel? Well, that's why you might win something, because it's my wheel. <laughs> mm. You, uh, want to do me a favor? You've done me a couple. I don't forget. Well, the guy who was just in here, John Ford. Oh, I can't knock him off for you, Ricky. He's too good a customer. Good customer loses a lot, huh? Uh, yeah. Forbes, one of the best customers I got. Pays up? Yeah, most of the time. Never got to a point where he couldn't? Only once I had to put the pressure on him. Only once. Oh, I see. But he paid up. Yeah. I gave him 60 days. How much was it, and when did he pay it? 15000 and he paid it 10 minutes ago. He's going in to lose some more. Uh, one more question. Did he give you check or cash? Uh, cash. You know something, Ricky? What would guys like me do if there weren't guys like that around, huh? With the guys like you around, there'll always be guys like that around. <laughs> Goodbye, Ricky. Goodbye. <laughs> Having a little snort, Fatty? <laughs> <laughs> you did it again. You always do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, tell me, if Forbes and Mrs. Johnson are still in the gambling room? Yeah. No, we were right. Forbes has been losing his money to Droka. Oh, there's the motive. Let's pick them up. No, no, wait, wait. I want to nail him for sure on the Fisher killing. Now, if we pick them both up now, they'll have time to think about it, get the story straight. Well, what do you want to do? We'll work on Mrs. Johnson, but let her alone until the bank's open. Why until the bank's open? Well, Forbes paid Droka 15000 cash. I want to see if Mrs. Johnson cashed a check for that amount. If she did, we'll pick her up, but not Forbes. I want him to think he's safe until we break down Mrs. Johnson. See you tomorrow, Fatty. Right. Morning, Walt. Hi, Rick. I got Mrs. Johnson in the other room, and she's screaming for her lawyer. Mm. What about the bank? You were right. Notice called in about five minutes ago. The bank cashed a check yesterday morning signed by Forbes and Mrs. Johnson for $15,000. How about Forbes? Had Collins watching him all night. He'll pick him up when we need him. Uh, okay, let's uh, go to work on Mrs. Johnson. Okay. Notice. Yeah, Lieutenant. Bring in Mrs. Johnson. Right, Lieutenant. You just going to come right out and accuse her of it? No, no. Just a little friendly chat. 
Mrs. Johnson, Lieutenant. Come in, Mrs. Johnson. What's the meaning of this, Lieutenant? How are you this morning, uh, Mrs. Johnson? None of your business. I demand to know what have right you have. Have a seat, Mrs. Not until Johnson. I have an explanation. Have a nice time last night, Mrs. Johnson? Why, I... Uh, yes, I had a wonderful time. My attorney, Mr. Forbes, took me to dinner. Anything wrong with that? Went to Jersey, didn't you? My, understand you followed me? Nice place, Trucker's Restaurant. I see. Yes, a very nice place, Mr. Diamond. Win anything gambling? I lost. Are you going to arrest me for gambling? How'd Mr. Forbes make out? He won a little, but I don't see what business won that Won a is. little, huh? Well, for him, that's a change. What do you mean? Well, according to Droker, Mr. Forbes has been losing heavily for some time. I wouldn't know. What Mr. Forbes does with his money is not my concern. He paid Droker a $15,000 gambling debt last night. Did he? I understand you cashed a check for that amount yesterday morning. All right, what about it? You uh, have the combination to your husband's safe? Of course, that's where I keep my jewelry. Does Mr. Forbes? I don't think so. That is, I don't know. Nice-looking guy, Forbes. Mr. Diamond, I don't know what you're getting at, but this is absurd. Until last night, Forbes was too broke to pay off his debt to drop. All right, supposing I gave Mr. Forbes the money. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't know. Wonder what your husband would say. It was a loan. Hey, excuse me. You know something, yeah? Mrs. Johnson? We think your husband was framed. We think someone put phony bills in his safe so he'd get caught yeah, passing them. Right. A uh, rank. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Johnson. McCarthy's been tailing Forbes. Says Forbes just purchased a ticket to Rio. One ticket? Yeah. If he's on such a gravy train, why pull out a loan? Maybe he got more than the 15000 Uh, Mrs. Johnson, we think John Forbes framed your husband so he could get money out of you. That's utterly ridiculous. And for a while, we thought you were in on it because the checks had to be cosigned. Well, I hope you've changed your mind. Oh, I guess we have to. Why would Forbes leave for South America if he was planning on getting money from you? Leave? One ticket for Rio. I don't believe you. Oh, check if you want to. Well, it doesn't make any difference to me. When's he leaving? He already has. No. No, he couldn't. Why not? Just a trip, probably. He'll be back. He couldn't be... Why, that... All right, Mr. Diamond. I signed over a power of attorney this morning so he could liquidate a half million in negotiable securities. I was supposed to be on that plane with him. Let's go pick him up. Pick him up? I thought you said he'd already left. Oh, shame on me for fibbing. I guess I just isn't going to go to heaven. Come on, Walt. Yes? Mind if we come in, Forbes? Oh, the private detective. And uh, Lieutenant Levinson. We've met. Well, I'm sorry, gentlemen, but I'm very busy. Oh, packing, eh? Well, Rio's nice this time of year. Yes. Well, uh, come in if you like. Just go right ahead. We won't bother you. All right, boys. What's on your minds? Well, we just had a talk with Mrs. Johnson. She told us everything. What do you mean, everything? She's a little unhappy about you skipping with those securities. Oh? You, uh, don't mind if I finish my packing? Well, go right ahead. But we really couldn't see our way clear to letting you take a trip if you had those securities. No? Makes it look like you might have framed Johnson for his money. What did you do? Make his wife fall in love with you and then talk her into it? I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. How about Leon Fisher, the counterfeiter you cleared back in 39? I haven't seen him since then. We better take a look in that bag. No, Lieutenant. Hold it right there. Put it down, Forbes. You can't get both of us. I don't think you're willing to take a chance on it. We're ten feet apart. You try for the lieutenant, I go for my gun. And if I try for you... Walt! <laughs> okay. Awful close. Yeah. Yeah. What's in the bag? I'll take a look. See how Forbes is. Well, well. Securities and a bundle of dough. All counterfeit. I guess he figured he'd get unloaded if things got tough. How is he? Dead. But don't worry about it, Walt. A guy like Forbes spent his time figuring out so many crooked angles for other people. Sooner or later, he had to trip over one and break his own neck.
Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The day without color is only six hours old, and the restlessness begins to eat at Broadway. The waiting, the longing for the nighttime begins to gnaw like hunger, like thirst. Because Broadway's night is a banquet loaded with delicacies. The scarlet wine of neon, the forbidden fruit of a trumpet scream, the lukewarm stew offered on a tin plate through an alley doorway. But Broadway's day, that's the drab time, kid, the empty time. The time of leaning against sun-warmed stone and waiting. And you wait with the rest of Broadway because it'll come. Something will come. And it does. You know that because Broadway nudges you with an elbow, winks, says, Follow me, kid. The day has turned bright. And it's not far away where the day is bright. On 39th Street, just off 7th Avenue in the Garment Center. The crowd is already there ahead of you, toothpicking its last bite of lunch, digesting the spectacle of a man sprawled on the pavement. The dress rack he'd been pushing lay beneath him. There was a scissors in his back. His blood sketched a new pattern on the bright, flowered silk prints. And the man, heavy in the shoulders, pushing a space into the crowd so you can be close to it, so he can fill you in on it. You got here fast, Danny. I was shown the way. Who is he, Mugovan? Well, it says he's Thomas Hart. Social Security card, YMCA membership, it all says he was Thomas Hart. These people know him. I've been calling him by name. He don't answer for 20 minutes now, I'd say. Any of them see it happen? No, I asked around. They were all busy with shop talk, with wife and kid talk, with union talk. First thing they noticed was Sinclair Stylecraft's new sample spring line was spilled in the gutter. They kept the cabs and trucks from running over the dresses. Sinclair what? Sinclair Stylecraft. See? On their dress labels. Huh? 
A dress manufacturing place up the street. He worked there. They all told me that, and I didn't even ask. Uh, keep him back, Muggerman. They're waiting for us to act something out. Just keep him back. And after a while, one of the onlookers glanced at his watch and hurried away. Lunch hour was over, and he'd be the big man around the water cooler this afternoon. Something big just happened to him. He'd seen a man with a scissors in his back. And a girl looked up from the pavement, smiled across the crowd to a boy in a sports shirt, and walked away slowly. And a woman in a youthful hat took her place. In a few minutes, it was all over. Two men threw a blanket over the face of Thomas Hart and carried him away. Then, work to do. Thomas Hart worked for Sinclair Stylecraft. Ladies and Mrs. Dresses, down the street. Go there. Four flights up on a freight elevator. Nod to the gray-haired man holding the wheel in a comic book and get no answer. And through the rows of sewing machines where a hundred women spend eight hours a day with a dress pattern and a bobbin. Then finally ushered into the office of the man of destiny for the fourth floor, Mr. Justin Sinclair. Sit down, Mr. Clover, Danny Clover, police. About what happened downstairs? That's right. Uh, you want a cigar? Tell me about Thomas Hart. Sure, I'll tell you. You don't mind that I'm smoking, do you? Oh, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. What's that supposed to tell me? Look, I've been in business for a long time. A man gets hard driving for a dollar. Takes a time like this to make me know what kind of a man I've gotten to be. I'm not asking you to weep for the boy, Mr. Sinclair. I wish I could weep. That's just what I mean. I've forgotten how. Tommy was a bright youngster. So what if he was pushing dress racks around? I did it once. Tommy was interested. Tommy asked questions about the business. I'm sad, Mr. Cloven. Don't laugh at me. I'm more than sad. I'm horrified. Mr. Sinclair. Oh, come in. Come in, Stella. Miss Croft, Mr. Clover. Mr. Clover is from the police. Yes, they told me in the shop a policeman was here. That's why well, I... I'm glad you did. He wants to know all about Tommy. What do you want to know, Mr. Clover? Well, as much as you can tell me. Mostly why somebody murdered him. Tommy was an errand boy and pushed dress racks. I'm sorry he's dead, but frankly, he annoyed me. How? <laughs> oh, Mr. Clover, come now. Look at Miss Croft, will you? Just look at her now. I'm looking. Does it annoy you, Miss Croft? Not yet. If you came into my office and stared at me sitting at my drawing board, then if you grinned, then if you winked... You really couldn't blame Tommy, Miss Croft. Natural, normal. Don't you do it, Mr. Sinclair. <laughs> Quite a girl, huh? Quite a young lady. What else about Tommy? Not a thing. Me either. All right. Where does he live? I can tell you that. Follow me out. I'll get the address for you from our personnel man. Yes, you'll find Sinclair Stylecraft cooperative, Mr. Clover. Anything, anything at all. Next time, knock soft, mister. You want something from Jonesy, the keeper of the garbage pails, the collective wrench will knock soft. They told me Thomas Hart lived here. Show me his room. Tommy? Tommy's dead. It's been the topic of the day for the tenants how Tommy's dead. He don't need nobody in his room. Now he's dead. Can't use him. Look closely, Jonesy. This is how a policeman looks who wants something. Huh? I don't care what your sickness is. Next time, knock soft. Come on. You knew Tommy? Oh, sure I knew him. He never wrapped his leavings in the newspaper. Not even a, a greasy brown paper bag. What else do you need to know about a man? But sometimes you'd open your door and peep at his collars. Sure I peep. You don't peep when you get the chance. Back off, Jones. Who'd you see? Who? Uh, well, once it was a guy with a dirty white apron and a sack of beer cans. Uh. Up these stairs, he went whistling. Uh, give me a minute, I'll tell you what he was whistling. Uh, no one else? Sure, sure, someone else. With silk stockings and high-strapped shoes. But living as I live in a basement apartment, it got away from me before I could see the face. That never took a moment's happiness away from me, not seeing a face. What do I do? Yeah. Tommy's room. Phew. Crummy tenant, wasn't it? Crumbs bring exterminators. Exterminators cost the management money. Take your hands off Tommy's suitcase. 
Something in this shirt pocket? What? Nose tissues? Tommy was always with nose tissues. I forgot to tell you. Money. Twenties, tens. Five hundred dollars. Those in there is a wash basin. Hmm. Yeah, that calendar you're looking at, I got piled downstairs. You can take your choice. Don't rob a dead man's dream. There's an address scribbled under the picture. Directions. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Out of the way. Uh, that's a dress, all right. You think, uh, hmm? Knock soft, Jonesy. You want something, knock soft. <laughs> Yes? The nameplate on the door says this is the residence of Justin and Elizabeth Sinclair. Is that right? No, I'm Mrs. Sinclair. What is it you want? Well, my name's Danny Clover. I'm from the... The police. You're from the police. Well, come in, please. My husband phoned and said a policeman might be around. Oh, my. Girls, girls, we're raided. <laughs> oh, I was just fooling. <laughs> no, Mr. Clover didn't come here to break up our canasta game, did you, Mr. Clover? We're only playing for a 20th. This is Mrs. Westfall, Mrs. Meston, and Miss Natalie. Now, Miss Natalie does our hair after the game. She wins Can our... we talk someplace, Mrs. Sinclair? Oh, of course we can. Deal me out, girls. In here. We'll close the door so we won't be disturbed. Now. Now tell me all about it. All right. I came from Tommy Hart's room a little while ago. He had some directions penciled on a calendar. The directions brought me here. Well, but I don't understand. Tommy's dead. Maybe Tommy scribbled those directions before he was murdered, huh? Oh, of course. Surely. Then Tommy must have been here on some occasion or another. Well, of course he was. What was the occasion? Dinner. You'd think I'd get someone in to cook dinner, wouldn't you? But I didn't. I never do. No, I still cook, Mr. Clover, like I did before all this happened. All this, you know, the French provincial furniture and the set of books and sending my son to private school. And... When was the last time Tommy was here? Didn't my husband tell you? Why, it was last night. Just last night, Tommy was sitting in that chair you're sitting in now, with that girl draped over him, lighting his cigars and waiting on him hand and foot. What girl did that? Well, the girl Tommy brought with him to dinner. That bleach blonde from the shipping department. In my house, imagine. Why my husband tolerates it. What was the girl's name? Ginny. Ginny Morrow, I think. She works for your husband? I told you she did. In the shipping department. Checker or something, I don't know. He invited Tommy over because well, Tommy's bright, and maybe someday he could learn the business. But why the girl, I don't know. What else can you tell me about Tommy? He ate everything that was put on the plate in front of him. What else? What else? Mr. Clover, I'm a married woman. I've got a son taller than me and... She took me by the hand to prove it. Back to the canasta table. The son was doing fine, wasn't he, girls? Wasn't he? And her life with Mr. Sinclair was all a girl could ask for, wasn't it, girls? And what right had a policeman to come nosing around spoiling everything? The card game, the hairdos, making the canapes grow cold, letting the ginger ale turn flat just because someone stuck a pair of scissors in her husband's errand boy. So I explained the rights of the dead. And the girls cried, scooped up the cards, shuffled, re-dealt, and I got up. At Sinclair Stylecraft, ladies and Mrs. Dresses, a woman finished a seam, took the rimless glasses off her nose, rubbed her eyes, told me Jenny Morrow, shipping, was on the loading platform having a smoke. You can keep looking at me, mister. The view is for free. Teeth, courtesy Dr. West Miracle Tough Toothbrush. Hair, courtesy Peroxide 10%. Eyes, cheeks, figure... Courtesy, careful planning. You're Jenny Morrow? For Eugenia. Mom called me Eugenia. Found the name in a book someone threw in the trash can. Dramatic, ain't it? Some questions I want to ask you, Jenny. Questions about... You're the... a policeman, ain't you? Yeah. Tell me about Tommy Hart. My hostess of last night blabbed to you, huh? Okay. How long did you know Tommy? Long enough to slap him a couple of times, slap his mouth. Then he says he'll make up to me. He'll take me to the boss's house for dinner. Big deal. You didn't enjoy it? I am practically spilling my life's blood on you, and I don't even know your name. Well, Danny Clover. It suits you. <laughs> no, no, I didn't enjoy the supper, Danny. 
I got the feeling... Oh, I'm crazy. I'm making it up out of my own head. What feeling, Jim? You ever had it? The feeling that you've been taken someplace just so as you could insult people with your presence? Just by being in a place you don't belong, it's an insult? Just by being what you are? But Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair invited you, Jenny. Tommy twisted an arm. That's how come I'm invited. Big deal. Tommy did that to you and he's your steady boyfriend? Oh, steady. What steady? That Daisy go pin on Stella the designer. Me. I was the last name on the list. Stella Croft? Stella. The designer of designs. Where is she? By the Pantages Theater on 42nd Street, in the third row on the aisle. An arrangement we got with the management, so Stella can steal the latest Paris creations from the Parisian actors. <laughs> oh, Stella has a life. Maybe it'll come to me someday. I'll work on it. It was a five-minute walk to 42nd Street in the Pantages Theater. On the stage, a man in a plaid dinner jacket was having a little trouble hoisting a girl to his shoulders. But when he did, they were fine together, circling faultlessly to the music. By the time I got down front, the man was holding his partner over his head, spinning, smiling, and turning red. Stella Croft was there, all right, pad and pencil poised, staring at the act. The dancers bowed. Everybody applauded. Everybody was happy. Not Stella. Stella with a scissor stuck in her side. Lifeless Stella. Dead Stella. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Every Sunday evening, CBS brings you two of its top comedy stars, Jack Benny and Eve Arden. It makes no difference where you live, whom you know, what your job is. Everyone immediately feels at home with Eve Arden's romantic, harassed schoolteacher and with Jack's careful spending, perennially youthful portrait of himself. CBS cordially invites you to join them this Sunday again when Eve Arden plays Our Miss Brooks on most of these same stations and Jack Benny and his gang are heard on them all. Now the second act of Elliot Lewis's production of... Broadway's My Beat. Of an evening in springtime, Broadway stands on a street corner, sips its penny plain, and counts its blessings. The Yanks, the Giants, the Bums, only a ten-cent subway ride's distance, and usually worth it. There's bottled orange juice from sun-kissed California to be tasted for a nickel. And the rides are getting painted at Coney. And the moon that rocks down over Manhattan in April is a special kind of moon. And the music that lilts from doorways is a special music. And the girls are golden. There's more, too. It blinks around the translux and demands your attention for ten seconds. Girl, stabbed at the Pantages Theater. Police seek early arrest, especially me. Oh, it's you. I was expecting the Mestons. More canasta, Mrs. Sinclair? More people did. The Mestons were coming to console us. They're good at it, make it enjoyable. I don't suppose that's why you came. No. But you want to come into my house and ask your ugly questions. Uh-huh. Just stand right where you are. Justin, it's that cop I told you about, the one who... Does he have a right to come in? Of course, Elizabeth. Of course. The man has all the rights in the world. Yes, dear. Justin says you may come in. Sit down, Mr. Clover. Take the world off your back. Sit down and talk to Elizabeth and me. Cigars there at your fingertip. Anything you need, ask Elizabeth for it. Maybe Mrs. Sinclair would like to make you some coffee or a sandwich. Or... Anything that'll take her out of here, huh, Mr. Clover? Don't be embarrassed. You can talk in front of Elizabeth. She knows more about the man Sinclair than I know. Correct, baby doll? Yeah, you want to know about Justin's friendship with Stella, is that it, Mr. Clover? Before the scissors episode, I mean. Well, that's it. I didn't think we'd get around to it so easy, but that's it. You won't mind if I tell him, Justin. Not a bit of it, baby doll. Just hand me a cigar first. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Anytime, Mrs. Sinclair. This friendship, as you called it. It was you, Mrs. Sinclair. I remember because it surprised me, the name you gave it. 
You thought it. There was nothing between Stella Croft and my husband, Justin, except the normal relationship of an employer to his employee. Consultation over dress designs during working hours, approval, disapproval, the putting into production, the countersigning of the weekly paycheck. Nothing more, Mr. Sinclair? There was more, she'll tell you. There were the times my husband, Justin, took her to fashion shows, to dinners for the buyers at expensive places. There was the time of a manufacturer's convention in Atlantic City. Justin called me every morning, every night. Stella was pretty. Some people thought lovely. She brought us customers, made us richer. That was what was between Stella and my husband. Nothing more. You don't know why she's dead? No, we don't know. But it saddens us, Mr. Clover. Send him home, Justin. I'm tired. I want to sleep. If the Mestons come, tell them I'm sick. They'll understand. More legwork now. The pinching up of the bits and scraps that people leave behind. Get as many as you can and arrange them chronologically, by emotion, by habit, by appetite. Draw a line, one from the other, and peep at a life now nearly dead. For instance, go now to the apartment of Stella Croft. Walk the corridor that once brought Stella home. Turn the knob of her door. The girl in the room was wearing slacks. She watched me close the door. And blew a smoke ring from her cigarette. Watched it die. Then she smiled at me. Hi, Danny. What are you doing here, Jenny? Oh, well, taking the tour. Seeing how a girl lives when she works in the front office of Sinclair Stylecraft. Gosh, quilted blue satin. How did you get in here? Did you see the superintendent downstairs? Yeah. Did his eyes light up when he saw you? Uh-uh, huh? Jenny, how well did you know Stella Croft? Who gets to know a dame like that if you're another dame? Look, Danny, I'm not the type to be a Pollyanna. My mother told me, Jenny, never be a Pollyanna. Stand on your own two feet. You don't like somebody, don't like them. And that's how I felt about Stella, to a T. Because she had all this, because she was going out with Mr. Sinclair? So I was jealous. But this apartment is something to get jealous about. You're going to try your luck with Sinclair? <laughs> He's already noticed, Danny. The day that I wore that black velveteen with the peasant blouse, he spent practically the whole morning in the shipping department giving me a personal supervise. <laughs> you want me for anything more, Danny? No. Just be around where I can find you, Jenny. Oh, sure, Danny. I really would, Danny. I drop all my appointments. The apartment looked like Jenny hadn't touched anything. The place was impeccable, slick, like Stella Croft had been. Lacquered furniture, highly waxed, and full-length mirrors. I walked back into her bedroom, around it, fingering this and that. The small, intimate souvenirs a girl like Stella collects. Then over to a Pullman closet, opened it. And wondered for an instant why a woman needed so many shoes. Wondered... Wondered why it hurt so much. The brightness of it, the pain. The sharpness slipping so easily into my back. Then gave it up. Because I couldn't hold on to it. the finishing touch, Danny. The claim to fame of Dr. Sinsky. In medical school, it was always commented upon how Dr. Sinsky finished off his handiwork. The bedside manner. I don't need it. Oh, that's right. You don't need it, Danny. Now hold on to something, Danny. It'll hurt. Yeah, yeah. Hold on to something, Danny. To me. It's gonna hurt. <laughs> he held on to something. To me. And it still hurt him. What is it with you, Dr. Sinsky? Maybe you need a refresher course in adult medical education. Uh, unruffle your feathers, Mother Tentaglia. I'm all right. Yeah. Listen to him, Doctor. Last night he got a hole in his back from unsharpened scissors. And this morning he tells me he's all right. Okay, if I go back to my office, Dr. Sinsky. You'll need rest, Danny. I'll bear it in mind. Okay, check me in the morning. You hear, Danny? You hear? Yeah. The debt piles up, doesn't it, Doctor? 
What, Dad? What are you talking about? I'll count out the times you've eased the pain. I'll let you know. Uh, get him out of here, Gino. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Let's go, Danny. I'll go get permission from the captain to give a sick leave, and then I'll, I'll conjure up a squad car, and we'll surprise the Mrs. Sergeant Artaglia in the middle of a mozzarella, and then we'll solve your, your, our wound together, and then... What made two people die like that, you know? Tommy Hart, Stella Croft... Danny, Danny, you disappoint me. You are thinking on your sick leave time. What ties it together, Gino? Danny, if I tell you, you promise to let me manage your sickness? Huh? What ties it is Tommy Hart and Estella Croft were once married in that place in Maryland. You know, on that quick marriage plan. Uh, I ain't making it up, Danny. Mugovan dug it out of the records. It was a secret between you two? Oh, Danny, don't mean nothing. They got an annulled the next day. That unties it. Danny, you're jeopardizing your good health. Danny! Good morning. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Hi, Danny. Hey, look at me. Yeah, look at you. Since when they move you out of the shipping department into the reception desk? Since this a.m. I told you. I got supervised into it. Oh. Tell Mr. Sinclair I want to see him. Sure, Danny. Watch me. See? What is it, Miss Morrow? There is out here at this moment the gentleman of the police department, a Mr. Danny Clover. Show him in. Show him in. Very good. To that door, Danny. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Sinclair. I'm a busy man, Mr. Clover, but I always have time to talk to you. Mr. Sinclair, how much of your affairs can you get in order in the next 15 minutes? My business, we never talk in riddles. It's how much, why, when, things a man can answer. What's on your mind? You, Tommy Hart, Stella. They worked for me, Mr. Clover, and they died. I'm going to pay for their funerals, and I'm going to find out if they had family. They'll be taken care of. We have a fund toward that. Tell the people at headquarters it might make an impression. Honestly, honestly, now, I don't know what you're talking about. Let's but... stop kidding each other, Sinclair. You're a man with tastes, from the lines of women's dresses to a lacquered apartment to a little employee who's now your receptionist, from Stella Croft to Ginny Morrow. Better find out if Ginny had a husband. No, I still don't follow you. Then I'll tell you. It's called the Badger Game. Listen to me, Mr. Clover. You listen to me. Tommy and Stella weren't married. Did you know that? You didn't know it, huh? I thought. I, I saw the certificate of marriage. The justice of the peace who married them. I, I thought... Marriage and all the next morning. Badger game. Stella invited you to make a play for her. You bit. Tommy walks in, waves a certificate of marriage. You pay him. Money. Invitations to your home. He gets greedier and greedier. So you kill him. I didn't have to. You don't know... What it was, Clover. That boy grinning into my face, taking over my house, making me... What is it, Justin? What's the matter? What happened? Make him understand. Make him understand. Mrs. Sinclair, your husband just confessed to killing Tommy Hart. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you kill him? It's all right, Justin. I'm here now. It's all right. You got Tommy out of the way, Sinclair. Why did you kill Stella? Listen. I said it was all right, Justin. Well, I'll tell you why. Stella knew you killed Tommy. It didn't worry her very much. She just upped the blackmail ante. Sinclair, that's why you killed Stella. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. You did? For what she was doing. Doing to my home, to my husband, to my boy, to my boy's name. Yes, and I stabbed you, too, for what you were doing to us. I killed, I'd kill again. What'll we do about the boy? You didn't think, did you, Justin? You just didn't think when you started it. When you saw that Stella, you didn't think. Please, please. The boy will be all right. We have money. It's more than you had when you started. He'll be all right, Justin. It's going to be all right. In the April night, Broadway echoes with sounds heard only in darkness. The whispers that speckle places where there's no sun. There's a touch on your coat, you turn. There's no one, nothing. Only the trail of dust on your shoulder. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway. 
Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Irene Tedrow was heard as Elizabeth Sinclair, Herb Butterfield as Justin Sinclair, Sylvia Sims as Ginny Morrow, Mary Shipp as Stella Croft, and Sidney Miller as Jones. <laughs> If you're in the mood for mysteries, you can try CBS almost any old evening. And there's a top-notch thriller on hand for you. Tomorrow and every Sunday, it's Charlie Wilde. Monday nights, the top Hollywood stars appear in original thrillers on the Hollywood Star Playhouse. Thursdays, there's a swell night for mystery and thrills on CBS. Suspense, Mr. Keen, and the FBI in Peace and War are heard on most of these same stations. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, here it is, Saturday night again in time for our weekly visit with that excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in the old familiar study, so let's waste no time enjoying it. Good evening, Mr. Bell. You're punctual to the minute, as usual. You bet I am. When it's time for Dr. Watson to tell a new adventure he had with the immortal Sherlock Holmes, I'm not going to miss a <laughs> second. It's nice of you to say so, my boy. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Before I sit down, Dr. Watson, you mind if I take a look at the old metal case on the mantelpiece? It wasn't there last week. No, I placed it there because it played a prominent part in tonight's story. You see, it's a memento of yet another encounter that Sherlock Holmes and I had with the arch-villain of London crime. Professor Moriarty. But what is it, Dr. Watson? Looks like an old compass. That's exactly what it is, my boy. But there are no numerals on it. Just these strange figures around the dial. Well, those apparent hieroglyphics helped us to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. I call it the adventure of the half-eaten apple, the Coptic compass, and the unclothed corpse. I can hardly wait, Doctor. Well, I'm sure you'll wait long enough to have a word with our listeners now, won't you, Mr. Bell? <laughs> right. Men, aren't you sick and tired of hair preparations which leave your hair looking and feeling greasy? When you run your hand over your hair, does your hair feel sticky and dirty? Does grease come off on your hand? If so, then now's the time to change to Kreml hair tonic. The first thing you'll notice about Kreml is how clean it smells, how clean it looks and feels on your hair and scalp. When you use Kreml, you can run your hand over your hair. And honestly, men, it's a pleasure. Not a trace of that greasy, sticky feeling. Yet you can't beat Kreml to keep hair neatly groomed. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair in place longer, with such a natural, well-groomed appearance. So, men, let Kreml give your hair this handsome, clean-cut look which is bound to make a hit, both on the job and with the ladies. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how's about the compass, the half-eaten apple, and the... And the unclothed corpse? (laughs) Well, Mr. Bell, the adventure began on a November morning shortly after the turn of the century. Holmes, seldom one to indulge in exercise... For its own sake, I displayed a rare burst of activity and joined me in a stroll through Regent's Park. Just before noon, we retraced our steps, and as we turned the corner into Baker Street, 
I nearly collided with a tall, well-dressed man walking in the other direction. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Oh, it's quite all right, sir. Excuse me. Aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. I'm Major Stanley. Indeed. You're a little, little early for our appointment, Major Stanley. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Dr. Watson. I am early, Mr. Holmes, and when your housekeeper told me you were still out, I decided to take a stroll. Then let's walk back together, and perhaps you can tell me your problem as we go. It isn't exactly my problem, Mr. Holmes. You see, I made the count to the Maharaja of Kasul. Oh, really? It's a very interesting job, I should imagine. Uh, yes, it you is. You know, I was in India myself, uh, Peshawar and further north. I was oh, once attacked uh, by... Quite, uh, Watson. Some oh. other time, don't you think? Oh, sorry, Holmes. The Jim Maharaja's Watson problem would seem pressing since his emissary has been oh. so eager to reach us. Oh. Uh, please continue, Major Stanley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of the Star of Kasul? A fabulously valuable diamond, isn't it? Yes. It's the treasure of the Maharaja's collection. At the moment, it's in the vaults of the Bank of England. No, it's the best place for it, I should say. There have been several jewel robberies lately. Uh, so I've been told, and that's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. You see, the Maharaja has come to England to have his portrait painted by Sergeant. Your problem becomes apparent, Major Stanley. When this portrait is painted, the Star of Kasul will no doubt be set in the Maharaja's turban. And you quite justifiably feel concerned about the jewel's safety. Exactly, Mr. Holmes. It must be cleverly and closely guarded on its daily journey from the vaults to the Maharaja's suite and back. Well, hardly sounds like a job for you, Holmes. No, Major Stanley. Without wishing to appear conceited, I may say that such a routine matter is rather outside my scope. The Maharaja insists on having you, Mr. Holmes. I assure you his fee would be princely. Uh, here we are at 221B. Come in, Major Stanley. We'll discuss the matter further, if you like. Mrs. Hudson, we're back. Oh, very well, Doctor. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, there were two gentlemen waiting to see you. Said they had an appointment, but they've gone. Said they'd come back later. Uh, did they leave their names? No, sir, they didn't. Oh, that's odd. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Hi, sir. Let's go upstairs, shall we, Major Stanley? Very well, Doctor. Regarding your problem, Major Stanley... It occurs to me that Humphrey Pedder might be a good man to see. Humphrey Pedder? Yes, I'm not personally acquainted with him, but I'm told that he specializes in the uh, uh, more physical aspects of detective work. The Maharaj will be very distressed if you refuse him, Mr. Holmes. Naturally, I wish to... Uh... I'm sorry, Major Stanley. I've made my decision. I can't handle the case. See Mr. Pedder, if you will. But, but Mr. Holmes, uh, can, can't we sit down and talk about it at least? Yes, Holmes. After all, there's no need to be rude. I'm afraid not. Good day, Major. I, I've heard you were eccentric, Mr. Holmes, but I, I didn't know how eccentric. Holmes, what on earth's the matter with you? You ask him up, and then you won't even let him in, uh, enter the room. For an excellent reason, Watson. Come inside. Look, there on the floor. Great heavens! I could hardly let the emissary of a Raja walk into a room containing a corpse, and an unclothed one at that. Lift the blanket off the face, Watson. Right, you are, huh? There. Oh, Doctor. The poor man. Is that the face of one of the men that called here? Aye, sir, it is. Cover it again, Watson. I saw the other one leave, sir. He said his friend had already left. Oh, I never dreamed... Now, this that... one you saw leaving, was he carrying anything? A bundle, perhaps? No, sir, he wasn't. Could you describe him? Well, he was tall and thin... And he had a but high If he was forehead. carrying no bundle, where are the corpses' clothes? There's no sign of them in here. What a shocking thing, sir. A murder right in your living room. Oh, will I send for the police? Definitely not, Mrs. Hudson. And please keep this to yourself. Aye, sir. When a corpse is deposited on my own carpet, there's a certain point of honor in being able to present the police with a complete explanation when I do call them in. Uh, that'll be all, Mrs. Hudson. All right, sir. What a terrible thing. Holmes, this is incredible. Why leave a corpse here? And why unclothed? The obvious reason to remove clothing would be to make identification difficult. And how did the murderer get the clothes out of here? Mrs. Hudson said that he wasn't carrying anything. We have many other questions to answer, old chap. The knife wound in the heart gives us no clue, I'm afraid. But observe the singular collection of objects that are lying beside the body. Well, let's have a look at them. A railway ticket, a funny-looking compass... And an apple that has been bitten into. The corpse has protruding teeth... I bet you that he didn't make the bite in this apple. Holmes, these must be the murderer's tooth marks. If you're correct, Watson, our murderer is an extraordinary man indeed. Well, why do you say that? Because if you look closely, you'll notice the interesting fact that this bite was made by two sets of upper teeth. <laughs> you... 
You're the one who no mistake, Professor Moriarty. <laughs> Two sets of appetite. Well, that was the best touch. Yes, Carter. I must confess it was neat. Simple, of course. You start the bite with your upper teeth, reverse the apple, and conclude the bite. <laughs> yes, simple. But I trust also somewhat disconcerting for the great Sherlock Holmes. Our past encounters have given me an insight into his very unusual mind. I'd like to watch his face when he walked in there, Professor. So would I. But the next 24 hours will give me little leisure, I fear. I must arrange for a certain matter concerning a change of ownership in the Star of Kursul. This should be a fascinating game. But the old compass, the railway ticket. Carter, with your somewhat limited cranial development, it must be hard for you to absorb the subtler points in such a plan, but surely its basic purpose is obvious. Sherlock Holmes is about to be engaged by the Maharaja to guard the jewel. I had to divert his attention, so I perpetrated an intriguing murder on his own doorstep and surrounded the corpse with meaningless and completely unrelated objects which I knew would torment his curiosity and keep him off my trail. And that corpse would take some explaining to the police too, Professor. Yes, that's why I placed it there. It puts him in an acutely embarrassing position. He has to try and solve the case or become the laughing stock of London. <laughs> it's one of your neatest jobs, Professor. Oh, I won't say that, Carter. But I'm quite sure that I've posed a problem that Sherlock Holmes will be totally unable to resist. <laughs> I can't resist this problem, Watson. No fee on earth could make me bother with the safety of a mere diamond when such a puzzle presents itself. On my soul, you talk rather as though you were settling down to a game of chess. You've got to solve this problem, Holmes, or else it's going to put you in a ridiculous position with Scotland Yard. And just think if it got into the papers. I shall reserve my imagination for the problem posed. The question of the apple is, of course, obvious. Well, I suppose all you have to do is to find a man with two sets of false upper teeth. <laughs> Very simple. Quite. The only way such an imprint could be left is to take a half bite with the upper teeth, reverse the apple, and repeat the procedure. The only question here is, why indulge in such a bizarre performance? Well, whatever the reason, those are the murderer's tooth marks. Unquestionably. You notice the eaten portion of the apple has only just commenced to turn brown. The bite was undoubtedly taken in this room. But to identify teeth marks is a monumental problem and might prove insoluble. Let's turn our attention to the compass for a moment. Well, I've never seen one like it. There are no numerals on it, no points of the compass indicated anywhere. Just a lot of funny little squiggles. Oh, no, Watson. Surely you recall the singular affair of the Coptic patriarchs? You overrate my memory, Holmes. In any case, I don't even know what a Copt is. My dear Watson, sometimes you astound me. Well, it seems to me it takes very little to astound you. I repeat, what is a Copt? The Copts are the principal Christian race descended from ancient Egyptian stock. What you refer to as squiggles on this compass, in reality, are letters of the Coptic alphabet. Oh, well, that makes it more confusing than ever. An apple bitten into by an eccentric, and now a compass with ancient Egyptian lettering on it. I just can't see any relation between the two of them. And yet we know there must be. That's what makes the problem so fascinating. Well, what does the compass tell you, Holmes? Two things. The Coptic lettering on the dial is inscribed by hand. Obviously, it was constructed for a cop who could speak no European language. And yet, the corpse was definitely not of Egyptian origin. I'll wager that he was born not too far away from the sound of Bow Bells. I agree, Watson. And so the problem becomes more confusing. Now, uh, let us examine another piece of this fascinating puzzle. The railway ticket. Well, it's the unused return half of a first-class ticket from the village of Chipping Sodbury to London. Yes, and the date stamped on the back is November the 6th. Today? Yes, Watson, today. Chipping Sodbury is a tiny village. I imagine that the number of passengers that travelled from there to London this morning could be counted on one hand. You're going to Chipping Sodbury? Yes. It shouldn't be too hard to find out who purchased this ticket. And while I'm doing that, I want you to stand guard here. Uh, with, with, with the corpse? Yes, Watson. And I suggest that you keep your revolver handy. My revolver? You mean that I... I mean that after what has happened in one short morning in Baker Street... We should be prepared for any eventuality. In just a moment, we'll see just what eventualities do develop. But first, if you're smart, you'll take better care of the hair you've got. Let me assure you, men, you can't use a better product than Kreml hair tonic. 
This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which no other hair tonic has. That is why Kremel keeps your hair in place longer. Why your hair always has such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. And listen carefully to this, man. Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kremel stimulates the circulation of blood right in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated, how clean your scalp feels. At the same time, Kremel removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls, Kremel actually helps condition the hair by making it feel softer, more pliable. So men, why be satisfied with a product which merely keeps your hair in place? when you can have handsomely groomed hair plus all those extra advantages of Kremel. Buy a bottle as soon as possible at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that Professor Moriarty did quite a job in sending you and Sherlock Holmes off on a false trail. He did, Mr. Bell, and for a while his nefarious plan succeeded. But to take up the story where I left off... While I stood guard in Baker Street over the mysterious corpse, Holmes caught the next train for the tiny village of Chipping Sodbury. He told me that after a talk with the village stationmaster, he had no trouble in tracing the purchaser of the first-class railway ticket that we'd found beside the body. It had been bought by a dignified and elderly clergyman by the name of Russell, and Holmes lost no time in calling on it. The stationmaster told me, sir that you were the only person to purchase a return first-class ticket to London this morning. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I had occasion to make one of my rare excursions to London this morning. But though it was an unfortunate experience for me, I can't think my humble visit to the city could be a matter of any possible interest to you. I'm very interested in what happened to the return half of your railway ticket, sir. Very odd you should mention that. A regrettable business. Most regrettable. It was stolen from me by a pickpocket together with my watch and chain. Didn't notice it until I had occasion to look at the time when I was lunching with the Bishop of St. Luke's. You've no idea when or where the theft took place, sir? I walked from the station. The crowds were quite dense, and I do recall being jostled rather heavily on one occasion. You reported your loss to the police, I suppose. Naturally. But I have little hope that they'll catch the criminal. Most regrettable business. Cost me a... Watch and the price of another ticket. An expensive lesson in the frailty of human nature. <clears throat> Do you uh, care for a cup of tea, Mr. Holmes? Uh, no, thank you. I'm afraid I haven't time. I must return to London on the next train. Urgent and unfinished business awaits me there. <laughs> We followed Sherlock Holmes to Paddington Station, Professor Moriarty. Excellent. He caught the train for Chipping Sudbury, no doubt, Carter. Oh, yes, Professor. A fat lot of good, that'll do him. Even if he does find the old clergyman we pinched the stuff from. Mm, but it consumed valuable time. Time during which I can complete our plans regarding the star of Kursul. Before midnight tonight, I think I can safely say that the jewel will be in our hands. <laughs> How very fortunate that Sherlock Holmes has such a devouring curiosity. Any luck, Holmes? A waste of valuable time, Watson. I found the purchase of the ticket all right. The return half, together with his watch, had been stolen by a pickpocket. Oh, Lord, so that means we start all over again. No, Watson. At least one clue has been eliminated. Let us analyze the remaining ones more thoroughly. Now, the problem of the Coptic compass should next engage our attention. A call on the Egyptian embassy might prove illuminating. You know, Holmes, <laughs> while you were away, I, I had a brainwave. Congratulations. It was connected with the missing clothes from the corpse. Where, I asked myself... Where would be the obvious place to hide clothes? Why, in the, in the clothes closet, of course. So I searched both our wardrobes absolutely thoroughly. They weren't there. Interesting, Watson. Of course, I'd already done the same thing. Mm -hmm. The problem of the missing clothes is still... Numbskull! Yes, Holmes? Why didn't I think of it before? What is it, Holmes? The special wardrobe that I keep for my disguises. In the dressing room. Come on, Watson. 
By Jove, yes, I, I never thought of that. Perfect place for hiding the dead man's clothes. Let's see if there have been any recent additions to this raggledy collection of mine. Costa's outfit. And there's a clergyman's suit. You always made a surprisingly convincing clergyman, Holmes. And here's the unfailing passport to many a servant's back door. The stained and roughened worsteds of the English plumber. Yes, these patched and frayed ghosts could tell many a tale of... Hello. Look here, Watson. Plain blue suit in rather good condition. Quite. And it doesn't belong in my collection. I think we've solved the mystery of the vanishing clothes. The labels have been ripped out of the coat. Yes. And the pockets emptied. All possible identification removed. We're getting warm, Watson. We're getting very warm. Wait a minute. What is it? Give me a knife. All right, sir. There's something in the lining of this coat. Feels like paper. Perhaps the murderer didn't remove all identification after all. Uh, Here you are. These scissors will do the trick. Splendid. There we are. Piece of paper sewn to the padding of the coat. Yes. Let's see what it tells us. Humphrey Pedder, 118 Montague Crescent, Knightsbridge. That's the private detective you were talking about earlier on today. Do you suppose that Pedder's the corpse? At this stage, Watson, I shall suppose nothing. We'll go to Montague Crescent and find out for ourselves. Mr. Pedder, I can't say how glad I am that we found you alive and well. From what you gentlemen have told me, Doctor, I feel glad myself to be here. Is it your custom to have an extra identification label sewn into all your clothes, Mr. Pedder? Yes, Mr. Holmes. A detective never knows what may happen to him. I've always felt such identification might be valuable. A very sound precaution. Thank you, sir. And you say that a suit of your clothes was stolen from your wardrobe last night? Yes. And I can't unearth a clue. Embarrassing situation for a detective, Mr. Holmes. Yes, it certainly is. Though I'm sure in your position, you've never had a thing like that happen to you. I um, doubt, Mr. Pedder, if you know just how embarrassing a detective's life may become. Yes, indeed. Take our present situation, for instance. Quite, I'll... Watson. Mr. Pedder. I can't get a word in it, George. Did Major Stanley call on you today? I suggested that you would be eminently suited to the task of guarding the Maharaja's diamond. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'm going over to the Savoy tonight to talk to the Maharaja. Much obliged to you for giving me the recommendation, particularly since I've never had the privilege of meeting you. I'd heard very flattering reports of your ability. I'm very glad, Mr. Holmes. Your recommendation means a lot to me. Well, Holmes, we've drawn another blank. Yes, Watson. I fear we must return to Baker Street and see if an ancient compass can point the way to the solution. Where to, sir? The Egyptian Embassy in Grosvenor Square, Caddy. What, your gentlemen? Jump in, Watson. I feel a blasted fool trotting around London with a Coptic compass under my arm. I hope this leads us somewhere. If the excursion proves fruitless, Watson, I'm afraid I shall be compelled to get in touch with Scotland Yard. A few hours' delay in reporting a murder can be explained, but beyond that, we may find ourselves in trouble. Well, I think you should have reported it before this. By the way, Holmes, did you notice the brougham and pair that drove up to Pedder's house just as we left? I'm afraid for once I was sufficiently preoccupied to yield to you in observation, my dear Watson. I'm not certain, but I thought that it was Major Stanley who who stepped out of it. Major Stanley? And yet Mr. Pedder said that... But of course, what an idiot I've been. Cabby, Cabby! Yes, sir? Turn around and drive us to the Savoy Hotel as fast as you can. Right, you are, Gunnar. But uh, why the Savoy Hotel, Holmes? Surely the situation is crystal clear now, Watson. just about as clear as porridge to me. The whole thing's a plot to fool me. Tell me, Watson, what is suggested to you by the combination of an unclothed corpse, a stolen suit, and a railroad ticket? Well, if I knew the answer, Holmes, I'd have given it to you this morning and saved ourselves a lot of trouble. The answer, Watson, is organization. A group of well-organized criminals who are able to perform these unrelated tasks. And who is the only person in London who can arrange for running the criminal gamut from murder to plain pickpocketing? Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Of course. Remember Mrs. Hudson's description of our visitor? Tall, thin, and with a high forehead. And if you add organization and Moriarty to Major Stanley, the Maharaj of Kursul, and the portrait painter, the sum total should be apparent. You mean that you've solved the problem of the unclothed corpse? I mean I know precisely how Professor Moriarty intends to steal the star of Kursul. Master Cabby, there's not a moment to lose. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, 
Holmes, it's an astonishing story you've told me. At least it explains my apparent rudeness this morning, Major Stanley. You appreciate the embarrassing position in which my friend was placed, sir. You, yes, indeed. But, but of course you understand that Mr. Pedder here is now in charge of guarding the Star of Kasul. Quite, Major. And uh, you're in very excellent hands, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. But your own problem still fascinates me. The unclothed corpse, the compass, and the apple. As a humble exponent of your profession, I'm curious to see how you arrived at your conclusions. I reached them only just in time, Mr. Pedder. If I hadn't, I should at this moment be paying a fruitless visit to the Egyptian embassy. Well, I'm still confused, Holmes. And yet the answer is simple. What was outstanding about the crime committed at Baker Street? What was its uh, individual peculiarity? Well, I suppose the air of mystery that surrounded it. I prefer to use the word mystification. The crime fascinated me, stimulated me, as Professor Moriarty hoped it would until I realized that it was intended to do precisely that. The whole plan was a decoy, designed to prevent me from accepting your mission, Major Stanley. How could I accept such a commonplace job as guarding a jewel while such a fascinating problem was presented in my own living room? And the apple and the compass Fictional clues that led nowhere, but were sufficiently challenging for the criminal to know I wouldn't be able to resist tracking them down. What an amazing plot. And the railway ticket and the suit of clothes that were stolen from me were all meant to focus your attention elsewhere and away from the diamond. Exactly, Mr. Pedder. Well, Mr. Holmes, I assure you we are very grateful for the warning. Yes. We shall be more than ever on our guard now. We know where the danger's coming from. Professor Moriarty. I'm taking the star across you back to the Bank of England in a few minutes. I assure you that I shall guard it extremely well. I think, Mr. Pedder, that if you don't mind, I'll take charge of the stone. But, Mr. Holmes, I've already been commissioned for the work. That's true, Mr. Holmes. Since you refused the job, I had to make other arrangements. Mr. Pedder was your own suggestion for the assignment. Nonetheless, Major... I think the Maharaja will sleep much more comfortably if I take charge of the stone. Holmes, I don't think it's very ethical. After all, you did refuse to take on the case, you know. This is hardly a time for ethics, Watson. Where is the Star of Kasul, Major Stanley? I just handed it over to Mr. Pedder before you arrived. Then supposing you give it to me, Mr. Pedder. By the way, I don't have the pleasure of knowing your royal name. But Holmes, he's Humphrey Pedder. Oh, no, Watson. The unclothed corpse of Humphrey Pedder still lies in Baker Street. This is one of Professor Moriarty's most trusted henchmen. You're too smart for your own good. Look out, he's got a revolver. A little slow in drawing it. A beautiful uppercut, Holmes. Send for the police, please, Major Stanley. We have a prize catch for them here. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I can't tell you how grateful I am. I'll take the liberty of removing the diamond from the pocket of our recumbent friend. There we are. Behold, Watson... The Star of Kasul. What a magnificent stone. Magnificent. And yet one man was murdered for it. I only wish another might hang the cause of it. But Moriarty still goes free. And he killed Pedder. We'll catch him, Watson. We'll catch him. He is getting clumsy. If he'd noticed the credentials in Pedder's clothes, he would have been in possession of this bauble before the night is out. Instead of which, the evidence of this man here may help us to trap him. I hope so, Watson. But Moriarty inspires his henchmen with such loyalty that I doubt if he'll give us much help. The jewel is safe, our own peculiar problem is solved, and we've captured a prize villain. Next time, we shall capture the master himself. And did you, Dr. Watson? Did I what? Mr. Bell? Did you and Holmes finally capture Professor Moriarty, the master himself? No, Mr. Bell, haven't you uh, got a word for our listeners? (laughs) Yes, I have. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, here's some advice from one of America's foremost beauty authorities, John Robert Powers. Mr. Powers tells his famous million-dollar Powers models to use only cremel shampoo to wash their hair. And how right Mr. Powers is. Because cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to its own natural, glossy luster. It leaves the hair shining bright for days. Just a vision of beauty. You know, cremel shampoo is great for washing children's hair, too. Yes. Its luxurious, active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Cremel shampoo never dries the hair. So, ladies, buy a bottle at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to its natural shining glory. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel shampoo. 
Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week I think I'll tell you a story about a dowager dip. A dowager dip? What on earth is that? <laughs> That's a, a slang way of saying that our story concerns the dowager duchess of Penfield, who had the misfortune of being a kleptomaniac. And the story also concerns the strange, and I must admit, embarrassing adventure of the elusive emerald. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. When Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the elusive emerald. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf is busy planning a menu. I'll see if he can talk to you. What's the name again? You want to talk to a dame named Mrs. Collins? Hang up, Archie. Do we know a Mrs. Collins? No. I don't suppose you care, but I think her voice is very charming. Doubtless. Every female has a charming voice to you. Hang up. Okay. I'm sorry, Mrs. Collins, but at the moment, Mr. Wolf is too involved with his digestive system to be interrupted. However, if I may introduce myself, Archie Goodwin, uh, Mr. Wolf's assistant, if I can be of any help. Archie. Uh, yes, Mrs. Collins, I'll ask you. Cocktail party. Hang up, Archie. Well, Mrs. Collins, I'm afraid it would be better if you didn't expect Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Cocktails. Fooey. Sad. Very absurd. She says you promised to come to her cocktail party, and why aren't you there? Because you are going to attend the cocktail party and the probable unpleasant ending. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, the most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Mr. Wolf and I refer to this as the case of the party for death. Nero Wolf really should have gone to the party since he'd accepted, but I was delegated. I can't complain now since it was there that I met Georgia, the most beautiful redhead. Well, that's my weakness, redheads. Yeah, and blondes and brunettes. And... Well, anyway, Mr. Wolf was adamant about going to the party. I've never been to a cocktail party in my life. You know, I drink nothing but beer. You could take your beer with you, couldn't you? I could not. Do we know a Mrs. Collins whose cocktail party you said you'd go to? The phone rang and I picked it up. Where was I? Exactly. Okay. So a Mrs. Collins with a beautiful, seductive voice conned you into accepting an invitation to a cocktail party that you knew you weren't going to. Archie. Yes, master. Just a little less sarcasm, perhaps. Sarcasm? Call it impertinence, then. Impertinence, master? Exactly. Less of that, much less. Okay. Continue now. Where was I? You were eating the duck recipe. Oh, yes, the duck. Oh, here we are. Dodine de Canard. The Dodine is one of the oldest dishes in the repertory of French cooking, being mentioned in books of the 14th century. Le Grand Cousinier de Tout Cousinier. Hooey, what time is it, Archie? Almost 6.30. Oh, in that case... Uh, you going to get up? Uh, here on this card are your instructions, Archie. If you are still alive tomorrow, you may make your report. 
I helped the huge bulk that was Nero Wolf out of his specially built desk chair and walked with him to the elevator that would take him upstairs to his orchids. I stepped back to the desk and found the card which bore my instructions. In his small, perfect handwriting, I read, Mrs. Albert Collins, Empire Towers. Arrive at 7, say I sent you. After the murder, telephone me before the police arrive. At exactly 7, I rang Mrs. Collins' doorbell. Mrs. Collins? I'm Mrs. Collins. I'm Archie Goodwin. We talked on the phone a little while ago. Oh, oh yes. Well, uh, come in, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, Mr. Wolf begs to be excused. At the last moment, he was unable to attend. Well, I'm glad you could come. You're not disappointed? No, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm rather upset. I'm afraid, Mr. Goodwin, for my life. That's why I called Mr. Wolf. Oh, oh, just drop your hat and coat there, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, may I tell you something, Mrs. Collins? Well, of course, Mr. Goodwin. Archie will do. Uh, Archie? When I spoke to you on the phone, I thought I knew what you'd look like. And? You do. Well, is that good? It's not bad, Mrs. Collins. Janie will do. Janie will do. Um, Archie, mm -hmm. I, um, I think it would be best if I say you're an old beau of mine. From where? Uh, in Hollywood. When I went to Hollywood High School and you went to USC. Okay, but don't expect me to remember much about it. Well, I'd be flattered if you remember anything about it. <laughs> I want you to keep your eyes and ears open. Observe everything tonight. Well, now shall we join the party? <laughs> well, Albert, this is Archie Goodwin. Archie, this is my husband, Albert. How do you do? Hello. And this is Joe Boyce, my husband's partner. How do you do? Boyce? I've told you about Archie, Albert, but well, I guess you probably don't remember, do you? No, I don't. When I was in high school and he went to USC... Oh. Oh, yeah, sure. What do you have, Goodwin? I'd like a plain lime and soda. Oh, not really. A teetotaler now? Uh, yes, I, uh... Well, I used to overdo it, uh -huh. remember? So you knew my wife in Hollywood? Quite a while ago, though. Uh-huh. Been here long? Oh, a while. Did you and my wife run into each other again just lately? Yeah. A few days ago? About... Joe Boyce here is my partner, chemical business. Makes this sort of an old home week, doesn't it, Joe? In a way, Al, I guess it does at that. Joe knew my wife back in those days, too. And they're still very friendly. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You two have got something in common to talk about, haven't you, Goodwin? Mrs. Collins, you mean? Uh, we never knew each other very well. No? Okay, Goodwin, let it go. Why, look. Look what I found. A new man. Just what I need. I'm Georgia. Archie. Archie, dear, will you fix up my drink, please? Anything for a lady. Let's go to the bar. Eh, Archie? I'm determined, Joe. If you're only the money, our only Jane, I might listen. Oh, Al, can't we talk about it later? I like talking about it now, Joe. You're going to be sorry about this, Al. I am already. But you'll have 20 years or so in prison just being sorry. I've got the papers you forged right here. You're hysterical, Al. Let's face it. The firm went broke, but I suffered too. So let's forget it. Yes, Joe. The firm went broke, but you didn't. And I don't think my wife did either. The two of you had everything figured for yourselves. Well, I'm turning the papers over to the DA tomorrow. Near a wolf speaking. Archie, what do you know about this expected murder, if anything? Has it happened yet? No, but who's supposed to get killed? I haven't the faintest idea, Archie. Then why don't you stop it? That is impossible. I don't even know who's there. You want me to tell you? Not in the least. How am I supposed to prevent it if I don't know what I'm looking for? You're not supposed to prevent it, Archie. I don't think you could. I don't think anybody could. You want to hear what I found out already? No. I'll tell you anyway. Collins thinks his wife and his partner, Boyce, have been stealing his dough, and he's threatening to send Boyce to the clink. Archie. Yeah? You're wasting our time. Go back to the party. There is nothing you can do to prevent the murder. But I want you to be there when it happens. Now that all the guests have gone, let's uh, sit down here, Georgia. When Janie was in Hollywood, she must have had more good-looking boyfriends. Let's get personal about this, Georgia. Yeah, let's. 
When you say good looking, do you mean me? I don't mean anybody else, Archie. You know, I think you're pretty, too. You'd better not let Jane hear you say that. You think she'd care? I thought you knew Jane. Only slightly. You don't like Jane too well, do you? Why? Why? Why what? Why don't you tell the truth about it? No man as attractive as you ever knew Jane slightly. Either they knew her or they didn't know her. Maybe you think I'm getting a little tipsy. The idea never occurred to me. No? Well, it has to me. Refill your glass? I'll come with you to the bar. Well, here's your drink, Georgia. Oh, I find there's no ice left in the ice bucket. Janie? Hey, Janie, no ice. Oh, well, I'll get some. Here, give me the bucket. Uh, Mrs. Collins, uh, Janie, I mean. Yes, Archie? May I use the phone in the bedroom again? Oh, of course. Will you excuse me for a minute, Georgia? I'm coming with you. Uh, why don't you just stay here until Jane brings the ice? Well, why don't you go talk to Joe Boyce? I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce. I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce ever. Now, look, Georgia. I'm coming with you, Archie. Is that clear? Okay, come on. Here's where the phone is. I could have found it myself. You don't want me with you, do you? Just sit down here on the edge of the bed and listen, if that's what you want to do. Mr. Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Well, Archie, what? Just a bit of a report. Go on. At this moment, I am sitting on the edge of one of two twin beds in the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Collins. Sitting next to me is a gorgeous redhead named Georgia. Georgia what, dear? Boy. You mean you're the wife of Joe Boys? Of course. Didn't you know? I am sitting next to the gorgeous redheaded wife of Albert Collins' partner, Joe Boyce. Archie, you annoy me. From what I just learned, I can see there's another friction going on. You mean Georgia and Jane? Yep, fireworks between them. This one, no like other one. Have you anything more to say? When I called, I was going to ask if there's any reason why I shouldn't come home now. I wrote your instructions for you, Archie. After the murder, call you. Yeah, that's perfectly clear, isn't it? But what if there isn't any? Don't call me. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Hello. He hung up. Archie. What? That was a strange conversation. Do you want me to explain it to you, honey? What was that business about murder? Shall we join the party? Murder. Archie, wouldn't you be surprised if there was one? Yeah? Who's going to do what and to whom? I don't know. Maybe I will. Elucidate, honey. Do you intend to figure as the killer or the corpse? I don't intend to figure as anything. But you never know. Archie, do you think Jane Collins is better looking than me? Nope. Honestly? Honestly. Then what's the matter with me? Nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, yes, there is. Look, do you want to kiss me? Uh, I... Well, I'll tell you. When I graduated from Sunday school, I took a vow. That's what I mean. But if I were Jane, you'd want to kiss me, wouldn't you? No, frankly, no. Why not? Well, when I graduated from Sunday school, I... Okay, Archie. Let's go back. You boys have such happy faces. Where's Jane? In the kitchen getting some ice. Where have you been? With Archie. Is he an old school chum of yours, too? Do you care, Joe? No. Mr. Boyce. What? How much do you weigh? 187. Why? Then I'll be giving you five pounds. Shall we step outside? This I have got to see. Shut up. Mr. Goodwin, you seem angry. Just terribly, terribly hurt. Would it do any good if I apologized? Today I'm a little upset. If I said anything to offend you, I do apologize. Now, um... If you still want me to give you a boxing lesson, I'm at your service. Let's forget it. I'm sorry, too. Jane Collins came in from the kitchen with a bucket of ice cubes, a tray of fresh glasses, and the strapless gown she'd been wearing. <sighs> there. I never thought I'd make it. Now I'm going to mix my own drink, and you can take care of yourself. Iceberg. Huh? Whiskey. And soda. <laughs> The simple recipe, isn't it, Archie? All it needs is the ingredients. Well, I drink to the ingredients. Mmm. Ah, nice. Janie, darling. What, dear? Would you mind very much if I took Archie away from you? Uh-huh. Haven't you done that already, dear? To listen to those girls, you'd think, wouldn't you, Goodman? Me, I never think. What do you do, Archie? I concentrate. 
On what? On not thinking. I did some serious concentrating on not thinking about Nero Wolfe or about the conflict of the partners, Albert Collins and Joe Boyce, about the jealousies of Jane and Georgia. The next five minutes hardly seemed an hour. Jane and Boyce murmured to each other. Collins drank gently but firmly. Why can't you be honest, Archie? What's the matter with me? What, Georgia? You weren't listening, were you? To every gorgeous word you said. What did I say? I want to hear it again, just the way you said it before. I said, why shouldn't there be a murder? Why not? It's an order. It's just not considered the thing to do. Thing to do. Can you think of anything better? No, frankly. I can. My glass is empty. My glass is empty, too. Jane. Jane! Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not much of a hostess, am I? Oh, don't answer that. Oh, you're all empty. But I've only drunk half of mine. You don't usually drink so slowly, Jane. Oh, I'm just not in the mood tonight. I usually drink faster to keep you from drinking mine. <laughs> See, Albert always gulps his and then reaches for mine. What's the difference? Well, I'll fix you some fresh drinks, but... Uh, put my drink over there by you, Georgia, and lay off, Albert. I only had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more. I suppose we know what dear Jane is going to do, don't we? Lay off, will you? Lay off. It's my husband who said that, Archie. Archie, meet my husband, Mr. Boyce. I will now explain why dear Jane took our glasses away to the kitchen when she could have bought a drink right here. Listen, George, will you... Mr. Boyce is speaking, Archie. What, Mr. Boyce? Uh, ah, oh, nuts. Mr. Boyce says nuts, Mr. Goodwin. What do you say, Mr. Collins? I think Joe has covered the field. We were talking, weren't we, Archie? Possibly. We were talking about dear Jane... She's got to be always the prettiest, always devastating. Right now, she's putting on a completely new face. And in about 20 minutes, when our tongues are hanging out, she'll come back, all horsed up and bright and smiling with another tray of drinks. Yeah, she'll take all night to fix them. Well, I'm going to get some air on the balcony. Don't jump off. Al, you're drinking too much lately. I shouldn't worry you, Joe. Especially now. When you start drinking not only your drinks, but everybody else's too, well... Ah, Jane's right. Is that what worries you? Slide Jane's glass down. Hmm. The ice is all melted. You see what I mean? Okay, Joe, let's not be nasty until tomorrow. That gives me an idea. Think I'll propose a toast. Until tomorrow. You know, it may be rather fitting that I should drink a toast from the glass that Janey left. Until tomorrow. Al. Al? Jane? Janey! Albert! Oh, Albert. Nero Wolf speaking. May I come home now? Oh, hello, Archie. I said, may I come home now? Have you sent for the police, Inspector Kramer? Of course. Who was killed, Archie? Albert Collins. How, Archie? I don't know. You were right, though, weren't you? Actually, about what? Murder. Oh, that. We can talk about it tomorrow. Good night, Archie. Come home when you can. What do you mean, come home when I can? You'll be held as a witness, won't you? <laughs> Try not to wake me with the elevator when you come in. Well, Inspector Kramer, you've had me here at headquarters for a long while. For quite a long while. Haven't you asked me enough questions? Goodwin, you say you never saw these people before, Collins or Boyce or their wives. Yet when all the other guests had gone, you were still there. I guess I just don't know how to say goodbye. You didn't know they were partners in a chemical company. You didn't know that Boyce had forged a lot of papers with Collins' name. All I know is what you tell me. Goodwin. Yes, sir? I'm trying to be nice. Yes, sir. Now, I know, of course, that you went to that party because Nero Wolf told you to. Do you? My question is, how did Wolf know it was going to happen? Why don't you ask him? I already have. He told you? He says he never heard of Collins or Boyce. Did he say he'd ever heard of me? He says he isn't responsible for you or your shady friends. Maybe he knows I found a poison pellet in George's bag. Inspector, may I make an important call? 
Go ahead. Argy, argy. Confounded light. Hello? What time is it, master? Confounded, Argy. I'll tell you what time it is. It's a little after 4 a.m. I'm at Central Headquarters, and Inspector Kramer has been chatting with me about my shady friends. Kramer is a jackass. Just a second. Uh, pick up the other phone, will you, Inspector? Uh, sorry, Mr. Wolf. What was that you were saying about Inspector Kramer? I said Kramer is a jackass. Thank you. Wait a minute. Wolf! Oh? Eavesdropping, Inspector. I was just talking about bringing you down here for a little questioning, Wolf. Fooey. What's that? Fooey. It can be spelled in several ways. I spell it P-F-U-I. Fooey. You think I won't bring you down here as a material witness? Yes, I think you won't. I think you'd be making a great mistake if you did. A great mistake? Why? Because I might not tell you who killed Collins. And you wouldn't know which one of these people to prefer charges against. Now send Archie home. Even he needs an occasional night's sleep. <laughs> what do you think of that? He hung up. So it seems. Busy? He's probably left the phone off the hook, Inspector. By now, he's probably asleep again. Well, you know I can go out there, don't you? Sure you can. More important men than you have tried it. And where are they now? Goodwin? Yes, sir? I'm going to let you go. I'm sure Mr. Wolf and I are very grateful, Inspector. You want to know why I'm letting you go? I know why. Why? Because if you're nice and cooperative and don't make too much trouble, Mr. Wolf will solve this case for you and tell you whom to prefer charges against. Goodwin. Sir? Get out. Thank you, Inspector. Good morning, Inspector. At three o'clock the next afternoon, I was rearranging the furniture in Nero Wolf's office while the great man sat behind his desk watching me perspire. Are you finished now, Archie? I guess so. And tell me where they sat. There were two couches, like this, in front of a fireplace. Collins and Boyce were sitting together on one couch. When Georgia and I came in, they were looking at some canceled checks... Where was Mrs. Collins? I told you she was getting ice and fresh glasses. Why was she getting fresh glasses, Archie? Where were the empty ones? I don't know. Maybe they were the same ones she brought back washed and polished. Archie, I trust your powers of observation absolutely. That's why I sent you to Mrs. Collins' cocktail party. Okay, how did you know there was going to be a murder? If it was a murder. It was a murder, Archie. But isn't it obvious? How is it obvious? Suppose Colin slipped a few drops of the poison into his drink himself. It's very strong, very deadly poison, with a remarkably strong odor. Like almonds, I know. I smelled it when I picked him up. Archie, was anything found on the body that might have contained the poison, a fountain pen, whatever? Not even that. Inspector Kramer found a poison pellet in Georgia's handbag. He thinks he poisoned Collins's drink. Say, could be. But it wasn't his drink, it was his wife's. Then Georgia was trying to kill Jane, and Collins got it by mistake. We shall soon see, Archie. I was expecting a murder because you told me to expect it. I watched every move that everybody made. There is no possibility that Jane's glass, the glass with a poison in it, was tampered with by anybody. Yes, I believe. Okay. Archie, you're sore, aren't you? Have you ever spent the night with Inspector Kramer? He's really a good man, too. Why did you say he was a jackass? Because he didn't know who killed Collins? Do you? Of course. Is there ever any question about it? Just a moment, please. The only trouble is it may be difficult to prove. That's why we are giving this little cocktail party this afternoon with the help of Inspector Kramer. By the way... Yes? Call Mrs. Collins and tell her to bring a bucket of ice from her refrigerator. Why? Because our refrigerator's broken down. No, it hasn't. I was just out in the kitchen a minute ago. Our refrigerator has broken down. And it would be very helpful if Mrs. Collins would bring a bucket of ice cubes. What makes you think she'll do it? She will. Call her. 6.45. There we were in Wolf's office doing a repeat performance of last night's smash hit. 
two couches faced each other, a cocktail table between them. On one couch, red-headed Georgia and me. On the other couch, it was a big one, Joe Boyce, Jane Collins, widow of the lately defunct Albert, and Nero Wolf. Jane had been drinking a little slower than the rest of us. Our glasses were empty. Hers was still half full. Wolf said, Margie. Yeah? At this point in last night's party, Mrs. Collins got up and left to get some fresh drinks. Repeat what she said. Approximately. Approximately will do. I think she said something like this. She said, um, put my drink over by you, Georgia. Lay off, Albert. I've had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more, Albert. Am I right, Jane? Close enough, Archie. But what of it? No. What is this nonsense all about, Wolf? Uh, Mr. Wolf is trying to make something out of nothing. I think Mr. Wolf is going to turn up something mighty interesting. Don't look so perturbed, Joe. Since I am playing the part of the late Mr. Collins, pass me Jane's glass. I'll keep my glass, Mr. Wolf. I haven't finished my drink. You're a very clever woman, Mrs. Collins. Would it be too much if I ask what this is all about? What what is you, Archie? You make it sound as if that drink she's holding is poison. But it can't be, because as yesterday, she's already drunk half of it herself. When our freezer broke down, she was more than willing to bring a bucket of ice cubes, wasn't she? So? What would happen, Archie, if you froze a gelatine-coated pellet of poison in the center of one particular ice cube? Mrs. Collins hasn't finished her drink. Notice the ice is all melted now. She hasn't taken one sip since the ice melted completely. She came prepared in case she was exposed. Smell it, Archie. No, Archie, stand back. I can easily swallow this before you can reach me. Mr. Wolf, in a few seconds, I'll drink it. But tell me something first. Tell me how you knew. Jane, Jane, listen to me. I knew there was going to be a murder last night because you said so. I knew that it was you who would commit the murder because it was you who invited me. You hoped an expert witness would prove that you couldn't have killed your husband. So I sent Archie Goodwin, whose observations are always exact, even when he doesn't know the import of what he's observing. She brought back clean glasses. She poured the drinks out of bottles already open. And if anybody had put anything in or touched one of those glasses, I would have seen it. Exactly. The poison pellet was frozen in a certain ice cube. Mrs. Collins put that cube in her own drink, drank it until the ice had almost melted down to the poisonous pellet center. And then, then she took all the other glasses away, leaving only hers half full. And as usual, her husband drank it. No, no, Jane, don't, don't. Too late, Joe. Too late. Well, boss, Jane didn't get away with the suicide try. That was clever thinking you did. I prepared a cube of ice in which I had frozen a gelatine capsule containing nothing more than a vitamin compound. I substituted for the cube in which Jane had placed the poison for herself. wonder why Jane Collins wanted to have Joe. He'd stolen practically all the money in the company. He was just a crook. Birds of a feather, Archie. I don't believe Joe Boyce had any idea that Jane was planning a murder. And he still had all the money. Well, the forgeries will put him away for a long time. And poor Georgia could have had it pinned on her if it hadn't been for me. Yes, yes. You knew all along, didn't you, that Jane had planned to have Georgia accused by planting another pellet of the poison in Georgia's handbag. Jane would have gotten rid of her husband and Joe's wife in one stroke. You knew all that, didn't you? Well, I... Um... How about a bottle of beer, boss? <laughs> Could you spare the time? <sighs> Georgia. Beautiful redhead. Wonder where she is tonight. I'm sure I haven't the slightest idea, but in case you do... <laughs> Well, just be quiet with the elevator door when you come in. <sighs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, 
This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gigi Pearson, Herb Butterfield, Peter Leeds, Evelyn Eaton, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the malevolent medic. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again, that question has been asked of doctors in all parts of the country, doctors in every branch of medicine, and again, the brand name most is Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. It was a cold afternoon in New York. There were six inches of snow on the streets and twice that much on the fire escape outside my window. I looked down at Broadway and watched the miserable pedestrians edging their way over the slippery, ice-covered sidewalks and thought about burning some of my furniture. It was just the day for anything unpleasant, and when the door to my office opened, I turned around to look at one of the most unpleasant sights I'd ever been faced with. Standing in the door was something that looked human, and I used the term human only because I stuck around long enough to find out for sure. He was about six feet and well-dressed, in a dark gray overcoat. But his face raised goosebumps from my argyles to my haircut. It was as dark gray as his overcoat, his whole face, his eyes, his lips, and when he spoke, even his tongue. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? I want you to find a man, and I want you to find him in the next five hours. He didn't sit down. He just stood there facing me like a bad dream. I pushed the chair back and got up, as though I had to be standing to protect myself from what was coming. The man I want you to find is named Carnes. He's a science teacher at State College. Is he missing? Would I want him located if he wasn't? Would I have asked you if I'd known the answer to that? How much is your fee, Mr. Diamond? When I know what I'm getting into, a hundred a day in expenses. Yes, five hundred. Find Lewis Carnes in five hours and you get another five hundred. Does it matter if you know what you're getting into? I never go waiting if there's quicksand around. Not even for a thousand dollars? I never like to count money when I'm suffocating. You only have to find Lewis Carnes. I guarantee you'll live through it. And after I find him? You can spend your thousand and forget about it. Why do you want him found? I owe him a debt. I want to pay him. And why do I have to find him in the next five hours? Because that's how long I've got to live. Interesting situation? You bet. And that thousand made it about as interesting a situation as I'd ever gotten into. I couldn't take my eyes off of him, standing there as gray as an early morning ghost. I wanted to ask him about his color. But in a business like mine, if a client comes in riding a purple llama, you greet him like everybody rides purple llamas and keep your mouth shut. 
He handed me the $500 and a card with his business address on it. Roger Vegas, 64 West 110th, studio of modern photography. He backed up two steps, smiled a slow, dead smile, turned and walked out of the office like he was going to look at his own grave. I sat back down and thought about it for a while, and the little voice in the back of my head kept whispering, Don't do it, Diamond. Don't do it, Diamond. Don't do it, Diamond. Oh, shut up. You'll be sorry. What about the thousand dollars? It'll buy a nice funeral. Eh, uh, peasant. <laughs> If it ain't Richard Diamond, the overstuffed flatfoot. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Otis, the overstuffed flathead. Oh, no. Someday you'll be sorry. Well, everybody is sooner or later. Think of what your poor mother must have gone through. That ain't funny. I bet your father didn't think so either. Oh. Oh, Rick. Still picking on him? Oh, he'll be picked on until somebody plucks off that other head. What's up? Uh, Walter wants some information. If I can... History on a fellow named Roger Vegas. Here's his card. Also, a Mr. Lewis Carnes, science professor at State College. Well, I'll try. What's it all about? Roger Vegas wants me to find this Lewis Carnes. Wants to pay back a debt. What's unusual about that? I don't know. Oh, but you should see Roger Vegas. He'd scare you right into a dozen more ulcers. I doubt it. No room for any more. Well, the ones you've got would hide. You should see this guy, Walt. His face, his, his, his hands are dark gray. What about the rest of them? Now, wouldn't you know it if I got to ask him to take his clothes off? Very funny. What do you mean he's gray? Well, that's just what he is. Even his eyes. Not just the pupil, but the whole eye. The whole eye? Yep. If he raised his collar, he could stick out his tongue, put a tie pin on it, and wear it with a dark blue suit. His tongue, too? Even his fingernails, his gums. I suppose his hair is plaid. Okay, okay. But if you ever run into this guy in a dark alley, get set to faint. Well, I'll see what I can find out about him. I've got to have the information pretty fast. I've only got four and a half hours to find Lewis Carnes. How come? Because Roger Vegas has only got that long to live. Rick. That's what he told me. A guy with a gray face comes into your office, wants you to find another guy, and tells you you've got to find him in the next four and a half hours because he's going to die. Who's going to die? The guy with the gray face. You didn't say that. You said got to find the guy in the next four and a half hours because he's going to die. Oh, well, you know what I meant. No, no. Vegas gave me five hours. You said four and a half. Well, that was a half an hour ago. Oh, swell. Oh, I'm wasting my time. I've got to find him. The man with the gray face? No, the science professor. Walt, you're getting pretty confused. I'll see you later, huh? I left the 5th precinct, grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later I was walking across the campus of State College... Being Saturday, the big school was quiet and impressive as it stretched out over the dozen acres of snow-covered grounds. I located the administration building and found one lonely student working in the main office. Uh, ahem. <clears throat> yes? Oh. oh. Good afternoon. Looks like it might be. Can I do something for you? Well, uh, yes, I'm, I'm looking for Professor Carnes. Professor Carnes? Mm-hmm. He's uh, in the science department, isn't he? The professor hasn't been on campus since last Thursday. Faculty's been rather worried. You don't know where I could find him? No, but I'm through here in half an hour. I could help you look. <laughs> I bet you could. You know where the professor lives? It's on file. Well, why don't you be a good little freshman? Junior. And a junior, and get me his address from that file. Because it's more fun not being a good little junior. And the college has certain rules. Well, then be a bad little junior and break the rules. I'm off in half an hour. Might be able to then. I've got to find a science professor, dear. And until I do, I'm afraid I'll have to pass the extension course in biology. And if you find the professor? Uh, we'll talk about it. I'm in here every afternoon. Hmm. College hasn't changed a bit since my days. Just jumped into second gear. The cute little junior walked her sweater and saddle shoes over to a long file and came back with Professor Kahn's home address. I thanked her, promised she could wear my gold badge if she passed lunch hour and took my cab back to town. At the professor's house, I met his sister, an elderly lady named Drusilla, 
who reminded me of my math teacher at PS14. I haven't seen my brother since Friday morning, Mr. Diamond. And you have no idea where I can find him? No. Why do you want to find him? Well, I, uh... I'm a private detective, Miss Carnes. I... I was hired by a man named Vegas. Oh, oh you know him? I most certainly do. Did he hire you to find my brother? That's right. He's not a good man, Mr. Diamond. I believe he's the reason my brother disappeared. Maybe you better tell me about him. My brother married a girl many years younger than himself, and unfortunately it was not a good marriage. Did this Vegas person mention my brother's wife? No, he just told me he wanted to find the professor in order to pay him a debt. A debt? That's what he said. Watch out for that man, Mr. Diamond. He broke up my brother's marriage. Well, uh, maybe I'd better talk to your brother's wife. That would be impossible. My brother's wife killed herself. Oh, well, that's uh, too bad. My brother and I believe she killed herself because of that man, Vegas. My brother found out they were seeing each other. When he begged her to stop, she said that it was impossible and refused to give a reason. A week later, she killed herself. Have you ever seen Mr. Vegas? No, I have not. Why? Well, I was just wondering why any woman would go for a man like him. Unless she liked ghosts. I left Drusilla Carnes and looked at my watch. It was three o'clock and I had only two hours left to find the professor and earn my thousand dollars. On the way to the nearest phone booth... I thought about the case and wondered if the thousand dollars would be worth it in the long run. I watched part of my last five bucks drop in the phone and decided it was. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Diamond, Walt. I want to know about a suicide. Otis won't do it. Uh, Professor Carnes' wife. I thought so. I checked for you in Vegas and the professor. The professor's wife jumped off a building five days ago. What did you find out about Vegas and the professor? Not much. At the inquest, the professor accused Vegas of breaking up his home and driving his wife to suicide. Neither man's got a record. Vegas is a professional photographer, and the professor has been teaching at State College for the past 11 years. I talked with some of the men at the inquest, and they remembered Vegas. They all say his skin looked pretty healthy at the time. Do me a favor, Walt. Check with the coroner and find out what would turn a man's skin that color. Sure. Got any leads on the professor yet? No, but he got a hunch. I just left his sister's, and uh, she doesn't seem at all worried about her brother's disappearance. So? So if she isn't worried, there's a good chance she knows he's all right. And if she knows he's all right, she might know where he is. Oh, no wonder they made you a Lieutenant Walt. You keep thinking like that, and someday you might even take over for Sergeant Otis. Bye. I left the phone booth and walked back toward Drusilla Kahn's house. I staked myself out across the street in a corner gas station and warmed my blue little ears inside while I waited for the good Drusilla to contact her brother. I was just guessing, but it worked. Ten minutes later, Drusilla, dressed in a heavy fur coat that looked like it should be out on the river building a dam, walked out of her house and hailed a cab. I hailed one, too, and followed. Fifteen minutes later, I was back on the campus of State College. I watched her get out, walk around back of one of the buildings knock on a door. She waited until someone opened it, and then she disappeared inside. I tried the door, but it was locked again. So I toured the building. The front door was locked, too. I set to work trying to pick the lock. I broke a Boy Scout knife, half a dozen fingernails, and several bobby pins that for some strange reason had found their way into my coat pocket. So I did the next best thing. I went back to the door that Drusilla had entered earlier and waited. Five frozen minutes later, the door opened and I stood there facing Drusilla while her look melted every icicle within ten feet. Standing directly behind her was a small man, his breath showing clearly against the cold air, coming in short gasps. Drusilla. It's all right, Lewis. What do you want, Mr. Diamond? Nothing now, Miss Carnes. I have found it. Is that the man, Drusilla? Yes. He's a detective. Vegas hired him. It's all right, Drusilla. If Vegas wants to find me, I'm tired of hiding. Tell Vegas that I'll be waiting here, young man. Lewis, you know what he'll do. It's all right. 
Vegas knows he's only got a few hours left. Has that strange color of his skin got something to do with it? Yes. Have you seen him since the inquest, Professor? No. Well, that's funny. How did you know about his skin and that he only has a few hours left to live? Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here is an important question. What do you look for in a cigarette? Well, most people say flavor and mildness. Those are two things you'll find in camels. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. The flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this conclusive evidence of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test, hundreds of people smoked only camels for 30 days. Each week, noted throat specialists examined the throats of these smokers and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Yes, that's proof of mildness based on day-in, day-out smoking, not just a sniff or a puff. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test, the sensible test, the thorough test. You'll enjoy camels' rich, full flavor from first puff to last. You'll see just how mild camels are, and you'll know why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel's 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, I'd found the professor, and the thousand dollars was close to being mine. All I had to do was notify Vegas and collect. Even the professor guaranteed to help by staying and waiting for Vegas. But something was wrong. Standing there in the snow, looking at the timid professor, something began to smell to high heaven. I turned and walked away. Even if the professor was going to run, what was I supposed to do? carry him piggyback until I located my dying client. The thousand was important, but there was a lot more that had to be solved in a hurry. I went back to town and over to the photography shop run by Roger Vegas. Yeah, just something... I... What's the matter? Huh? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, can I do something for you? I'm looking for Roger Vegas. Oh, he ain't in. Ain't I seen you someplace? You might have. I move around. Where can I find Vegas? He ain't here. I know he ain't. Where can I find him? Home, I guess. Home. That would be somewhere in New York, huh? I, uh... I ain't supposed to give out the address. Uh, who wants him? I do, and I ain't supposed to give out the name. Uh, you're pretty sharp. Sharp guy, huh? Tell him to call Richard Diamond. Rich? Richard Diamond. My family thought it up. Okay. You know me now? No. No, I was mistaken. Well, I'm surprised. I sent you to Sing Sing ten years ago. The professor's hiding in the school? That's right, Walt. In the basement of the science building. I just left Roger Vegas' photography shop, and guess who was working there? Who? George Youngwell. Youngwell? The guy you sent up on that blackmail rap. Ten years ago. Well, I knew he was out, but I haven't heard anything about him in a couple of years. Well, he's working for Vegas. Must be keeping his nose clean. Oh, I've seen cleaner noses on pigs. Somebody want me? No, what is it, your melon head? Well, gee, don't yell at me like that. I got something more than Roger Vegas. Well, do you want to hand it to me, or would you just like to stand there and throw it? Oh. Gee, I wish you'd stay away from Diamond. Every time you see him, you get meaner and meaner. Come on, come on. What do you got? Here. Ain't nothing much. Robbery detail come up with it. Huh. That photography shop was broken into this morning, Rick. What was? A uh, burglary got some prints on the windows. Belongs to some guy named Carnes. Carnes? Yeah. Says here, checked prints with State License Bureau. 
Prints belong to one Lewis Carnes, professor of science at State College. I'll see you later. Rick. Yeah? I nearly forgot. I checked with the coroner, told him about the color of Vegas' skin. He said that it could only be caused by a strong dose of silver salts. Silver salts? Poisoning known as Perinia. P-Y-R-I-N-N-I-A. Silver salts. Uh They used that in a photography shop. Carnes said a man would have to drink about 30 grains for a fatal dosage. That's quite a bit. Hmm. you tell you how long he'd live? Yeah, anywhere from six to eight hours, according to the dosage. First the victim turns gray, then green. About what time was that photography shop broken into, Walt? Oh, sometime before nine this morning, before they opened up. Mm, thanks. Where are you going? Going to talk to George Youngwell and then find out if my gray client has turned green yet. Hello, George. I told him, Diamond. I told him you wanted to see him. He said he was going over to your office. Well, thanks. Look, what are you looking at me like that for? I'm going straight now. Swell. I got a good job, see? Legit. I don't want no trouble. I don't blame you. Okay. Mr. Vegas has gone over to your place. Why don't you go meet him, huh? Plenty of time. Look, he's in a hurry. He's got a big trouble, and he's got to take care of it in a hurry. Yeah, I know. He's got about an hour. Well, go on, go on. He, he paid you, didn't he? What do you do around here, George? Now, listen. Listen, you. I know my rights. I'm clean. I don't know what you're trying to prove, but I don't buy none of it. Now, get out of here, or I'll call a straight cop. You know why Vegas is going to die in an hour, George? Yeah. No, no, I don't. If I did, I don't have to tell you nothing. Nothing, see? Maybe you know why he wants to find the professor. No. Maybe you knew the professor's wife. No. Maybe you know why she got killed. No, no, no. Get out of here, Diamond. Get out. I'm clean. I'm legit now. Yeah, like a tub of mud. What do you mean? I want you to tell me about Vegas. What about him? What about him? He owns the shop, that's all. He makes pictures. What else does he do? Nothing, nothing that I know of. What else he does, I don't know about. What are you doing? Get away from me. I want to know all about it, George. I think I know most of it. I want to know the rest. No, I don't know. No, get away. I'm not a cop anymore, remember? I don't have to play the rules. You can't scare me. You won't get rough. You ain't a cop. It's right to lock you up if you get rough. Get away. I want to know why the professor's wife got killed. I don't know. I swear. I don't know. She she, she jumped. She jumped off the building. I thought you said you didn't know. Get away. No, please. Please. I could figure everything but the wife. If she jumped, she had to have a reason. When I saw you, George, I got the idea. Please, please. Blackmail, maybe, George. I'm legit, I told you. I'm working here. Blackmail with pictures, maybe? No, no. The dirtiest racket in the business. Diamond, no. You're going to tell me, George, I wish you were dead. I'm not telling you anything. Blackmail's the dirtiest racket I can think of. No, please, please, please. If Vegas finds the professor, you'll kill him. I've got an hour to stop a murder. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, we were blackmailing the wife. Phony pictures? Yeah. How many others? How many others? A lot of them. Lots. Okay, George. Let's get down to the station. I hate to get in a rut, but I'm going to see that you get another ten years. I hauled George Youngwell down to the precinct and went back to see the professor. He gave me some very interesting information. Interesting enough to make me call Walt and set up a plan. Then I went back to my office. When I walked in, I found Roger Vegas facing me. He turned an ugly shade of green, all but the gun in his hand. Where is he, Diamond? I've got less than an hour. I just left George Youngwell at the 5th Precinct. He's singing like a quartet. I thought that would happen, but I'm not worried. You've got perennial poisoning, huh? That's right. You had it for about seven and a half hours, ever since the professor broke into your store and made you drink the silver salts. Yes. He was getting even for his wife. I've got about 40 minutes to live. Where is he? Well, if you're short on time, maybe you'd better start looking. No, I don't think so. You're going to show me. No, I don't think so. I can't argue. I guess you won't live through it after all. Oh, no. Wait a minute. Let's not lose our heads. He's uh, at the college. Don't lie to me. He's in the science building, in the basement. You're coming along. It'll take 30 minutes to get there. If you're lying, I've got five minutes left to kill you. I think that's plenty of time. The professor's in this building. 
Is it open? It should be. Go ahead. Stop. I can't see anything. The lights are out. If you're lying to me, Diamond, if he's not here... He's here. Call him. Okay. Oh, Professor. Professor Carnes. Yes? Oh. He's in the back room. Tell him to come in. Will you come in here, Professor? Who is it? It's Diamond. The detective? Get him in here. Yes, Professor. All right. Yes, what is it, Mr. Diamond? I... Hello, Professor. Vegas. Yes. Surprise. No. No, I knew you'd hired this detective. I knew you'd come. Not too late, eh? Huh? All right, Professor. I've got but five minutes, so you're going to die before me. You're a pretty terrible man. Look who's talking. Break into my store, pull a gun on me, make me drink that stuff. You're a killer and you're going to pay for it. I'm not a killer yet. I haven't got the time to talk about it. You won't get away with it. You think you pulled it off just great, don't you? Well, I'm not only going to kill you, but I'm going to tell you something. I want to see how you take it. I got a little additional revenge, Professor. Your wife didn't jump. I pushed her. I don't believe it. She was going to stop paying me. Going to tell you about the pictures I was blackmailing her with. But I couldn't have that. So I pushed her off the roof. That's all I wanted to know, Vegas. What do you mean? Walt. Very nice, Lieutenant Levinson. Here's his gun. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Get up, Vegas. You cheated me. But you've got to take him. He made me drink this stuff. Oh, relax. You're going to be all right. You're crazy. I'm going to die, but he'll be the murderer. It's a little satisfaction anyway. You'll hang, Professor. Tell him, Professor. You lose all the way around, Vegas. What do you mean? It takes 30 grains of silver salts to be fatal. I only gave you 15. No. In another few hours, you return to your natural color. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Don't be so unhappy, Vegas. You tried so hard to die, I think the state will do everything they can to see that you make it. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. And among the millions of camel smokers are many stars who know the importance of mildness in a cigarette because their voices are their living. Our own Dick Powell has been a camel smoker for a good long time. Is that right, Dick? Yes, it is, Ed, and I'm smoking one right now. Well, you're in good company. Among other stars who smoke camels are John Wayne, Risa Stevens, Ezio Pinza, Martha Tilton, and so on. Friends, find out for yourself how mild and flavorful a cigarette can be. Make the camel 30-day test... And you'll know why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. You know, ladies and gentlemen, no one deserves our appreciation more than the hospitalized men and women of our armed forces. As a tribute to them, the camel people send gift cigarettes each week to servicemen's and veterans' hospitals in this country and also to overseas where our fighting men are hospitalized. This week, camels go to veterans' hospitals, American Lake, Washington, and Fort Bayard, New Mexico, U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Stoneman, California, U.S. Naval Hospital Ship, Repose. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell will soon be seen in the RKO picture, Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Men, for pipe pleasure, get the National Joy Smoke, Prince Albert. P.A. has a rich flavor and wonderful natural fragrance. It's crimp cut for cool, smooth smoking and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. You'll enjoy Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell.
This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In springtime's early morning, Broadway depends upon the mood you're in. Now the seesaw of color is gone, the riot of night sounds is stilled, and the revelers have found their sleep. There's nothing here but litter and mist and the beginning sunlight. But it's the start of an April day. That's something. You walk into it. And there's something else. The man standing against the lamppost, staring, hands locked in back of him, and last night's newspaper trapped against his leg. Walk past him quickly, kid. It's better to start the day with a cup of coffee. I didn't have time for coffee. The call came while I was pouring the cream. The call with a code number that said homicide, that said an address on Fifth Avenue, that said get there. And get there and get ushered into a room and into the presence of a man who uses words instead of numbers in describing death. Here's a gun that did it, Danny. Revolver. Two shots missing from the chamber. One killed him over there on the bed. We're still looking for the other slip. Well, who is he, Muggerman? Philip Hunt. Securities, investments. Retired about two years ago to try to enjoy himself, the maid said. Uh, the maid called it in. Uh-huh. But what else? Plenty. Now, let's go. I'll show you. It's down the hall. Big party here last night, Danny. Glasses, scotch, bourbon, gin, cigarette butts, gold tip, cork tip, lipstick tip. Oh, this too. Oh, pocket lighter. Fancy one. Give me a light, will you? Thanks. Yeah, real fancy. And Evans, catchy engraving on it. From Barbara to Willard. It'll have to be traced. Mm-hmm. Found it in the bathroom in the shower stall. Uh, doorbell. Maid will get it. In here, Danny, the library. Uh, who are they? Well, the girl stretched out on the couch is a niece of the dead man. Name's Lois Hunt, the maid said. Lives here. Him, the soldier over there on the, ca- on the uh, chair. The maid didn't know him. Never saw him before. Well, how about the rest of the people at the party? Nothing there yet. Maybe the girl and the corporal will know when they come to. Dr. Sinsky gave him a needle. A needle to a couple of drunks? What are you talking about? They're not drunk. Their drinks were doped. Here, the girl's glass. Mm. Smell. The corporal's the same. Dr. Sinsky said it's fortunate he got here in time. Then the gathering together of the police reporters and the press photographers. The statement for the noon editions, the jolly farewells over the dead, and the promise of the mention of your name... The bribe for more detail, more, you know what, Danny, got to compete with the comics, kid. And the walking away from it. And in your office, the arrangement and rearrangement on your desk of the clutter that attended Philip Hunt's dying. A cigarette lighter, a gun fired twice, two glasses stained with death. And a few hours later, the quiet opening of the door. And two kids stand waiting, bewildered. Their eyes not touched by the morning light. Dr. Sinsky said it was all right for you to interrogate us now. He said... Oh, come in, Miss Hunt. Corporal. Sit down. Thanks. You sure you feel all right, Miss Hunt? No, no, no. I'm fine. Just a little dazed. I've had other mornings like this. Maybe not quite so sad. Uncle Phil did. You, Corporal? I'm fine, sir. Just fine. Oh, he'll be all right. Dr. Sinsky's a good man. You two known each other long? Been going together a long time? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, a long time. Maybe five or six months. I saw Lois at a USO dance. You're and... lying, Tommy. Don't tell a man a lie. I know what I'm doing, kid. Just, just well, let me... Maybe you don't, Corporal. You, you tell me, Lois. I only met Tommy last night. He was sitting at a bar, lonely, kind of lost. Made him so attractive. 
I'm rich. I bought his drinks. Then you took him to the party at your home. There wasn't a party. We made it up as we went along. You know, bar hop. Picked up people who said funny things. I took them home because I wanted to celebrate Tommy, the nice corporal. It wasn't a pickup, sir. Lois is a fine girl. Sure She's not. Sure I the... am, Tommy. You're sweet. Was your uncle at the party, Lois? We crashed in on him just as he was getting ready for bed. We all kissed him good night. That's how gay we were. We all kissed my uncle good night. That's how you left him. Going to bed? Yes, sir. Then you rejoined the party. Yes, sir. Well, this gun... Is that the one that killed my Uncle Phil? You know the gun? It's given to my Uncle Phil by his employees. They know how he loved guns. You know the gun, Corporal? Yes, sir. L- Lois took it out of the case. So I could show the party how a, how a soldier uses a gun. Who'd you show your tricks to, Tommy? Who else was at the party? I don't know, sir. Honestly, I, I don't know. How could he know them if I didn't? They were strangers, funny party strangers. We had fun. Yes, sir, just fun. Then I passed out. And Lois was sitting there already passed out, with a book in her lap. She'd been reading poetry to me, and she passed out. And I laughed, I remember. And... Uh, Danny, I... Pardon me. Pardon me. Danny, they have traced the cigarette lighter from descriptions distributed hither and yon by calm, efficient men on the beat. Oh, uh, you'll tell me, huh, Sergeant Tataglia? Sold by Tiffany's to one Willard Jordan, 2346 East 80. Steady customer by Tiffany's. <laughs> me, I only gaze in their windows on Sundays. All right, I'll check it. Uh, do that, Danny. And also bid adieu to Miss Hunt. Her wealthy lawyer has put a bail for her. And the corporal? No, oh, arrangements have been made with the military. Him we can keep. Bail is only for the likes of Miss Hunt. Yeah, now, take care of things. Be calm and efficient while I'm out, at Tartaglia. I'm very sorry. I'm busy. I'm from the police. Does Willard Jordan live here? Yes, he does. I'm his wife. What is it? May I come in? I suppose so. We'll talk here, if you don't mind. I'm uh, getting ready to go out. What is it you want? Is your husband home? No. You'd better stop in another time, Mr... Clover, where is your husband? I don't know. I, I didn't invite you to go in there. Where-, where do you think you're going? Is he your husband? Pepe, I told you, if you stared in that mirror once more, I'll scream. Sit down. Sit down and drink your drink. And don't you move. Don't you open your mouth. Not your husband, huh? Then who? Pepe. You must know Mr. Clover. He's a model for my husband. Willard did him as Narcissus. What's Pepe doing here now? Waiting. He dropped in to see Willard. Willard's uh, going to paint him for his summer show. When's the last time you saw your husband, Mrs. Jordan? Early yesterday morning. I handed him his sketch pad when he walked out of the door. Now, you tell me something. Why is it so important for a policeman to talk to my husband? He was at a party last night where a murder was committed. You think Willard did it? Willard? I didn't say that. I just want to talk to him, that's all. Willard commit a murder? Pepe! Pepe, one more time and out you go. Doesn't it worry you that your husband didn't come home last night? Why should it worry me? What do you mean? Willard has not come home like this before? Oh. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, Willard stays way off and he's a roamer. He goes places, talks to strange people for material to paint... Let's see. Yes, he said he was going to take a model around last night. What model? A, a Pepe? A Barbara, I think. Yes. Barbara Sullivan. Nice girl. You've seen her in the beer ads, Mr. Clover. She lives close by. I'll tell you where. If she knows where Willard is, phone me. Let me know. Will you? Of course you will. Open up, Miss Sullivan. It's the police. Must be kidding. Open up. The door's unlocked. Walk in. This is me. And last night's frock. This morning's iPads. 
Trying to sleep away the bags under my eyes so you won't lose a kick when you draw mustaches on me on the billboards. Mrs. Jordan told me you might know where her husband is. Melissa told you that? Good old Melissa. We want Willard for suspicion of murder. What? You were with him last night with Willard. Where is Willard now? Sleeping off a jag under a cold water tap in the shower stall of the Fifth Avenue mansion. I know. I threw him there myself. Everything I do myself. He's not there anymore. We peeked. Well, then go look for a man with wet coat and pants. Try the gutter on 3rd Avenue and 28th. Willard's favorite, his pride and joy. That's where you left him? I left him in the shower stool. I told you that two yards ago. You threw Willard in the shower, went home. What time did all these good things happen to you? Mm, maybe two, three, four in the morning. I don't remember. All was on my mind was my beauty sleep. I'm vain. Coddle my beauty. Get fat checks for coddling it. So you want Willard for murder, hmm? Anyone I know? Philip Hunt. You were in his house last night. Oh, that's where I was. That's where that pale little rich girl took us. I wish I'd known. Maybe I could have wheedled the old man into using me in his advertising. That's all it means to you, a man's murder? Our wanting Willard for it, maybe? Uh, come to me with a Hollywood contract, mister, and I'll show you what things can mean to me. I'll change overnight for you. I'll live for it. Keep posing for beer, Miss Sullivan, just so I'll know you're around. I'll do it good. Because I'll keep it in mind you'll be staring at me through shop windows. Oh, bye now. It's iPad time again. So a half day had gone by and I had nothing. The technical division had something, though, and they gave it to me. There'd been about 17 people at the party last night at the home of Philip Hunt. Seventeen people, according to the kind of drinks, dregs in the bottom of liquor glasses and fingerprints. Maybe nine men and eight women. So far, I had talked to three of the seventeen. Result, shrugs and bleary answers. Result, nothing. Back now to the home of Philip Hunt and talk to his niece again. Outside this time, in the small garden. Sit in a wrought iron chair and watch Lois Hunt take her three o'clock scotch and soda. Sure you won't have one, Mr. Clover? Uh, no, thanks. Listen to me, Lois. All I want you to do is try to remember who else was here last night. Somebody who had a motive for killing your uncle. I had a motive. Money. I inherit most of the estate. How's soldier boy, Tommy? Nice kid. I'm going to visit him tomorrow. You mean you just picked these people up and brought them home? Oh, sure. Grab bag. Miss you Lars. never know. Miss Lars! In the guest house. What's the matter, Francis? I was cleaning. Please, please look. <laughs> The guest house was just across the garden and up a few steps. The place was neat as a pin, starched linen curtains, maple chairs, and three shag throw rocks placed at interesting angles. On the one that stretched diagonally across the floor was a man. I knelt beside him, away from the blood stain that had spilled from the bullet wound in his chest. His coat was still moist, and it was spread open. And there was a label on the inside pocket. Tailored, it said, by Jensen's Mills, expressly for Mr. Willard Jordan. And Mr. Willard Jordan was dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. With the kids of the Beverly Hills Beavers to the right of him and those two curious revenue agents to the left of him, Jack Benny meets plenty of trouble this Sunday night on CBS. Be listening. Be laughing with the Jack Benny Show tomorrow night. And be with us, too, for the fun with Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> Long winter is dead on Broadway, and the street mourns its dying without a tear. What's to weep, kid? The dawn banging on the radiators, tearing sleep into pieces on a cold morning? The standing on the street corner in the night wind, trying to thumb through the racing foam with 100% wool mittens? And the girls so bundled up you can see their face? That's to weep? Give me the springtime, kid. In the springtime, things bud and blossom. The girls, the neon flowers, the field of golden daisies on the translux. Look at it now, kid. Artist dead in Fifth Avenue guest house. Police sift murder clues. Search linked with death of Philip Hunt, millionaire. Ever smell posies like that, kid? 
Spring's come to Broadway. Give up to it. And at police headquarters, that's just what Sergeant Tataglia did. He gave up to it. Ah, uh, Danny, the missus has been slipping the sofa with the molasses into my pizzas lately. It's that time of the year again. <sighs> Goody. Tastes good that way? The way Mrs. Tartaglia makes a pizza, Danny, no harm could come to it, no matter what felony she commits to it. Yeah, which reminds me, when you come in to partake of a springtime pizza? Oh, soon, Gino, as soon as I can. A promise? Hmm? Ah, goody. I have also by mail so invited Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well lady detective from London Town. She's coming? No, she has not as yet replied with her RSVP. On an English caper, no doubt. What else? I will notify you, Danny, when she accepts. You do that, Gino. Now... Firstly, and to the forefront, the boys in technical have deduced that the bullet that killed Willard Jordan Artist sprang from the same gun that did likewise to Philip Hunt. Thanks for telling me. I yeah, thought you would relish it. Secondly, and in the background, Major Robert E. Woodcock retired. Hmm? Hey, try me again, Gino. I haven't had my sulfur and molasses. Major Robert E. Woodcock retired. Partook of breakfast every morning of his retirement with the late deceased Philip Hunt. A fact established by Sergeant Mugovan while questioning the housemaid. Every morning, huh? Mm-hmm. That's interesting, Gene. Only a stab in the dark. But if a fellow wanted to talk to this Major Woodcock... He would go to the Union Club where the retired Major resides. Naturally. Naturally. Major. Major Woodcock. Wake up, Major. Wake up. It never ends. It never ends. Major? I'm awake, young man. Awake. A recurrent dream, you know. Never ends. Always cut off when it gets interesting. Always cheated of the ending. I'm from the police, Major. And don't pussyfoot, boy. You're from the police. Be proud of it. Nothing to be ashamed of. Walk on tiger's feet. About Philip Hunt. My friend. My old friend. Chaperone to Mademoiselle around Paris in the old army days. Together, Phil and I. Many sunny days to remember. You want to know if I was with Phil the night he died? Were you? Dropped in for a brandy, game of chess. A lot of young people took me in tow. Made me act the major with a boy. A young corporal who was there. I'm afraid it was a rather pathetic entertainment. Then you got away from them. They were happy to dismiss me. Shunted me upstairs to old Phil. We had our quiet brandies, our endless chess game, never finished it, and cried old soldier's tears, and so to bed. You didn't come back for breakfast. Oh, you know about that, do you? Had breakfast with Phil every morning since our discharge, in the library, 7 a.m. Pleasant. Then we'd putter around in the garden. Pleasant. A ritual. But you didn't come back that morning. Why? Too tired. Overslept. Overbranded. I wish I had come back. Why? Bid Phil a good journey. Dead men can hear things like that, you know. Pleases them. There was another reason I wish I'd have come back. What, to console Lois? And thought of that. No. To thank Phil for including me in his will. Left me quite a sum, enormous sum, <laughs> quite an overpayment for my work in his garden. But you knew about that. No, I didn't. Makes me a suspect, though. It does. It should be interesting. When do you ask me about Willard Jordan, the artist? Right now. Painted my portrait, Willard did. There it is, hanging in back of me. Major Robert E. Woodcock, retired. <laughs> leaning against a field piece. Classic claptrap. But I've grown rather fond of it. That's all there is of me now. Me and it. I can always reach you here, Major. Phil's gone. Where else would I go? doesn't matter to you that I'm a widow now, does it? You have to ask me questions. That's right, Mrs. Jordan. I won't answer them. I don't have to answer them. Please get out and let me alone. You told me you weren't at Lois Hunt's house last night. 
Well? You heard what I said. All right. I was at Lois Hunt's house last night. I know. It was a terrible party. Pepe take you to the party? Pepe never goes to parties. He spills things on people's rugs. So I went alone. Did Lois pick you up at a bar? I never go to bars. Then you were following your husband. So what? So what? It's your right, Mrs. Stewart. Of course it is. I was his wife. Just tagged along. Just in case Willard got into trouble with that brewery poster, that's all. Saw Willard go into the house. Waited a while, and then I went in, too. Willard got into trouble, Mrs. Jordan. Where were you? Well. Well. Well what? Well, a girl has to be sociable at a party. Anybody knows that. Well, somebody gave you a drink. I never did get to see Willard. And you must have gotten to know some of the people. Oh, just names. Like Nicky and John and, and Bobby. Honestly, I don't remember a lot. Honestly. Can I see you, Danny? Oh, sure, Muggerman. Come on in. What have you got? I've got a report here from the fingerprint department. You know what's strange, Danny? <laughs> the gun's got the prints of 17 people on it. Well, maybe you did have once, not anymore. Wiped clean. What's the drama for, Muggerman? Why don't you just say it didn't have any prints on it? Because it has prints on it. The most beautiful set of prints as possible. The entire hand of Lois Hunt. Here's a photostat. Without a blemish or a smear. Killer Lois Hunt, huh? You think so? I'm asking you, Danny. No, no, I don't think so. Somebody doped a drink and pressed her hand against the gun. If Lois had handled the gun to kill both men, she'd have handled it twice. Then there would have been two sets of prints, not one. Yeah. Killer tried to plant a frame, huh? I don't know, maybe. Oh, what else? Nothing. Just these. Photographs of the Hunt Mansion. Interiors, exteriors. Uh, six of the people who were at the party last night are outside. You want me to bring them in? Yeah, one at a time. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Huh? Come back here, Michael. Have you talked to that corporal lately? A couple of times. Six to his story. Passed out right after the girl did. She'd been reading to him. Isn't that what he said? Yeah, poetry. He even told me the name of the book. A sonnet's from... Uh... Look at this picture, Muggerman. Huh? Library, where the kids were found dope. Boy sitting here, girl there. Yeah. See any book near them? Now, look at this one. Picture of Hunt, dead in his bedroom. Squint, Muggerman. What's the name of the book? Yeah. Sonnets from the Portuguese. You don't have to talk to those people now, do you, Danny? <laughs> Lois is upstairs in her room. I'll tell her you're here. Take me to her, please. This way. What time did you find Miss Lois and that soldier in the library, Francis? It's about a quarter after six. I told that other policeman that. A quarter after six, isn't that pretty early? Sure, it's early. I do it every morning. Clean up in the library so Mr. Hunt and that major could have their breakfast. Saw Miss Lois and the soldier passed out and went to tell Mr. Hunt. You saw Mr. Hunt dead and called the police. I told that other policeman that, too. Miss Lois? What is it? Policeman. Hello, Mr. Clover. Come on in. That'll be all, Francis. Well, come to tell me something about that soldier boy that, um... Tommy Milo? I'm going to try to do everything I can for him. You want a drink? That gun that killed your uncle and Willard Jordan had your prints on it. Aren't you warm? I am. Just a second, Willard. Casement open. It's much more pleasant, don't you think? Now, what did you say? The gun had your prints on it. Didn't it have everyone's? We all handled the gun. Why just my prints? Because you wiped off everybody's prints and put your own on it. Oh, I must have been loaded. Why did I do that? To make me think what I thought, that you'd been framed. That someone had put the gun in your hand when you'd passed out. You've come to tell me you don't think that? What were you reading to Tommy when that dope drink caught up with you? Some sonnets, I think. Everybody else had left, so I thought sonnets were just the thing. <laughs> Corny, huh? You were reading the sonnets, and all of a sudden you felt dizzy, and you went to sleep. Is that what happened? Exactly. I told you. But the book wasn't there when we found you, Lois. What? Where was it? On the night table next to your uncle. 
But I was drugged. How would it get there? You put it there. That was an oversight, Lois. You carried it up to your uncle's room. But I was drugged. You know that. The doctor knows that. I was drugged. Later, you put on an act for Tommy, pretended to pass out, waited for the drug you'd put in his drink to work on him. Then you got up, killed your uncle, came back, then drugged your own drink. Don't tell me what I did. If I'd done that, I would have died. The doctor said that drug was deadly, your own doctor. You didn't have anything to worry about. Frances, your maid, always cleaned up the library at 6 o'clock. You knew she'd yell for help. Now tell me about Willard Jordan, Lois. Don't talk to me like that. Don't tell me what to do. Willard Jordan came back, didn't he? He was looking for his cigarette lighter. You know everything. You and Uncle Phil. Came back and saw Tommy lying there alone. Then you appeared. You had a gun in your hand. You're so smart. You walked Willard to the guest house, killed him because you had to. Smart. Uncle was smart. Told me what to do, why I had to do it. It wasn't just the money. You had that. Your uncle gave you everything you wanted. Like I was a little girl. Like I didn't know my own mind. Just the way you're talking to me. Let's go, Lois. No. 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 Come on. No, I won't go. I'm going to kill myself. Get away from that window, Lois. I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump. I don't care. I'm going to jump. Listen to me. Don't you come near me. I'm going to die. You'll be sorry, all of you. But when I'm lying down there, you'll be sorry. My friends will come and they'll look at me and they'll be sorry. They'll be... When I grabbed her, she didn't struggle. Just shrieked over and over. When I let her out of the room, she was still shrieking. And all of a sudden, she stopped. Then she looked at me, bewildered at first, then smiling. An etiquette smile that a girl gives a man after a pleasant dance. Then she touched my cheek. She spoke to me. I don't think my friends would have been sorry, Mr. Clover. I really don't. On Broadway, the fury of the night races against the time of dawn. It needs those hours to prove itself. The mob, the grinning faces, the voice that whispers. But hurry, time's at your heels, and the night lasts only so long. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Kathy Lewis was heard as Lois Hunt, Lee Millar as Tommy Milo, Peggy Weber as Melissa Jordan, Michael Ann Barrett as Barbara Sullivan, and Russell Simpson as Major Woodcock. Our defense program today calls for sacrifices, but the better we produce, the fewer those sacrifices will be. To do this most effectively, we must all work together toward top productivity. The free booklet, The Miracle of America, gives the story of the American system and of the benefits which increased productivity through teamwork has brought to all of us. Write Box 10, Times Square Station, New York City, for your free booklet, The Miracle of America. Remember, the better we produce... The stronger we grow. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Night.
Vince Feet. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start many different ways. This one started, strangely enough, with the flame of a match, whose feeble glow lit up a lightened face in the darkness, a frightened face twisted by an agonizing fear of death. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. The night is a thief, some poet once wrote, that steals the colors from the day. It's kind of pretty if you like words, but for my doll, they're not exactly true. Because there are colors at night. The burning red of passion, the angry green of jealousy, and the ugly, terrifying black of fear. This was one of those nights when pickings were slim. I'd cover the town from Henrici's Bar in the Mart, out to Hyler's on the North Shore, and back downtown again with nothing to show for it. I was taking a shortcut through Lincoln Park to pick up my car. At that time of night, the park was pretty deserted, except for this girl walking up ahead of me. Not a bad silhouette, I might add, against the distant light. We were about halfway through the park when suddenly she stopped and threw herself onto a bench at the side of a path. There was something almost desperate about the way she did it. I ran up to her. Mm. Excuse me, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Well, I thought maybe you were sick or something. I told you I'm all right. Now, you please let me alone. Oh, now, look, lady, it's not what you think. I, uh, well, this park, at this time of night, it's no place for a girl to sit around by herself. I don't need any help. Just go away. Oh, sure, sure, I'll get lost. I can see you're all right. Only you don't mind if I just sit here and smoke a cigarette before I go. It's a public park. I don't care what you do. Thank you. You care for a cigarette? No. Of course, in order to really enjoy a smoke, you've got to have a match first. <laughs> I said in order to enjoy a smoke, you've got I to... heard you. Here. Thank you. Here. Keep the book. No, no, you better hang on to these. I won't need them. Well, you might need them later tonight. After tonight, I won't need anything. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's no way to talk. The only time you're not going to need anything, sister, is after you're dead. Why did you say that? What? That about being dead. For no reason. Why? Because after tonight, I will be. The girl jumped up and started running. Here was a kid that was afraid. Afraid of death or afraid of life. But then isn't everybody. I turned the matchbook over and looked at the ad on the cover. Penguin Club. A little all-night jump and jive place over on Clark Street. That's one I've been missing lately. On a hunch, I ambled up North Avenue in that general direction, turned up Clark a ways, and there it was. It was good to get inside out of that wind. Check your hat and coat, mister? No, thanks. I'm just looking around. Can I get to the table? It's almost the end of the floor show. Now, anywhere in the back will be all right. Okay. The hat check girl, hostess or whatever she was, walked me through the bar to the edge of the main room. And then I stopped and really did a take. Out in the middle of the dance floor, under a little baby spot, singing in front of a five-piece band, was Little Miss Desperate from the park. Nice voice, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Who is she? Why, that's Fanny. Fanny Fowler. Haven't you been in here before? Not for quite a few months. Of course, she hadn't got much experience yet. She's from out of town, hmm? Someplace over in Wisconsin. Not bad looking, huh? Mm. In everything. Hey, what's wrong with her? She, I don't know. I can't! Well, how do you like that? Come on, folks, come on. Let's give the little girl a great big hand. Nothing like a real sad tone to light up a real sad act. Especially for a real sad tomato like tomato. <laughs> Guys and girls, get out of here. 
Hiya, Peggy. You got yourself a live one, huh? Hello, Tommy. <laughs> this is Tommy Mason. Ain't he the one? Yes, yes. He's quite the one, all right. Gee, Tommy, you, you sure covered up for Franny, all right. Never let down. Keep him going all the time. That's show business. You know how it is, mister. Oh, yes, yes. I've heard. The show must go on. It's a new thing. Uh, right? you got to keep him laughing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Honest, mister, he's this way all the time. What a joker. Now, look, about that girl. Franny? Yeah, Franny. What seems to be the trouble? Well, that's hard to say, pal. Maybe she just found out she ain't no dinosaur, and she sure ain't. Tommy, you killed me. Uh, Seriously, fella. (laughs) Fella, why would a girl break up that way in the middle of a number and start to cry? Ah, could be she got a cinder in her eye. But just to make sure, I'll go ask her. See you later, Tommy. Come on, fella. How's about buying a girl a drink? Oh, sure, sure, in a minute. Um, about this Franny. Look, do we have to talk about her? I, I thought you came in here for some fun. Maybe I get my fun wondering about people. What time's an explore show? Next one's at two, then four. Oh, they're not kidding about this all night business. And still another one at daylight. She's singing all of them? How should I know? She missed most of the 12 o'clock show. Just got here for that last number. Any idea where she lives? The Lumen House, around on Erie Street. Know the number? 391... You know, you ask an awful lot of questions. <laughs> well, that's my business. I'm a reporter, Randy Stone. I might have known it. Look, you're, you're not going to bother her tonight, are you? Of all nights? Tonight? This is the night that Charlie Dane is being executed down at Joliet. What's that got to do with her? Well, how would you feel? Look, Mr. Stone, she's human. This is the night her boyfriend's going to die. <laughs> I went up to the front of the bar to a phone booth and called the paper. There was something about this in the back of my mind somewhere. Something I ought to remember but couldn't. I had the girl on the board put me through to Gabby in the library. Library? Oh, hello, Gabby. This is Randy. Yeah, Randy? Uh, What have you got on the Charlie Dana case? Still a little early, Randy. Execution's not set until 1.30. No, no. I mean old stuff. Oh, I got the file right here, Randy. Dug it out earlier for background. Good. Anything on a girl named Fran Fowler? Yeah, let's see. Charlie Dana, small-time gambler, killed a guy named Tonelli. Oh, yes, yes. I remember that. A gambling beef. Execution originally set for November, but he got a couple of months to stay. Oh, here she is, Fran Fowler. Singer in a nightclub was supposed to be his alibi, but the DA blew her up in the witness stand. She admitted she wasn't positive, but when she'd been out with the guy... Oh, yeah, yeah, that was it. I knew it was something. Anything more? Oh, details, Randy, details. Okay, Gabby, thanks. I'll catch up with you. Oh, Mason. Excuse me, were you waiting to use the phone? Uh, no, I was uh, waiting to talk to you. Why, certainly, but this time, no jokes, if you don't mind. I'm expecting a headache. <laughs> You're not funny, Stone. Who are you talking to? Well, isn't that uh, kind of my business? Uh, Peggy says you're a reporter. Yes, of a sort. You were asking about Fran, where she lived? That's right. You've got to let her alone, see? you printed enough about her. Uh, just a minute, Mason. Those are my lapels that you're hanging on to. Peggy shouldn't have given you Fran's address. I don't want you bothering her. I said let go of my lapels, funny man, or something's liable to explode in your face. <laughs> now, you stay out of my way or I'll ruffle that shiny hair. Where are you going? See about a cinder in a lady's eye. You're not going to see her. I won't let you. Can't you see this whole thing's driving her crazy? Tommy, believe me, I'm not interested in harming her or anyone. I'm just a guy trying to do a job. Now, if you'll step out of my way... You're not going there. I won't let you. I won't let you. Tommy, did you ask for him? My, my, that's a real nervous fellow. Now that he'd made such an issue out of it, going around to see Fran follow is a definite must on my schedule. I picked up my car and drove over to Erie Street. 391 wasn't much different from any of the rest of the rooming houses on the block. I got the number of her room from the mailbox and started down the dingy corridor to room 8. I knocked at the door, but there was no answer. I knocked again, and then I smelled gas. Hey, anyone in there? Miss Paula! Fran! I put my shoulder to the door, and the flimsy lock snapped open. I rushed into the gas-filled room, holding my breath until I could smash open the window and let in some air. And then I saw Fran Fowler, the girl from the park, lying across the bed. And on the table beside her, one of those two burner gas stoves with both jets wide open. I turned them off and started shaking the girl. Miss Fowler, Franny, come on, get up. you got to get out of here. How come I'm going to have to carry you? Put me down. You little fool, this room is filled with gas. Not my purse. Where? On the table. 
Okay, I've got it. Oh. Fine thing with a gun in it. Give that to me. Outside, baby, outside. It was six seconds flat when we hit the sidewalk in the fresh air. I put Fran in the front seat of my car and then ran around and climbed in behind the wheel. I headed out to Sheridan Road along the lake. The cool, clean air felt good in my lungs and I could see Fran drinking it in, realizing now how close she'd been. I didn't make her talk until we were a long way out of town. And I pulled over to the beach side of the road and killed my motor. We, uh, seem to keep bumping into each other in the strangest places tonight. I... I guess I should say thanks. No, no, not at all. I'm the one who should say thanks. I still haven't returned your matches. Please don't make fun of me. No, I'm not. You see, I know now who you are. Charlie Daney's girl. Why don't you say it? In my book, you're just a kid on that in the park. What time is it? It's quarter to two. Then... Yes, it's probably all over by now. Like me to turn on the radio and... No. No, I don't want to hear about it. You must love him an awful lot. Love him? I despise him. Just... But still you were willing to alibi for him on a murder charge? I wasn't. I... I told him I wasn't sure of the time I was out with him, but he made me say it was the exact hour when the man was killed. Didn't you realize you might have been perjuring yourself? I didn't lie. I just didn't remember. It might have been like he said. When you're not sure, what else can you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd you happen to get mixed up with him? I I didn't know anybody when I first came here. I was lonesome. And he was nice to you. He was. A lot more decent than most of the men who want to take you out when you're working in a club. And why do you hate him now? I didn't know what he did. A lot of people gamble. I didn't think too much about it. Then we got to going out evenings to him shows at the club on my nights off. And the killing happened when you and he were supposed to have been out someplace together? That's what he said. He wasn't arrested until a few weeks after the... the trouble. I couldn't remember if I'd been with him during that particular time or not. Well, it's all over now. You did what you had to. That's about all any of us can do. But you've got to forget about it. Put it out of your mind. There's nothing more to worry about. Oh, that's just it. You don't understand. There is. What are you talking about? He promised. He promised, and I know he'll keep his promise. Promised what? I I want to see him in prison. In the death house? I had to. I wanted him to understand, but he said I tricked him. What, by telling the truth on the witness stand? He said I double-crossed him. But now he, he didn't care. Why would he say that? He said he didn't care because the night he died, I would die. And I'm afraid. <laughs> You are listening to Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. This was real. This was no act. The sound she made would tear you to pieces, like some pitifully frightened animal who'd lost everything in the world. I let her cry it out. After all those months of strain, she'd have to get it out of her system. He said the night he died... I died. Sure, sure. So you were scared. Who wouldn't be? But don't you see? That's just a cruel boast made by a cheap hoodlum who's trying to hurt you, make you feel responsible for his own plight. But he meant it. I know he did. Well, maybe he did at the time, but you've got nothing to worry about now. You had nothing to do with it. He paid for his own crime. Now he's dead, and you're still alive. He'll keep his promise. How can he? He's dead. I, I, I know you think I'm crazy. No, 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 no. But has anyone really tried to harm you? Oh, but this... This wasn't the night he was supposed to... Yes, I know. The execution was originally set for November. It was that night in November. I hadn't been afraid before. I thought it was like you said, because he was bitter. But all that day, I was upset. I I told him at the club I couldn't work. And late in the afternoon, I got a note from Peggy saying, why didn't I go out to her cabin at the dunes for a couple of days? Nobody would bother me. No reporters, and I I could get a good rest. So I I drove out there that evening... It was quiet. Nothing around. Just empty sand dunes and her cabin all alone on the edge of the lake. I, I-, I called Peggy at the club to let her know I got in all right. Oh, hello, Fran. Where are you calling from? Why, from your place. 
My apartment? No, your cabin. At the dunes? I wish all of you, Peggy, to let me come out here. Well, of course, Franny, you're, you're welcome to use the place, but I, I don't quite know what you mean. Well, your note this afternoon telling me to come out here. I didn't write you any notes. Oh, come on, Peggy, you did. You even told me where the key would be under the flower pot. But, kid, that's where we always keep it. Everybody knows that. Peggy, I... I... Now, don't worry about it, kid. One of the girls probably sent you the note and just hasn't had a chance to tell me about it yet. I should have thought of it myself no, in the first place. No, wait, Peggy. I'm scared. Well, what in the world else? You remember what I told you about what, what Charlie said the last time I saw him? Prison? It was about tonight that he said when he died... Cut I... it, Franny. Now cut it before you drive yourself Peggy, back. I'm all alone and I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Franny, you've got to hang up right away. You shouldn't be out there all alone tonight. Get in your car and come back to town as fast as you can. I'll, I'll wait for you here. All right, Peggy. All right. I hung up the phone and ran out of the house to my car. I turned on the ignition key and stepped on the starter. It wouldn't start. My car wouldn't start. I looked at the gas gauge. Empty. Somebody had drained the gas out of my car. I got out in a panic and started toward the highway. But there was a car out there. Parked behind the big sand dune. I turned and ran back to the house. It was like some crazy, frightening nightmare. I didn't know what I was doing, but somehow I managed to get inside and lock the door. And then suddenly I was at the telephone. Operator? Operator, answer me. Operator, you've got to answer. I want the police. Operator, please help me. Someone. Operator! It was no use. The line was dead. While I was outside, someone had pulled the wires away from the wall. Crawled over to the window. Looked out to the highway. There was a car out there. Its lights were on. But as I looked, they went out. And now, I was alone. In the dark. With him out there. When I came to, it was morning, and, and Peggy was there. She and Tommy had driven out after the club closed to, to find me. But you see, you didn't die that night. But neither did he. Could have been your imagination, you know, this man in the car. No, no, no. The news about this day of execution was on the radio. The man in the car must have heard it and gone away. Did you call the police? They didn't believe me. Just because I'm a nightclub singer, they said I was trying to get publicity. How about the car not starting and the telephone being dead? According to them, my car was just out of gas, and I must have pulled the telephone wires off the wall myself. In the panic you were in, you could have. But I didn't. I tell you, I didn't. All right, all right. Anyway, it's tonight that we're concerned with. I don't know what to do. I... I just don't know what to do. Well, if it's true, this fear you have, you've got to find it out tonight. If you don't, it'll haunt you the rest of your life. Oh, I know, I know, but how? You've got to go back to your room. Oh, no, I'm afraid. I'll be with you. Still got your gun, remember? By the way, what were you going to do with that? I... I didn't have the nerve to use it, even on myself. Well, if anything is going to happen, it'll happen tonight. Not tomorrow or any time after that, but tonight. We'll go back to your place now and wait until it's daylight. I drove Fran back to the rooming house on Erie Street. There were no lights on anywhere in the building. We tiptoed down the empty car to the Fran's room, listened at the door a minute, and went in. The door closed all right, but it wouldn't lock. I must have sprung it when I forced the door. We settled down and waited. For what? Once I thought I heard steps on the sidewalk far out front. It was that still. And then I did hear steps, slowly coming down the hall. There's someone... in the hall. Keep it down. Outside the door. Don't move. Who's in the organ at my door? 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 
around. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, kid. Go ahead. You got it coming. I, I'm sorry. I'm all right. Nothing to be sorry about. I was kind of scared myself. It's a funny thing about fear. It's catching. Look out the window. I... It's almost light. And this all night has gone for good. You see? It was all in your mind. Things you were frightened of. It was nothing, really. You won't be afraid if I go now. No. I've caused you an awful lot of trouble. Oh, no, you cut the hell or you'll get me going. And the kids at the club, I guess I should go back there and let them know I'm all right. What the doctor ordered for you is a little shut eye. I'll stop by on my way and give them a word. Good night. Good night. Oh, here's your gun. You might want to pawn it for a couple of pair of nylons. Yes, a real nice tomato-type tomato, as the funny man at the club would say. On the way over, I got thinking about him and that girl, Peggy. Come to think of it, that was one point Fran had forgotten to clear up for me about the note that sent her out to Peggy's cabin at the dunes that night. Yeah, my mind wouldn't let go of that. When I got to the club, it was daylight, and they were folding up the joint, and Peggy was sitting alone at the bar. Well... You got a nerve coming back here after... How's your boyfriend? He's not my boyfriend. It's a figure of speech. Where is he? He just left. Okay, I'll settle for you. If you don't mind, it's a little late for small talk, mister. Okay, I'll give it to you fast. It's about that note you wrote to Fran Fowler last November on the night Charlie Dana was supposed to die. What note? <laughs> a little late for small talk, remember? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about a note inviting Fran to stay out at your place at the dunes? I told her. I didn't know who wrote it. Were you telling the truth? Yes. Yes, I was. Okay, okay. Maybe you were. But you found out later who wrote it, didn't you? No, I... Now, tell me the truth. Or would you rather tell the police? All right. I did find out, but it wasn't like you think. Well, who was it? Tommy. Tommy Mason. Tommy Mason? The funny man? His idea of a joke, no doubt. A hilarious joke that might have scared a poor kid to death. No, no, you're wrong. It wasn't a joke. Well, then why? Why did he do it? Because he's in love with her. He made me swear I wouldn't tell her. He, he wanted to wait until the time when she needed him, and, and then he'd tell her himself. Until she needed him? That's... How was he going to make her need him? Use a condemned murderer's empty threat to frighten her out of her sanity so she'd need him? Is he crazy? He is where Fran's concerned. Where is he? I don't know. He's been like a maniac all night since you left here. After every show, he's gone over to Fran's place looking for her. He's crazy jealous. Jealous? Of whom? Of you. He thought she was with you. But what if she were? This was the night. This was the night he was sure she would need him, and instead she turned to you. Don't you see? Yes, I do now. Thanks. It was only about a half mile to France, but it seemed more like 20 miles until I turned off Clark up Erie Street and slammed into the curb. There was no one on the street. I was hoping he'd walk and I'd pass him on the way, but there was no one. I ran down the narrow hall, not daring to think what I'd find, and I flung open the door. Are you alone? Well, you... You're frightened. Are you alone? Well, yes, I've been sitting here since you left. I'm too tired to undress. Come on, let's get out of here. Grab your coat. But never where... mind, never mind, never mind. I'll tell you on the way. I shoved Fran out the door and we started cautiously back down the hall. We got about halfway when I grabbed her arm. The front door was opening slowly and a man made a dark silhouette against the gray light of the dawn. It was the funny man. The man with the slick, shiny hair and a permanent smile and the fast jokes. Only the smile was gone and he had a gun in his hand. Keep coming. Keep coming. We started towards him slowly. Tommy. Tommy, it was you. You who were going to kill me. You didn't know. You didn't know that I had a heart too, just like Charlie Dana did. Tommy, you never told me. You never let me. You didn't need me. You would have laughed at me like you laughed at my jokes. It, it couldn't have been you at the dunes that night. I followed you out there. And then drove back to the club. No, Tommy, no. You were lonesome, but you didn't need me. You needed Charlie Dana. I thought if you were afraid, you'd need me. And then you were afraid, but still you didn't need me. But I'd make you need me. I'd make you. Step by step, we moved closer. 
Keep coming. I could see his face twisted with jealousy and hate, his eyes wild, as though a spark might make him explode. And tonight, when you were afraid and should have needed me, you didn't. You turned to him. Tommy, please. But now you need me. Now that I have my finger on this trigger, you need me more than you've ever needed anyone in your life. You need me. You need me, Fanny. You need me. Say it. Say you need me. I, I can't shoot. I can't shoot. He started to shake, and I ran forward to grab his gun. Look out! Drop it! Drop it! It's all right. I've got the gun. I can't. Is he hurt? Not to what he will be. Get up, funny man. No. Don't be too hard on him. He didn't realize. No, no, I... I guess maybe he didn't. It's funny, isn't it? You never really know what's going on in some of the best combed heads. Well, that's the way it goes. A little later than usual this morning... The day shift has already moved in and let the night crew wander off to their own private little beds. Well, at least I got to see the sun come up. And here I sit, still trying to make it all add up. But no matter how I figure it, the only answer I get is... You never know about people. (laughs) But bless them, maybe that's why we love them. See that man walking towards you with a smile on his face? What's he smiling about? Or is it just so you won't notice how he's screaming inside? <laughs> Ooh, the trouble with me is I haven't had my coffee yet. Coffee, boy. Night Beat, a dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. The part of Fran was played by Joan Banks. Paul Dubov played Tommy. Others in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Ken Christie, and Carol Richards. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Throughout the week, NBC brings you the best adventure mystery dramas on the air. You will hear action-packed, fast-moving plots to hold your interest right up to the smashing climax on such thrilling programs as Big Town... Mr. District Attorney, The Big Story, and Dragnet, every week on most of these NBC stations. On Dragnet, you'll hear documented cases from the Los Angeles police files. The Big Story brings you true tales from the front pages of America's newspapers. Mr. District Attorney, the champion of the people, takes you through an exciting episode in the conviction of a criminal. And tomorrow night on Big Town, you'll hear crusading editor Steve Wilson crack down on the forces of evil. For the best high-tension dramas, hear NBC's great mystery and adventure programs. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. Now, stay tuned for Brian Donlevy as a soldier of fortune on Dangerous Assignment on NBC. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, it's time for our weekly visit to Dr. Watson, genial friend and colleague of the great Sherlock Holmes. Good evening, Dr. Watson. I trust I'm not intruding? Not at all, my dear fellow, not at all. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. 
You know, Dr. Watson, I've been struck by the remarkably large number of signed photographs of titled personages and notables that ornament the walls of your study. Mementos of your active career, I presume? Yes, though I must admit most of them are clients of Sherlock Holmes rather than grateful patients of mine. Well, this picture, for instance. Naturally, I recognize the photograph of the late royal No, 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 no names, Mr. Bell. I, I, I beg you. Holmes and I always referred to the gentleman in question merely as uh, Mr. Edwards. And what did you and Mr. Holmes do to cause his royal... I beg your pardon, Mr. Edwards, to inscribe his photograph in such affectionate gratitude? Oh, nothing of any great importance, I assure you. Merely that Mr. Edwards had become a trifle entangled, shall we say, with a little dancer at Maxim's in Paris. A young lady with a joisting in the appellation of uh, Fru Fru. <laughs> Quite a delightful little bit of fluff, too. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, I gather that Sherlock Holmes settled the matter to Mr. Edwards' complete satisfaction. Uh, very easily and very discreetly. But it led us into one of the most curious and singular affairs of Sherlock Holmes' career, and one which I don't believe would ever have been solved had Holmes not been a distinguished amateur on the violin. I call it the adventure of the genuine Guarnerius. Sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. But if you don't mind a momentary interruption... Not at all, Mr. Bell. Go ahead. Men, there's a famous saying about locking the barn door after the horse has been stolen. Well, the same applies to the hare. Once bald, bald forever, they tell us. But you can make the most of the hair you've got. And you can't begin too early. That's why I want to tell you about Kreml hair tonic. Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. Kreml makes the hair stay better groomed longer. With that natural, greatly desired he-man look. Never greasy, never sticky. But Kreml does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. A massage with Kreml actually helps stimulate circulation in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp always feels so alive, so invigorated after applying Kreml. This highly specialized hair tonic also has an excellent lubricating effect on a dry scalp. It makes dry, brittle hair that breaks and falls feel softer and more pliable. So men... Buy a bottle of Kreml hair tonic at any drug counter. You'll be delighted with its extra advantages. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the adventure of the genuine Guarnerius? Well, the British ambassador to France, Sir Hubert Ashley, had invited Holmes and myself to a reception at the embassy in Paris in order to thank us both for successfully concluding the rather delicate affair of uh, Mr. Edwards. The ballroom was a blaze of light. The guests were dancing. By Jove, Holmes, have you ever seen anyone more attractive than our host's wife? I must say that Lady Ashley is really the finest type of English beauty. Sometimes, Watson, I envy you the directness of your mind. What do you mean? When you look at a beautiful woman, you see only beauty. Well, what on earth would you expect me to see? In the case of Lady Ashley, my dear fellow, I notice her elderly husband... Her many gallant admirers, and I think, what a motive for murder. Oh, really, Holmes? Ah, oh, Mr. Holmes. I trust our guest of honor is enjoying himself. Very much indeed, Lady Ashley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, may I introduce a very dear friend, Monsieur Jacques Merivaux who has known me more years than I care to remember. Well, how do you do, sir? Good evening. Yes, I think I can claim to be Lady Ashley's most devoted cavalier having first made her acquaintance when she was just over two hours old. <laughs> she wept bitterly the moment she saw me. Yes, but I've been trying to make up to him for it ever since. During the time we're in Paris, Monsieur Maribault, I've been promising myself the pleasure of a visit to your famous music shop. It should be honored, Monsieur Holmes. I've heard, of course, that you play the violin. Merely as the veriest amateur. Incidentally, I'm looking forward eagerly to hearing Monsieur Drenko play this evening, Lady Ashley. I was unfortunately out of London during the only recital he gave this season. He's a great artist. Yes, he comes from one of those little countries down the right-hand corner of the map, doesn't he? I always heard the fellow was a bit of a bander. You have an opportunity to judge at once, Watson. Our host is approaching with a gentleman in question in tow. Oh, Holmes, there you are. Mr. Dranko has been asking to meet you. Mr. Dranko, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do, you do? Holmes? Hubert, if you'll excuse me, I must see to our other guests. Until later, Mr. Holmes... Dr. Watson. Yes, yes, indeed, of course. Of course. Dr. Watson and I are looking forward to hearing you play, Monsieur Drinko. I always enjoy an appreciative audience. Uh, tell me, Mr. Holmes, might I speak with you alone for a moment? Uh, come along, Marivaux. 
You promised me your opinion on that 83 champagne. No, it's a sound vintage, but I, I find it too dry. Well, Mr. Drenko? I said hello, Mr. Holmes. I have no secrets from Dr. Watson. Very well, then. It so happens that I find myself in a slight uh, predicament. I thought that with all your experience, you might advise me. As a social favor, Mr. Drenko? Gladly. If, of course, you would like to come to the tea at my hotel tomorrow and bring your violin to entertain my guests. I beg your pardon. Oh, <laughs> I understand, Mr. Holmes. We professionals must each respect the other's métier, must we not? It would be preferable. Yes, I told you what sort of fellow he was. Nevertheless, Mr. Holmes, I still ask for your advice, and I will expect to pay the customary fee. You see... I find myself a trifle involved. Only a harmless flirtation, of course, but I did write one or two indiscreet letters to one of the girls at Maxim's, and now the greedy little thing threatens blackmail. Hardly an unusual situation, Mr. Drinko. For myself, for my reputation, I do not care, you understand. An artist is an artist. But uh, there is my wife at home. I must think of her, naturally. You think of her a trifle late, aren't you, Omar? So you can see there might be unpleasant mm. results if Fufu... Fufu of Maxims? You know her. Oh, we're not unacquainted with a young person, eh, Holmes? Uh, from my rather brief acquaintance with her, I think the matter may be settled rather simply. Ah, I shall be happy if you will handle the affair. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The Sir Dranko whom we're all very happy to welcome here this evening, will now give us the pleasure of his incomparable music. You are, gentlemen, Mademoiselle Frufru's dressing room is right here. Oh, Papa. <laughs> I say, Holmes, did you notice that girl just passed? The one wearing just those little uh, little thing jigs? Quite. <laughs> I also notice, Watson, that backstage at Maxim seems to be one place where you not only see, but also observe very closely. <laughs> oh, hello, hello, Monsieur Holmes. Good evening. Oh, I have not expected to see you in that cute little Dr. Watson oh, again so soon. <laughs> But perhaps this time it is pleasure, huh? Not business. Oh, I say not, Mademoiselle Frou-Frou. Mademoiselle Frou-Frou, it was only because I thought the gentleman we have agreed to refer to as uh, Mr. Edwards was at least as culpable as you that I persuaded the French police not to prosecute you in that matter of his mother's jewels. But, Monsieur Holmes, that little matter, we have settled it, uh, have we not? The charge is still pending, Mademoiselle, and at a word from me could be followed up. But why should I you? also happen to know that the Marsovian embassy is most curious regarding the attraction which brings Prince Danilo so frequently to Paris. That uh, also does not concern me at the moment. Assuming, of course, that you return at once all the letters that were written to you by Monsieur Drenko and that you cease from molesting him in any way. Oh, mais je comprends très bien. Oh, I see. Well, Monsieur Holmes, uh, since you have put it so convincingly... I am rather tired of listening to a soul fully played violin. Monsieur Drenko may have his letters back. Here they are. Thank you, mademoiselle. I knew you were a sensible girl. Good night. Good night. And now what? And now for a good night's rest. And in the morning, we can report to Mr. Drenko the satisfactory solution of what was perhaps our simplest problem. Well, I hope you charge him a stiff fee, Holmes. I still say that the fellow's a bounder. Good morning. I think Monsieur Drenko is expecting us. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. What's the number of his room, please? Click, click. Send a message to the police. Oh, Monsieur Holmes. Monsieur Maribel, what's the matter? It's Drenko. Well, we're on our way up to see him. He's dead. Killed him, sir. What? Good heavens! Come, Maribo, take us up to his room. The man's been dead for more than an hour, Holmes. Yes, no, not more, more than half an hour. Closer to an hour, I should think. I see. Maribo, would you please ask that chap we passed, uh, the one who was painting the hall, to step in here for a moment? But of course. Curious. 
I wonder what could have been Drenko's motive in committing suicide. It is a fainter, Monsieur Holmes. Ah, yes. Tell me, have you been working there all the morning? Uh, oui, Monsieur, ever since eight o'clock. For over two hours, in other words. And were you working constantly in sight of this door? Absolutely, Monsieur. I heard the gentleman in here practicing the violin for a little while, but he stopped almost an hour ago. Well, that puts the time of death at just about what I thought, Holmes. And you saw no one enter or leave this room during the entire time? No one. Oh, uh, except five minutes ago this gentleman went into the room. A few seconds later, he came running out calling for the police. Thank you. Your statement has been very clear. You may go now, but better not leave the hotel. No doubt the police will want to question you. Très bien, monsieur. I have never had such a shock in my life, monsieur Holmes. I came up to deliver a new violin that Drenko had ordered. And when I opened the door and saw him lying there, with his face all twisted up in agony... Yes, the common appearance of cyanide poisoning. Not very pretty, I'll admit. You note the characteristic odor of bitter almonds, Watson? Yes, indeed. And here's the empty bottle. Quite. The poison label on it removes any possibility of accident. Now, nobody could possibly have got in or out of the, the window. It's a sheer drop of, of four stories to the street. Look, Monsieur Holmes, this torn piece of paper. I found it here on the desk. It's his suicide note. Evidently written under the stress of considerable emotion, to judge from the writing. Hmm. It is intolerable. I utterly refuse to endure it any longer. Signed, Mihai Drenko. It's his handwriting, Monsieur Holmes. I'd swear to it. Hmm, yes. Unquestionably the perfect setting for suicide. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Well, Monsieur Holmes, a pleasure to meet you again, even if under such unfortunate circumstances. How are you, Inspector Bernard? Nice to see you again, my dear fellow. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. Dr. Watson and I have been carrying on for you until your arrival. Oh, thank you. And uh, may I pick your brains to ask what you have learned? A Marivaux here discovered the body only a few minutes ago when he arrived to deliver a violin Drenko had ordered. The painter, you'll find out in the hall, has had the room under observation all morning and will assure you that no one else entered or left it. And the fellow stopped practicing about an hour before. Set the time of death pretty accurately. Here's the suicide note, Inspector. I'm afraid we're presenting you with rather an open and, and shut case. Oh, well, Dr. Watson, a hard-working officer like myself welcomes the absence of any uh, mystery. And uh, here's the violin that Drenko was practicing on. Let me see it, Watson. Odd. Very odd indeed. You mean uh, odd that Renko should be practicing the violin until just before he killed himself? No, Inspector. That fact by itself would merely be singular. But listen to the violin on which he was practicing. Well, sounds all right to me. I confess, Monsieur Holmes, that I find no mystery in a man playing the violin just before he killed himself. Perhaps, Inspector, you may then be able to explain why a world-famous violinist like Drenko should do his practicing on a violin that is most unmistakably out of tune. But how should I know what a man would do just before he commits suicide? Suicide? This isn't suicide, Inspector. This is murder. <laughs> Men, once you get bald, there's nothing you can do about it. Science tells us it's impossible to grow hair on bald heads. But you can make the most of the hair you've got. And let me tell you, there's nothing better than Kreml hair tonic to do it. In the first place, Kreml does a marvelous job of hair grooming. It keeps every lock neatly in place, yet never looks greasy or sticky. Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients, the like of which have never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. But Kreml does lots more than just keep hair in place. A massage with Kreml helps stimulate circulation of the blood in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp feels so clean, so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry and brittle that it breaks and falls, remember, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. It also has a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. So remember, men, make the most of the hair you've got. Use Kreml Hair Tonic daily. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. 
And now, Dr. Watson, what happened in that hotel room when Sherlock Holmes told Inspector Bernard that Drenko, the violinist, had been murdered and had not committed suicide? Well, naturally, Inspector Bernard was rather surprised. As a matter of fact, it seemed to me that he was a bit huffy about it all. But, Monsieur Holmes, you cannot fly in the face of all the evidence we see before us. The bottle of poison clearly labeled, the suicide note unquestionably in his own handwriting... Dr. Watson's medical evidence that the man had been dead at least an hour, and the final confirmation of the man painting in the oil who tells us that no one entered or left this room until a few minutes ago. And against all this, Mr. Holmes, what have you to offer? A violin that is out of tune. Ah, zut alors. Nevertheless, Inspector, it is the crux of the entire case. But, Holmes, how can you tell what a fellow like Drenko would have done? I can assure you, Watson, that he would have done almost anything in the world except practice on this violin. No, Inspector, this was murder. I'll stake my reputation on it. Uh, it is only your reputation, Monsieur Holmes, that makes me hesitate at all. Give me 24 hours in which to establish how this murder was done and who did it. Since you ask it, Monsieur Holmes... Very well. Thank you. Come, Watson. We have some busy hours ahead of us. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. Good day. Good day. And where are we off to in such a hurry, Holmes? The British Embassy. The Embassy? Why on earth? You should... evidently failed to notice during last night's reception that Lady Ashley left us very abruptly the moment Drenko joined our party. Her manner to him venged on rudeness. And that's so unlike Lady Ashley that I feel that an inquiry in that quarter may bear interesting fruit. <laughs> May I ask, Mr. Holmes, the purpose behind this unexpected visit? In just a moment, Sir Hubert. I'd like to have Lady Ashley present yes, when I... Yes, Hubert? My maid said you wanted to talk... Why, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. I didn't know you were here. I'm afraid our visit concerns a professional matter, Lady Ashley. You see, Dr. Watson and I have just come from the room of the late Monsieur Drenko. Is it... The late Monsieur Drenko? I, I don't understand. Drenko has been murdered, Lady Ashley. He... Oh. Quick, Watson, catch her. Cynthia. Uh, she's quite all right. Looks nothing but a faint. If you will just ring for your wife's maid, Sir Hubert. Yes, I'll get her at once. I must say, Holmes, you certainly broke the news rather brutally. She took it pretty hard. Nonsense, Watson. What caused her to faint was relief. That was my object. I had to find out what her reaction would be. Here, Annette. You and Mary help Lady Ashley up to her room put it to bed. Oh, we, we must Just you. keep her quiet. A cup of hot tea will do her no harm when she comes round. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me. I'm sorry, Sir Hubert, but I must ask you to remain here with us for a few moments. Well, I, I don't understand. Uh, Sir Hubert, Lady Ashley's reaction to the news of Drenko's death was a good deal more pronounced than might be expected in the circumstances. I haven't the faintest idea what you're trying to insinuate. I insinuate nothing. I merely state facts. Would you prefer that I question her? Or will you tell me what lies in back of all this? Very well, Mr. Holmes. But I should like to spare my wife as much as possible. My only interest is in any light that she might be able to shed on the matter. Cynthia is a very young and very beautiful woman. Before we were married, she had... Well, how shall I put it? Uh, fallen under the spell of this man, Drenko. I, I asked her no questions, but I know that he continued to have some strange hold over her. I had the impression that she hated seeing him... And that he was forcing his presence on her on those occasions when he was a guest in my house. Yes, I still don't believe anyone killed the fellow, but if someone did, it sounds like a good riddance. Unfortunately, Watson, we are not concerned with the equities of the murder, but with its solution. Yes. Thank you, Sir Hubert. You've been extremely helpful. Well, justice must be done, Mr. Holmes. But if ever I wished that your great powers might fail, it is now. I have no hesitation whatsoever in saying that I'm infinitely grateful to the murder of that swine drinker. Join me in a cup of tea? No tea, thanks. I'm rather trusting to the inspiration of music to assist me in resolving some of the more puzzling features of this case. Well, at least you can't complain of a scarcity of suspects. First of all, Sir Hubert, for obvious reasons. Possibly Lady Ashley. Great Scott, Holmes. What's the matter? Tea too hot? No, but have you thought of the possibility that Fru-Fru might have killed Drenko? 
After all, she might have been mad in love the with him. The possibility she... had occurred to me, but I discarded it. Oh, discarded it. By Jove, look at this glass here on the table. It's positively vibrating from, from that high note. A not uncommon phenomenon. As you must know, certain objects vibrate in harmony with certain notes. Uh, Watson, huh? get your coat. We huh? promised to pay a visit to Marivaux's shop. I think this would be an ideal time to discharge that obligation. Dingy little place, I must say. Founded 1821, eh? Looks as though they hadn't washed the window since. But full of priceless treasures. As Marlowe said, infinite riches in a little room. I say, where's Marivaux? I don't like the look of that customer over there, the one with that bushy back beard and theatrical cloak. He looks like one of those bomb-throwing fellows. What you call them? Uh, nihilists. You must remember, Watson, that music appeals to oddly assorted people. Well, of course, uh, Professor Moriarty, after all, knows no peer in his interpretation of certain of the Bach fugues. Well, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, or is this other gentleman waiting? No, 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 I'm in no hurry. It's no wonder the fame of your shop is worldwide, Monsieur Maribaud. I see you have some remarkable instruments. You see about you the fruits of a lifetime of devotion to the violin. <laughs> I must confess, Monsieur Holmes, that it pains me every time I sell one of my treasures. I can well believe it. And uh, have you made any further progress toward a solution of Grinko's death? I feel safe in saying that my investigation has gleaned a few pertinent facts. Would it uh, be indiscreet for me to ask what they are? Not at all. You yourself were present when I made the curious discovery regarding Drenko's violin being out of tune. And only a short time ago, while I happened to be playing my violin, Dr. Watson made a remark which threw further light on the case. Didn't you, Watson? Huh? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Sir. I don't know what kind of a violin you possess, Monsieur Holmes, but I'm sure you'll appreciate one magnificent example that I'd like you to try. A Guarnerius. The equal of any strad I've ever seen. I'm afraid it would be far beyond the reach of my poise. But you at least owe yourself the pleasure, the great experience of playing it. Here it is. Isn't it beautiful? Exquisite. If the tone's as mellow as that varnish... But of course. Why don't you take it into my private office and try it? Hmm? No one will disturb you here. Thank you. I've never had the good fortune to test the guarnier. Dr. Watson, while Mr. Holmes is amusing himself, perhaps you'll be interested in one of these bows. Bows? Oh, yes, yes. Horsey, I think, with you, Bows. Uh, there's more to it than that. There is only one family in all Italy, Dr. Watson, that possesses the great secret of making a bow like this one. Yes, it's all very fascinating, Mr. Marivaux, but Holmes must have made up his mind if he likes that fiddle by now. And I know he wants to ask you some questions. I, he told me that... Uh, good heavens, what on earth... He's lying on the floor. He must have fainted. Holmes! I'm afraid he's dead. Quick, Dr. Watson, go for the police. And give you a chance to plant a bottle of cyanide by my side? <laughs> oh, no. Watson, stay here and listen to Maribel confess how he murdered Drenko. You, you're alive? No, thanks to you. I took the trouble to dissect the violin you gave me and then played one of the others here to lure you in. He killed Drenko? But the suicide note... Elementary, my dear Watson. I would hazard a guess that it was torn from the end of a letter to Marivaux referring to an unsatisfactory instrument, which was intolerable and which he couldn't endure any longer. But Holmes, Marivaux was nowhere near Drenko when he died. Marivaux had left a very oddly constructed violin with Drenko, presumably last night, knowing that it was Drenko's habit to practice each morning from eight till ten. Inside the violin, in place of a sound bar, Marivaux had put a thin glass vial containing cyanogen the lethal gas which is identical in odour and effects with the cyanide. Good heavens! When Drenko reached the proper high note, the extremely thin glass vial cracked under the impact of the sympathetic vibration, releasing the deadly fumes through the F-holes in the violin. And the violin that Marivaux was delivering to Drenko when he discovered the corpse... Precisely, the... Watson. He merely left that one by the body, planted the note, and carried off the fatal weapon and all proof of the crime in his now empty case. He made only one error... He neglected to tune the violin he left. Amazing, Holmes. I've listened very patiently, Monsieur Holmes, to your ingenious and utterly imaginary reconstruction. I suppose you can furnish a motive, too? I'd prefer to spare Lady Ashley the ordeal, Marivaux. 
But I have no doubt that it was in you, she confided, that Drenko had been blackmailing her on the strength of their earlier romance. But to convict a man of murder, you need something more than words. You need proof. You seem to be overlooking this dissected violin on your desk, with which you attempted to murder me. I fancy that the sample of your handiwork with the vial of gas affixed therein will offer ample proof... You'll never send me to the guillotine. I'll kill myself first. But I'm going to take you with Drop me. Drop that vial, Malibu. Precisely what I intend to do. Drop it and release the fumes. They will put a speedy end to all three of us. I've got you, Miss Malibu. Give me that vial if you don't want a broken arm. Ah, there. Much better. Good heavens, it's an analyst. I mean, Inspector Bernard. As you noticed when you commented on his beard and cloak, Watson, the inspector's tastes in disguise are a trifle flamboyant. <laughs> and, uh, now, Monsieur Holmes, I must extend my thanks to you on behalf of the Sûreté. Not at all, Inspector. Your promptness in acting in response to my message undoubtedly saved Watson's life and mine. Thank you. Oh, no, Monsieur Holmes. Thank you. Oh, well, have it your way, Inspector. <laughs> and now, Marie come <laughs> along. <laughs> Phew. Rather too close a shave to suit me, Holmes. I say, that fellow Malivo was, was very ingenious. Quite. You know, Watson, I have one bitter regret concerning this case. Regret? I find that I have, despite all my protests, ended by acting for Drenko without a fee after all. <laughs> Just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us something about next week's story. But first, girls, some of the most beautiful women in the world are Powers models. And one of their outstanding characteristics is their shining bright hair. Now, here's how they keep it shining. Powers models use Cremel shampoo. This amazing, beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair. Revealing all its natural, glossy luster. My wife says cremel shampoo is wonderful for washing children's hair. How about that? Oh, yes, it would be. Because there are no harsh caustics or chemicals in cremel shampoo. And its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if you could only see how Powers Models' hair fairly radiates glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try cremel shampoo right away. You can get a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the adventure of the Sally Martin. The Sally Martin? She was a boat, Mr. Bell. Oh. A luxurious yacht. Holmes and I entered the case when her owner was found lying dead in his bunk with a knife stuck between his ribs. <laughs> New Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Illustrious Client. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting to be you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Sally Martin. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, transcribed in 30 seconds. Tomorrow, you're invited to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. The orchestra will be under the direction of Bruno Walter for tomorrow's performance, and celebrated violinist Joseph Zagetti will be featured soloist. Selections for tomorrow include the overture to Mozart's Marriage of Figaro, and the same composer's brilliant concerto for violin and orchestra. You're invited every Saturday to a concert by the NBC Symphony. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Mr. Hal Horton, United Industries? Oh, I see. Well, I must warn you, Mr. Horton, Mr. Wolf doesn't take kindly to big industrialists. Says their great wealth upsets his digestion. Why do you want to see him? The connection's bad. I don't hear you. Who? Who? 
Mr. Horton, who... Hmm. We're cut off. What is it, Mr. Goodwin? Mr. Hal Horton called. I understand that. I won't see him. Tell him what money I have to invest I put into orchid plants. Mr. Horton wasn't promoting anything. Then what did he call you for? The great Horton needs a detective. Maybe just my occupational reflex, but I thought he said somebody had been murdered. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. It turned out that what Horton had said had been murder, which became celebrated in the case of the malevolent medic. But its solution wasn't a simple matter of following up his accusation. It had false clues mixed all through it like raisins in a pudding. The man we came to know as the malevolent medic was young Dr. Benjamin Sloan. The case began on the sunny afternoon when Grace Banks, his nurse, came into his private office. Waiting room's finally empty, I take it. Well, there's one more patient, darling. I'm sorry. Doctor, hmm. Mrs. Horton's here for another of the thymine chloride shots you ordered for. I said you could give her those grades. She doesn't have to wait to see me. Oh, she's hung up her mink coat, parked her orchid and her alligator bag, and filled up all the ashtrays with lipstick cigarette stubs. Mrs. Horton prefers to wait for you. She seems very upset. I hoped she'd get hold of herself. Mrs. Hal Horton, with all that money. Whatever gives her such jitters? <laughs> Darling, if I ever get in that condition after we're married, please shoot me. I've advised her to go to a specialist. Hers isn't a true medical case. Well, I'll do what I can. Get a needle ready, will you, Grace, and show Mrs. Horton in. Yes, darling. I mean, doctor. (laughs) Mrs. Horton, will you step in now? Been in that waiting room for hours. Ben, I wrote you every day this week. Why didn't you answer me? You say your health hasn't improved, Leslie. I'm worse, much worse. Still chain smoking, drinking, and the sleeping pills? I have to take something. I can't walk the floor all night, can I? Thinking, thinking. Why are you so unhappy, Leslie? You have what you always said you wanted, money, clothes, excitement. You have the right to say that. But don't, please don't. I'm only pointing out facts you should face. I told you from the beginning you need a nerve specialist. I need you. Nobody else can help me at all. Leslie, you went over this the last time you were here, and in all those letters you've been sending. Now, let's cross it off for good, shall we? Don't talk like that. You don't mean I'm no longer a lovesick dope, and you're the wife of one of the biggest industrialists in the country. Yes, Hal Horton, I despise him. He thinks his money makes him God. He thinks he can buy anything that he bought me. He made me think I was getting the world with a fence around it. Everything I want is on the other side of that fence. You don't know what you do want. I want us the way we used to be, happy in love together. Leslie, please be quiet. Why? Miss Banks is in the laboratory. She can hear you. What of it? I'm not ashamed. I'll tell her. I'll tell everybody. Imagine Hal's face when he finds out I'm leaving him. But I'm coming back to you. He already knows about you. I told him you were in love with me, that you're jealous. He doesn't like you. Leslie, you're raving now. Stop it. You always said I was the most attractive woman in the world. You made your choice. Now get this into your head. I'm really in love now. In a few weeks, I'm going to be married. Now I'll get your medicine. So it's really true. You are going to be married. Yes. I'd heard it, but I didn't believe it. Going to marry a nurse. All my friends have known and been laughing at me. Please, now that's enough. I made a plan, a wonderful, beautiful plan about us. Ben, you love me. Ben, say you love me. Mrs. Horton, that is all over. You don't love me. No longer. You're here as my patient, and that's all. After this treatment, I must ask you to get another doctor. A wonderful, beautiful plan for us. And now she threatens to step in and spoil it. Well, maybe I'll spoil a few plans. How would you like that? Threats will accomplish nothing. I can ruin things for you, Ben. All those fancy ideas of yours about having a fine practice, being a great doctor. Do you want to give those up? I can arrange it so that 
Maybe there won't be any wonderful future for you. Are you prepared to face that possibility? Because I'm prepared to make it a reality. And I mean it. You'll regret this day as long as you live. I'll get your medicine, Mrs. Horton. Hand me my bag. Thank you. Oh, I hate you, Ben. I hate you both. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mrs. Horton. Miss Banks had to do a repair job before she could use the sterilizer. Alcohol, Miss Banks? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Now, Mrs. Horton, may I help? Thanks. So nice of you. There. Right side for the hypo this time, isn't it? Just touch with this cotton. Ready now, Doctor. Oh, I... I... What's the matter, Mrs. Horton? I'm just cold. Alcohol. After this, I advise you to go home and rest. These massive doses are a little painful, but they give results. There. That's all. Just relax here and you can leave in ten minutes. Come, Miss Banks. I want to talk to you. Doctor! Doctor! I, I feel sick. I feel very sick. You might as well stop acting. I can't get up. My feet, Ben. Look at her. Something's happened. Hysteria. No, her face. Oh, and she's falling. Mrs. Horton, hold on to me. I've got you. Hold her up. Leslie, what is it? Pain. Terrible pain. Where? What from? Sick everywhere. Pain. Everything's pain. Pain in my head. Pain in my feet. My feet. My feet. Doctor. She's dead. Yes, Grace. Get a card from the files. I, I want to study it. From the first day Mrs. Horton came here. What was it, Ben? What happened to her? Symptoms are of a heart condition from which it seems the patient has just expired. Then you must call her husband. Grace, did you hear me? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Well, I discouraged your visit here, Mr. Horton. I do have a sort of curiosity about the operation of so-called big business. Maybe I'll be a glass of beer and hear an explanation of the rise and fall of this morning's stock market. You don't think I've come here socially? I wish to engage your services for... Not available. You're a detective, aren't you? Specializing in cases that interest me. Sherry, Mr. Horton? I don't need it, thank you. But Mr. Wolf says he specializes in cases that... Interest... I've just got here. I haven't told my story. I don't believe you even know who I am. Oh, yes, we do. We do indeed. A millionaire. Did I offend you by speaking of a fee? No, on the contrary. It is that portion of your conversation which interested me most. Frankly, I planned to spend the evening examining the first edition of Henry James I'd like to purchase. And the word fee suggested a possible way. Now, what have you done, sir? What have I done? <laughs> One doesn't have to be a detective to recognize you're in trouble, Mr. Horton. Look, Mr. Wolf, I have done nothing. But I've got a question I've got to have answered. I need facts. They tell me you're the man who can give them to me. If Nero Wolf can't get them for you, they're not facts. They're fancies, Mr. Horton. Well, my story's involved. But the gist of it is, uh, your beautiful wife, a former model, died last week. The death certificate indicated a heart attack. You suggest she was murdered. How did you know? Never mind how I came to my conclusions. How did you come to yours? Leslie had been going to a Dr. Benjamin Sloan. She said he was a specialist. Some friend had recommended. She'd been upset. He was giving her vitamin B shots, she told me. You doubt that was true. Dr. Sloan informed me, uh, after she died in his office, uh, there'd been a heart condition from the beginning. Well, I don't believe it. Leslie was a very emotional girl. She'd have been quite frightened of a heart ailment. She'd have told me about it. Maybe she didn't comprehend its seriousness. Dr. Sloan did. Why didn't he get in touch with me at once about it? Then, when I went to clear up Leslie's room, I discovered something. Leslie didn't go to Sloan through a friend. She'd known him when she was a model and he was a hospital intern. She'd kept letters he'd written to her then. Love letters. Indeed. Well, doesn't that give you an idea, Mr. Wolf? Sloan lost Leslie to me. No man who'd been in love with Leslie would ever get over it. 
Would a man be jealous enough to kill a woman he loved rather than have her belong to another man? An interesting theory, Mr. Horton, one frequently advanced in fiction. Shall we investigate and see how it works out in fact? Ah, you'll take the case, then. The intricacies of the feminine nature are challenging if you do not have to come in contact with the creatures. The uh, practical research in such matters I leave to Mr. Goodwin here. It is a field in which he specializes. But it's you I want. Our method of operation is not under your control, Mr. Horton. You'll be so kind, Archie. Get a first-hand report of Dr. Benjamin Sloan and the women in his life. Just came to ask a few routine questions, Dr. Sloan. I don't understand your interest in the Horton case, Mr. Goodwin, is it? That's right. The death certificate was signed and a report made to the medical inspector. Detectives are a snoopy lot. Detectives? Are you from the police department? No, I'm employed to note some details before we close up the Leslie Horton estate. Sudden deaths have to be double-checked. I'm afraid I can't add a thing to what I've already reported. Well, thanks for seeing me anyhow. Been a pleasant visit. Ever have a patient die in your office before, Dr. Sloan? No, but I've seen similar cases in the hospital, of course. Was Mrs. Horton warned about her heart condition, Dr. Sloan? I discussed her case with her fully and frankly. And her husband, wasn't Mr. Horton alarmed? He didn't know. Mrs. Horton's ailment was, well, not to bore a layman with medical details, was not a fatal one necessarily. She might have gone on for years. Just played in bad luck, huh? The worst. Mm -hmm. When did you first meet her? Several weeks ago. And you saw her how many times? It's all on the record. She was nervous. I prescribed thiamine chloride. Her medical report card shows that. You read it for yourself. Well, I guess that's all, Dr. Sloan. Won't bother you further. Miss Banks will show you out. Yes, Dr. Sloan? Sort of a modern Aladdin arrangement, isn't it? Wish I could press a buzzer and have a beautiful girl like you up here. Mr. Goodwin is leaving. Oh, this way, Mr. Goodwin. You can use the side door. The waiting room's full of patients. So long, Doctor. This way, through the lab. There's a door from it into the corridor. Cozy place, all those bottles. I suppose there's enough stuff in here to kill an army. To cure one. Miss Banks, may I say that you're the kind of a nurse that patients dream about? Make it a pleasure to go to a hospital. Blonde hair, blue eyes, winkers an inch long. Are they real? If you'll excuse me. Who do I have to come down with to persuade you to take care of me? I don't take cases. I'm a technician. Good day, Miss... So you work just for Dr. Sloan? That's too bad the way he's involved in this Horton case looks serious. Mrs. Horton simply died of a heart attack in Dr. Sloan's office. If you wanted to help your boss, Miss Banks, you'd stop rushing around and answer a few questions. I'm sure Dr. Sloan gave you the necessary information. Guess he doesn't realize the trouble he's in. If you can supply any details that'll change the picture, you'll be doing him a great favor. He's a nice guy. I want to help. What is there to say? The report... Let's get it in your own words. Just what really happened here that day? Well... Dr. Sloan gave Mrs. Horton the vitamin B shot. That was routine. Mm -hmm. But she didn't get up afterward. She said she was sick. And then she fell and I caught her. And Dr. Sloan administered emergency treatment. What did that consist of, Miss Banks? All that is in the office record. What would bring on such an attack? It could have been several things. Could it have been something she ate? Acute indigestion affects the heart. Maybe Mrs. Horton would be here now if the doctor thought to use a stomach pump. He did use one. He did everything there was time to do. She certainly went in a hurry. Suffer a lot? She said she was in pain. Where? Her stomach? No, not her stomach. Where then? She seemed to be in pain all over. Reflex, maybe? When it was over, what did you do, Miss Banks? Call Mr. Horton. Must have been a blow to the great man. I understand she was younger than he is and quite a sultry gal. I've talked to you professionally because you said it was necessary to help Dr. Sloan. Is that all, Mr. Goodwin? I guess it is for now. Unless you'll have dinner with me. Thank you, no. I'm handsome, hardworking, and harmless. I'll bring you references from my employer. What do you say? The express elevator's the one on the right. Must be there's another man. Wouldn't be the doctor, would it? Well, you'll fit better in a Pullman kitchen than here among the test tubes at that. My reluctant congratulations. Verdict, Archie? Innocent as lambs, both Sloan and the nurse. Evidence to prove it? My unfailing sensibilities, not the murderer type. Nice couple, doctor and the nurse, I suspect they're engaged. She's so much in love with him, I could have been you and she wouldn't have known the difference. Very flattering. Records? The usual medical record, Mrs. Horton's first visits, symptoms, subsequent visits. Here are the notes on it. Hmm. 
Vitamin B shots. No chance they brought this on, huh? Dr. Sloan says absolutely not. I checked that with other doctors. But Mrs. Horton did go into this right after the hypo. That's the story, Jives and Sloan? Mm-hmm. A little more detailed. She says he did everything. He even used a stomach pump. The woman was in pain? What's this? Head to feet? My way of saying pain all over. What other papers did you examine? Only the medical record. Get back to Sloan's office late tonight and examine all the papers in his desk. Can't you trust me? I tell you, there's no reason even to suspect these two. When you have one of your adolescents' infatuations on, blood dripping from a dagger in a girl's hand would look to you like crushed rose petals. With this grace bangs out of the way, maybe you can recognize evidence. Uh, sounds like a long, bleak evening. Hand me that medical book and then be on your way. I want to think. Mr. Goodwin. Oh, good evening, Dr. Sloan. This is a surprise to us both. I didn't anticipate that you'd be keeping office hours after midnight. What are you doing in my office at two o'clock in the morning, Mr. Goodwin? Reading your mail and having a ghoulish time surrounded by all these shiny instruments of yours. You've been rifling my desk. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I've put things back very neatly, even the letters from this little secret compartment, which isn't secret at all to anybody who knows about desks. I've kept only Give one. Give me that easy. Let... It's the my darling mine first shan't ever give you up one way or another one. You remember? I'll bet that nice little nurse you're engaged to never wrote that, did she? What do you intend to do with it? Mark it Exhibit A in the Horton murder case. Maybe you'd like to come with me and explain it to Nero Wolf. Very moving, very flattering, very interesting if you like women. But also very incriminating, Dr. Sloan. What does it prove? A silly woman with a nervous breakdown imagined she was infatuated with me. A woman who is now dead, you must remember, under, shall we say, unusual circumstances. You signed a death certificate which stated Mrs. Horton died of a heart attack. As you signed it, Dr. Sloan, did you remember she had threatened you... And he was a sigh of relief that fate had done you such a good turn? I didn't bear Leslie any ill will. I was sorry for her. You felt adequate to the situation. You call no other doctor, though there are several in your building. My first thought, of course, was that it was some extraordinary allergic reaction to the vitamin dose. It was not until an hour or two after she was dead you decided she expired from a heart attack. Yes. How did you explain the pain? I... I reported no pain. Miss Banks said Mrs. Horton had pain from her head to her feet. Grace said that? Well, not in those words, but that was the general Dr. idea. Dr. Sloan, why did you use a stomach pump on a heart case? Why, I, I, I told you I tried everything. Sometimes an acute digestive disturbance. But... I suggest you did it because to you, as to any qualified physician, the pain in the feet suggested poisoning. A particular kind of poison. An inorganic poison. There wasn't any in her stomach. You maintain that? Archie, get the medical examiner on the phone. Tell him the body of Miss Hal Horton must be examined for any evidence of poisoning. I know you think Mrs. Horton was murdered, but it's impossible. There'd been no one near her. Miss Banks. Miss Banks couldn't have done it. She was working with me constantly. That's what I thought you'd say, Dr. Sloan. Mr. Wolf, I had to see you. This is the most dreadful thing I've ever heard of. Trying to accuse Dr. Sloan of murdering a patient. It appears he had a reason to want Mrs. Horton dead, Miss Banks. She was that thing the poets write about, a woman scorned. She had sent him this hysterical letter, threatening scandal, and if he rejected her, he couldn't control her. She kept coming back to his office making scenes. He gave her nothing but thymine chloride. I know, I fixed the shot myself. Don't start covering for her. I'm not. I tell you, I fill the needle. And I didn't put anything but thymine chloride in it. You haven't any reason to think anybody did, except for that letter you stole. If it wasn't for that letter... Give it to me. Give it to me. Stop it, Archie, quick. Now drop it, baby. Come away from that fireplace. Well, why, you little tiger kid. I didn't think you had it in you. Come on, let go of it. No, no. Let go. Give it to Papa. Now, look what you did. You almost got Nero Wolf out of his chair. Destroying evidence is a serious offense, young woman. She kept coming to the office, writing him, pestering him. I heard her from the laboratory. You read her letters too, didn't you? 
You knew if something didn't stop her, Dr. Benjamin Sloan was a ruined man. But he didn't kill her. I know he did. I don't believe he did. You... You don't? Well, then who? You've just provided an excellent motive for having done it yourself, Miss Banks. Pears in white wine. Cold, luscious, exotic. Excellent, Fritz. Excellent. Best thing that's happened today. I don't like this Sloan case. If you ask me, I think that Horton Dengawa was coming to it. Those are not the words of abstract justice, nor the phrases of a gentleman of culture. A good detective never plays favorites. Good night's rest, and you will find your attitude more normal by morning. You expect to have this case solved by morning? It's solved now. Thanks to the expedition I sent you on this afternoon. Your rest can wait. No one will escape. I feel like a murderer myself. If I hadn't wormed it out of grace about the Horton woman complaining of pain, and if you hadn't jumped at the word feet... That, Archie, my dear fellow, is the purpose for which you exist, to discover pertinent facts. Have we quite finished? Copy in the study, then. Here's the door. I'll go. Mr. Wolfin? He isn't seeing anyone this evening, Mr. Horton. Well, he's seeing me. Archie, if that's Mr. Horton, I'll see him. You'd better... Sorry you found Mr. Goodman so impossible, Mr. Horton. He, uh, he came to pay you a call this afternoon. I sent him, but he didn't find you in, did you, Archie? No, but I made myself at home. I knew anything that would help to solve this case you'd want us to have. What do you mean? You were in my house? What did you take? Nothing of monetary value, I assure you, that will not be returned in due course. But before I announce the solution of a case, I like to have all my little props in place. I appreciate a well-rounded performance. Mr. Wolf, I've had enough of this foolishness, this, this delay. I hired you to convict Sloan, not to play parlor games. You must be patient, Mr. Horton. Don't force me. I want action. Well, I had planned to wait until the morning, but if you insist, these papers here may interest you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Goodwin here collects them, your wife's letters. Leslie's? You recognize the script? These are addressed to Dr. Sloan. Do they, uh, they prove anything against him? The lady's correspondence should be kept private. This other letter, however, was sent to you. D- to me? Leslie's? What, what? Give it to me. Easy, Horton, easy. Don't grab. No, but that letter's mine. You stole it from my desk. There is a point in a case, Mr. Horton, where letters cease to be personal property and become evidence. What evidence can that letter provide? It seems you had reason for wanting to kill your wife, Mr. Horton. A man can get annoyed by a note saying his wife never loved him, that all his money isn't enough, and that she's going to another man. You accusing me of murder? It could have been the perfect crime. Poison in one of those pills she was forever taking, or on the tip of the cigarette she chain-smoked, and a doctor's office to die in. If you hadn't been fool enough to try to pin it on Sloan, you might have gotten away with it. If I had known while she was alive what Leslie was, I might have done anything. But that letter you stole from me was one she left under my pillow. I didn't find it until after she was dead. I didn't kill her. Sloan did. You hired me to prove that, Mr. Horton. Suppose you let me go about my business. Near a wolf's office. Yeah? Oh, you did? Good boy. We'll expect you. I'll tell Mr. Wolf at once. Medical examiner's officer, just as you thought, they found poison in the body. Listen to me. Inspector Kramer's picking up Dr. Sloan and Grace. They'll be here any minute. Kramer's set to make an arrest. I told you. The police know it's Sloan. Put the letters and Mrs. Horton's bag on my desk, Archie. Leslie's alligator bag? You stole that from my house this afternoon, too. Those things are mine. Inspector Kramer will want to take them with him. But you think I want it made public what Leslie did to me? Kramer can't have them. Maybe the inspector will want to take you, too, Mr. Horton. Let him in, Archie. Come in, Inspector Kramer. Oh. Dr. Sloan, Miss Banks. Wolf asked me to bring them here first before I locked anybody up. Mrs. Horton was murdered, all right. I'm sending a man for Horton, too. You won't have to. Mr. Horton's waiting here to join the party. Come into Mr. Wolf's office. Good evening, Inspector. Good evening, Wolf. Uh, will you all please range yourselves around the room as I indicate? Miss Banks here. Dr. Sloan, Mr. Horton, Archie, you stand between the two men, if you please. Mr. Wolfe, this is a dreadful mistake. I swear the doctor didn't... Stop thinking about the doctor. What about you? If you're accusing Miss Banks, I might as well tell you now. Hold it, Dr. Sloan. From here on, anything you say will be held against you. That's what I want. Let Grace go home and I'll... For heaven's sake, why don't you arrest the man? Isn't it obvious he's guilty? You and your trumped-up charges against me. I'll do the talking now, Mr. Horton. 
Mrs. Horton died from a certain inorganic poisoning. Poison administered in your office, Dr. Sloan, with a hypo syringe. Let's get it over with. I gave her the hypo. But I fill the needle. There you are. They're both guilty. Which would solve the case if they weren't lying. Miss Banks believes Dr. Sloan killed Leslie for her sake. Dr. Sloan thinks Miss Banks put poison in the hypo to save him from professional ruin. They're trying to protect each other. The fact is the hypo they gave was perfectly harmless. It did not kill Mrs. Horton. Then what did? Mrs. Horton came to your office in desperation, Dr. Sloan. But she came prepared for the worst. You see this handbag? Can any of you identify it? Yes. It's hers. Is it Mr. Horton? It's Leslie's. The bag she carried to the office the day she died. Open it, Archie. You will see it contains her change purse, billfold, cigarette case, matches, her handkerchief, nothing more. That is, not unless you look closely. Then you will observe this lining has a double fold. A secret compartment. Exactly. We open it this way, and there we find it. A hypodermic needle with which the unhappy woman committed suicide. Miss Banks, Dr. Sloan, you can stop protecting one another. Mr. Horton, the world need never know you were a betrayed husband. Mrs. Horton killed herself while in a confused state following a mental breakdown. The case of the malevolent medic is closed. How did you ever get the hunch about the handbag, Mr. Wolf? I know nothing about women. But on my occasional trips abroad, I have been forced to observe their handbags. Monstrosities. They hold anything and everything. <laughs> now that our guests have gone, Fritz is bringing coffee to the study. Would you like some beer? I believe I would. Somehow I feel I've earned it. Ah, here you are. Poor fellow, I'm very sorry for you. How so? This is one case in which there is no falsely accused unattached young lady for you to squire about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's to your better luck next time. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Ruth Adams Knight was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Vic Perrin, Bruce Payne, Bill Johnstone, and Mary Lansing. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Hasty Will. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and mystery for you every Saturday evening on NBC. For music tomorrow, your hit parade brings you the top tunes of the land with Snooky Lanson, Eileen Wilson, and Raymond Scott's orchestra. And for mystery, Herbert Marshall stars as the man called X, a man in search of adventure who travels wherever there is intrigue, danger, and romance. More good mystery at Sam Spade next on NBC. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. can a cigarette be? One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how mild a cigarette is, how well it agrees with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test. 
Smoke only camels for 30 days, and you'll see just how mild a cigarette can be. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency. Diamond, that's a girl's best friend, you know. Not this girl anymore. Oh, Helen, hi. Hi, you stinker. Hmm? Where were you all day yesterday? Oh, well, you'll never guess what happened. No. Nine o'clock City Hall. They told me I have to renew my license. Cost $200. Go on, I'm listening, but I'm not sympathetic. Ten o'clock, my bank. Withdrew $2.35. The wad. Well, big oaks from Little Acorns Grove. Exactly, that was the idea. So 11 o'clock, my broker's. Pawn, that is. Deposited typewriter, watch, ring. One thirty, Louis Barbershop. A lie? You had a haircut two days ago? And I was trimmed again. Louis tip on the 7th should have been read backwards. Rick, do you mean you still haven't renewed your license and you lost all the money you raised on your things? Honey, not only that, I lost a lot of faith in Louis. What I need is a good client with $200, and I... Oh. Uh... This might be the one. She's wearing mink. And she's got nice black eyes. Uh, Rick, I'll loan you $200. Tell her to take her eyes somewhere else. Oh, uh, sorry, honey. The eyes have it. Bye. Well, uh, may I help you? Is your name Richard Dunn? I'm thinking of changing it to Richard Zircon, but what can I do for you? Will you work for me, please? Here. $300. Lady, I'll die for you. He was always so nice. And then this morning I met him at the house for coffee and told him what I found out. Suppose you start from the beginning and we'll see what we can do about him. Sit down. I don't know how I could be so stupid. They were just using me. I've made a terrible mistake. Uh, we all make mistakes. I'm in desperate trouble, Mr. Diamond. I... What's wrong with you? You're shivering. The cab. All the way from Brooklyn, I found... It hurts. What is it? What... what? She fell into my arms, tearing at her stomach as if she'd just swallowed hot milk. She was still trying to talk when I let her down to the floor and ran out for some water. When I came back five seconds later, she was unconscious. And in another five seconds, she was dead. It ain't Richard Diamond, defective detective. <laughs> and your name, Sonny? Why, it's me, Otis, Sergeant Otis. You know me, Rick. Oh, yes, yes, Sergeant Otis. I didn't recognize you there for a minute. You had an intelligent look on your face. Oh, you think that's funny, don't you? Well, let me tell you something really funny. Well, do. Personnel division tells me if you don't get up 200 bucks by midnight, you're going to be an ex-private detective. One of the reasons why I'm here, Otis, old buddy. Now, on your lunch hour, trot up to personnel and tell them about the color of this. Gee, where'd you get all the scratch? For my client. But she's dead. De- well, go ahead, say it. She's dead. But dead or alive, she hired me and paid me, and I'm still working for her. Here. You can take it upstairs and cover my license fee for me. Oh, all right. Now, try to smile through those tears. There you are. Two hundred. All counted. You won't have to take off your shoes. Okay, I'll take it up for you. Uh, hey, uh, about that dame, Diamond. You, you know, I gotta see you. Otis, Otis, there's smoke coming out of your ears. I told you that would happen if you ever tried to think for yourself. Now, where's Levinson? Lieutenant's across the hall in the medical examiner's office. I'll go get him. Uh, never mind. I'll do it myself. You might lose your way. Oh, you talk like that. Hello, Rick. Glad you dropped by. Hi, Walt. What did you find out about the girl? Medics just finished with her. It was Xynethal killed her. Xynethal? That's new to me. It's a drug. Petrol base. Been in her stomach about an hour. Judging from the way she acted and talked, it could have been suicide. Hmm. What's her name? Haven't made it yet. Don't know who she is? You need some new talent around here, Walt. Well, there's no identification. Prints haven't lined up with anything yet. Too bad, huh? Real nice-looking kid. 
I agreed. She was a nice-looking kid, the kind you wait all year long to ask to the senior prom. Watching her die that morning hadn't been easy. It was like standing helpless in the middle of a sudden blizzard that wipes out the flowers of an early spring. When I got back to my office, I was still wondering who she was and how I could help her. Hi, Ricky boy. I've been waiting for you. Oh, hello, Bridgie. Isn't it a little late in the day to be cleaning up my office? Oh, I finished swabbing it down a few minutes ago. I was just waiting to uh, get... Sorry, Bridgie. No canasta this afternoon. Don't feel like it. Well, me neither. Got to take my banjo lesson in half an hour. Waited around to give you this. What, uh... Found this purse lying in your waste basket. One of your girlies must have knocked it off the edge of your desk. Uh, give it to me, will you? Maybe that wasn't the mink coat I seen come in this morning. Hmm. <laughs> It was hers, all right. The faint, sweet odor of her perfume still clung to it. But it wasn't the lipstick, comb, small change, and key that made it so heavy. It was the thirty-two revolver inside, three bullets recently fired. A driver's license told me her name was Doris Romano, and it gave an address. Nobody was home. The lady next door dropped her mop long enough to wheeze out where Mr. Romano worked. I twisted my way down an iron stairway into a furnace room. Doris Romano's father was taking huge bites out of a coal pile with an outsized shovel. I told him his daughter was dead. He slammed the furnace door and threw down the shovel. I knew someday I would hear this. You look like a nice young man. Like my two daughters once a nice young ladies. They went away from me a long time ago, and I'm left here. There was nothing I could do. There is nothing I can do. It's as if they never were. It's better that I go on shoveling until there is no more coal, and I die too. I'm better dead. I took Mr. Romano down to the coroner's office and he identified her body. Later, I told Walt about the purse and turned it over to him. Everything but the 32 and the key. Maybe it was the wrong way to play it, but somehow I felt I could still give Doris Romano the help she'd wanted. She said that she had taken a taxi from Brooklyn. So Diamond went to Brooklyn. <laughs> I don't know how many cab stands there are in Brooklyn, but I can tell you where you can find 104 of them. Sorry, but I got a fare. Where? Under the floorboards? In there, eating. I'm looking for information. Here. Ah, gumboots, huh? Who's getting cheated? Did you carry a brunette in a mink coat all the way to Manhattan sometime this morning? Maybe. Where'd you pick her up? Brooklyn, house on M Street. What house? How's a little all expense account? Well, here's a fen. Oh, no. That's all there is. Only one to a customer. Okay, I'll tell you about the house, but I won't tell you about the guy. What guy? You sure only one to a customer? Well, let's say we had a change in management. Okay, now tell me about the guy. Uh, tall, dark-haired, blue suit kind. He was sort of chasing her when she climbed into me cab. Looked like a mesh. Hmm. With spring still two months away? Come on, take me to the house. Uh, it's the gray one, 900 block. Find it yourself like I told you. I got a fair. I found the house easy enough. There was a for sale sign on it. The door was locked, so I walked around and back and peeked in the kitchen window. Then I remembered I still had the key that had been in Doris's purse. Ah, uh, it worked. Inside, the order of tar or printer's ink or something along those lines hit me. I was just starting to sniff around when a tall blue suit eased himself in through the kitchen door. He looked at me like I was breathing some air that belonged to him. You could use your GI loan. You ought to buy it. It's a real steal. Oh, thanks. I'm just looking. Well, we charge for that, too. Oh. Well, I, uh, I don't think she'd like it. Your wife? No. Just a girl in a mink coat. Name of Doris Romano. Where'd you get the key to this house? From her. It was in her will. She's dead. I'll get my black suit pressed. I met a cab driver who says he knows you. 
Said you'd be doing a chase scene with Doris Romano early this morning. Mister, when I chase a girl, I catch her. I suppose you've got a name. Yeah. Yeah, it's Joe Riley. I own this house, or if you're a buyer, okay. If not, cop a heel. Well, I'm not a buyer. Then blow. Oh, I didn't know Luger's came that big. Mm-hmm. And they make holes to match. Yeah, oh, I imagine so. All right, Pilgrim, you got a name? For me or you? Mm. School isn't out yet. Just answer. Well, there's Richard Diamond, a private detective. She came to my office this morning. What'd she have to say? Nothing. She died of poisoning before she could say anything. And the police? They have her body and identification. Well, goody for them. That all? There's still you. Any cop who wants me can find me listed in the book. I got a permit for this gun and I haven't got a record. You see, Diamond, I could blow your head off for trespassing. But I'm a real nice guy, so just get out and forget you saw me. Well, that won't be hard. Half an hour later, I picked up the evening paper. And the lead story stuck out like a white derby on an undertaker. It was about an unidentified man pulled out of the river that afternoon. The coroner had picked three thirty-two slugs out of him. What is it, Rick? Well, uh, about this guy they pulled out of the river. Anything on him? Why? No, oh, just curiosity. Uh, it's a terrible thing. Not just three thirty-two slugs, but they'd been filed down the center. Dum dums. Dum dums. Tore the poor guy all apart. Everybody in the department's plenty sore. You want to see the body? Uh, some of the time. I know what it would look like. As I left Walt's office, I felt like I was standing on a trap door and the warden had just smiled at the hangman. But I had to take Doris Romano's thirty-two out of my pocket and look at it. The three remaining bullets were all filed right down the center. Dum-dums. Everybody had a right to be sore, especially me. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. That's right. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. You'll find the reason in two words. Flavor and mildness. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. The flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Singing stars know the importance of mildness in a cigarette, and that's why so many of them smoke camels. Ezio Pinza, Nadine Connor, Patrice Munsell, Mario Lanza are a few of the operatic stars who choose camels every time. Friends, make the sensible cigarette test. Make your own camel 30-day test and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. It was hard to picture my angel-faced client pumping dumb, dumb bullets into some guy and tossing him in the drink. But that's the way it looked. I had no choice but to turn the gun and bullets over to Lieutenant Walt Levinson for investigation. And the aftermath was something only a hurricane would understand. He acted like an historian who'd caught George Washington telling a lie. Well, I guess this kind of proves who knows what who was talking about, doesn't it, Rick? All right, so who's on first? Want me to tell you what's on second? I don't want you to tell me anything because I know everything now. You know, they could use you in some very high official circles. Go ahead, make jokes. I didn't know I had. A man is found in the river with dum-dum bullets in him. She's carrying the gun that did it. 
Her fingerprints were on it. And then she commits suicide. Remorse. Ah, baloney. Why did she come to my office to die? Why, when she didn't even know me, was I the last person on the earth she chose to see if she committed suicide? Dames in love want to make a big show. Publicity. Go out with a three-column spread. Then why didn't she drop down on the city desk of the graphic? They'd have printed the story in real blood. Hers. You were a lot closer than the graphic. Now, Walt. Walt, I'm going to explain this to you patiently. Mm -hmm. I've seen women of every kind. Hard, soft, sweet, warm, cheap, treacherous, mean. But I've never known a woman to lie in your arms dying, look up at you with the most innocent black eyes in the world and ask you to help her after she had just come fresh from killing a man. Psychology, I don't know. But evidence, I do. If she went to all that trouble to get rid of the body, why didn't she get rid of the gun, too? Well, I don't know. Oh, Walt, this is the sweetest double cross since the three-way stretch. Somebody planted that gun on her. Now, if you can keep it out of the papers, somebody's going to wonder why the gun wasn't found and come looking for it. Will you give that theory a try? And I suppose you'll be waiting for them with a butterfly net. I'll be waiting for them with a picture of that girl's black eyes in the back of my head. What do you say? Well... Thanks, Walt. Personnel told me that the gun had been purchased by American Trust and Loan Company in 1941 and permitted to a bank messenger named Dale F. Bronson. The address was an apartment on 63rd Street. When I saw all the expensive cars out in front, I was thinking I should have been a bank messenger. When she answered the door, I knew it. Pure gold. Well, hello. Tall, aren't you? Oh, I do my best. Somehow I knew you'd belong to one of those cars out in front. Which one? Longest low convertible. What can I do for you? Oh, well, I'll rephrase the answer. I'd like to talk inside. It's terribly early for me to receive strangers. Oh, well, I sent my hourglass to the Sahara for a checkup. Besides, my watch is broken. Come on in. I'll see if I can fix it. I'm great with the Swiss movement. Hmm, it shows. Are you Mrs. Bronson? Yes, and my name's Kitty. Kitty? Oh, nice. That's too bad I have to say this, but I'd like to see your husband. Preferably before he sees me and draws the right conclusion. He's not here. Expect him? You're going to love this. No. Where is he? He's in a place where nothing matters anymore. Cemetery. Sorry. Don't be. He stuck his neck out and tried to be a hero one day. Somebody shot him and stole the money he was carrying. You don't seem to miss him much. He's still wearing black. Right color, Kitty, but wrong cut. It's a new philosophy I've worked out. I understand he worked for the American Trust and Loan. They uh, bought him a gun. Don't tell me you're here to talk about guns. Who sent you? Field and stream. Well, this is a sort of a collector's item. Recognize him? No, should I? It belonged to your husband. You say it was my husband's? I suppose it was. I don't know for sure. We only stayed together a year. He had a lot of things. After he was killed, what happened to those things? I don't know. He moved in with his mother. She probably disposed of them. I'd like to talk to his mother. Where could I find her? <laughs> this just isn't your night. She's in the cemetery. Next to him. Heart failure. Well, I'll wash up, get my pay, and go home. Just who are you? Richard Diamond. You can call me Richard Diamond. Detective? Fridays. Arrest me. Mm -mm. Not until you commit a felony. This is only a misdemeanor. You're a sergeant? Five-star general. Run my own outfit. Come here. Hmm. My application for the auxiliary. Pass. Uh, uh, fail. If we ever open a recreation center, I'll let you know. Outside, where things were milder, I lit up a camel and tried to think of something smart. Then I began looking around for a cab. And that was my first mistake. Two bulky forms slid in behind me, and we walked Indian file for a few steps. When we reached the alley, I turned around to see who it might be. Ooh! That was my second mistake. I didn't have time to make any more. All right, Rennie. Drag him down this alley. Now, prop him up against the wall. I hope we don't chip none of these bricks with his head. <laughs> hey, Diamond. I know it's hard for you to see right now, but can you hear me? You've got a lot of punch in that delivery. Do you get it? If I didn't get it before, I 
I just got it then. Yeah. I just got one thing to say. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. I went out of business about two punches later. At the nice age later, a yellow cat with one bad eye began licking my face. I guess he thought I was something left over from Toot Shores. When I dissolved back in, I was lying on a soft, white bed in police emergency hospital. Lieutenant Walt Levinson was leaning over me. He looked sad and puzzled, like he was trying to pick a lock with a wet hair. Rick. Rick, it's me. Oh, I, I can hear you, Walt. You've got a mouthful of firecrackers. One of the radio cars found you lying in an alley. What happened? Oh, that's a bright question. Will I even rate a little sympathy? Why should you? Nine times out of ten, you ask for it. And get it. Now, look, Walt, there's, a, there's an irritated tone in your voice that isn't on the scale. Ask somebody to get me my pants, will you? You can't walk out of here in your condition. I got work to do. My client still has a bad name. Yeah, it's even worse now. You know, besides being overconfident, you're overconfident. Rick, Rick, that body with the dum-dum's been identified. His name's Sam Gulliver, treasury agent. Treasury agent? Yeah, he'd been after your client for a couple of months for passing bad money. Looks like he moved in to make the pinch and she shot him. Bad money? Bad money? Oh, Walt, uh, what time is it? Quarter of twelve. Why? Hmm. Well, I guess I'm 15 minutes away from being out of business. I used her door to renew my license fee. Well, I'd pay it for you myself if you could tell me who she'd been working with. Well, dig, Walt. I know a gray house in Brooklyn that just reeks of printer's ink. And I know a guy named Joe Riley who's probably got some skin knuckles. Oh? Well, do I get my pants now? I filled Walt in with some of the details on our way over there. He took it pretty hard. But the thought of talking to a live suspect thrilled him. I knew it would. We slipped down the alley and back of the place and cut our lights. The house was dark and quiet. No one stopped us when we let ourselves in the basement door. The smell of printer's ink was still strong. Throw the flash over there against that wall, Rick. Hey. A whole basement full of evidence. Plates, prints, machinery. You hit it, Rick. Now all we need is Riley. Just above us, the whole world began to explode. I took the stairs three at a time, walked right behind me. We ran to the front of the house, and from the window we saw a long, low convertible that looked familiar, streaking from the curb. I was making a lunge through the doorway when I tripped over a former acquaintance. Hi, hi, nosy. How's tricks? Riley. You, you must be made out of rubber. I thought I bounced you for at least 20 hours so that we could get... Uh, uh, I'll get an ambulance, Rick. Uh, no hurry, Walt. He wouldn't know the difference. I better get a pickup out on that car we just saw pull away. Uh, but I find it before you do. Huh? You got a corpse here, Walt. Let me have my fun. I used the cab to get back over to 63rd Street. The same kind of expensive cars were still parked out in front. Only one of them, a long, low convertible, had a very hot radiator. Oh, it's you. Tell me how tall I am, Kitty. Well, I'd love to, but not right now. I was kind of hoping we could have a drink. Got any hemlock? I said later. I'm really tired. I said now. You... Well, you are eager. What do you want? A poor dumb kid who knew she'd been used asked me to help her this morning. Just before she dropped dead. And I'm helping her. I just happen to be fresh out of medals. You shot Joe Riley less than half an hour ago. Uh, now, don't uh, reach for it, lady. I'd like a good excuse. Let me go. Doris Romano didn't know she was passing bad money for you and your boyfriend, Riley. When the agent tried to make the arrest, either you or Riley shot him. And then Doris knew the whole setup. And you knew she was scared. Joe Riley poisoned her. I didn't do it. I didn't want him to do it, and he was dumb enough to think it was clever to plant the gun in her purse. But you didn't kill Riley for being so dumb. You had a better reason, Kitty. I talked to a coal shoveler in a basement this morning. He was bitter about both his daughters going wrong. 
One of them was Doris. The other was you. Those black eyes give you away right now. All right. Look, I have a lot of money. Real money. Good money. Enough for two of us. We could do anything, go anywhere. Be a chance to stop gumshoeing around and be somebody. And Ricky, you know how I am. I can be nice. Awful nice. That's what scares me, Kitty. Now listen to me. They'll send me to prison. I'll grow old and ugly there. If you're lucky. Oh, Rick, please. Please let me go. I'll give you all the money. I'll do anything. Please. Please help me. You know, lady, for a minute you sounded just like your sister. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. In a repeated nationwide survey, doctors in every branch of medicine have been asked this question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, try Camels and see why so many people say, once a Camel smoker... Always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30 day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, any way that we can help make the lives of our hospitalized servicemen and veterans happier is always gratifying. The way the camel cigarette people have been doing it, is with gift cigarettes sent to service hospitals around the country and overseas. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Roanoke, Virginia, and Northport, New York, U.S. Air Force Hospital, Alaskan Air Command, U.S. Naval Hospital, St. Albans, New York. The camel people have now sent more than 194 million cigarettes to servicemen, servicewomen, and veterans. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen in the RKO picture, Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by John Michael Hayes and E. Jack Newman with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Men, pack your pipes with Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. P.A.'s choice tobacco is rich and flavorful with a fine natural aroma. It's crimp cut for smooth, even burning, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Get Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The carnival scream rises high on Broadway, carried high on plumes of neon light, and its shape is of many things, the metallic anguish of a trumpet shriek, the futile beating against closed doors, the laughter, bargained for, bought, paid for, under the winking girl on the spectacular. Broadway's scream rises, shatters into fragments of glitter, prowls through the city, and finally touches you. Wherever you are, it touches you. For me, it was a phone call. A girl dying, it said, from a jackknife in a diamond dance palace on Broadway. Come to it, Danny. Maybe you can grab yourself a free dance. 
The welcome committee is out, the pale girls with the scarlet streaked across their mouths, and the restless scarlet-tipped hands playing in the spinning lights, reaching out for you. Someone called, said a girl was hurt. Where is she? Me, I called. Sure you don't want to dance with one of those girls first? Where is she? You're square. You're a square policeman. Come on, I'll take you to her. George is the neat type. Don't like to spoil the fun. That's why she picked the lonesome lounge to die in. You got her picked out where you're going to die. You should. You really should. The lounge with beaded curtains. With Georgia. Get out. Go dance. It's all right, Danny. You? You, Georgia? Me, Danny. Fran can stay. She's my good friend. Okay if she watches me die, isn't it? Who did it, Georgia? A dancer. Keen dancer. You should have been here for his mambo dancing. It was a show. Who? He stabbed you, Georgia. That makes it all right to tell me. Who was it? He bought five dollars worth of tickets. A man like that, you feel you know. Don't ask his name. It spoils it. With this knife? <laughs> yeah. While dancing. I'm keeping it for a souvenir. Make sure it's with me in the coffin, huh, Danny? Promise. You're a long way from home, Georgia. What brought you here? I like it here. Come here a lot. It's peaceful. The man blows the bugle so peaceful. A crowd, Georgia? Will the boys in the crowd stab you because you're not liked anymore? How can you talk when he's... Listen to it, Danny. Listen. A girl feels young again with music like that. A girl... After that, the place got cluttered up. People started to come into the lounge. Policemen with notebooks. A woman in a tweed suit with a press card in her hat band. A couple of men with a stretcher. The only thing the doctor picked up on his stethoscope was a trumpet blowing what is called the blues. Because there was no heartbeat from Georgia Gray. Because she was dead. Find out why. Go now to Mott Street, where it intersects an alley whose name no one remembers. Climb four flights of stairs and wonder briefly why the quality of sound and light in a tenement is like nothing else in the world. Walk a corridor where mice and men live together in perfect tolerance. And stop at a door. Stand in the light a little bit more so I'll know who's... It's Danny Clover, Benny. Oh, you coming to check? I'm okay, I'm okay. May I come in? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, Danny, I'm okay. Except for the stomach. It hurts when I press it. You've been behaving yourself, Benny? Well, since I got out of the hospital, sure, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm beating now. He taught me to make things out of beads when I was resting in a ward. Belt buckles and ladies' uh, accessories. You know why I came here, don't you? I ain't a stool pigeon no more, Danny. I got cured of that, too. I'm a, I'm a beater now. Who killed Georgia Gray? I'm a beater. How long since you checked in with your parole officer, Benny? Oh, Danny. What about Georgia? You know as much as me. Georgia was close to Nicky Gowan. You know that. Bought his shirts for him. Ran down the drugstore for him. What's the word on Nicky? The crowd ain't happy with him, Danny. Oh, Danny. Leave me alone. I got an order from a lady down the hall for love bracelet. I got to deliver to you there or I'll be breaking my contract. Nothing else, huh? Say, help me, Danny. Nothing. Of course, Nick again. Uh, I'm a beater now. Well, you, huh? Off your beaten path, aren't you, Danny? Inside, Nicky. Oh, strong arm, Danny. I was going to invite you in anyway. Georgia Gray, Nicky. She's dead. Word came to me how you closed her eyes. 
I wish it had been me. Maybe you got there ahead of me, Nicky. Maybe you went dancing, saw Georgia in a place you never thought she'd be. Killed her because she was getting away from you. <laughs> oh, you're tired, Danny. Awful tired. No one gets away from me, not even the dead. Come on into the den. I want you to meet my mother. If she'll be hurt, I don't show her my friends. All right, Nicky. I wouldn't want her to be hurt. You'll wish yours had been like her. Just wait. Mother, look what I brought you, Danny Clover. Sit down, Danny. Have a mint. Nicky has a made-up special for me. Thanks. Well, special, huh? Nothing too good for my mother. It's always been like that with my son. Up to now. Nicky hasn't been good? He let his girl die in a cheap place. Dancing with another man for pay, for dimes. That cheapens his name. You could have stopped it, Nicky? How could I have known, Mother? I told you. Don't snap at me, Nicky boy. I'll slap your mouth. Wash it out with Doit. Georgia liked that hole, Danny. I never understood why. She tried to explain it to me about the music, about dancing. Crazy for dancing. Who understands these things in a girl? When she had everything a girl... Everything you gave her. Everything you worked hard for. You're getting your share, huh, Mother? The funeral, too, Nicky? Will you buy me one like the one you're buying for Georgia? Let me show you the invoices, Danny. I never knew dying came so high. Inflation, huh? Maybe it'll wipe out the taste of what happened to her. Where it happened to her. It's just a maybe, son. Don't build a monument on it. <laughs> Want to know why they killed her, Danny? You know, Mrs. Gannon? They think my son is finished. Done. Used up. They killed a girl to frighten my Nicky boy. And you know what? My boy's frightened. Who does that to you, Nicky? Your friends? Your boys? You'll know when you see their bodies on a slab. It'll be in all the papers. You'll save the clippings for me, huh, Nicky? Oh, isn't she a dream, Danny? I told you. Wonderful girl, my mother. When I got back to headquarters, there was a file on my desk. The neatly centered sticker on its front cover was typed Georgia Gray. Open it. Read it. Digest it. Georgia Gray, age between 25 and 29, computed from data gathered from arrests. Hometown, Salina, Kansas. Followed a soldier to New York Port of Embarkation in 1943, but never caught up with him. So she stayed. Counter girl in a 5 and 10. Then model for ladies' garments. Then nightclub hostess. And two years ago in night court, after losing a race with a squad car, she said she'd retired. Because I don't have to work anymore, she said. No better reason, she asked. Name linked with Nikki Gannon from here on in. Address Park Avenue. Expenses shared by Fran Holland, who said now she'll have to look around. First thing I'm going to do is get another roommate. Did you get along well with Georgia? She had her ideas, I had mine. You know what I mean? Tell me. No, this and that. Georgia was what, a pretty girl? I'd say she was beautiful. Yeah, I guess she was very beautiful. Very. Ah, but she was ruining it. Ran around, danced, but she didn't enjoy herself. I know she didn't. She only enjoyed herself relaxing here with me. Something I haven't made up my mind about. Well, you better make up your mind about it, Danny. Sure. She had all that dough and she lived with a dance hall hostess with me. You know why? Because she needed someone like me. To run home to her. Right. So she could have soft hands rubbing the back of her neck. To bring her cold tomatoes when she needed it. She run often, friend? Look, Danny, she was dance happy. That's why she hung around the place I worked. A little bit of music and a guy in a high waistband with two strong feet could make her smile like she was happy. Did Nicky Gannon mind that she stepped out on him? Why did Nicky care? He used her for a front for his business. He didn't care about her dancing. Who killed her, friend? A man. What else but a man? What man? Who? You know what you ought to do, Danny? You know Tommy Chandler? Nicky's hood? The padded shoulder that stands near Nicky with his hand in his pocket. Ask Tommy. See how he reacts when you ask him. You know where Tommy is? I know where he'll be in the morning. You know where the ducks are in that pond in Central Park? Eight o'clock, he throws them bread. Stale bread. But what do ducks know? That one over there likes pumpernickel, Danny. Here, 
Give him a piece. You'll make an impression. We got none of these advantages at city jail, Tommy. You gonna arrest me, kid? No. Ducks will miss me. You want a piece of Papa Nickel, too, Harm? Sure you do. You see how Harm looked at me, Danny? Sad. Like he already knows about the arrest. What are you taking me down for? We'll think of something. Feeding the pintails in Central Park? I won't be able to hold up the head for the shame, huh? Let's go, kid. That's your squad car over there? You gonna blush when I say suspicion of murder? That's been done to me, too. Hmm. You didn't come out for a long time. Georgia. You got me case for that. Georgia was murdered. Maybe Nicky Gannon goes, too. The whole crowd will miss him. I'll tell you something else. Whoever stabbed George ain't going to be around long, ain't he? The crowd will see to that, huh? I didn't say that. I just said a prediction, that's all. Who takes over if Nicky is rubbed, Tommy? You? Take over what? A backroom poker game for matchsticks? What are you talking about? Look, baby, arrest me if you want, but don't ask me stupid questions. It makes Herm nervous. Here, Herm. Here you are, boy. Herm looked sad when I took Tommy away from him. All the ducks looked sad. For a minute. Then they found a new love with a stale loaf of bread. Swam away, screaming for it. Tommy looked back over his shoulder, stopped to call them a name. Got shoved into the squad car. But on the way down, a code call, a woman's voice in the police radio. Man dead, she announced with a quiet number. Then she said it plain, in an alley, 4th Street, off 6th. Get there, car 62. We got there. Mind if I tag along? Danny, man dead. I recognize from the number. You gotta share these things. Hold your gun on him, Muggerman. He wiggles a toe, break it for him. Pleasure, Danny. Let me through. Let me through. They can't skay anymore, can they, Nicky? Not anymore. He was propped up against the wall, his head thrown back, his mouth open. Like he was trying to tell someone about it. The furtive dog scrubbing for food in the trash, not listening. The small crowd he'd assembled because the blood sighed across his shirt front, but not listening. Watching an alley wind gather soot at his feet. Watching me lean over him. Watching Nicky Gannon. Dead Nicky Gannon. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. You'll find Jack Benny in the desert this Sunday night on CBS. Jack and his gang are making a safari to entertain the boys at an airbase in Nevada. And for more laughs, there'll be another session with Eve Arden as the gay, romantic, fun-loving schoolteacher, our Miss Brooks, on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> Broadway is wide enough for everybody. Generals in open touring cars, blondes in taxis, and sailors against lampposts. It's the place to come to, for one reason or another. To be a tourist, or get stared at by the tourists. To make a pitch, buy a bargain. Get cheated, insulted, or have your picture taken. And end the day with a memory, depending upon what you wanted, what you got, and what you gave for it. And part of the day's memento of Broadway will be the news item. Nicky Gannon shot down in an alley. Hoodlum slain in new outbreak of mob violence. Police seek clues in killing. Especially me and another man, the Sergeant Gino Tartaglia, who had once passed a civil service examination. And the medical examiner, Dr. Sinsky, reveals that death was caused by hemorrhage in the pleura, parentheses, lungs, closed parentheses. And that is why Nicky Gannon was done in. Thanks, Gino. Oh, you're quite welcome, I'm sure. Anything else? May I? Yes, you may. Thank you. You know, Danny, this shooting up an alley brings to man mind a case which was solved by Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well girl detective from London Town. Do we have to, Gino? Lady Jane looked at the deceased and flipped her shiny tuppence. Flipped her what? 
A shiny tuppence. Lady Jane has a lucky tuppence which she flips before she undertakes a case. Ah, uh, that Lady Jane. May I interrupt? Oh, you're the boss. Do you have anything else to tell me about Georgia Gray or Nicky Gannon, please? Oh, indeed I do, Danny. Indeed I do. In the murder of Nicky Gannon, Tommy Chandler, our prime suspect, has been released. And without a nickel's worth of bail. What? I have said it. So help me if you're kidding, Gino. Why was he released? Oh, because another fellow has confessed to the deed. You remember Cozy Barrett? Even at this moment, he is with Sergeant Mugovan, confessing all over the place. And that, Danny, is all the news I have for today. Case is solved, huh, Danny? Yes, and that ain't all of it, Sergeant. George ain't all of it. Lots of people met with me then ended up under a sheet in the ice house. You killed before, Cozy? Oh, hi, Danny. Come on in. Join the fun. This is a new kick, isn't it, Cozy, for you? Confessing to a murder? What's the matter? You don't trust me? Read me to him, Sergeant. I'll brief it for you, Danny. Cozy says he took a pocket full of dimes to the diamond dance joint where Georgia Gray was. To celebrate the end of a perfect day, he tells me. You danced with her, Cozy? Sure I dance. How else I get close enough to kill? You didn't like the way she danced, huh? Crazy for it. Dream about it. Who else I dance away my hard-earned door? That buys you her dying, too, huh? Ah, oh, she gives his insults. And from a foot away, that. But I got close. Eventually I got close. Yeah, yeah. Get on the phone, Muggerman. Have a policewoman sent up here with a portable radio. Danny, you all right? You've been working so hard. Do you... you got a thing against telephones, Muggerman? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. Uh, what are you going to do, Danny? Yes, you got Muggerman. tricks with batteries and portable radios to make people talk? Uh -huh. I'm talking. Why you need electricity? Should be right up, Danny. Hey, uh, you're going to put me away, huh, Danny? To the sound of music, huh? You treat me nice because I'm nice to you, huh? Killing. A little out of your line, isn't it, Cozy? I always figured you as more of the purse snatcher type, the jackroll kid, the friend a drunk finds in an alley. Well, I got a right to come up in the world, ain't I? This gives me class, a reputation, the things a fellow needs so he can admire himself in the night. Sure, I understand. man has to get ahead. You sent for me, Lieutenant? You want this? Yes, come in, please. Turn on the radio. Go on, turn it on to dance music. That'll be all right. Dance with the lady, Cozy. Huh? Go on, dance with her. <laughs> yeah, you're crazy, Danny. I give myself up to you and you, you, you go crazy. There are people like me, honest. Dance with her like you did with Georgia. Show me how it was with Georgia. You know I can't dance, Danny. You know I wouldn't go near a dame to dance with her. They laugh in my face when they see me coming. You're never near Georgia Gray, were you? Uh, Not even close enough to... Then they promised me they'd get me off, Danny. They said confess, and then when I got off, they'd give me the big dough. Who promised you all that? Well, friends, Danny. I, I got good friends. They they, they, they promised me things. They, they called me up and, and, and promised me things. <laughs> you got to lock me up, Danny, so I don't disappoint them. You got to lock me up. Make it come true for him, Muggerman. Lock him up. <laughs> Now the afternoon was two hours old, and the gray had turned into a wetness, a drizzle that hung scurling in the air before it touched the pavement. But the citizens didn't mind getting wet. It was a sight to see. The funeral procession wasn't very long, not like the good old days when a gangster's death took up a mile of Broadway. Not like the good old days at all. None of the mourners walked, they all rode. And the wreaths were wrapped in cellophane, which not only protected the snapdragons from the rain, but it was more sanitary. I went along because I'd known Nicky Gannon for a long time. The rain let up a little when they lowered him into his grave. And none of the mourners stayed, not even his mother. And I wanted to talk to his mother. Mrs. Gannon? Hello, Danny. You want to ride back to town? I wanted to tell you how sorry I... You talk like that, you don't ride with me. Come on. My son was a hoodlum. Why should you be sorry for him? We've talked together. We've had a beer together. That's the reason. You cry. Not me. Whatever you want. He was your son. My son got scared. A man gets scared, a man don't live anymore. And that's all his dying does to you, Mrs. Gannon? Look what I've got, Danny. A thug's funeral on a rainy day. He was your son. He's dead, Danny. 
I'm not. I'll think about them. Some things will come up in my mind from time to time that I've forgotten about right now. And I'll smile. And I'll think nice about Nikki then. Do you know who killed him? I know. Who? I said I know. The same person who killed Georgia? If I let you out of the car now, you'll get wet. You're going to do anything about the person who killed Nikki? I'm sure of it, Danny. Sure of what? It's going to rain all day. Funny, ain't it? The paper said it was. In a hurry, Danny Clover? Yeah, I am. Bother you, mister? Mm Mm-hmm. But it bothers me more, your unhappiness. Let's have a good cry over it in my office, huh? You in the hallway suits me. I used to draft your hallways, spend my life in them, waiting to do things for unhappy people. Spreader of good cheer. That's your business at police headquarters, Mr... What name do you spread it under? Forbes, Counselor at Law, my card. Forbes, Counselor at Law. Someone came to you, said I was unhappy. You took the case. Almost precisely how it happened. They told you what makes me sad. Kindly people, they grieve when a policeman throws away a confessed killer. Cozy Barrett? It seems to them almost ungrateful. However, they respect your analytical prowess. You got something I can hang on my wall that says that? Something much better. Silver cup, maybe, with an inscription. Better? An envelope, Manila with money. It could take you hours to count. No silver cup, huh? Better? A bonus, the killer. The real true killer of George and Nicky. That could bring you so much happiness to a man like you. Where do I find it? Mm, where else? Envelope and killer. The Diamond Dance Palace, where Georgia danced upstairs, one o'clock. That's this morning. Be there in a smile of grow on your face. You've brought me true happiness, Counselor. Thank you. Then he walked away. At the end of the hall, he stopped and looked back over his shoulder, grinned at me. Then he turned up his collar and walked out into the street. This was at 7 p.m. Then a walk down Broadway and dinner and a double feature on 42nd Street. Then it was time to go. The Diamond Dance Hall was blaring against its time of closing. I walked through it, pushed my way across the floor into a doorway. No one stopped me. Then up a flight of stairs and into a loft littered with old telephone books, cigarette butts, and a neatly stacked bundle of year-old newspapers. The only light, the light from the spectaculars down the street, spelling out the evening's pleasure. Forty girls, forty, no cover charge. Up front with Willie and Joe, continuous performance. Chinese food, fried rice, and dancing. I waited. I didn't wait long. You here, Danny? Come on in, Tommy. Thanks. I brought you some. Here. It's all yours, Danny. Who is he? The killer that got promised to you. Dead? Uh huh. You bring the envelope, Tommy? <laughs> You bring it? <laughs> sure. Sure, I brought it. Yeah. Count it at your leisure. 15,000, kid. I don't know, Tommy. A dead killer. How am I going to explain a dead killer? I thought of that, too. What did you come up with? Danny, I found a guy in Skid Row. He wasn't doing anybody any good. So I figured he could do us some good. So you shot him? With a police positive. Just like you, carry. Here's the gun. You track this killer down, he tried to escape, you shot him, makes you a hero. That's right. And how many heroes have $15,000? <laughs> We're going to get along fine. You've taken over for Gannon? I deserve, don't I? Yeah, yeah, you do. Killing Georgia and Nicky Gannon, sure you deserve it. To courage. You don't know how much. Had me sweating there for a while that she didn't die right away. Only... Georgia was a girl with character. Live and let live. Die and let live. Great girl. Well, I call you from time to time, Danny. Wait a minute, Tommy. Get used to it, Danny. I said I'd call you. Don't go away. You're under arrest for murder. You practicing being a cop? Don't be a cop around me. You forgot something, Tommy. I can't be anything else. Let's go. 
Because you're pointing the police positive. You got trouble, sucker? <laughs> it's that way all over. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Don't let me fall! I got your coat! Don't! Don't let me fall! I, I don't want to die that way! Hold me! Yeah! Daddy! Daddy, hold! Hold me! His fingers clawed against the sheer stone. Daddy! Body twisting. Face tortured. Daddy! Pleading for a return to life. Daddy! His body hung there below me. Out of reach. Daddy! Then the fabric that held his life together gave way. Daddy! And the noise of the street came up to meet him. Till they scream. When I got outside and walked through the gathering crowd, I remembered something in my hand. Tommy Chandler's torn coat. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. The place to come to, erase what's happened, start all over, make a memory, and try to forget it, if you can. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Anthony Barrett was heard as Tommy Chandler, Francis Cheney as Fran Holland, Martha Wentworth as Mrs. Gannon, Larry Dobkin as Nicky Gannon, Joy Terry as Georgia Gray, Leo Cleary as Benny Fane, and Junius Matthews as Cozy. Every Saturday night on CBS, Jan Murray gets on that coast-to-coast phone and gives away $1,000 at a crack if you can identify the phantom voice. Be listening for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Willie Inch, did you say? Just a second. Do you want to talk to a fellow named Willie Inch, which I doubt? No. He says he's got to see you, got to. Who is he? I'll ask. Uh, Mr. Wolf doesn't recognize your name, Mr. Inch. He wants to know who you are. Uh, Just a second, I'll tell him. Mr. Inch says he's a sneak thief. He says you never heard of him, but he's heard of you. Should I tell him to get lost? Wait a minute, Archie. Ask him what he wants. Uh, Inch, Mr. Wolf wants to know what you want to see him about. A phony murder rap. This is a phony murder rap. It'd have to be, wouldn't it, Archie? How do you mean? Phony, I mean. Did you ever hear of a sneak thief committing murder if it could possibly be avoided? Yes, Archie. Tell Mr. Inch. I'll listen to his story. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Mr. Wolf and I talk about this little difficulty. He calls it the case of Archie Goodwin and how he got hooked. However, I call it the case of the disappearing diamonds. I prefer my title. He prefers his. 
Anyhow, it started with an improbable character named Willie Inch. That'll be our sneak thief, Archie. Let him in. Okay, boss. Okay. Inch? Yeah. Come in. In there. I'll follow you. Mr. Wolf, this is your client. Mr. Inch? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Tall fellow. Must be over six feet six. Sit down. Uh, where? Archie? Here, Mr. Inch. This ought to be comfortable. Where, well, Mr. Inch? Uh, uh, look, Mr. Wolf. They're going to claim that I killed a woman I never even touched. And I'm going to fry for something I never even done. All right, Mr. Inch. How did you kill her? I didn't. I didn't. I never killed nobody in my life. Mr. Inch, you say you're a thief. Can you prove it? Uh, I got a record. Why? I was wondering about that bulge in your pocket. Oh. Oh, here? It's, uh, it's a silver cigarette lighter, ain't it? I guess it sort of dropped into my pocket as I was going by. Y- you see? You see the way it happened? Never mind, Miss Dange. Now tell me how you didn't kill the woman for whose murder you will fry. Well, well, Mr. Wolf, sir, it, it was like this. There was a window half open, you see, and I happened to crawl inside the house. But hey, now. Well, Miss Dange? This, uh, this is just between us, ain't it? Possibly. How do you mean? Explain, Archie. Mr. Wolf said possibly. Oh. Well, uh, okay. So I happen to find myself in the bedroom, see? So I happen to sort of roam around, and I hear there's like a party going on. You know, people and music. So I lock the door. So go on. Let him carry it his own way, Archie. Well, Miss Lynch? Uh, so that's the mistake I make. A mistake? Uh, maybe I, I leave my fingerprints on the door. So? so? So later, a dame gets herself knocked off in the same room, and they look for fingerprints, and they find mine. I'm it. That's all. I, I got a record. So, so the chair. I see. Pitiful case, isn't it, Archie? Very, very mournful. Inch. Uh, yes, sir. I presume you came away with some souvenirs? Oh, nothing. It wasn't worth the trouble. You know, just odds and ends, junk. Have you got the junk with you? Yeah. Let me see. Uh, here. Cigarette case, platinum. Lighter, gold. Vanity case, gold. That's, that's all? Mm, positively. Junk, the man says. I promise nothing, Mr. Inch, but it might be better if you told the truth. Me? You. Oh, well. Mm. One square cut emerald ring. I, I just happened to find it. <laughs> it's something more. A pewter ashtray. Look, the room is dark. I can't see. Piles of coats under beds and hats and handbags. I take what I find. Why didn't you turn on the lights? One of these big standing lamps. You know what I mean. Go on. I bump into it, and it scares the living... I mean, it scares me. So? I I turn the switch, it don't work. Archie. That sounds like the law, boss. The law. Stay right where you are, Willie. May I suggest there is a way to find out, Archie? Okay, okay. We don't want any. Good morning, Goodwin. You remember me, your old friend, Inspector Kramer? Two gentlemen with me are also with the department, Pearly and Ostrakovich. May we come in? What do you want? We want a murderer, and we want some rocks worth 250 grand. Does that answer your question? What makes you think you'll find all those goodies here? Come in, man. We know Willie Inch is here. Where is he? Now, just a second. We're coming with you, Goodwin. Okay, Inspector, come along. Uh, the law. That's Willie Inch. Frisk him. Uh, no weapons? Okay, just put the cuffs on him. Inspector Kramer. Oh, yes. Hello, Wolf. I want to tell you something about this man whom you and your men have so bravely captured in my office. You don't need to tell me about him, Wolf. We know about him. Do you indeed? Yes. We know he killed Mrs. Florence Avery March and stripped a quarter of a million worth of diamonds off her. That's all we need to know. I didn't do no such a thing. Where's the ice, Willie? I never even seen none, honest. Take him away, boys. I'll make the charge when I get back to my office. Wait. Uh, Mr. Wolf, sir. Take him. Look, I ain't done nothing, I tell you. Inspector Kramer. Yeah. We're going to have a little talk now, aren't we? If necessary. How do you mean? Explain, Archie. Uh, Mr. Wolf means you're going to have a little talk if necessary. Very funny. I will now draw up a chair and show you why it's necessary. In the first place, $250,000 worth of diamonds makes it necessary. Archie, if you please, a bottle of beer. Okay. Will the inspector name his poison? You know I never drink on duty. 
Then just for me, Archie, please. On my way. While I opened a bottle of imported beer, it occurred to me that I had something to be grateful for. At least I wasn't in Willie Inch's enormous shoes. And as I went back to the office, I had time to wonder why Mr. Wolf would stick his fat neck out for a no good like Willie. Thank you, Archie, and sit down, Archie. Inspector Kramer has a theory that may amuse you. Nero Wolf's office. It's for you, Inspector. Hello, Kramer. Yeah? A gold cigarette holder? That's all? Okay. Inspector, do you realize that you have already taken a great deal of my time? Archie. Yes, Inspector? The great Mr. Wolf just said I had a theory that might amuse you. Would you care to hear it? I can hardly wait. Okay. My theory is that both Wolf and you are receivers of stolen property and possibly guilty of murder conspiracy. So far, you got me in stitches. <laughs> Willie Inch, with a record as long as your arm, robs the home of Mrs. Florence Avery Marsh. He strangles her with a silk scarf, takes the diamond she's wearing, grabs everything else that's lying around, and then what? Is it a question? I'll tell you what. He will, too. <laughs> Archie, listen, listen. Dan Inch brings the stuff here, the stuff that's piled on Wolf's desk and the diamonds. You want me to tell you where the diamonds are? They're in that safe right there. Inspector Kramer, I know nothing about the diamonds. They are not in the safe and they're not in the house. Now, you can take my word for it, or you can get a search warrant and make a fool of yourself. I'm going to have lunch. By two o'clock, the newspapers were full of the murder of Mrs. Florence Avery March. The suspect was already in custody, caught at the home of Nero Wolf, well-known private investigator. Some of the stolen jewelry had been recovered, but not the diamonds. Then we had a visit from Mr. Anson Stark, who had opened Mrs. March's door and found her dead. Stark was a big athletic guy of about 30 or so, with the large, capable hands of a surgeon or a laboratory worker. He seemed annoyed at the inconvenience we caused him, but that was only natural. That's the story, Mr. Wolf. I don't see how I can add anything more to it. Uh, you had known Mrs. March for several years, huh? Mm, casually. When you broke the door open, uh, was it difficult? Not very. You were the first into the room? There were three or four of us. We pushed in together. You saw the body of Mrs. March immediately? She was lying across the bed that was heaped with coats and hats and handbags. You knew she was dead? Of course not. In fact, somebody else discovered that she had been choked to death. And who discovered that the diamonds were gone? I don't know. I didn't. Uh, were there many diamonds, Mr. Stark? No, just a few, but big ones. She wore them on a pendant around her neck. Mr. Stark, I want to thank you again for having been so patient. I have been patient, Mr. Wolf. I have my own business to attend to. Which is? Oh, I have a small but hopeful enterprise. Electronics, tubes for radio and television. Mostly experimental. Well, that reminds me, Mr. Stark. When you entered the bedroom, was the light on or off? Uh, let me see. Of course, it was on. It must have been on. Why? Just curiosity, Mr. Stark. Oh? Anything more? That's all, except thank you for coming here. Archie, will you take Mr. Stark to the door? Mr. Stark departed like a man who'd been delayed by a petty annoyance. A few minutes later, the door buzzed, and I went, expecting anything. Anything but what was standing on the threshold when I opened up. A honey blonde. Or, to put it another way, a blonde honey. I said hello. No, more like hello. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, I'm his assistant, Archie Goodwin, and what can we do for you? Well, I'm Valerie Ladd. And I'm Archie Goodwin. Or did I tell you that? Well, that's exactly where I came in. Well, I mean, where well, I thought you were going to ask me to come in. Oh, come in, come in. I'm sorry. Well, is he, is he here? Wolf? Mm -hmm. uh, does he know you? No. Is he expecting you? No. I see. Of course you don't see, do you? Well, uh, this is it, Mr. Goodwin. I'm a writer. Well, I may not look like it, but that's what I am. And I want to do a, a profile, a character study of Mr. Wolf for a magazine. Uh oh Well... What's wrong? Well, you see, there's a writer named Rex Stout. Oh, I know. He's written a lot about Nero Wolf, but... Well, can't I write about him, too? I don't know if he's going to like it. 
But you can't be shot for trying. Come on. Mr. Wolf, this is Valerie Ladd. Pardon me for not rising, Miss Ladd. It is not impolite. It is merely impracticable. Miss Ladd wants to write about you for a magazine. Please, Mr. Wolf. Nonsense. Mr. Wolf, if I could just spend a few hours with you, that would be enough. Would it indeed? Oh, yes. Have you written much, Miss Ladd? Oh, reams. You know, uh, the habits of writers interest me. The habits? Yeah, the writing habits. For instance, do you use a pen or a pencil? Do you dictate, or like most writers, do you do your own typing? Mr. Wolf, if you knew the hours and days and, and years that I've pounded a typewriter. Of course. Archie. Yes, sir. Why don't you take Miss Ladd up and show her the orchids? You never know about Nero, Wolf. At least I never do. This was something I would have bet against a thousand to one. I couldn't understand it. But I certainly couldn't complain. Archie, look at this one. Oh, did you ever see anything so gorgeous? Very pretty. Ah, they're all just beyond belief. Yeah? But you're not even looking at them, Archie. What? Oh! <laughs> Archie, are you always like this? What do you mean, like this? Well, so... So distant and preoccupied. Honey, you got me wrong. Completely. I was thinking. Oh. Yeah, about telephone numbers. It's <laughs> a lovely thing to think about. What can you think about telephone numbers? I was thinking how some girls have them and some don't. Oh, I see. Archie, I apologize. For what? I did have you wrong. You're not a bit distant. I can be a lot closer than this, honey. What is it? What's what? The number. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's in the book. Yeah? I wonder. Hmm. Sound as if you don't believe me. Oh, I believe you, but uh, here's a telephone book here. Let's lick it up together, shall we? Uh, Archie. Yeah? I, I'm afraid I lied to you. I was afraid of that, too. Are you angry? Well, I can take no for an answer, honey. Even when it's hard to take. Archie? I've changed my mind. I want you to have my number. And I want you to use it, too. You know, honey, I'm beginning to take an interest in this dialogue. Let's have it. Okay. Olympia 9, 3659. And a very, very pretty number it is. Valerie Ladd. Two Ds? Mm-hmm. Olympia 9, 3659. Honey Blonde. Gorgeous. Oh. Spelled gorgeous. There. Uh, what are we doing tonight, Olympia 9? And I said that you were distant and preoccupied. Oh, we were talking about tonight. <laughs> All right, Archie. Yes, I'd love it. Oh, these orchids, they're really beyond belief. And you won't even look at them. True. I'm too busy looking at you. Well, how do I look, Archie? Beyond belief, honey. <laughs> beyond belief. Well, there goes the good one luck again. It's a house phone part. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. He wants us to come down. Archie. Yes, dear. Even if he says no, we uh, we still have a date. Honey, though the heavens fall. When we entered the office, Mister Wolf was frowning over a sheet of letter paper in his hand. He looked up and tossed the paper to me. That is a peculiar thing, Archie. The sheet of letter paper just arrived. Since Miss Ladd is interested in detection, show it to her. Thank you. Well, well some sort of code, isn't it? Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P. That's all. What do you suppose it means? You're kidding. Archie. Oh. What? Did I say something wrong? No, 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 no. Miss Laird, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I haven't time for an interview just now. Goodbye, Miss Laird. Oh, but Mr. Wolf. Goodbye, Archie. Say goodbye to Mr. Wolf and let's go. Honey. Goodbye. That's the way things can be around here. Well, uh, here's the door, and shall we, uh, shall we pause for station identification? Mm -hmm. oh. I'll wipe it off, Archie. There. Thanks. Well, what happened, Archie? Yes, indeed. Yeah, oh, Mr. Wolf, I mean. Oh. Why did he suddenly want me to go? 
Well, I'll tell you, though, I don't know whether I should. That, that code message he showed you? Yes. Quirk you up? You remember. Yeah, sure, because I use a typewriter. From left to right, it's the first bank of letters on any typewriter. I see. It was a test. Yeah. And you flunked it, baby. You're no writer. Archie, I, I, I can explain sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. Tonight. Tonight, Archie. You do believe me, don't you, Archie? Oh, of course, baby, of course. Well, it's just that I was there at the party, I mean, when, when poor Florence was murdered. Then I read in the paper about, well, how they caught the man at Nero Wolf's. And I always wanted to be a writer, so I thought if I could get an exclusive interview and... Well, that would be a good way to start my career, wouldn't it? Yes, yes, it would. Uh, pardon me a second, will you, Valerie? i got to make a phone call. There's a booth. It'll only take a minute or two. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, I'm at the Riviera with Valerie Ladd. I'm happy for you, Archie. I will remind you that I have not seen you since Valerie left the house. I was otherwise occupied, Archie. With orchids. With orchids? What do you want, Archie? Look, with that typewriter gag, you practically told me she was a phony, didn't you? Of course, of course. Just for the record, how did you know? Have you looked at her fingernails? She never touched a typewriter in her life. I wanted to be sure. Okay, now... Now, do you want me to tell you something? You mean that your charming companion, Valerie, was at the party when Mrs. March was murdered? How did you know that? Simple, Archie. I got a list of the guests from Inspector Kramer. Among them was the name of Valerie Ladway. Simple? Ladway. Lad. Yeah, sure. Okay, what am I supposed to do about it? Just hang on, Archie. Just hang on. I went back to the honey blonde, the beautiful phony Valerie Ladd, Ladwell. I mean, I went back to the table where she should have been, but she wasn't there. I sat down and waited. Looked at my watch, 11.24. 11.32, no Miss Ladway. 11.45, I finally realized that not only Valerie, but her coat and bag were also absent. I called the waiter. Yes, sir? Uh, what happened to my friend? The young lady left some time ago, sir. Okay, give me the bill. She paid it, sir. She did? Yes, sir. In fact, she said you gave her the money for it. Yeah? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, I didn't know it, but she is certainly right. Oh. Oh, my. Well, Archie, this is most thoughtless of you. Sorry, I, uh... I lost my keys. My money, too. Your keys, Archie? Yeah. Glad you were still up. You lost Miss Ladway, too? Definitely. I'm going to bed. Good night, Archie. You think it's funny, don't you? <laughs> yes, Archie. Yes, yes, I do. Good night, Mr. Wolf. Archie. Yeah? Before you retire, one thing. What? Open the safe, will you? And leave it open. Why? Because there's nothing in it of importance. And it's a valuable save and I don't want it damaged. Good night, Archie. At about two o'clock in the morning, I thought I heard a noise. I got up, put on the rest of my pajamas, picked up my gun and went down to the office. The man had his head in the safe and everything was scattered all over. I stepped inside the door. Put your hands behind your back and stand up. Okay. Now, just what are you after, bud? Uh... When I woke up, I was alone on the office floor. I did not feel good. The place looked as if a hurricane had struck it. Every file drawer had been empty. I felt a draft from somewhere. Got to my feet, trying not to joggle my head too much. It was the front door standing open. It closed it gently. 
Then very, very gently, I groped my way to the kitchen for ice, water, and towels. Margie! What? Oh, didn't you hear me scream? No. Is it bad? It's better. You're angry, aren't you? Nuts. What are you? I said nuts, Mr. Wolf. Nuts. I'm sorry about what happened. Yeah, you expected it. But I didn't expect you to be caught by somebody behind you. You must have known there would have been two of them. Now, how would I know that? How? Think of Mr. Ladway's delicate hands. Do you believe she intended to open the safe herself? You think she stole my keys and so on? Well, let me tell you... Hey, wait. That guy was digging in the safe that... Then who hit me in the head? (laughs) Ah, gee, someday you'll be the death of me. In the morning, will you tell Inspector Kramer I'd like to see him here? Fuming and protesting, Kramer arrived about 1.30. When I let him into the office, Mr. Wolfe was gazing thoughtfully at the ground floor plan of the house of the late Mrs. Florence Avery March. We'd gotten it from the original architects. Wolfe looked up and almost smiled. Thank you for coming to me, Inspector. You know how difficult it is for me to come to you. Okay, okay, what's up? I take it you haven't found the diamonds. No, not yet. We'll break inch down, though. Don't think we won't. Oh, I'm sure. But this is what I want to ask you, and it's quite serious. Okay, okay, all right, what? After the body was found, your men arrived at the house before anyone left. Right. And before anybody was allowed to go, every person was searched thoroughly. Nobody could have gotten a pin or a needle out of that place. I know something about police methods, and I believe you. Now, how thoroughly did you search the house itself? Wolf, look. We've got that floor plan you're studying now. There are no hidden closets. Every square inch of that house has been examined. The diamonds aren't there. Willie Inch killed the dame and snatched the diamonds. What he did with them, we'll find out. Possibly, possibly. Goodbye, Inspector. At approximately 3.15, the postman arrived with an envelope for me. The envelope contained my keys, the bill from the Riviera, and the money left after the check was paid. At approximately 5.07 p.m., I discovered that Wolf had been using the telephone all by himself. He explained. He was going to have a party. He had invited all of the guests who were at Mrs. Florence Avery March's somewhat fatal party, including Anson Stark, Willie Inch, and Valerie. Nero Wolf, the natural-born ham, he made an entrance that would have been worthy of Queen Victoria in her heavier days. He sat in his oversized throne behind his oversized desk and beamed at the peasants. Valerie moved toward me. I'm... I'm sorry, Archie, but you must know why I did it. Why? But you said I wasn't a writer. I wanted to prove that you weren't a detective. Did you take the stuff while we were dancing? I could have, couldn't I? You could have bumped me on the head last night, too, couldn't you? Oh, Archie. Let it go. It was humiliating, though. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you realize the purpose of this party. We want to know who killed Mrs. March and what became of her diamonds. Mr. Inch. Uh, Yeah? When you visited the room where the body was found, the room was dark? Uh, The bulb was burned out. I tried to turn it on. If there had been a body on the bed, would you have seen it? Maybe. With all those coats, maybe not. Sure. Mr. Stark? Yes, I said the light was on. Perhaps I was wrong. What of it? You're engaged in the manufacture of tubes for radio and television, huh? I told you that. Inspector Kramer. Yeah, what? A light bulb was found in the wastebasket in the room where Mrs. March died. Yeah. Like you said, we tried the bulb in the socket and it worked. So what? One more question. Does anybody remember whether Mr. Stark was carrying a bundle or a package... Under his arm when he arrived at Mrs. March's party. Oh, I do, Mr. Wolf. I think he had a box of flowers. That's true. I did bring flowers. No, Mr. Stark. That box contained two parts of a light bulb and some adhesive. During the party, you strangled Mrs. March, put the diamonds into the light bulb, assembled the thing, and screwed it into the lamp socket. Archie, stop him! Really, Archie, it was quite simple. Light bulbs are only a stem glass bowl and a brass sheet. 
Yet nobody, including the police, would think of looking inside one. Mr. Stark could come back and collect his treasure any time after the excitement had died down. What's the matter, Archie? I got a headache. Valerie Ladd. Lad me. Poor girl. She and whoever the man was with her must have thought the diamonds were here. That bump on your head will be better in the morning. A bottle of beer, please, Archie. I'm going to bed. <laughs> yes. Why must you place such confidence in women? Remember what happened to Mark Antony and Samson and Archie Goodwin. <laughs> Good night, Archie. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. This is an Edwin Fadiman production. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and G.G. Pearson, Bud Heaston, Gray Stafford, Dick Ryan, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Midnight Ride. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, yeah, hello, Doc, how are you? <laughs> what? In trouble, you? <laughs> More trouble, you attract trouble, Archie, hang up. It's our dentist, Dr. Thrumming. Let him wait. We never can find him when we need him. Tell him it's after office hours. Doc. Doc, you're talking so fast, I can't make head and the tails of it. Look, look, listen, Doc, come on over here and we'll be able to hear you. It'll only take you a few minutes. Right. You consistently disobey me. I want to work on my paper about odontoclasms. Doc Thrummick has a friend who's in some trouble and he needs our advice. Besides, we owe Doc a fair-sized little bill, remember? Money again, Archie. Money is the curse of our times. Yeah, man, bring on all the curses that is available. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This story is one we refer to as the case of the Midnight Ride. Oh, yeah, there was a ride, all right. But it would never have happened if we hadn't received another phone call a few minutes after our Dr. Thrummig phone. It was late in the evening, and Nero Wolf was studying his paper on orchids while I was absorbed in playing some phonograph records. Archie, Archie, not so loud. I can't possibly think when you play that infernal thing at such volume. What was that you said, boss? I said I can't understand why you can't get music from a phonograph without vibrating the top of the instrument. That's right, that's right. I can't understand why the neighbors haven't called the police. Do you hear that, Archie? Archie! All right, I'll answer. You're fired, naturally. Hello? Hello. Is this Archie Goodwin? I know, Mr. Wolf's... What? Me? Archie. Yeah, who is it? I need help, Archie, please. Come at once. Please. Oh, please. You and Nero. Who is this? This is Gloria Bo No. No, don't. Gloria who? Ronaldo West. Hello? 
Hello. Well, did you hear that? Another female by. What happened? Boss, who do you know named Gloria? Gloria? I know nothing about anyone named Gloria. She said her name was Gloria something. I couldn't quite get the last name. But she did say Ronaldo Road. Well, it's quite possible that she resides on Ronaldo Road. First she asked if this was Archie Goodwin speaking, and before I had a chance to say anything, she asked me to come to her at once. She needed help. And for you to bring me along. I mean, for me to bring Nero along. You don't even know what you're talking about. Well, she said she was Gloria Barr or Mar or something like that. And then she said Ronaldo Road West. And then the scream, and that's all there was. Hmm. The usual pattern of your experience with women. Sounded like a hand was slapped over her mouth or she was grabbed by the throat. Bring Nero with you. I am taking no more assignments this week. Ronaldo Road West, where is it? I don't believe there is a Ronaldo Road West. If I remember correctly, Ronaldo Road runs north and south and is approximately 12 miles long. But she said west. What she probably tried to say when she was interrupted was Ronaldo Road West Chester. West Chester, of course. Asked Inspector Kramer to try to check on that phone call. I'll ask him to try. By the way, do you expect to find this Gloria alive, Archie? I certainly hope so. And are you aware that if someone strangled her, then they must have heard her speak your name? Yes, and yours too. Shall I open it, boss? Why not? Let us face it, Archie. Huh? It's me, Archie. (laughs) Wait till I slide the night chain off, Dr. Thrummy. My nose. (laughs) I forgot all about you, Doc. Where have you been? It's only been three or four minutes. I have never had such a disturbing night since I had my first patient. But at first I was afraid to leave the house. And why were you so afraid, Dr. Thrummy? There were two men sitting in front of my place in the car. Oh, oh, good evening, Nero. Uh, Were they waiting for you, Doctor? Why not? It's very likely. Since she called me, I've been so completely unnerved. Here, Doc, here. Have some brandy. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, I never... uh, Well, that is... uh, Well, a small one. I I am upset. Uh, You understand, Archie. Uh, Ah, ah. Oh, well, that's better. Just who called you and upset you so? Oh, hello, Nero. Did someone call me? Uh, when? You phoned me frantically that a woman called you. I couldn't understand you on the phone. Oh, yes, yes, poor Gloria. She was cut off. Oh, Gloria. Did you say Gloria? Well, didn't I? I thought I did. Oh, dear. What did you say? I said Gloria. Oh, my, isn't that strange? I thought that's what I said. No, no, no more, please. We just had a call from Gloria. Who is Gloria? Well, you remember. We all went to school together. Uh, That is... Oh, you do too remember. Uh, Gloria, you know, she was... um... Uh, Just what is Gloria's last name, Dr. Thrumming? Well, it was Gloria Barnesworth. I don't know what it is now. That's what she was trying to say to me, Barnesworth. Did she tell you where to find her? Uh, No, she didn't. Uh, Oh, dear me. She was just about to tell me when I said I'd call you and Archie and get your help. And then she was cut off. How do you know she's the Gloria Barnesworth you knew and I'm supposed to know? My. Uh, could you open the windows? Why, yes. Archie. Uh, oh, sorry, Doc. The air outside's contaminated. Oh, is that so? With what? Oxygen. Mm, oh, these factories, factories, factories. Oh, well, I found her picture in an old class photo. Here it is. Oh, yeah, now I remember. But, Doc, you and this gal were several years ahead of me in school. I, I'm not in this picture, so she must be about 40 now. Well, gentlemen, you both seem to have the situation well in hand now. So, if you'll excuse me, I will retire to my room. Oh, oh, oh yes, but we don't have anything figured out yet. Ah, but you will. Let me know in the morning how successful you have been. Good night. Well, anyway, a woman called here, and just as she was about to tell me who she was and her address, she was cut off as though she was strangled. Archie, did you say someone strangled her? I don't know, Doc. I hope not. Well, let's start our search along Ronaldo Road. Archie, Archie, don't answer it. They're after me. The men in the car, they saw me come in here. After you, nonsense. They found out Gloria phoned me. Don't let them in. Now, how could you know all that? Oh, dear me. Do you mind? A short one? I'm so weak tonight. Please, Archie, don't open it. I warn you. Just relax, Doc. I'll handle this. Good evening. Evening. Are you Archie Goodwin? Uh, no, he is. Yes. No, I'm not. He is. Put up your hands. Unhook the night chain. Now just turn off this light. Oh, right. 
told you. I told you. Where's Wolf? Oh, he's been in bed for hours. And who is this little man? Uh, why, I'm... Don't you know? This is my, uh, my, my brother, Brother Cuthbert. Yes, he's quite right. I'm a bit older than he is. Shut up, uh... Cuthbert. All right, get your coats and hats off that rack. What for? We're all going for a little ride along the river. And it's a bit chilly. Oh, dear me. Uh, I feel faint. I'm getting dizzy. Get your hat. Uh, yes, sir. And put that bottle down. Yes, but it's so cold out there. Get tonight. along. Here's the car. Now, Mr. Goodwin, hand over that gun in your pocket. But I haven't got... Okay, there you are. Thank you. Now, get in the car. You get in the front seat with the driver, Goodwin. Your brother can get back with me. Okay, you know where we're going, driver. Yeah, yeah but... Yeah, but I... what? Get going. But do you know who this guy is? I do. Why? Well, now, look, I... Well, this guy is Archie Goodwin. What if he is? Well, this won't work. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be Goodwin. He's with Nero Wolf. What's your name, pal? I can't see you, but I seem to recognize your voice. Well, well, you see, it was like this. I was in a... Are you going to shut up and start driving? Okay, okay, I'm going. Now, see here, it's getting very late. I, I don't like this. Uh, where are you taking us? Keep calm, Doc. Yeah, don't get excited. Just take it easy. Listen, Goodwin, I got a record Shut for up, you. Shut my... What's the idea back of all this, friend? We're off the road here, driver. Yes, but we're way out in the country. Now, we'll all get out here. Now, wait a minute. I said get out. You too, driver. Oh, now, wait a second. What's the big idea? Now, all of you start walking over to that clump of trees. Go on. <laughs> What's he going to do? What do you think? Okay, that's good. Just stand there. Now get out your gun, driver. Get... Oh, now wait a minute. This is the way you Get out your gun and don't turn around, driver. Now let him have it. Go on or I'll kill you. I don't go in for this kind of stuff. Besides, come on. Shoot your gun into them. Go on. Oh! Now just drop your gun on the ground. There. Now I will take Goodwin's gun and after I finish with it, I'll just toss it over beside his body. You what? Hey, now wait a minute. You'll notice I have gloves on. Hey, Doc. Dr. Thrumming. You all right, Doc? Oh, Oh, Archie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got you into this. I, I can't last long. Where are you hit? Tell Nero I make him a present of his new bridge work I put in. Let me have a look at you. I wanted to die in my bed with my friends around You're me. You're not bleeding. I wanted the choir to sing. What? I'm not bleeding? No. Are you? No. The driver was a bad shot. He missed both of them. Then what am I doing down here on the ground? You fainted at the first shot. I dropped purposely on the second shot. He missed every time. Come on, get up from there. Uh, We're very lucky people. Uh, what became of them? Hand me my gun. Oh, oh, is this your gun? Wrap it in this handkerchief. Come over here. Yep. Here he is, the driver. And he's dead. This is dreadful, Archie. What do we do now? You got a lighter? Uh, here's my pocket flash. Well, here's his gun beside him. Don't touch it. We'll look through his pockets. Wish I knew what he meant when he said he had a record for me someplace. A picture of a girl says to Mike from Violet. Mike. Mike. This fellow's face is certainly familiar, but I can't... Hey, wait a minute. Mike. Mike... Mike Jordan, that's it. Mike Jordan? Yeah, Wolf cleared him on a frame-up three years ago, and this, uh, this girl Violet is an entertainer in a nightclub downtown. Uh, Violet, yes, but what does all this have to do with Gloria? Strange, there's no other identification on him. Maybe the other guy took it off of him. Well, now we got to find Violet. How? We can't even find Gloria. I think now that this guy, Mike Jordan, missed us deliberately. Let's start hoping it back to that last crossroad. There was a telephone there. I'll call Nero. So that's the story so far, Mr. Wolf. Sorry to wake you up, but we wanted you to know. Yes, we did. Oh, such a night. What was your reason for telling the man that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? Well, I didn't want him to know that it was Doc because Gloria had called Doc and he must have known about it. And the driver turned out to be Mike Jordan. And what did Mike say to you in the car? Well, he didn't finish, but he said, I got a record for you, Goodwin. And then the man shot him up. 
And when you located Violet at her place, she was cataloging recordings, hmm? Bring her in here now, Archie. Sit down, Dr. Thrumming. Uh, yes, yes, I am a bit weary. Come in, Violet. Uh, Violet, this is... Hey, wait a minute. You, you're Nero Wolf. Sit down, Miss Violet. Well, what's the idea, Mr. Goodwin? Why'd you bring me here? Will you look at this photo? It says to Mike from Violet. Where'd you get this? I got it, Violet. What we want to know is, where's Mike now? What's he doing? Can you tell us where he lives? What's Mike done now? Can you tell us his address? Maybe. Do you know who he has been working for? Yeah. A guy with a big car and a lot of dough. You seen this man? Yeah, kind of a good-looking guy. I think his name is Durant or, or something like that. I understand you've been occupying yourself with cataloging some phonograph recordings. Yeah, that's what I was doing when Mr. Goodwin came in. Mike's got a home recorder over at his place. Do you have all the records that have been made on the machine so far? No, just what we made in the last week. Lots more at his place. Do you and Mike know of a woman named Gloria? No, at least I don't remember. It was on Rinaldo Road. Gloria Barnesworth was her maiden name. Where is this Rinaldo Road? I don't know. It's in Westchester, we think. I've never been there. What has Mike done, Mr. Wolf? Is it bad? As a matter of fact, Mike is in the clear. Good. There is no charge against him, and there never will be. You haven't seen him for a couple of days? No. And I never go to his apartment unless him and some guests are there. Do you know where he is? Will you give me the address of his apartment? Okay. 324 East 35th Street. Thank you very much, young lady. What's all so mysterious? Oh, something's happened to Mike. I can tell by the way you talk. Very well, Archie. You have a special visit to make. Look for the machine, and it's quite late, so you had best hurry. Well, I'm going with you, Archie. Uh, good night, Nero. Oh, I mean, good morning. Oh, I don't even know what day it is. Come along, Violet. We'll drop you at your place first. <laughs> Well, there we are, Doc. Yes, has his name right on it. Mike Jordan. No, well, we're fairly certain that no one's in there. Hey, what do you know? It isn't locked. The lights are on. I know, I know. Listen. Yes, a light humming noise. Huh. But where is it coming from? Over in that corner, those wall cabinets. There it is. A radio. And a phonograph combination. Yes, and a recording machine. And the recording arm's still down on the record. I'll just lift it off and put the playback needle on. Yeah, there we are. But look, I don't go in for that kind of stuff. You've been working for me for several weeks now, haven't you? Well, sure, boss, but I never went in for no kind We're of going to pick this guy up and take him for a little ride. It ain't my life. All you do is drive the car. Okay, I'll take a chance. But remember, I'm just the driver of your car. If anything happens, I didn't know nothing. You'll do just as I say. Incidentally, I know a lot about you. Things the police would like to know. Okay. Okay, I'm working for you. I came out to Ronaldo Road to make an honest living. But I see I'm right back where I started. And worse, the guy just ain't got a chance. Oh, remind me. I've got to phone the place. did say Ronaldo Road. And that's where our Gloria called from, so they're all tied in together. Come along, Doc. We're going back to Mr. Wolf again, and we'll just take this record with us. Well, Archie, I guess this phonograph was worthwhile after all. Yes, indeed. Hey, don't you find this a very interesting recording, Nero? I'm sure we're going to add it to our collection. 
And these are the two men who took you on the right. That's right. But we're really no further along in our desire to help Gloria. That's right. We're on Ronaldo Road. Boss, if we can find the address, will you go with us down there or over there or wherever it is? I might. And you already have the clue to the address. We have. Where? In that phonograph recording. Play it again, Archie. Just the part where he uses the telephone. And slow the speed way down. Then take down the numbers I call off. Okay, boss. Six. Five. Three. Two. Two. Three. That's enough. By slowing down the record, we were able to count the clicks of each number he used on the dial. Now, there's the number the man called. We hope it is on Ronaldo Road. Have Inspector Kramer get the address of that number combination, and we are ready to make our assault. I'll call Kramer, and then I'll get the car out. It hadn't been out for weeks. Maybe it won't start. <laughs> no such luck, Archie, I assure you. No such luck. <laughs> I think we must go through this big gate. Uh, yes, yes, there's the number. 23, Ronaldo. Slip up to the entrance as softly as possible. Turn out your headlamps. Here we are, boss. Easy now, getting out. Don't pull, Doctor. Don't pull on me. Oh. Yeah. There we are. Now come along. Yeah, spooky sort of place, isn't it? All big houses are like that. Must be 20 rooms. There's not a light in the place. Use the knocker, Archie. Uh-oh, stand back. Here comes somebody. Yes? Uh, is Gloria in? What? Gloria? And who are you? Uh, uh, we are here to see Gloria. Uh, uh, come, come. It's this hour of the night? Certainly not. Uh, just a moment. She's an old friend of mine. Uh, yes, and his too. He's Archie. My good man, what is your name? Uh, Jennings, sir. And the um, household is in bed at this hour. What is it, Jennings? Who's at the door? Uh, they're asking for you, Miss Gloria. For me? Well, come in, gentlemen. You may go, Jennings. Please. Very well, miss. Just as you say. Now... What did you want? Say, Doc, is this the Gloria? Well, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem... Are you Gloria? Yes. Well, why did you call us? Oh, then then you're Archie Goodwin. Yes, and I'm Dr. Thrilling. Uh, but you I are... I called you because I need your help. Desperately. Gloria, oh. what is going on here at this stop? Oh, and who are these gentlemen? Well, you... You see, Uncle, Mr. Goodwin came... Came to see you? Why? Well, I... Because I... I think you'd better go to your room, my dear. Don't you think that is best? Your room and rest? No. No, I don't want to. I won't. Go to your room. No. No, I won't. I can't. All those people walk in and out. They want to kill me. Jennings, take her to her room. Uh, yes, sir. Come along, please. No. No, I won't. I won't. Let me go. There are hundreds of people. They'll kill me. Come along. No, no. Please. I'm so sorry. But there's nothing we can do with her. Now, Mr. Goodwin, yeah? what is it you wish? The girl called you Uncle. Oh, pardon me, I'm near a wolf. How do you do, Mr. Wolf? Yes, she called me Uncle, but I'm not really a relative. I'm Dr. Gunther, retained by the family. As you can see, the girl is quite ill. Oh, well, we're old friends of Gloria's, and we'd like to see her. But you just saw her. We don't refer to this young lady. We have in mind the elderly Gloria... Now, come, Dr. Gunther. You know to whom we refer. What? You... You mean the girl's aunt? Well, it's very strange. If you are a friend of the aunt's, that you are not aware of her condition. Her condition? Yes. The aunt has been bedridden for nearly a year. Paralysis. And it seems to be most coincidental with your visit, but... She passed away this afternoon. Died? 
Gloria? This afternoon. But how could that be? We'd like to see the remains, Dr. Gunther. Yes, we'd like to see the remains. Just where are they? They are here, Mr. Goodwin. And if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way to the small parlor. There you are, gentlemen. I'll leave you alone. I'll be in the library. Well, gentlemen, there she is. What do you say? Do you recognize this woman? Well, yeah. It's been many years, but that is Gloria Barnesworth. Well, good heavens, yes. It's Gloria, all right. Poor woman. I remember now. She married a very wealthy manufacturer named Kenton, who died. She's remained a widow, I guess. Uh, he said she died this afternoon. Are you sure it was an elderly woman who called you this evening? And by the way, just feel her forehead. It's warm. She couldn't have been dead more than an hour. She isn't dead. No signs of pulse. Your cigarette case, please. Hmm. Very slight moisture. Respiration, barely perceptible. She's under heavy narcosis. You've given a heavy dose lately. Uh, let's get out of here. Wait. Do you recognize the uncle? Rather, Dr. Gunther? No, do you throw me? No. Does he look like the man who took you for a ride? It was too dark, boss. And he was all bundled up in heavy clothes. <laughs> let's get out of here. The door was locked after we came in. He's right. Come on, Doc, let's put our shoulders to it. One, two, go! Well, gentlemen, what on earth does this mean? Why'd you lock the door? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It, it's a spring lock. I had no intention of locking the door. And I suggest, Archie, that you have it repaired. And now, Archie, will you step to the door and let Inspector Kramer in? He followed us up the driveway. Yeah, about time. Getting cold down here. Inspector Kramer, this is Dr. Gunther. In that room is a woman he claims is dead. She is actually under the heavy influence of narcotics. Yeah? Well, who is she? Mrs. Gloria Kenton, widow of the wealthy shoe manufacturer. And this attractive young lady coming down the stairs is supposed to be mentally ill, which I do not believe. Her name is Gloria, too. A niece of the elder Gloria. But Archie and I both knew Gloria Barnesworth. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. And I suggest that this man is not a doctor, but is young Gloria's husband, and they're attempting to force the Aunt Gloria to change her will in their favor. This is utterly ridiculous. The aunt was able to phone Doc Thromig and me tonight, but she was apparently caught in the act. And this man, who is posing as the uncle, hired Mike Jordan to drive his car while he picked up Archie with the intent of killing him. Well, this, this is the same man? The same. And if Mike Jordan hadn't recognized Archie, both of you would be quite dead. This man double-crossed Mike and killed him, believing that the whole thing would be blamed on Mike. Mike deliberately missed. All right, so what's he going to do about it? Come on, let's get out of here fast. Look out, he's a cop. All right, now get those hands up and keep them up. Come along, Archie, I have another appointment. The inspector can handle it from here on. Oh, dear me. Uh, oh. Uh, what happened? Uh, am I all right? Yeah, you just fainted again when the shooting started. Oh. Really quite fortunate that Mike Jordan recorded that conversation. Fortunate indeed. How did you know this uncle was the same guy who took us for a ride? First by his speech pattern, he is undoubtedly a Canadian. But you must have missed the most important slipper. What was that? When he escorted us to see the body, he said to you, Archie... If you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way... Now, uh, how would he believe that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? No one mentioned it. Of course, the clue I planted and then missed myself. Quite right, Archie, quite right. What time is it? Uh, 8 a.m. I certainly appreciate your coming out for me on this deal. Oh, but I didn't do it just for you. There is an orchid lover's convention this morning at 9 o'clock. What? And you mean... Yes. I'm sure you'll enjoy it tremendously. <laughs> Both of you. Oh, brother. Uh huh. What's that? What's that? Nothing, Doc. Nothing at all. You 
have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Howard McNear, Gene Bates, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, Grace Lennard, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Final Page. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Transcribe. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Oh, Fritz. Yeah, I thought it was the outside line. Yeah? Yes, thanks. I'll be right down, Fritz. Boss, Mr. Wolf, will you please hurry? You're well aware that it will avail you nothing to hurry me? Why must the world be in such a rush today? But the car, it's downstairs waiting. Fritz is all ready. Let him wait. Isn't it enough that I've agreed against my better judgment to leave the comforts of home to go rushing through the crashing traffic of the city? To a dinner, that should be an inducement. Fritz could have prepared a delicious dinner. He has truffles in the pantry. Well, why did you promise Arthur Merle? You didn't have to accept the invitation. Quite so. He's an old friend. Besides, he does set an excellent table. It's just that I don't like the traffic. Traffic? (laughs) I know why. It's that awful oxygen in the atmosphere outside. It's not the traffic. Archie, you're talking much too much. I know, boss. I'm impatient. Would you mind giving me some slight indication that you intend to move from that chair? Just as soon as I finish this beer. Sure you wouldn't care for half a dozen sandwiches before we go to dinner? If we were going anywhere other than to Arthur Murrow's, I'd agree with you. He's the only person in the world I know of, except myself, of course, who has a proper appreciation and respect for the art of preparing good food. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. We usually refer to this story as the case of the final page. Under normal circumstances, the last page of a manuscript would be absolutely worthless unless you read all the preceding pages. But in this instance, the final page held the answer to a murder. Without that page, we couldn't arrive at the solution. Actually, we didn't even know the problem. Anyhow, I finally got Nero Wolf to the lobby of Arthur Merle's apartment building. Going up. Going up. Up, please. Are you going up, gentlemen? Are you, honey? Certainly. It's my job. Then so are we. After you, boss. When did they install women elevator operators in this building? I've been here for two years. Floor, please. Arthur Merle's apartment, I believe. It's 814. That's right. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, no. This is Mr. Wolf. I'm Archie Goodwin. Although the name Wolf would be much more appropriate for him than for me. How did you know he was Mr. Wolf? Mr. Merle came in half an hour ago. He mentioned that he was expecting you. You see, Archie, you rushed me unnecessarily. We practically preceded him here. And we'll probably have to wait interminably for dinner. I just hate to be late. Arthur Merrill has never been on time in his life. He's no more punctual than any other writer. He's never been known to meet a deadline on time. This is your floor, gentlemen. Arthur Merrill is just down the hall to the right, 814. Uh, thank you. And uh, by the way, I want to compliment you on your congenial attitude, Miss. I'll speak to the management. Oh, thank you, sir. Decent of you. Uh, what's your name, huh? Women are usurping everything. Really cost to live here. Merle's really in the chips. Every book he writes sells a million copies. Remember the last time we had dinner with Arthur Merle? I do. Delicious. Mountain quail shot them himself. Yeah, he's quite a marksman. 
Archie, such proficiency as Arthur Merrill displayed in hunting is evidence of a wasted life. Sure, he probably never made over $500,000 a year in his whole life. Well, ring again. Don't just stand there. Surely he's expecting us. The elevator operator said he was? Yeah, she seemed quite well informed. If I were a judge of women, which I am not, I'd say she has a line on every male in the building. She can get a line on me anytime she wants. Archie, your insatiable interest in the female seems sometimes to border on the psychopathic. You know a more pleasant way to go crazy? Phooey. This strange as a light on in there. I can see it under the door. Shall I try the door? Do so, Archie. Thank you. Mm, unlocked. Well, at least we can get in. He may be in the bedroom. Probably in the kitchen. I'll just sit here. I must figure out the comforts of my own home. I certainly intend to avail myself of the comforts of Arthur Merle's. Hmm. Very much over-decorated. You wouldn't like heaven unless they had orchids and beer. Hmm. Not a chair in the place worthy of the name. Well, I'll try that divan while you have a look around. For what? Ah, the mail, of course. Suppose you have a look in the study. Maybe writing. Have a look, my boy. I am exhausted and thirsty. See if he has any... Boss! Vi- Boss! Good heavens, Archie. Don't shout. Uh, I'm coming. It's Arthur Merle. Look. Slumped over his desk. A knife in his back. Yeah. He's quite dead. You haven't touched anything? Certainly not. I've been around long enough to know that. Well, you just call Inspector Kramer at homicide. How long do you think he's been dead? I'd say a half hour. From all appearances, yes. And perhaps only ten minutes. I can't understand it. Why would anyone want to kill Arthur Murrow? Everybody liked him. Nice man I'd expect such a thing to happen to. The answer is probably a considerable distance from the question, Archie. Inspector Kramer, homicide. Archie Goodwin, Inspector. Just a minute, Nero Wolf wants to speak to you. Oh, no. Don't tell me you two have started up something on a night like this. It's ten below zero. I'm sorry. Here you are, boss. Hello, Inspector. Yes? What is it this time, Wolf? Find a dead body under Grant's tomb? <laughs> I'm sorry you'll forgive any apparent failure to find humor in your little witticism. But I'm at Arthur Merle's apartment. I suggest you come here at once. Seems that Arthur finally met a deadline. So, you just walked in here and found Merle dead, huh? We were invited here for dinner. Hmm. Anyone else around when you got here? No. You see anyone, Goodwin? Only the elevator operator who brought us up. Well, Mr. Wolf, since you were in on the ground floor, maybe you've got some ideas. Sorry, Inspector. Had I been able to solve the crime so soon, I would have advised you, Inspector. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's obviously murder. Obviously. You knew him well? Quite well. Ever know of his being in any trouble? No. Everybody liked him. Arthur Merle, I felt, didn't have an enemy in the world. Is that so? I don't think anybody pulled this as a little friendly gesture. Don't jump to conclusions, Inspector. That this murder was committed necessarily by an enemy of Merle's. Meaning? It could have been an absolute stranger. A woman? Or a burglar? Or a madman? Or a crank? Or... As far as we know, it could have been anybody in the city, Inspector. Arthur's been dead nearly an hour. And an hour ago, I was in my own home, sitting comfortably in my own big easy chair, drinking a delectable glass of beer. Someone to the door, Archie. Yeah, just a minute. I'll answer that. Mr. Merle? No. Uh, well, is Mr. Merle here? Yes, he's here. But he's not seeing anyone. Well, he's expecting me. I'm from the Serve Right Catering Company. We're ready to serve for four here tonight. The dinner has been canceled. Oh, but it's been ordered. Breast of guinea hen, cooked in wine and cloves, delicious. It's prepared and waiting. I'm afraid that I must insist on seeing Mr. Mr. Merle. Mr. Merle has been murdered. Well, I'm afraid I must... Uh, Murdered? Well, oh, my goodness, but... Well, in that case, I... Yes, good evening. 
Don't you think you might have taken a bit more time with the fellow, Inspector? Why? You might at least have let him serve the dinner. Guinea hen, wine, and clove sounded positively delectable. Look, I've had dinner. I'm afraid you're too busy, Inspector. So busy that you've just passed up an extremely interesting bit of information. What are you talking about, Wolf? He said he was to serve dinner for four. Well? Arthur Merrill, Archie, and myself are only three. Well, who else was supposed to be here? A fourth guest who either hasn't arrived yet or who arrived earlier and left. Oh, I see what you mean, Wolf. Good. In that case, I'll leave you to pursue your deductions from that premise. Archie, will you please stay with the inspector and be of any help that you can? As for myself, I'm going back to my own home, which I should never have left in the first place. Okay, that finishes the apartment search, Goodwin. And what have we? Nothing. Except that Merle had over $300 in his pocket, and he was wearing a ring worth a couple of thousand, so it couldn't have been robbery. And I don't think it was premeditated murder. Why not? The weapon. Obviously, if someone had planned on killing Merle, he'd have prepared it better. Used a better weapon than a blunt paper knife. No, as I see it, someone was here before you and Wolf arrived, and for some reason that person found it necessary to kill Merle, and he did it on the spur of the moment. I'm listening. Well, it's obvious. Merle was slumped over his typewriter. The sheet of paper was in it. He'd been working. May I see it? Yeah. Starbreaker. Strange title. Page 189. He was getting well along with his latest mystery. Apparently. Okay. Gregory Thorne slipped the paper into his pocket. It was just an ordinary piece of paper, but Gregory knew its value. Used properly, as Greg knew how to use it, it would be worth $100,000. He walked away briskly, and as he... That's all. Yeah, that's all. Must have been right. You no, know, I'd it? like to read the rest of it. We didn't find any more of it. Any other ideas? No, at the moment we seem to be right where the murderer himself left off. It. Oh, what is this? Open house. Sorry to be so... Oh. Oh, what? I was... I mean, I expected to see Mr. Murrow. Is he here? Well, who are you? Cynthia Roberts. He expecting you? Well, no. That is... Uh, come on in, Miss Roberts. Thank you. Maybe the young lady is trying to say that he didn't have to expect her. Maybe she felt free to call without advance notice, Inspector. Inspector? Uh, what did you want to see Mr. Merle about? I... Well, I'm his fiance. Oh. Had dinner yet, Miss Roberts? Why, yes, I had dinner earlier. Uh, when I... were you last here, Miss Roberts? Well, last night, after the theater. Arthur and I were... What's the matter? Is something wrong? I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Miss Roberts, but... Arthur Merle was murdered. And you say you hadn't talked to Mr. Merle all evening. Is that right, Miss Roberts? Yes, that's right. You didn't have a date with him tonight? Oh, no. Then why did you come here? I told you we were engaged. I just came by, that's all. I see. Any more questions, Inspector? Yeah, none for the present. How about you, Goodwin? Nope. But maybe Wolf. Let me call him. Yes, I guess under the circumstances we can't very well leave him out. Go ahead. Oh, Arthur, I just can't believe it. Why would anyone want to kill him? That, Miss Roberts, is a question we'd all like to know the answer to. Nina Wolf speaking. Archie, boss, I'm still at Merle's. We haven't found out anything new except that Arthur's fiance dropped in a few minutes ago. Did she know anything of interest? I don't think so. What does the inspector plan to do about it? Just a minute. He wants to know what you're going to do with it. Well, hold her, of course. He's going to hold her. Let me speak to him. Okay. He wants to talk to you, Inspector. All right. Hello. Inspector, I suggest you let the young lady go. Are you crazy? I haven't got enough suspects in this deal to be letting the hottest one go free. You can't consider her a suspect simply because she knew Arthur. Now, see here, Wolf. If you go around arresting people at random, you'll suddenly be tipping your hand to the real murderer, admitting that you don't have a real clue to go on. And just what do you suggest? Find a motive, Inspector. Find a motive. Then, if you stumble on a suspect, you'll have some basis for making an arrest. At the moment, I suggest that you let the girl go and tell Archie to stop wasting his time down there and come home at once. So that's the story, boss. We went over that place with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing. There's not a single suspect. The last person to see Arthur alive was the elevator girl. 
Correction, Archie. The last person to see Arthur Merle alive was the person who ended his life. Well, I just can't imagine that pretty little elevator gal. You don't solve crimes by imagination, Archie. Then there's Cynthia Roberts, his fiance. You suspect her? Not exactly, but just suppose she did have a motive. Maybe he threw her over. Wouldn't it have been very clever of her to come back to Arthur's apartment after the police arrived, allegedly looking for him? I thought you were the admirer of the fair to six, Archie. So far, the best you can do is practically accuse the elevator girl and Arthur's fiancée of murder. Well, who else is there? Certainly the fellow who came with the food doesn't count. I repeat, who else is there? The entire population of the city, Archie. Thanks. Well, that's all I get. Oh, oh there was something else. What? This. Page 189 of what appears to be Arthur's latest novel. It was in his typewriter. As you can see, just started the page. Hmm, Starbreaker. Hmm. Very interesting. What's the rest of it? It's all we found. What? And there was something missing. Archie. Yes, boss? First thing tomorrow morning, get the address of Mr. Morton, who publishes Arthur's books. Then get over to see him right away. Yes, may I help you? I'd like to see Mr. Morton. Uh, did you have an appointment? Tell him I'm from Homicide. Uh, hom- oh, yes, sir. Yes? Uh, Mr. Morton, I know you have someone with you, but uh, there's a gentleman here from the Homicide Bureau. He wants to see you. Tell him I work for Nero Wolf. My name's Goodwin. His name is Goodwin. Send him in. Yes, thank you. You may go right in, sir. The large door to your right. Thanks. Come in, Mr. Goodwin. Come in. I understand you're from Homicide. Not exactly. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. We're working with Inspector Kramer. And what can I do for you? You've heard about Arthur Murrow. Yes, I received the word when I came in this morning. It was a great shock. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Goodwin. This gentleman is Henry Childs. How do you do, Mr. Childs? Glad to meet you, Mr. Goodwin. You're with Nero Wolfe? I'm his, well, his assistant, man Friday. Mr. Childs is a publicity agent. He handled all publicity for Arthur Murrow. I've not only lost an excellent client, but a very good friend. Did you know Mr. Merle? Yes, I'd met him a number of times with Mr. Wolfe. Yes, indeed. Arthur Merle was a great writer and a fine citizen. He'll be missed by millions. Mr. Goodwin, when was the murder discovered? Last night, shortly before dinner. Well, what are the police... I mean, what do you think the motive was? Don't know as yet, Mr. Charles. A little early for that. Well, it's certainly a shame. I, uh... I wanted to ask you a few questions, Mr. Morton, privately. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Charles. Oh, no, no, not at all. I was about to leave... I'll run along now, Mr. Morton. Uh, See you again soon, Mr. Child. Good morning, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Goodwin? You did a lot of business with Mr. Merle, Mr. Morton? I published every one of his novels for the past eight years. And you intended to publish his new one, the one he was working on? Yes, we had a contract. The usual agreement between you? Naturally. Although I didn't know the story, I was always sure that if Arthur wrote it, it was good. Mr. Merle's name on a novel was a guarantee that it would sell a million copies. You don't know what this last one was about. I haven't the faintest idea. We relied completely on Arthur's judgment. Not even any carbon copies, huh? Not that I know of. Why? When Mr. Merle was killed, the only thing missing from his apartment was the novel. The novel? The first 188 pages. All we found of it were a few lines of page 189 in his typewriter. He must have been working on it when the murderer stabbed him. But the rest of it's gone. You mean... Goodwin, the, the novel's gone? This will cost me a million dollars. Well, it cost Arthur Merle his life. Arthur Merle dead and his novel gone. I can hardly believe it. Well, thank you, Mr. Morton. I hope I've been of some help, although I don't I'm sorry you haven't. But we may call on you again. Before it's over, you may be a great help. Mira Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. I just finished with Morton. He doesn't know a thing. Merle never discussed his stories with anyone, and as far as Morton knows, he never made comments. I see. Where do I go from here, boss? See Cynthia Roberts. Oh, then you haven't dismissed the possibility that she may have had something to do with it. Being his fiance, she probably knows more about Arthur than anyone else. She may know who the fourth guest was to have been last night, and she also may know what Merle's novel was about. Right, boss. I'm anxious to know what the novel was about, too. I personally don't give a hang what the novel was about. What I want to find out is someone who does know the story. Because I have a hunch that whoever knows that is the person who killed Arthur Merle.
Miss Roberts, I know you want to help us find out who killed Arthur. Oh, yes, of course. I'll do anything. Nero Wolfe and I were invited to have dinner with Arthur Merle last night. Well, I knew he was having friends in for dinner, but I didn't know who they were. Oh, I'm sorry. I hoped you'd know whom he invited. No, he didn't tell me. Miss Roberts, we have reason to believe that there was to have been a fourth person there last night. A, a fourth? The caterer came to deliver dinner for four. Now, the fourth party never did show up. Or else came earlier and left after Arthur was killed. You mean someone Arthur invited to dinner might have killed him? Maybe. Oh, there's no one that I can think of who bore any ill will toward Arthur. We're convinced I... that this was done on the spur of the moment. Unpremeditated murder. Arthur Merle suddenly became a threat to someone. Now we've got to find out what the threat was and who was threatened. We'd hoped you could help. I'm sorry. Did he ever discuss his new novel with you? Oh, no. He never talked about his stories until he'd finished them. So, his latest mystery contains the answer to an even greater mystery. Unless we find the first, they'll both go unanswered. Mr. Morton? Yes? Nero Wolf speaking. Oh, yes. Your man Goodwin was here to see me. I presume you are interested in seeing Merle's murderer brought to justice? Certainly. Arthur was a close friend of mine. And his death cost you a best sir, I know. Now, would you be willing to help a bit? Why, yes, if I... I prepared a statement for the papers. I want you to call the literary editors first thing in the morning. Here's what I want you to tell them. Got a pencil and paper? Yes. And take this down. Quote, Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publishers with carbon copies of each day's work Consequently, with the major portion of his... Boss! Boss! Good heaven, Archie. Please don't be so loud. Look here. In this morning's paper, why, that rat, he lied to me, that... that... What on earth are you talking about? That publisher, Morton, he said he didn't have copies of Merle's manuscript, that he didn't know what it was about. And And listen to this. Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publisher with carbon copies of each day's work. Consequently, with a major portion of his latest work, Starbreaker, in the hands of his publisher, together with a complete synopsis, including the denouement, it will be possible for a ghostwriter to complete the novel. It will be published posthumously in proceeds with... Boss, did you hear that? I did, and it couldn't have been more to my liking if I'd written it myself. Now, excuse me. I want to make a telephone call. Who? Publisher Morton. Yeah, I'm beginning to see. He lied about the whole thing. I still don't see why he'd kill Merle, but on... Hello, Mr. Morton. This is Nero Wolf. Yes, perfect. Now I'll call Kramer, and he and Archie will be waiting for you. Remember now, if anything comes of it, you are to say the manuscript is in the safe in your home, and you steer the party here. Say you've recently rented this place. I hope we'll be seeing you. Yes. Goodbye. Oh, and be careful. Remember what happened to Arthur. The manuscript is in my desk in the middle drawer. What the... You mean... Archie, look out of that window. Huh? Yeah? Out there is a city of some five million people. In that five million, there is one who murdered Arthur Merle. Now, we don't know who it is, so we can't go out and put a finger on him. But, Archie, since we can't go to him... We have only one other choice, make him come to us. Will you tell me why we're sitting here in the dark in Wolf's office? Yes, Inspector Kramer, Mr. Wolf promised us a caller. Mr. Morton is to pretend that he's rented this place recently. Well, who's the caller? Can't tell you until he or she gets here. You seem certain he'll come. I'm quite certain. I'm just hopeful. You trying to tell me that Morton killed Merle? You're almost as dense as Archie was. No, Morton didn't do it. Unless Mr. Wolf is very wrong, which is doubtful, before the night is over, Morton will know who did. Then it won't be long until we know, too. Uh, you should get on a quiz program. You're so good at guessing games. Shh. Listen, huh? Someone's coming. 
A great introduction, my dear Kramer. I hope there are two of them. Inspector, behind these drapes. Quick, I'll get behind the screen. All right, Mr. Morton. So far, you've been very cooperative. Just keep it up. I have no intention of doing otherwise. Your gun has me completely convinced, Mr. Child. Get the manuscript. Uh, yes, uh, just a moment. It's in my desk. Wait a minute. I thought you said it was in the safe. A mistake, Mr. Childs. I don't have a safe. Shall I get the manuscript? Yes, but no tricks. You be careful. I'm being exceedingly careful, Mr. Childs. There you are. Uh, Starbreaker by Arthur Merle. Yes, this is it. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Now, I trust that's all you want of me. I'm sorry. I wish that were true. Unfortunately, you see, it's not the actual novel that I want. Oh? My interest in this copy is the same as it was in the original. And that is? That no one should ever learn the content. I take it you know what it's about, then. Yes. You see, Mr. Murrow made the mistake of telling me when I called a bit early at his apartment for dinner last evening. I was forced to deprive him of his life once I learned the storyline of this novel. This story must be kept secret. Why? Most of you people in the publishing business know me as a public relations and publicity agent for several prominent writers. Yes? Actually, I've been as successful as I might in this business. Because a few years ago, I stumbled onto a very neat and foolproof method of blackmail. Unfortunately, Arthur Merle thought of the same thing and based this story on it. If it got out, I'd be exposed and sent to prison. So you can see why I had to stop it, why I had to kill Arthur and why... Now I'll have to kill you, too. Oh, child, for heaven's sake. The contents of these pages condemn me. You know what's in them. Further, I've confessed the murder to you. You don't think I could let you live after that, do you? Child, you're insane. I'm sorry that I must repay you for your trouble in such an ungrateful manner. I'm sorry to do this to you, Charles, but I can't... Child, please, enough! <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Charles. There wasn't time to ask you to drop the gun. All right, Mr. Charles. Get your hands up and stay where you are. Nice going, Mr. Morton. Who are you? That took courage, Mr. Morton. Sorry we had to wait so long, but we had to make Mr. Charles here convict himself. Convict? What do you mean? We've been waiting here for you. Behind the drapes all the time. We heard every word. Mr. Charles, you're under arrest. Police? Yes, Mr. Charles. Only one person could have been so anxious over a copy of that novel... That's the person who killed Arthur Merle for the original. And we heard you confess to that. And that's all we need to convict you. We didn't have any proof until we set it up for you to make a second try to cover up for the first. Fortunately, the setup worked. Setup? Take a look at the rest of the manuscript, Mr. Child. What? Oh, the front page is there, all right, but look at the rest. Why, the blank. They're just blank pages. You didn't have a copy at all. No, but we certainly got a murderer. Hey, Inspector? Childs! Childs! Stop, Childs! Stop! Well, that's one way to avoid standing trial. Well, Archie, I'm glad you and Kramer got Childs. Some beer, please. That was a clever scheme, boss, making him think there was a copy. Yes. In a way, though, I wish it hadn't been just a scheme. Meaning? I wish there had been a copy of Arthur Merle's novel. Why? You never read detective stories? No, but I've drummed up so much curiosity over this one, I'd like to know exactly what that blackmail gimmick really was. Good night, Archie. Ah. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Don Arthur was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production and is directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin. And Evelyn Eaton, Peter Leeds, Lucille Alex, Marna Keneally, Herb Butterfield, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. 
There's excitement for you Sunday when talented servicemen compete on the Phil Regan Show. And Sunday on NBC also means another delightful adventure with Cary Grant and Betsy Drake when they star as Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, the proud but bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to Mr. and Mrs. Blanding. Tomorrow for excitement, hear Herbert Marshall in The Man Called X on NBC. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. My stories start in many different ways. This one began in the shattering turmoil of a manhunt and ended in the quietness of the morgue. Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. People are always telling me how lucky I am to have a job where all I've got to do is walk around Chicago at night looking for a story. It's a dandy little job, sure. All you need is a pneumonia jacket, an extra set of art supports, and a goodly supply of penicillin, and you're all set. <laughs> the city at night, fascinating. That old nose for news, frozen stiff and ready to fall off. Those eagle eyes so watery and bloodshot from the wind, they wouldn't serve a self-respecting canary. Yes, sir, it's lovely work if you can get it. And brothers and sisters, have I got it. Oh, I guess I was just bitter. I'd walked from the loop to the near north side, waiting for a story to tap me gently on the shoulder, and so far it was no hits, no runs, and no errors. The streets were empty. Everybody was home hugging a radiator. And then far away I heard that lonely blues in the night sound, a police siren. And then another. And another. And then it seemed like there was a whole chorus of sirens singing about what a cruel, cruel world it all was. And then one siren separated itself from the rest and came closer. A prowl car coming down the street, stopping just a few yards away from me. And a police officer jumping out of it and hurrying to a call box. The officer passed under the street lamp and I saw the excited look on his face. And I thought, all right, Stone, you lucky dog, let's go to work. This is Malachek. <clears throat> yeah, okay, we're on our way over there right now. Right. Uh, officer, just a second. What do you want, mister? What's up? Sounds like every squad car in the city's on the loose. Look, I got no time, mister. Read it in the papers tomorrow. Oh, I never touch the stuff. Look, the name is Stone, Chicago Star. Oh, reporter? Well, mildly, that's a general call, isn't it? I got no time to stand here, Gavin. I'll give it to you fast. Gig Sanvers busted loose. Sanvers? Great. When and how? Read it in your paper, Stone. All right, cross and let's move. They got him trapped. <laughs> Gig Sanders, two-time loser, a killer, loose in a city of four million people and everyone his enemy. I hurried to a phone, checked with the police, and then drove over to that part of Chicago called the Badlands. That strange area belonging to every city, surrounded by business section, yet itself run down, deteriorated, filled with tenements and abandoned factories. It was there the police had thrown a cordon around a boarded-up building. My pass got me through and up to the front line, and police captain Arlen. Hello, Stone. Oh, the hunt's on, huh? I don't know. We'll see in a minute. Sanders in that building? Got a tip he would be. Wait a second. All right. All right, Billings. Turn the searchlights on the building. Keep two of them on the roof. Run the others back and forth. All right. Sticking around, Stone? Yeah, I guess so. You sure Sanders is in there? No, but we couldn't afford to pass up a tip. A tip? Where'd he come from? No, no, no. It's just a phone call. Uh -huh. But Sanders knew this neighborhood like the back of his hand, likely to be here. Captain Ireland, ready with the speaker now. Okay, bring it here. Now, check. It's quite a crowd gathered for the kill. Yeah, making it tough for us. Sanders is armed like an artillery corps, and if he's in there... Yeah, I see what you mean. How'd he get away? I haven't got the full details yet, but he was being taken to the death house. Killed a cop. He's a nice boy. Here you are, Captain. Okay. All right. Here it goes. Sanders? Sanders! Listen to me! There's no way out of that building that isn't covered. Come out with your hands in the air. We'll give you 20 seconds. Hear that, Sanders? 20 seconds. We'll count them off for you. 
And what if he doesn't show? Tear gas first, then we'll go in after him. Mm-hmm. If he comes out with his hands up, he goes to the death house. And if he doesn't... He'll come out. Rats always believe there's a chance to beat the chair. <laughs> well, his life is hope. No sign of him. Malachek, come here! Yes, sir. Take the microphone. When I give the signal, start counting off 20 seconds. Yes, sir. He's given him more than 20 seconds. Not him, the crowd. They won't push in so close when the counting starts. Oh. Oh, look at them. Look at those faces. Perfectly normal human beings for 23 and a half hours of the day. Give them something like this for 30 minutes and they become a mob. Waiting, watching, hoping for the kill. People, Randy, want to change them? Uh, yeah, sure. We'll retool and put out a nice new eight-cylinder model with a convertible soul. Get ready, Manochek. Yes, sir. Captain, there's my story. Sandwich? Oh, no, no. That's for the front page, boys. That mob, that's my story. Look at that young couple right over there. Look at those two. They're hoping Sanders will come out shooting. Otherwise, they'll want their money back, huh? I suppose so. I'll see you later. Where are you going? I want to stand by that couple and listen to them. All right. Malachek, start counting. But warn him first. Once more. Sanders. Sanders. We're going to start counting right now. Come out with your hands in the air or we'll cut you in half when we come in after you. One... Two, three, four. I edged my way behind the young couple. They looked so nice and so human. But here they were, the same as all the rest. Nine. Go back just a little over a thousand years, put on a toga, and take a seat in the Colosseum at Rome. Have a great day watching the gladiators butcher each other. Cheer for the lions, or if you prefer people, cheer for the slave to kill the lion. Seven. Makes no difference. It's all the same holiday. Somebody gets killed. And then it started. Let him have it! It was all over in a few moments. The tear gas, the police rushing in with their masks on, the crowd straining forward to get a glimpse of Sanders. But there was no Sanders, and the police came up. Nobody in there, Captain Ireland. He must have been. No, sir, not a soul. We've covered every inch. I watched the crowd, and strangely enough, there was relief on their faces. And even a little shame that they'd hoped for the kill. But the young couple in front of me. He wasn't there, Ken. He wasn't there. I know. Come on. Let's get out of here quick. Ken, Ken, I'm, I'm sick. Evie, hold on to me. Let us through, please. Let us through. Yeah, here, this way. Come on. Will you clear the way, please? She's sick, mister. Maybe it's a natural reaction to disappointment. Huh? Nothing, nothing. Come on. We'll get through this way. Will you let us through, please? Excuse me, will you? Please. Thank you. She's got to sit down, mister. She's got to... Okay. Here, here's my car. Let it get in here. Kenny. Kenny wasn't there. He's... He's loose. Never mind. Come on, baby. I'll get you home. You better let me drive him. No. We'll be all right. Ken, I... I'm sick. I... Just a little while, Evie. We'll be home. Look, fella, it's easy to see what's the matter. She can't walk home in her condition. It ain't far. A block would be too far. I'll get a cab. No. I don't want anybody around us. Don't want anybody around you. That's a laugh. You bring her out here to this. Why didn't you take her on a nice tour through the packing house? Oh, shut up. What right you got to talk like that? The founding fathers gave it to me. You don't know nothing about it. You don't know. Ken, take me home. Look, my car is still here. You're in no spot to refuse help no matter what your reason. Now, come on. Let him let him take his Kenny, please. I come on. They lived very close. It didn't take over three minutes to get to their tenement building. I wanted to take her to a hospital, but she refused. She refused in a way that made me look at her hard. And there was another thing: the way she reacted when the police found out Gig Sanders wasn't in the oil factory. Terror. That's what it was. Sheer terror. And I helped her husband carry her up the stairs and into their meager little flat. On the couch, mister. Yes. Okay. There. Now, have you got a phone? What for? Call a doctor. We ain't got a phone. But there's a drugstore. No, the... Ken. But, baby... We gotta get out. We ain't got time for a doctor now. Just let me rest. You're in no gotta condition get to refuse a doctor. I'm all right now. Yeah, yeah, Sure. It ain't going to be for three weeks. That's what the doctor three said. Three weeks? And you drag her out to that great exhibition? Why didn't she... Shut up. I told you before you didn't know nothing about her. Mind your own business and leave us alone. What are you looking like that for? What's the matter with you, with both of you? Nothing. Oh, yes, there is. You're scared stiff. Of what? Please go, like Kenny says. Leave us alone. 
Well, let me phone for a doctor from the drugstore. I, I, I won't come back. Just the doctor. Evie? No. We ain't got time, Kenny. Don't you know that? We ain't got time. He's loose, Ken. He's loose. Easy, baby. Don't. You're talking about Gig Sanders, aren't you? Why? Why are you afraid of him? Do you know him? Come on, what about a talk? No. Not to nobody. You're scared of Sanders. Why? Look, mister, you helped us, all right? Thanks. Now get out of here. We gotta tell somebody. I said nobody. You know what'll happen. We gotta tell. Mister, who are you? My name is Stone, Chicago Star. Newspaper. Newspaper. That frighten you? Maybe he can help. Maybe he can. Nobody can. You know that. I'll tell him. Evie, shut up. It was Kenny who took the cops. Evie. I had to tell somebody. Maybe he can help. That's the truth, Kenny? I... Yeah. It was me tipped the cops. That Sanders was in the factory? I thought he might be, but he wasn't. All right, all right. Now tell me something else. How do you know so much about it? Come on, if you want me to help, i got to know you're on the level, so tell me. Tell him. How do I know that he won't go straight to the police? How do I know that? we got to trust somebody. we got to. Can we trust anybody? Well, try it and see. I... Him and me in the same gang once. I did time, but I got out before he did. I went straight because... Because... Go ahead. It was for me. Oh. All right, now, how about the tip to the police? There'll be a reward, you know. Sanders is big time. I didn't do it for no reward. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Mr. Stone, help us. How? How can I help? By getting out now and keeping your trap shut up. And about that'll me. help? Now you'll be back where you started. Your wife knows that, or she wouldn't have asked me to help. Gig will come after us. How would he know that you gave the information to the police? He'll guess. We used that factory plenty of times for a hideout. Nobody else knew how to get in. There's a cell away. All right. Let me ask you another question, Kenny. What? Why did you tip the police? Gig. Gig hates me. Why? Kenny married me while... while Gig was still in the pen. Oh, you were uh, his girl? No, I never was. I never was his girl at all. I was like everything else Gig liked. Everything was his, no matter who it belonged to. To him, a, a girl was like anything else. His gun, his clothes. Anytime Gig Sanvers wanted something, it was his. I never loved him. I, I told him, but I just laughed like what I felt didn't mean nothing. I see. And now? Now he's loose. He hates me because of Evie, and he's going to know I tipped the coppers. Mr. Stone, if it's the last thing he does, he's going to get us, Evie and me. You are listening to Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Those kids were scared, plenty scared. I asked them the only question that made sense, and I got my answer. Go to the police? <laughs> sure. A guy who serves time goes to the cops. He tells them he gave him a bum steer. They got every copper in Chicago around that factory while Gig gets away someplace else. Yeah, yeah, sure. They'd believe me, wouldn't they? Well, try it. I'll go with you. Listen, you don't know. I changed my name. I moved all over the state looking for a job. This is the only place I could get one. I had to come back here. So what does that prove? It'll be in the papers. He'll lose his job, Mr. Stone. I can't do that. Not with Evie. Then what do you want me to do? Look, maybe if I give you a, a, a list of the places the coppers might find you, maybe you could tip him. So what if he doesn't show up? There ain't many places he can go. Look, maybe by this time he's out, maybe even out of the state. He's killed an officer. He won't dare to stay here. Gig, as long as he knows Evie and me are still alive, he'll stay. He hates me so much, he'll take that chance. Does he know you live here? No. I ain't even seen any of the old bunch at all. I moved around. Always moving. Keep away. Mr. Stone, go to the police. But don't tell him nothing about me. Will you get it through your head that they'll protect you? Even so, Gig's got friends. If they find out it was me... All right, yeah. So you gotta go to the police... All right. Where's the drugstore? Right at the corner. You'll see it. All right. Stay right here. Keep your door locked until I get back. It was a short two minutes to the corner drugstore. I put in my call and started back to the flat. The street was quiet, deserted. The dirty tenements, a solid block of ugliness against the night. I reached the tenement entrance, and I was just about to start up the steps. Hey, pal. Huh? Don't send around. Well, and nice and quiet. That's it. What is this, a holdup? Sure, a holdup. 
Now listen to me. Take out a cigarette. What? Take out a cigarette. That's it. Now light it. Act natural. Good boy. Now? Where are you? In your car at the curb, smart boy. What? Don't turn around, I said. Take a look up and down the street. I am. Coppers? No. Okay. Now come here to the car. Gonna do like I tell you, understand? What do you want? Who? You don't know who I am, Stone. Yeah, I guess I do. Listen, I'm going up to that flat you come to. Don't do it, Sanders. Sure, I'm gonna do it. This gun says I can do it. Leave the two kids alone. Yeah. All alone. You're wasting time, Sanders. Time you could use to better advantage. Sure. Now step back a couple of feet. I'm getting out. Just stay in there. Keep smoking a cigarette. Walk ahead of me. Straight in that house. Move. Stop here. Sanders, you're not going to do this and still have time to get away. Real concerned about me, ain't you? Don't worry, I'm a big boy. All right, give him a break. Sure, like they was going to give me. Now listen, you're going back up to that flat. You're going to knock on the door and you're going to tell them to let you in. That clear? What if I don't? So be a hero. I'll get in anyway. It's just easier this way. Okay? I, uh... All right. So let's go. The slow walk up the stairs was a nightmare. I walked down the hall toward the flat. The flat where those two kids waited behind the door that they thought would keep the terror and death away from them. Then... Knock. Who is it? Sanders, please don't do it. You can answer him. Who is it? Answer. It's Stone Kenny, but I... You was the long time inside. (laughs) Shut it up or I will. (laughs) Easy, easy, easy. Easy, don't. You stop. Lock that off. All right, Kenny boy. Over on the couch. Gig, gig. Don't hurt Evie. She's gonna have... I see, yeah. Congratulations. Listen to me. Shut up. Stone... What? Get over to the couch. On your way, turn out the light. And stay in line with the window so I can see you against the street lamp. Now sit down. We'll talk. You gonna listen to me, Gig? Sure, I'm a wonderful listener. Only make it good and funny, huh? Even me fell in love, Gig. You ain't gonna blame us for that. <laughs> Evie and you fell in love. You think I worried about that? You think I cared what she did? Nah. It's what you've done tonight. He was afraid, Sanders. Afraid that you'd come after him because of Evie. I thought about it, mister. Yeah, plenty. But I figured let it go. It ain't worth it. But this tonight is something different. Turning stooly. You'll never get out of Chicago, Sanders. Every cop in the city will be looking for you. That's nothing new to me. Now you, Kenny boy. You did tip the coppers, didn't you? Kid, listen. We're... We're nothing, you haven't got a chance, Sanders. <laughs> no chance? I always got a chance. My luck's good. You know why I wasn't in that factory, Kenny boy? Because my luck held. I had to get some dough first. <laughs> and you know where I was? In that crowd, just standing there watching. You were in the crowd? Yeah, like watching my own funeral, only the coffin was empty. And I saw you and Evie, Kenny. That's how I knew where the tip come from. All right, you're smart, Sanders. Now be smarter. You got us where you want us. We can't make a move. But if you kill us, you'll kill the time you need to get away. I got ways. Like I come here. I followed you in that cab, then hid in your park car. Now, ain't that smart? Evie, you ain't said nothing. Big, you gonna kill us? Yeah, I'm gonna kill you, Evie. Sanders, you said your luck held. You can't hold forever. What you're doing now is giving the police minute after minute to catch up with you, and they will sooner or later. You killed an officer, Sanders. You know what that means. Him or me, it had to be that way. Doesn't have to be this way. This way? What Kenny done was to save Evie's life and the baby's right or wrong. That's why he did it. What would you have done to save your own life? I killed a cop to save my life. That answer you? Yes, I guess it does. So it makes sense. That's a radio there by you, ain't it? Yeah. Send it on. We're all going to sit here and wait for the news. I'm going to see how I'm making out. We 
sat in the semi-darkness of the room. The only light came from the window that faced the street. Then the 11 o'clock news broadcast came on. The meeting tomorrow will tell us more. Tonight in Chicago, the city's manhunt goes on for Gig Sanders, convicted and sentenced killer. Acting on an anonymous tip, the police surrounded the old Phillips factory, but Sanders had not been there or had escaped before the cordon could be drawn tightly. Meanwhile, rewards totaling $2,800 have been offered. Shut up! 2800 A real nice nest egg. I can't even believe it. wasn't any reward. There is not now. Sanders. What do you want, Stone? You said you were smart. So? What are you getting at? Maybe you forgot one thing. Yeah? You came here in a cab. So? The driver get a look at your face? <laughs> Don't give me that. The cops would be here long before now. Oh, no, Sanders. Only about a half hour has gone by since they tried for you in the factory. Figure it out. By the time the cab driver reports, by the time the police check... Shut up. You're wasting time. You got half a chance if you take it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you talked me into it. Okay, I'll get going. Gig. No. Please. No. Gig, gig, gig. Not the... Not Evie. Not the baby. The baby? Evie? I could have been rotten in that factory by now. What satisfaction will you get from this sandwich? Satisfaction? Everything in the world. You were friends. Yeah, friends. Did you tell him how good friends we were, Kenny? Did you tell him how we played in the same dirty, stinking streets? How we ate the same slop in the orphan asylum? Did you tell him all that? Big. Yeah, Big. Evie, did you tell him how I was always the one to get Kenny out of jazz when we were kids? They tell you that, Stone? No, but you're thinking of it. Remember it. I am. Oh, I am. All Kenny wanted was a decent life. Even though it cost mine, huh? He wanted to live for his wife and their baby. And I want to live. For what? You shouldn't have said that, Stone. I didn't have nothing against you till you said that. I was going to that death house when I busted loose. I figured a million ways to get away, and I took the chance. When it come, I killed a cop, a cop. And I know what happens to a cop, killer. I know. Ah, they're coming. I guess you were right about that cabbie. The minute the couples will all be set up and ready to get me. Yeah, but I killed a cop. That's how bad I wanted to live. But nobody wants me to. Nobody, you hear? Nobody. Listen, Sanford. You listen. A couple of weeks ago, there was a leopard loose. And you know what the people said? You know, Stone? Yes, I know. They felt sorry for the leopard. That's right. Everybody wanted that leopard taken alive. Nobody wanted it killed. But me, me, I'm a human being. And they want to see me cut to pieces. Maybe because that's all the difference in the world between you and that animal. Is there? Is there? You're going to tell me the leopard would know better if he killed to get away. Well, I don't. No, because that's the way I learned to live. Because you didn't want any other way, Sanders. Because it was the easiest way. You grew up in a gutter. You never wanted to get out of it. Other men did. I ain't other men. I'm Gig Sanders. Gig Sanders. Gig, they're all around. You ain't got a chance. Yeah, and that's dandy for you. Just what you want. No, Gig. No, I swear it ain't. You swear. Now, you listen. I'm going out. Yeah, but not with my hands up. And I ain't gonna die alone. Sanders, don't. Do one last decent thing. Let these kids alone. Gig, listen. I'll go with you. Kenny, no. Gig, Gig, I'll, I'll go with you. It'll be you and me again like it always was. I'll help you get away. We can do it together, Gig. We always used to, me and you, remember? You're crazy, Kenny. If they think you're going out with him, you won't have a chance. They'll cut you down with him. You Kenny, won't have... stay here. I gotta do it, Evie. You gotta see that. I have to do it. Gig, you want to kill me, all right. I'll be dead if that's what you want, but I'm going out with you. I got a gun. I got a gun. Kenny, put it down. Don't. So you got a gun. You got a gun. All right, shoot me. Why don't you shoot me? I could have. Any time we were sitting here. But you didn't. You was always soft, Kenny boy. You see, Stone, that's the difference between him and me. Then shoot me. Go ahead, kill me now. But even if you don't, I'm going out with you, Kenny. Kenny, you're not talking sense. Sanders, Sanders, we know you're in there. Sanders, this is Captain Ireland. Listen to me. Sanders. I'm listening, copper. Sanders, there are innocent people in that building. We'll give them time to clear. If you've got any human decency left in you, wait before you do anything. But I warn you, Sanders... Come out with your hands in the air. What are you going to do? You know what I'm going to do? Coppers! Coppers, I'm coming out! 
Right out the front door. Tell everybody else to stay and tell them. All right, Chambers. But with your hands up. Now listen, people. Stay in your rooms, lie down on the floor, and stay away from windows and doors. I'm coming, coppers. So kill your gig. Sanders, go out with your hands in the air. Oh, sure, sure. Now, Evie, Kenny, gig. Sanders. Do it, then, gig. Do it and get it over with. Kenny, Kenny, boy, get where I can see your face. Think what you're doing, Sanders. Shut up, son. And the light by the window, Kenny. Now, let me look at you. you. You said you'd go out with me. Yeah. Kenny, don't lie to me now. Don't lie now. I'll go with you, Kate. Swear it's the truth, Kenny. Swear it's the truth. I don't have to swear it, Kate. You're looking at me. Okay. I'm going out alone. And what about Kenny, Evie? That can rot in this stinking world. That can rot. Not me. I'm going out. I'm going out and meet all the coppers in Chicago. Gig, stay where you are. He's gone. He's gone. Sanders, come out with your hands up. Hello, coppers! Well, there's $2,800 lying down there, Kenny. Better go down and pick it up. I don't want it. You had all the chance in the world. Why didn't you kill him? I couldn't. Gig Sanders was my brother. It's almost dawn again, and I've written another story. It's a story that began a long time ago when a man looked up and answered a question with another question. Am I my brother's keeper? There's an answer to that, and our society has made it. Yes, you are your brother's keeper, but the kept must be worthy of the keeper. Copy, boy. Night Beat, a new dramatic series, stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Tonight's story was written by Russell Hughes. Night Beat is edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. Others in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Georgia Ellis, Shepard Menken, Louis Haight, Herb Ellis, and Alan Slate. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Throughout the week, NBC brings you the very best adventure mystery dramas on the air. You'll hear action-packed, fast-moving plots to hold your interest right up to the smashing climax on NBC's thrilling mystery shows. During these stellar programs, you'll hear mystery and intrigue, adventure and high-tension drama. Match your powers of observation against the best in detective fiction in solving crimes and unraveling intrigue. There's fast-moving action to lift you from beside your radio into the romantic land of mystery and adventure. These exciting dramas are as interesting as tomorrow's race results today. And you'll hear them every night over most of these NBC stations. Remember, if it's mystery and adventure dramas you're tuned for, tune for the best on NBC. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. Tomorrow, Fred Allen joins Bob Hope. Now, Jack Benny is on NBC. <laughs> Thank you.
Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, it's time to keep our weekly appointment with that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us. Of course I am, Mr. Bell. So come in, draw up your usual chair, and make yourself comfortable. <sighs> ah, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Watson. What story are you planning to tell us tonight? Quite an exciting one, I think. Uh, the only relic I have of it is this rather mildewed piece of paper. I came across it just before you arrived as I was going over my notes on the case. Well, this doesn't look very exciting. It's a hotel bill, and all it says is board and lodging for one week, 28 shillings and sixpence. <laughs> then there's an extra item, one pint of ale not paid for, five pence. And yet that extra pint of ale was ordered at the very moment... When Sherlock Holmes and I entered into one of the weirdest experiences we ever had. I call it The Adventure of the Sally Martin. Before you begin the story, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I... Uh... Have a word with our listeners? <laughs> <laughs> of course not, Mr. Bell. Men, if you want a successful, prosperous appearance, don't give your hair that cheap, greasy, plastered-down look. Many products advertise that they don't leave the hair looking or feeling greasy. But let's make this test. Run your hand over your hair. Does your hair feel greasy or sticky? Now look at your hand. Is there a greasy film on it? If there is, then you certainly are not using Kremel hair tonic. Because Kremel positively never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Kremel contains a very special hair grooming ingredient found in no other hair tonic. It makes dry, unruly hair stay in place longer. Gives it such a nice, healthy-looking luster, too. When you use Kremel, you can run your hand over your hair and no grease comes off. Notice, too, how delightfully clean your hair feels. And just see if the ladies don't like that natural, well-groomed look which Kremel always gives. Try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the adventure of the Sally Martin? Well, the story began many years ago in the tiny fishing village of Kingsgate on the Kentish coast. At my insistence, Sherlock Holmes had agreed to take a much-needed holiday. And we were staying for a few days at a small seaside inn known as the Silver Dolphin. The adventure began, I remember, on a foggy, bitterly cold evening. Holmes and I, after a hearty dinner, were seated in the public bar of the inn talking to a garrulous old sailor. Little did we think that even in that peaceful village, dark tragedy was stalking us. Tragedy that very soon was to be brought to our attention. Here you are, Albert. Another pint. Thank you, Condy, sir. Ah. Yes, you're very good health, gentlemen. What an amazing capacity. That's the fifth. I can't think where he puts it. I see no mystery there, Watson. Go on with your story, Albert. You just reached the point where the shark had turned on you. Ah. Well, gentlemen, I ups on the rail and dives into that raging sea. Pulls out me knife. Oh, really? Uh, Where did you get the knife? I thought you said that you'd lost your clothes in the hurricane. Stuck to me middle, I was. But I always kept a barry knife stuck in me belt. Oh, really? How uncomfortable. Well, I see the white belly of the shark turning at me. I let him have it. Uh, a rip here. A slash there. Ooh, there was blood all over the place. Never saw such a mess. Uh, Storytelling's very dry work, gentlemen. I'll order you another pint, Albert. Uh, thank you kindly, sir. Watson, look who's just come in. Oh, it's our old friend Sergeant Dobson, isn't it? Yes, and judging by his expression, the local representative of the law has serious business on his mind. Good evening, Sergeant. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Evening, Dr. Watson. How are you, Dobson? <laughs> can I have a word with you, Private Lake? Of course you can. Oh, I beg pardon, sir, but uh, you did say something about buying me another <laughs> pint. <laughs> Don't worry, Albert. We'll have it sent over for you. <laughs> Please give Albert another pint, Annie. Put it on my bill. Right you are, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps you wouldn't mind stepping into the private bar, gentlemen. Very well. Now, Sergeant, sit down and tell us what's on your mind. Murder, Mr. Holmes. Great Scott. Who? Where? Well, have you gentlemen noticed the fancy sailing boat that's been moored out in the cove this past week? Yes. I was informed that it was owned by George Byron, the Lancashire cotton manufacturer. Uh, that's correct, sir. The boat's named the Sally Martin. And right at this moment, Mr. Byron's lying there in his cabin with a knife in his ribs. Deader than a boiled mackerel. Good gracious me. I rode ashore to send a telegram to the police at Canterbury. 
But I left a constable to guard the people aboard. Good. I, I'm going back now to conduct my investigation. But the Canterbury police can't be here for morning, and I... I was hoping that... That we'd help you, Sergeant? Well, sir, a case like this is a little outside of my experience. Well, just a minute, Dobson. Mr. Holmes is still a sick man. It's cold out and foggy. As his doctor, I forbid... Rubbish. Oh, How can I stay here in the inn while a murder lies waiting to be solved less than a mile away? Come, Watson. The game's afoot. How much further is it, Sergeant? About a, about a quarter of a mile, well, sir. If we don't get there soon, I won't answer for the consequences. I'm a rotten sailor. Cheer up, Watson. In the meanwhile, Sergeant, suppose you give me as many facts as possible. How many people are aboard the Sally Martin? Well, there's three passengers, Mr. Holmes, and, and two in the crew. Well, let's have those passengers first. Well, there's, there's Mrs. Byron, the dead man's wife. A lot younger than him, she is, and... And she looks a bit on the flighty side, if you ask me. Even though she was having a proper fit of hysterics, like. And then there's... There's Clarence Byron, the dead man's brother. And what opinion did you form as to his character? Well, sir, you understand I didn't talk to him much. But he acted cool as a cucumber, just... Just as if murder didn't mean a thing to him. And the third passenger? Well, he's a young fella by the name of Hodgson. Secretary to the dead man. Very nicely spoken gentleman he is. But it seemed to me as if Mrs. Byron had quite an eye for him, even, even through her tears. That's why I said she seemed flighty-like. You're very observant, Sergeant. Oh, it's, it's just training, sir. How about the two crew members? Well, there's, there's Captain Small. He seemed perfectly above board. And a, a man by the name of Coggins. Arthur Coggins. He's a, he's a deckhand. And a mighty surly one at that. <laughs> He gave me quite a bit of back chat when I questioned him. Holmes, how much further is it? Barely a hundred yards, old chap. Oh, I feel awful. Do hurry up. Move over, Sergeant. Let me take an oar. There's the murdered man, Mr. Holmes. That's just how we found him. Very illuminating. Look at that murderous knife. It's buried to the hilt in his chest. Yes, but more interesting than the knife at the moment is the tableau presented in this cabin. What story does it tell you, Watson? Very simple story. Somebody opened the cabin door, came in, and stabbed him. Oh, come now. Surely our years together have made you a little more perceptive than that. Well, that's what you're driving at. Well, for one thing, in his right hand is an open book. Oh, been reading? Yes, and the sergeant has told us that the oil lantern beside his bunk was still burning when the body was found. Oh, that's right, Mr. Holmes. There's no sign of a struggle. The bedclothes are in, aren't even rumpled. No cry for help was heard, so let us reconstruct the scene. Mr. Byron was lying in his bunk, reading, as you observed, Watson. Oh, quite easy. The door opens. The murderer comes in, the knife hidden in his or her clothing. The victim has no suspicion of his fate because the murderer was someone who could enter his cabin at will. And suddenly, the fatal blow is struck. Then it must have been one of the three passengers. I think we may reasonably include the captain. The master of a schooner surely would have the ability to enter his employer's cabin without creating suspicion. Oh, you're right, Mr. Holmes. I think we've seen enough here, Sergeant. Where are the passengers? In their cabin, sir. I told them to wait there until they were sent for. The main saloon's empty. You could see them in there nice and private-like. Splendid. Then let's go there. At once. My friend's only trying to help you. Oh, how can he help me? He can't bring poor George back to life again, can he? No, madam. <laughs> but at least I can try to find his murderer for you. He's right, madam. So take it easy, like, and answer his questions. Very well. Uh, what do you want to know, Mr. Holmes? Can you suggest anyone who might have had the motive for murdering your husband? Oh, half a dozen men. George made a lot of money. He was a hard businessman. He had many enemies. But none of his business enemies had an opportunity of killing him tonight. His biggest enemy, though I never could make him believe it, is on this very boat now. His brother Clarence. Biggest enemy? His own brother? Oh, come, come, it's come, true. madam. It's true. Clarence sponged on him. That's done for years. And ever since our marriage, George, he's tried to be more friendly to me than a brother-in-law should be. Mm -hmm. Just because I was once in the theatre, he seems to think I didn't know how they laid it Oh, you, you in the theatre? I wonder if you knew a girl who was Daly's. Pretty little figure. And they Watson, the... surely this is no time for your theatrical reminiscences. Oh, well. Mrs. Byron, are you familiar with the terms of your husband's will? Everything he has comes to me. Oh? 
Well, that's perfectly natural, isn't it? Perfectly. But in that case, your brother-in-law would hardly seem to profit from your husband's death. I don't know what you're suggesting, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Do you think I stabbed him? I wouldn't have had the strength. Mrs. Byron, I suggested nothing. But I'm interested to notice that you answer your questions as well as ask them. Well, I'm not staying here to answer any more questions, Mr. Holmes. I'm going back to my cabin. If you want me, that's where you'll find me. No, wait a minute, ma'am. Let her go, Sergeant. And please ask Mr. Hodgson, the secretary, to come in here. Just as you say, sir. Well, upon my soul, she's a fine little thing, isn't she? <laughs> That's attractive, too. What do you make of her, home? It's hard to say. If one wished to adduce motive, it would be easy. Well, she must be 25 years younger than her husband. And uh, a fortune coming to her. It is deaf, eh? Precisely. And despite her own statement, a woman would have the strength to stab an unsuspecting man to death. Here's Mr. Hodgson, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Please sit down, Mr. Hodgson. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This is a shocking business. It is indeed, my boy. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Any questions you like. When did you last see your employer tonight? Mm, shortly after dinner, Mr. Holmes. He was taking a turn round the deck. We chatted for a few minutes, and then I went to my cabin and retired. It was about 9.30 or quarter to ten. You heard no cry for help? No shout in the night? No, none. The first I knew of the tragedy was when the captain awakened me. Can you suggest who might have had a motive for his murder? Mr. Holmes, that's... that's a little hard to answer. Come now, Mr. Hodgson, don't hold anything back. You'll have to talk in a court of law, you know. Yes, I suppose so. Well, gentlemen, in my capacity as secretary, I did know that my employer's brother, Clarence, has been borrowing heavily. Only yesterday morning I was compelled to draw my employer's attention to an irregularity in the monthly bank statement. A 500-pound check had been drawn. The signature was a forgery. And you think that Clarence Barron committed that forgery? Yes, I do, sir. And so did my employer. The two brothers had a terrible row about it. Uh, Sergeant, will you be good enough to ask Mr. Clarence Byron to come here, please? Right you are, Mr. Rowe. One very personal question, Mr. Hodgson. Was the relationship between you and your employer's wife a purely social one? As a matter of fact, Mrs. Byron has been very kind to me. Oh, really? My family are dead and she's taken an interest in me. But I give you my word that it's been purely platonic. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant Hobson. Mr. Clarence Byron's lying in his bunk, sir. He says he can't come here. He's got a heart attack. A heart attack? That's rather convenient, eh, Holmes? Yes, Watson. And it's also convenient that there's a doctor aboard. Let's go and see him, shall we? <laughs> Any better, Mr. Byron? Yes. Yes, I do, Doctor. That injection you gave me helped. It was digitalis, I suppose. No, it wasn't. Holmes's heart perfectly sound. He was simulating an attack. So I gathered, since an injection of plain water apparently gave him immediate relief. Plain water? Yes, your heartbeat was full and regular, and your color normal. So I decided to try an experiment. And a very successful one. Why did you pretend to have a heart attack, Mr. Byron? I, I wasn't pretending. I do have a bad heart. That I don't doubt. Only a bad heart could prompt you to swindle your brother and then murder him. I didn't murder him. Though, uh, I can tell you who did. Oh? You are very eager to shift suspicion, Mr. Byron. Who, in your opinion, murdered your brother? It's that deckhand, Arthur Coggins. Only a few days ago he threatened my brother's life. You heard him make the threat? Yes, I did. It was his second day aboard. It was early in the morning, and I was strolling on deck when I came on this man Coggins, who was standing by the mainmast, practicing throwing a knife. You're pretty handy with a knife, Coggins. What's that? I said you're pretty handy with a knife. Yes, I know how to use a knife. Do you uh, think you're going to like being on this ship? No. Not if I don't get treated like a human being. Just yesterday, the owner yells out to me, Yeah, you, whatever your name is, treating me like dirt. Whatever your name is. Can't he find out my name? I'm as good as he is. One of these dark nights, he'll get what's coming to him. That's what he said, Mr. Holmes. And he looked as if he meant business. He's an expert with a knife, you say. Holmes, do you think it's possible that Coggins threw the knife through a porthole into the dead man's cabin? Yes, Watson, it's possible. Your story was interesting, Mr. Byron, though, of course, entirely uncorroborated. 
I think we'll go and talk to the captain and see if he can supplement your information. Well, Mr. Holmes, I I can't answer for the passengers. That's no business of mine. I appreciate that, Captain Small. But you'll answer for your crew, no doubt. That I will, sir. And this man Coggins is a no good if ever I saw one. Insubordinate, surly, always talking about how he's as good and better than those who employ him. Then why did you engage him, Captain? I didn't, sir. That was arranged by my employer, Mr. George Barron. If I had my way, Coggins would have gone back ashore the first day he stepped aboard. Where are his... Great Scott, is that a revolver shot? It sounded like it, and it came from the forecastle. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! This way, Sergeant. Good heavens! Why, it's Coggins! With a smoking revolver in his right hand. He's committed suicide. Yes. Very convincing, isn't it? His head is sprawled on a piece of fool's cap. A confession note, no doubt. Yes, it is. Look at this. I killed him, and with my record, I knew you'd catch me, so I took the quick way out. Case is solved, Holmes. On the contrary, Watson, it's becoming more involved. If you look closely, you will realize that we now have two murders to solve instead of one. And somewhere on this boat, a murderer is still at large and may strike a third time. In just a moment, we'll find out if the murderer does strike a third time. But first, men... If you're bald, you might as well grin and bear it because science tells us it's impossible to grow hair where the hair roots are dead. But you certainly can make the most of the hair you've got. And men, you can't beat Kreml hair tonic. To help you, Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps hair neatly in place longer and without that offensive, greasy look. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Let me repeat, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A massage with Kreml helps stimulate circulation right in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp feels so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff and has a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. And for hair that's so dry that it cracks and falls, remember Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. Men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. It's such a nice, clean product, you can use it every day so that your hair always looks its best. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. So, Dr. Watson, the apparent suicide turned out to be another of the murderer's victims. Yes, Mr. Bell. Holmes at once sent Sergeant Dobson to check the passengers while the three of us stood in that tiny cabin. An oil lamp swinging above us and shedding a strange glow on the macabre scene. I asked him why he was so positive that it wasn't suicide. You will notice, Watson, that the revolver is in Coggins' right hand. Yes, Holmes, I don't see what... Then ignore the right hand and observe the left. A deckhand is accustomed to hard manual labor. Notice the calluses on his left hand and the freedom from them on the right. By Jove, he was left-handed. Yes, he was, Mr. Holmes. I've noticed him at work. Again, you'll observe the shot entered his head from behind the right ear. A remarkable feat of dexterity for a left-handed man. And the murderer had the note ready, shot Coggins from behind, but made the mistake of placing the revolver in the wrong hand. Precisely. But this note, obviously in disguised writing, poses another problem. What does the phrase, and with my record, I knew you'd catch me, mean? He must have had a police record. But why volunteer the information? I wonder if the murderer had a reason... Captain... You said that Cockins was engaged by Mr. George Byron. Well, sir, he told me about the new man, but I don't know that he interviewed him personally. Where was he engaged? At the Siemens Hostel uh, here in the village. What are you getting at home? Surely it's obvious, Watson. If this man Coggins had a police record, his murderer might have deliberately placed him on this boat knowing he would be suspected. Yes, yes, it's possible. But the question is, who engaged him? Well, Sergeant? All three of them in their cabins, Mr. Holmes, and swore they hadn't left them. And yet we know that one of them must have slipped down here and shot Coggins. Lock them in their cabin, Sergeant. Keep good watch on them. Dr. Watson and I are going ashore. Ashore? Why, Holmes, when the murderer's here on this boat? Because I'm convinced that the clue to his identity lies waiting for us at the Seaman's Hostel. Where is the place, Sergeant, and who runs it? Old Ma Jenkins. It's the house just next to the Red Lion on the quayside. Splendid. 
Watson, we're taking this note and rowing ashore. Another trip in that filthy rowing boat? Must we, Holmes? It's a fine time of night to rootle a respectable woman out of a warm bed, I must say, and no mistake. But, Mrs. Jenkins, you... Call me Ma. Everyone calls me Ma. Very well. We've come to you because you're the one person who can help solve two murders that took place on the Sally Martin tonight. Murder? Come into me parlor. I'll light the lamp. There. Now, what's this you say happened aboard the Sally Martin? The owner, Mr. Barron, was stabbed to death about ten o'clock tonight. Later on, a seaman by the name of Arthur Coggins was killed, too. Arthur was killed. You knew this man, Arthur Coggins? Of course I did. Over a year he's been staying with me. He couldn't get a ship because of his record. What record was that? He brought his ship's papers to me. They all do when they're out of a berth. The last ship he was on two years ago, it was. He got mixed up in a knife fight. Oh, uh, did he? Alaska was killed and Arthur arrested. They couldn't prove he was guilty, but he hasn't had a birth since because it was written in his papers. Well, that fits into your theory, Holmes. The murderer engaged him deliberately, knowing his record. Exactly. Mrs. Uh, Ma. That's me. Do you recall the name of the man who interviewed Coggins? No. The man who engaged him for the Sally Martin? Uh-uh. No. But, but it's here in my book. It's the last entry I made. Uh, here it is. Clarence Byron. The brother. There's our man, Holmes. Could you describe the appearance of Mr. Byron, Ma? No, I, I can't say I remember much about it. He was all muffled up. He was a nice-spoken gentleman, though. You can recall no clue to his identity? It's uh, worth a sovereign to you, if you can. A sovereign? Well, let me think out. Y- yes, there's one thing I do remember. He had a gold signet ring on his right hand. Splendid, Ma. Watson, the case is solved. Of course it is. Clarence is the man. May I congratulate you on your powers of observation, Watson? Ma, here are two sovereigns for you. Two? But you The said... extra one is for the privilege uh, of borrowing this uh, registry book of yours for a few uh, hours. No. I'm taking it back to the Sally Martin with us so that we may compare the handwriting in it with that of a murderer. <laughs> This is ridiculous, Mr. Holmes. Why should you ask Clarence to sign his name? Bear with me a few moments longer, Mrs. Byron, and you'll see why. Blessed if I know what you're up to, Mr. Holmes. A little patience, Sergeant, and you'll see, too. Have you any objection to signing your name, Mr. Byron? I uh, suppose not, though I'm just as confused as the rest of them. There. Thank you. And now, Mr. Hodgson, I wonder if you'd mind helping us. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. What can I do? You saw a forged check. I wonder if you'd try and imitate the signature that Mr. Clarence Byron has just written. Mr. Byron's signature? Yes, his writing is extremely individual, but I think you could help prove that under certain circumstances it can be elastic. See how nearly you can imitate it. I think it'll help us to prove that he murdered his brother. Clarence, you did murder George. I knew it. Mabel, you're out of your mind. Will you copy his signature, Mr. Hodgson? Of course, if you think it'll help you. Holmes, Holmes, look, look. Hodgson. Sign, please, Mr. Hodgson. Clarence Byron. There. Thank you. That's a remarkably fine gold signet ring you're wearing, Mr. Hodgson. Thank you. Watson, give me Mar Jenkins' register book. There you are, Holmes. Sergeant, I want you to compare the signature in this book with that which Mr. Hodgson has just given us. I think you'll agree that they're both written by the same man. They are. Well, blow me down. So he forged Clarence's signature. Exactly. He is quite a specialist in handwriting. Albert, you didn't kill him. You couldn't have done it. It's no good, Mabel, and you know it as well as I do. You knew what I was up to. You helped me. (gasps) You suggested that I use Clarence's name. That's a lie. A lie or not, Sergeant, I suggest you take out your notebook. They're talking in front of witnesses, so make the most of the fact. The sun's coming up, Watson. Oh, yes, and the, the sea's calmer, Hingham. A very satisfactory start to a new day. The confessed murderer and his accomplice, both of them safely in the care of the police. Yes, I was convinced, until we found him murdered, that Coggins, the 
The deckhand was the guilty party. Exactly what you were meant to think. I thought that uh, as he was an expert knife thrower, he could have thrown one through a porthole into the dead man's cabin. No, Watson. Both portholes were at the head of the bunk. But the knife wound was from the underside of the heart and upwards. It would have been impossible to have thrown the knife through a porthole at such an yes, angle. Yes, yes, I can see it all now. Young Hodson, coveting his employer's wife, planned a knife murder and then engaged Coggins, knowing that with his record, he'd be the logical suspect. Yes, but like so many murderers, he tried to be too clever. He left enough clues to hang himself half a dozen well, times why over. Why did Clarence pretend to have that heart attack? The nervousness of a person who knows himself to be under suspicion. A futile attempt to escape interrogation. Oh, I'm glad it's all over. I'm exhausted and I'm frozen, and I'm delighted to think that this is my last trip in this horrible rowing boat. Whereas I'm feeling very stimulated, and in a distinctly altruistic mood. Altruistic? What do you mean, Holmes? If you'll observe the flurry of excitement at the quayside, the figures in blue surge that are at this moment embarking in boats, you'll realize that the police from Canterbury have just arrived. Well, I still don't see how altruism comes into the picture. I intend to claim no credit in the solution of this crime. And in consequence, I see little reason why our old friend Sergeant Dobson should not very soon be known as Inspector Dobson. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us something about next week's story. But first, girls... If you want to really make a hit with the boyfriend, here's a beauty tip right out from here in Hollywood. And one which lovely Powers models were among the first to discover. Give your hair a ten-minute glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying shampoo has been especially developed so that it actually brings out all the brilliant, natural luster of each tiny strand of hair. Cremel Shampoo leaves the hair fairly teeming with highlights. And don't forget, Cremel Shampoo is wonderful for the entire family. Yes, even in the hardest water, it whips up gobs of rich, luxurious foam, which penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy the large family size of Cremel Shampoo. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel Shampoo, the largest selling shampoo with an oil base. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week... Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes solved a murder with only one clue. The depth to which the parsley had sunk in the butter on a hot summer's day. I call this bizarre adventure the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Rygate Puzzle. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited every Saturday over most of these NBC stations to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. Tomorrow's symphony performance features Metropolitan Opera star Helen Trouble as guest soloist. For tomorrow's broadcast, the orchestra will be under the baton of the widely acclaimed conductor Wilfred Pelletier. For the world's great music, hear the NBC Symphony, brought to you tomorrow and every Saturday. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes, who's calling? Mr. John Blake? Well, is this a matter of business? That's fine, Mr. Blake, I'll just call him. Archie, I'm not here. Tell him I'm up in the plant room with the orchids. Uh, I was going to call him to the phone, but he's up in the plant room with his orchids. Uh, what sort of a case is this, sir? Really? Really, is that so? Is it a man or a woman? Oh, I understand perfectly. It's a man. Well, at least that's something different. Yes, sir, very urgent, I understand. And I assure you, Mr. Wolf will be here waiting for you. The fee? Oh, um, shall we say about 
Oh, a thousand? I will not see any crowd until after dinner. Fritz is having mountain quail on toast. Yes, Mr. Blake, come at once. What were you saying, boss? And found you, Archie, nothing but business. All the time. What's the problem? I don't know. And at a thousand dollars, considering our bank balance, I'll help him poison his great grandmother. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> we chose to refer to as the case of the hasty will began, of course, with an urgent phone call from the mysterious John Blake. At the moment, Nero Wolfe was seated in his chair, which was specially built for his 300 pounds, and I was giving him a lecture on the importance of money. Archie, that will do. I'm not interested. You will be when you learn you can make no more purchases of beer and Skittles. You've passed up two cinch cases now. Each would have meant a healthy fee. Let us hope this Mr. Blake has a nice, fat problem that will take us days to solve. Archie! Yes, sir? Answer the door. Good evening. I'm John Blake. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Blake. You have no idea how welcome you are. Archie, show Mr. Blake in and close the door. That draft is unbearable. Uh, this way, sir. Mr. Wolf doesn't care for anything resembling air. Oh, I'm Archie Goodwin. Uh, good evening, Mr. Blake. Mr. Wolf, uh, I have a little business for you. Now, uh, before you say anything, I know you're not a lawyer. I'm not a member of the bar, let us say, Mr. Blake. Of course. What kind of business, Mr. Blake? I have here a short will, which uh, I have typewritten myself. I, I haven't signed it yet. Uh, also, I have here a sealed envelope containing a letter which I want you to be prepared to deliver to the addressee. A will and a letter. Very well. Yes. Uh, do you know who I am? Seems that I've certainly seen you before. Same here. I just can't place you. Well, I'm John Blake, president of the Plymouth Building and Loan. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture many times. You have a staff of the best attorneys in the city, Mr. Blake, and this is most assuredly the business of attorney. Perhaps. But in this particular instance, I wanted an individual who had no interest in me, uh, nor uh, previous knowledge of my affairs. I see. Also, I wanted the person who was, well, uh, shall we say, not too well fixed. Well, you certainly yeah, could Archie. have... Archie. Imagine Mr. Wolf being in need of money. Just why can't your attorneys handle this? You'll know in a moment. But when I leave here, I want you to forget the whole thing uh, for the time being. Indeed. You have said it. Here's the will. You may read it. Archie. January 25, 1951. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. So, sure. Simple enough, isn't it? That's all. Now the pen, please, and I'll sign it. Now then, you sign as witness, Mr. Goodwin. You retain the will, Mr. Wolfe, and the envelope here, which is addressed to Hillary Brake, my brother, who is now living in this city. Your brother? He's just recently returned from 25 years in Australia. Though Hillary has written me several times, I have not favored him. We've, uh, we've been estranged these many years over, uh, well, a certain unpleasant situation which this enclosed letter will clear up. Are you in fear of your life, Mr. Blake? Murder? No, Mr. Wolfe. There was a time, yes, but, uh, well, not now. You will know what to do with the will and the letter, though, when the time arrives. Now, uh, as to your fee, you said a uh, thousand? Well, we usually receive... A thousand uh, will do. Well, here's a check, all made out. If you're thinking of suicide, Mr. Blake, we must warn you. If you don't care to go through with this, please say so. I'm not planning on suicide, I assure you. We have taken the job, Mr. Blake. <clears throat> and good evening, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for your kind indulgence. Well, that's the simplest little thousand we ever made. I believe, Mr. Goodwin, you're going to be quite surprised. I want you to get acquainted with John Blake's secretary. 
You have more than earned this thousand, young man. Archie. Archie, is that you? Yes, boss. What time is it? It is 6 p.m. The clock is right in front of your eyes. I'm thinking, Archie, it's very interesting. Very. An entire day has passed since the visit from John Blake. Did you learn anything from Blake's secretary? I did. He left his office late yesterday, she said. His daughter Anita is quite upset because he didn't come home. Check his club? Yup. I didn't talk to the daughter, but I learned that she's engaged to a young fellow named Wilbur Martin. She told the secretary that her father had been acting strangely of late, a bit morose. And what does the daughter feel has happened? Anita's afraid he's been kidnapped. You haven't met nor talked to any other than the secretary? Not yet. And so far, no one's called the police. Good. We must, for the time being, prevent that. What did you learn of Blake's brother from Australia? He's been here only a year. They've met only once or twice since his return. The secretary thinks the breakup was because of their love for the same woman. Hillary became very wealthy in Australia. Very well, Archie. It is time for you to visit Miss Anita Blake at her home. I'd love to, boss. She's a mighty purty gal. Fooey. Archie, you can do me a great service. Anything. Be sure to close it tightly as you leave. Close what? The coal chute, of course. I'm awfully glad you could come, Uncle Hillary. Wilbur seemed to think you might know something about Father's disappearance. No, I don't know, Wilbur. Uh, I'm just as nonplussed as you are. When did you see your brother last? Oh, it's been four or five months. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. What do you two think has become of him? Surely you know his recent actions better than I. Well, at first I thought he'd been kidnapped. Now I'm afraid it's suicide. Oh, I say, really now... Have you been putting such ideas into our head, young man? On the other hand, could have been murder. Indeed. Well, I suggest that the police be called. Hospitals, the morgue, every place. Have you thought of doing that, young man? I was going to. Oh, really? Then what are you stalling about? I'll just step into the library and do it myself. Oh, it can't be, Wilbur. It just can't be. Miss Blake, there's a Mr. Goodwin to see your father. Oh, I'll see him. Thank you, Miss Blake. I'm Archie Goodwin. This is my fiancé, Mr. Wilbur Martin. Mr. Martin, how do you do? What is it you want, Mr. Goodwin? Is your father here, Miss Blake? Why, no. No, he isn't. What is your business, Mr. Goodwin? Why do you want to see Mr. Blake? As a matter of fact, I don't really want to see Mr. Blake because I don't think he's here. I came to see Miss Blake. Just who are you? I'm a detective. Police? Private investigator with Nero Wolf. John Blake has disappeared. I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. We have called the police. Oh, what do you think has happened to my father? I think he's dead. Oh, dear. What, why do you think that? Yes. Just what do you know, Mr. Goodwin? Oh, Anita, I want to ask you a few questions. I think it's advisable. Mr. Blake. To... Yes? I, I thought you were done for. That is... I don't think I... Uh... This chap is a detective. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Blake, but curiosity got the better of me. I hope I haven't wrecked things. What are you talking about? You remember the agreement. What agreement? Mr. Goodwin, do you know who you're talking to? Why, yes, John Blake. Oh, no, Mr. Goodwin. This is my uncle Hillary, my father's brother. Hillary? Hillary Blake? Yes, my father's twin brother. John and Hillary were twins? Of course. Well, this news to me, I didn't know that. What did you know about him? Well, now that I look at him, now that I can recall his speech, there is a difference. And now, why do you think John Blake is dead? I've just come from police headquarters. You mean he's been murdered? No. From all indications, he's committed suicide. Suicide? Oh. Are you sure? Poor father. Oh, I was afraid of this. This morning, a hat and an overcoat were found on the East River docks near Pier 9. In the coat was a typewritten copy of a will made yesterday. The hat bears the initials J.B. There was a will? Yes. Could you identify the hat and coat, Miss Blake? Well, yes, of course. Very well. Come in, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Hanlon. Miss Blake, do you recognize this coat and hat? Yes. Oh, yes, I do. They, they were fathers. I... Oh, Wilbur. Suicide. I can't understand it. But the hat and coat are not conclusive evidence. What about the will found in the pocket? Show them the will, Sergeant. 
Read it, miss. You, you read it, Wilbur? Hmm. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marsha Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. But no signature. I have the original. Here you are. Where did you get this? Notice the signature of the witness? Archie Goodwin. You witnessed his signature? In Nero Wolfe's office. But Mr. Blake had his own attorneys. Nevertheless, he came to Mr. Wolfe to take care of the will. If we hadn't recognized him from his photos in the papers, I wouldn't have witnessed the signature. Anita, is this your father's handwriting? Yes. Yes, it's his, all right. But there still isn't proof that he's dead, nor that he committed suicide. No corpus delecti. And the body may not be found for days. But this evidence we have here certainly indicates that a body will be found eventually. Maybe not, Mr. Goodwin. It's possible they could have... What were you going to say? Nothing. Miss Blake, in a way, I blame myself for your father's death. How do you mean? I had a sort of premonition. It's obvious now why he came to Nero Wolf. Is it? He wanted someone who didn't know him personally. His own attorneys would have been able to see through his plan and prevent his carrying it out. But he made a will. Why did he draw this new one? Yes, that's what I don't understand. Well, I still am not convinced that he committed suicide. Mr. Blake, here is a letter he asked to be delivered to you. Oh, well, now. Perhaps it will shed some light on the problem. What does it say, Uncle? Uh, Joe says, uh, hmm, Hillary, 25 years now, jealousy and bitterness have kept us apart. I know why you stayed in Australia all these years. I know you loved Marcia. She was rightfully yours. But I loved her, too, and I couldn't go on without her. I know you've despised us both, and I've uh, pretended to despise you. I had to pretend, because I lied to Marcia. I told her you were engaged to marry a woman in Sydney. Marcia was innocent. I was to blame. Uh, When Marcia died last year, and you wrote that you were coming back, I knew then that your resentment had faded, but I didn't answer you, and I've kept away from you because I couldn't face you. I've told you all this because things have happened which you will learn soon enough that have decided me to close my book and write Finney. I uh, have made a new will, leaving everything I possess to Anita. Anita is young, Hilary, and I beg you to watch after her as though she were your own, which, but for my selfishness, she might well have been. Forgive me, Hilary. Mm, Well, this this certainly indicates suicide. But what does he mean by things have happened? That, Miss Blake, is the motive for which we'll just have to wait. Yes, for that and the body. Well, boss, up here in the conservatory a bit early, aren't you? How are the orchids? Well, it's a nice sunny morning. Even though it is around zero outside, the sun is fine to them. And behold, Archie. Huh? What is it? The dendrobium scorostel. The b- b- Yes, indeed. What about it? Showing two buds. Most encouraging. Indeed, indeed so. Boss, I can't take the steam heat here. Tell me, this painting of Marcia Blake, is it large? It hangs over the Blake mantle, about three by four feet. Find it most intriguing that John Blake should mention the painting in so short a will. And Hillary, does he seem to offer any suggestion on this problem? He has very little to say. Wilbur has definite ideas, and he's in there pitching all the time. He has a rather unpleasant way about him, though. You have talked with Inspector Kramer? I have. And asked Miss Anita and Hillary to meet you at the morgue to look at the body? Right. And I left Wilbur out of this gathering. This body is practically unidentifiable, huh? In Kramer's opinion, it is. After you're finished down there, I'd like to have a chat with this Wilbur Martin. Okay, but you'll get nothing out of him. I've tried. Archie, you're becoming so conceited. Soon I fear I'll have to uh, fire you. If it were summer, I would forthwith resign. Run along and close our coal chute behind you. Morning, Inspector Kramer. Up early. Yeah, Goodwin. I just love to come down to this morgue. This is Miss Anita Blake and her uncle Hillary Blake. How do you do? Good Howdy morning, do. Mr. Goodwin. I hope you don't object too much to my joining the proceedings. Oh, I know, Wilbur. I suppose it's all right. Please, Mr. Goodwin. What's happened? There's a body here. 
Rather badly bruised and cut and in a bad condition, but I think you should look at it. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Miss Blake, but I'm afraid it's necessary. Very well. I'll be all right. No, I'd like to come along. Oh, yes, Wilbur, you must. Well, come on. This way. Say, Miss Blake. Oh. Now get hold of yourself, Anita. Please, you must. Yes. Yes, that's Father. And you, Mr. Blake? Well, it's certainly hard to say. It looks as though it might be John. Was there no means of identification on the body? No jewelry or. Father never wore any jewelry. There was nothing but this suit here, nothing in the pockets. Yes. That's Father's suit, all right. I know. Oh, why? Why did he do it? Come along now. That's all for today. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Wilbur Martin. Ah, oh, yes. How do you do, Mr. Martin? Sit down. Thank you, sir. No, no, no. Take the red leather chair. That's right. So glad you could come. Archie, uh, Beavers. Uh, tell me, Mr. Martin, you saw the body? I did. Whether it was John Blake or not, I'm not sure. But Anita feels positive enough. You are skeptical about the suicide theory, eh? Well, yes, I am. Are you trying to cast suspicion on someone else? No. He thinks he was murdered. I do, but not by you, of course. Certainly not. (laughs) But who would know that John came here, signed the will, and gave us the letter to his brother? He must have contemplated suicide, don't you think? Are you positive it was John Blake who signed the will? Hmm, how interesting. You think it was his brother Hillary who came here, posing as John, huh? It could have been. But the man was quite gray and had no Australian accent. Hillary could have dropped the accent for a short while and grayed his hair, and they were twins. So enlightening, Mr. Martin. Do go on. After he left you here, he could have killed John and thrown him in the river. And left his overcoat and hat on the wharf. And why would Hillary kill John? Well, I... Well, there may have been several reasons. Maybe because of Marsha. Well, uh, there's several reasons. Tell me, did John Blake object to your engagement to Anita? No, why should he? I don't know. <laughs> Amelia asked. Anita Blake identified her father's handwriting. She identified the body. You still believe it's murder? Maybe she only thought it was his handwriting. You had best be careful, Wilbur. In trying to make a murder out of this, you might place yourself in a most unhappy position. I checked the letter and the will with papers at John's office, and the handwriting is identical, in my opinion. Maybe Hillary is clever at forgery. Maybe. Did you have the experts check the writing? Not yet. Then how can you tell unless you had a bona fide sample of Hillary's writing? Hmm. I take it that you found a sample of Hillary's writing? Some letters from Hillary to John? Yes. I found a package of them. In John's desk at his home. That, Wilbur, is most encouraging. Here they are. Several of them tied together. Some written in 1928 and a couple in 1948. Now, we'll tell you something. We never thought John committed suicide either. You... You didn't? No. And before you go, Wilbur, write your name here on this pad. Very well. Thank you so much. I hope we shall see you tomorrow. Well, I'm surprised, Inspector Kramer, to see you out in such inclement weather. I like the cold spells. Sit in the red leather chair. Yeah, thanks. Good. Have your experts finished checking the will and the letter? Yep. But not all through with a package of Hillary's old letters that Wilbur found. What's the verdict? If this is forgery, it's the cleverest bit of forgery we've ever come across. My men say the will and the letter you received appear identical with the specimens from John's office. Indeed. The will and the letter then do seem to have been written by John Blake. Yes. But on the other hand, and this is unusual, by comparing this letter from John with a letter Hillary wrote from Australia in 1948, we found characteristics in both men's letters which were definitely similar. Then, Inspector, you feel that Hillary might have written the letter and signed the will. That it was Hillary who came to my office? It's a tough thing to prove, but I think that's being on the right track. Inspector, what about the rest of the package of letters I got from Wilbur Martin? They're still working on those down at headquarters. 
Uh, what about young Wilbur? Well, so far, can't see much in him to worry about, but it's a bit early. Archie, phone out to the Blake Mansion and tell Wilbur Martin that we've uncovered the whole thing. And if Wilbur's in on it, he'll be gone before you get there. We can pick him up later. Okay. I'll let you know about the rest of Hillary's letters. Good. We won't phone out there until you're finished. I'll call you as soon as possible. Archie, I want you to look into the affairs of the Plymouth Building and Loan Company. See what you can learn about the actual uh, stability of the company. Okay. Boss, please put on your muffler and overcoat and open a window. A candle couldn't burn in this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on my way. Anita. Anita. What is it, Wilbur? What's happened? I came out as soon as I heard. Well, what's happened? Speak up, man. You haven't heard? You don't know? No, what? Look. Look at these headlines. Plymouth Building and Loan Crashes. Wilbur, what does this mean? It means your father embezzled the funds of the company and he has gone to the wall. What? Yes, closed the doors. Oh, no, Wilbur, no, I can't believe such a thing. I'm sorry, Anita, but there it is in black and white. Then this is the motive for John's suicide. Why? Why? Because he, well, he knew he was caught. What else? He could have put the money back, couldn't he? Yes, but maybe he lost it by trying to make more to come up the shortage. I don't think he lost it. You don't? No. No nonsense, he must have. Else why would he kill himself? Maybe he didn't kill himself. Oh, this is awful. Oh, please, please, Anita, you mustn't worry. I know this is very embarrassing for you, but it isn't your fault. Now, let me take you away for a while. We can run down to Mexico until this blows over. You won't take her to Mexico. You won't take her any place. Just what do you mean? What's wrong with you, Wilbur? You're acting stupid. You... Your father may have fleeced the company, but I don't believe he lost the money. Wilbur. He hid the money, and your Uncle Hillary found the hiding place. And he set up the suicide to cover your father's murder. Hillary killed him. Oh, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Why, this doesn't make sense. I have all the money I need. Yes, you have now. Pack your things, Anita. I'll phone the airport for reservations. You can't leave at a time like this. You won't leave this room. Do you know what can be done to you for threatening people with firearms? I'll call the police. You don't need to call the police. I've just talked to that detective, Mr. Goodwin. He's on his way here. The police have uncovered everything. I know you killed John and you have the money. Wilbur, you're out of your mind. I know what I'm talking about. Get out of here. Get out! I won't leave. No one will leave till Goodwin comes. Ah, Archie, come in, Miss Blake. Mr. Blake, Mr. Martin, glad you were all able to accept my invitation. You too, Inspector Kramer. Yeah, I know how glad you are I could be here, Wolf. Please be seated, folks. Hillary was going to Mexico on the next plane and taking Anita with him. Mexico? John Blake stole the money from the company, but Hillary found out about it and killed him. Mr. Wolf, this is utter nonsense. Mr. Blake, Inspector Kramer's handwriting experts have examined the will and the letter left with me. They have also checked them with your recent letters from Australia. Indeed. And your letters from Australia show a definite resemblance, having the same characteristics as the letter and the will you give me. You you mean you think that I signed the will and wrote the letter? Definitely. Ridiculous. But there's something else. The will mentions a painting of Marcia Blake, Anita's mother. Archie, where is that painting? Did you bring it? It's here. Uh, bring it in here, Sergeant. Uh, just a moment. I hope you don't mind, Miss Blake. What are you doing to it? Tearing off the paper backing of the picture. Yes, and there you are. There's the reason for the whole thing. Bonds. Pasted in the back. Thousands of dollars in negotiable bonds. Then Hillary did know about the money. He killed John for all this. He had a neat order the picture to be credited for shipping. I did no such thing. Nevertheless, you didn't kill John Blake. Certainly he did. Look at these two letters from Hillary Blake to John here in America. What are the dates? September and November 1948. Those were supposedly Hillary's most recent letters to John. And look at these letters, June and July 1928. Notice any difference? All are signed by Hillary, but the ones dated 1928 are not at all like the ones written in 1948. Not the least similarity. The ones dated 1928 were written by Hillary. But those dated 1948 were written by John. By John? How do you mean? Carry on, Inspector. You're under arrest, Mr. Blake. Not for murder, because there's been no murder. You're under arrest on a charge of embezzlement. Embezzlement? Oh, but how And you... you, Miss Blake, are under arrest as an accomplice. What? I don't understand. Mr. Wolfe. Wilbur, you yourself unearthed the old 1928 letters, rarely written by Hillary from Australia. The recent letters are not in the same handwriting. They were poorly forged by John in 1948. 
Furthermore, we checked with Australia and learned that Hillary Blake died in Sydney ten years ago. And this man here is really John Blake posing as Hillary to escape the penalty for looting the company. Anita, it just doesn't seem possible. Anita knew all about it, and they might have gotten away with it if they hadn't come to us, Archie. What a fantastic plan. I'm giving you back your thousand dollars, Mr. Blake, but I'm afraid it won't do either of you much good now. Thank you so much, Inspector Kramer, for dropping in. Well, boss, that was a clever bit of deduction. You really think so, Archie? It was quite a blunder for so clever a man as John Blake. Why did he make the mistake of coming to us? There are many holes in the plans of the criminal mind. He must have forgotten about the 1928 letters or he would have destroyed them. And he underestimated Wilbur's intelligence. And I thought he was a dope too. But he was half right. He really slipped up on the body in the morgue. Inspector Kramer was most kind to cooperate with us in that elect. Anita was too eager to identify the first body she saw. And the painting. You sensed there was more importance attached to it than the fact that it was a work of art. True. Some beer, please, Archie. Coming up, boss? Now, that brings me to an unpleasant subject. What's that? You were talking about resigning. Are you still in that frame of mind? Resigning? When did I say anything like that? Then you're going to be content with conditions as they are? Why, of course. What are you saying? And you don't mind it a bit as long as this dreadful weather continues? Well, not at all. I... Don't mind what? Going in and out of the house through the coal chute. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout and produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In tonight's cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Victor Rodman, Louise Arthur, Hal Gerard, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Disappearing Diamonds. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how mild a cigarette is, how well it agrees with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test, the 30-day camel mildness test, and see just how mild a cigarette can be. Yes, and you'll find out why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, the Milton Burl of Homicide. Pretty bad. Oh, hi, Helen. What are you doing? Playing canasta. Who's there? 
Well, just me and that Japanese beetle I found hiding in my bills. Japanese beetle? Yeah. And you're playing canasta? Well, what do you expect us to do? I'm tired. He just finished giving me my judo lesson. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think you believe me. Oh, sure I do. Who's winning? I am. He can't speak English. Besides, I make up the rules. Mm-hmm. Am I going to see you tonight? Well, I... You what? I don't know. Something just came into my office. Client? I don't know. Here comes another one. One what? Well, beats me, but they're pretty strange. Hey, uh, where'd you leave your saucer, fellas? Maybe they're shills for the beetle. I'll call you back. Bye. Bye. Well, uh, what can I do for it? Hey, wait a minute. Oh, that was a piece, Salvador. Now pick him up, drag him over to the chair. Sure thing, Yuki. He is certainly very unconscious. He seems to be. Let's see if you can revive him, Salvador. A pleasure. Would you mind holding my nuts, Yuki? Mm-hmm. I don't want I should break his jaw by accident. Mm-hmm. Ah, such a nice man. You are so considerate. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I would be happy to hold your nuts for yourself, though. Mm-hmm. Diamond. <coughs> Diamond. <coughs> he is very out. Well, here, Salvador. Try this pitch of water. Uh, wait. wait. I'll remove the gladiolus. I felt as if I was lying in the middle of a crowded sink and someone had piled all the dishes on my head. They turned on the faucet and I floated up with a dirty coffee cup and took a look around. I treaded water and squinted through my dewy eyelids at two of the ugliest dishwashers I had ever seen. Look! He's twitching. Mm, oh. Mm. <laughs> you see, Salvador, it's just a little lazy. How do you feel, Diamond? Oh. Let us know when things start making sense. Oh. Oh. Not, uh, what's going on? What happened? Mm. He's confused. Yeah. Uh. I think maybe you sapped him too hard. Oh. Yuki, I take that as an insult. You know how careful I am. I apologize, Salvador. Thank you. I... Hey, uh, how, how'd you monkeys get in here anyway? Well, it sounds like he's collected most of his marbles. <laughs> Looks like a complete recovery, Yuki. I want to know what this is all about. Oblige the man, Salvador. Sure. But keep him with us. <laughs> Naturally. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh. That's enough, Salvatore. That's enough. <laughs> Can you hear me, Diamond? Eh, it's going to be obstinate. I don't think he likes it. Belt him across the ears. He'll listen. Mm. Can you hear me now, Diamond? He's nodding his head. I guess he don't want to open his mouth and let the blood out. Oh, that's fine. Now, mm. listen, Diamond. In a while, you'll get a call from a Mr. Wharton. Mm. He'll offer you a job, but you will not take it. Do you understand? Salvador, please, see if he understands. He says, yeah, he understands. But now he's got a sore arm. Remember, Mr. Wharton, you don't want to work for him. I think he understands, Yuki. Yeah. But he looks tired from the strain. He certainly does. Look at those dark circles under his eyes. Well, put the man asleep, Salvador. Certainly. Nice. Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond, can you hear me, Mr. Diamond? Oh, oh, oh. So this can get monotonous. Go away, will you? Should I call the police, Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. Oh, I was expecting uglier company. Can you sit up? Oh, I'll take a crack at it. <clears throat> oh, I, uh, I'll bet your name's Wharton. Well, that's right. How did you know? Get out of here. Well, I want to talk to you. Well, I just had one long conversation. It was too one-sided. Now, go on. My health is doubtful, but it's fun to have it around for company. Maybe $500 would pick you up. It might for a while, but I 
Don't like to waste that kind of money on funerals. Seven fifty. Yes, yeah, so they line the coffin with velvet. A thousand. Well, you're beginning to make a short life sound practical. If you do the job successfully, there'll be another thousand. You just bought yourself a corpse. Let me wash up. Uh, talk some more. I, I can hear you. Well, it's my son, Roger. He thinks he killed a man. He, he thinks? What do you want me to do? Find out for sure so he can brag about it? Ever heard of a John Alter? Oh, sure. Walt Levinson sent him up five years ago on a manslaughter rap. Well, he doesn't like it up there, and he'd like to get out. I don't blame him. What's this got to do with your son? I'm chairman of the parole board. Yeah. You look much better now, Mr. Diamond. Oh, you're chairman of the parole board. Yes. Some of Alter's friends promised to keep quiet about my son if I let Alter go free when he comes up before the board next week. Uh-huh. And you think maybe your son was framed? Yes. About a month ago, he met a girl in Florida. Her name is Lenore Brown, and she's a friend of Alter's. When Roger went to pick up the Lenore girl at her apartment, he found her struggling with some man. Mm, that happens. It looked like he was trying to kill her. There was a gun on the floor, and she called to Roger for help. He picked up the gun and shot the man. She told Roger he'd killed him and that he must get out. When we went back, they were both gone. About a month later, some of Alter's friends got in touch with me. They forget about the killing if you let Alter out of Sing Sing, huh? That's right. Hmm. Well, I don't remember reading anything about it in the papers. You're the first one outside of Alter and his friends who knows anything about it. You see, they say they're hiding the corpus delecti, so there was no report of the murder. Now, you think maybe they staged the killing, put blanks in the gun, and after your son beat it, the dead man walked out on his own steam? Well, that's what I want you to find out. Uh-huh. The man your son thought he killed, uh, what did he look like? Dark man with a scar from his nose to his chin. Mm -hmm. If my son is innocent, I want you to bring the parties responsible to justice. Amen. Well, here's a check for a thousand dollars. Thank you. If you find the girl and prove my son innocent, there'll be another thousand in your pocket. Well, I'll sew up the holes. Thanks, Mr. Warden. I'll start right away. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. You can reach me at the Wentworth Hotel. I'm staying there until this matter gets cleared up. Well, I won't get in touch with you unless I find something. The guys who work me over are pretty set in their ways, and there's no sense in you tripping over a lot of dead bodies. I grabbed a pack of camels, looked at the thousand-dollar check, thought about the warning the two bruise artists had given me, and decided it was a toss-up. If I spent the thousand like I knew I would, I'd wish it was dead anyway, so I left the building, grabbed a cab for the fifth precinct. Ten minutes later, I walked into the squad room and spotted Sergeant Otis, looking like an advertisement for a sour stomach. Well, Richard Diamond, Private Sloth. Well, Sergeant Otis, Private Sloth. Huh? Well, look it up. S-L-O-T-H. I will. Under S. I know. The three-toed variety. And get your uniform press, won't you? Looks like you've been hanging it in a taffy machine. Oh. Well, hello, Rick. I... Hey, you must get tired changing your face every day. Somebody shove you around again? Oh, I've been catching up on my patty cake. Tell me, Walter, do you ever know a girl named Lenore Brown? Yeah, sure. John Alter's expense account. They used to hold hands before I sent him up. Know where I can find her? Alter's still got her staked out. When he gets out, he's going to come back and dig up the claim. You better forget about it. She's got the antidote for lonely nights, but some of Alta's boys are protecting it. I know, I know. They gave me a pep talk this afternoon. Then listen to them. It's better watching the game from the bench. Oh, uh, you never can tell. I might make a score. Well, you're outweighed, outclassed, and liable to be outlived. But she used to work at the Black Swan in Florida. We heard Alta was trying to get a parole, and she came to New York to be close to him. Any line on her here in town? No, but if she's seeing Alta, you might spot her on a visitor's day. Well, Rick, how are you? It's been a long time. I know a lot of people wouldn't like to hear that, Warden. <laughs> how are you? Oh, fine, fine. What's on your mind? Well, I hear Johnny Alta's been having company. I'd like to take a look at her. Oh, Miss Brown. Mm hmm. Well, I can't blame you. <laughs> well, I just want to spot her and see where she goes. <laughs> you can't miss. If she walked through the yard, there'd be a jailbreak tomorrow. What time are visiting hours? 
Well, if she's seeing Alder today, she should be downstairs right now. Like to take a look? Uh huh. I'll have a guard take you down. Good. Well, well on uh, second thought, I'll go myself. There she is, sitting at the end table, talking to Alder. Hmm. Well, now I know why Alder needs a lot of money. She's wearing enough mink to carpet Radio City. <laughs> you should get a load of her on a warm day. Huh? Well, the coat doesn't stop me. If she'd show up, she was wearing a tent. How long has she got with Alder? Mm, about another five minutes. Warden, you know, uh, maybe I'll let you put me away for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. With something like that to look forward to on Visitor's Day, I might go for the change. <laughs> You'd get tired of just talking. I hung around by the big gray buildings until she came out. She walked over to a long white convertible and got in. I decided to let her buy me a new fuse, so I walked over to the car. Uh, going into town? Oh. Back up three feet and I'll let you know. Three. Okay. Mm-hmm. Your tailor couldn't do all of that. Get in. Visiting? Oh, yeah. The, uh, the warden's an old friend. How many years did you know him? Uh-uh, baby. I've been going home every night all my life. Every night? Well, uh, almost. What do you do with the, uh, almost? It depends. Everybody likes something different. You must get tired thinking up new ideas. Oh, I don't think much. It's more fun being surprised. Hey, what's the idea? Surprise. Oh, yeah. And a nickel-plated one. Look, baby, you don't have to pull a gun. If I'm getting fresh, I'll get out and walk. You'll sit right there, Diamond. Name dropper? Mm-hmm. Expecting company? Mm-hmm. And you've met them before, honey. Well, that's nice. I wouldn't want you to get stuck with the introduction. Uh, aye. Those your friends driving up? It should be. Now, you hold real still. They'll only shoot you this time. When a gal's got a gun, you don't stand much of a chance unless she's got her mind on something else. This one did. And when she looked up at the rearview mirror to make sure it was her boys, I tagged her. My two playmates were just pulling up and I jumped out of the car. There he is, Yuki! He's struggling off! She's out cold! Well, shut him, Salvador! Shut him! Before we continue with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. One reason is flavor. Camels' costly tobaccos have a rich, full flavor you won't find in any other cigarette. Another reason is mildness, proven mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test. The sensible, thorough test. Not just a sniff of the tobacco. Not just a puff of smoke. Only by day-in, day-out smoking can you discover how well a cigarette agrees with your throat. Smoke camels for 30 days and see how mild camels are pack after pack, week after week. See why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. There he goes! Get him, Salvador! I was running through the trees then, and I could hear Salvador somewhere behind me, falling all over himself. I pulled my gun and thought about waiting for him. But I had another idea. I stopped and listened. 
He's around here somewhere, Suki. Well, come on, we're spread out, Salvador. They were somewhere behind me, and both of them were looking now. So I cut off to my left and headed back to the highway. The cars were about 100 yards down the road, and I used my last lung getting there. Lenore was still unconscious, so I climbed in the white convertible with the unconscious nylons and drove off. I'd been driving for about 15 minutes when I noticed something lying on the seat beside the still-sleeping Lenore. It was her purse, and she didn't wake up when I grabbed it. Doing a rummage job at 80 miles an hour isn't easy, but there wasn't much of interest anyway, just a little black book. I needed a gimmick, so I stuck it in my pocket. I put the purse back on the seat just as she started coming around. Well, now that's it, baby. Sit up and look at the scenery. How did you get here? Where's Yuki and Salvador? Playing Peter Pan. Jaw hurt? Yes. You heal. Well, play rough and you get hurt. Where do I take you? My apartment, I guess. I drove her to her place on East 51st and walked her to the door. She looked at me like a fat woman eyeing a French pastry, and her mouth slipped down to her shoelaces when I gave her a peck on the cheek and left her standing with an old front doorknob in her hand. I went back to the office and took out her little black book. There were a lot of names, and some of them I knew. Yuki, and after it, likes his work. And Salvador. And after his name, has own gun. And oh, yes, yes, Richard Diamond, too. I never did figure out what the three stars were for. But three other names and addresses put me in second gear. One was in the village, another down by the East River, and the last was somewhere in Chinatown. All of them were set up for a dead man who wanted to make himself scarce. I wanted to talk with Wharton uh, before I started hunting, so I called him at the Wentworth. Did you find out anything yet, Diamond? Uh, not yet. Look, Mr. Wharton, you said the man I was looking for was was dark with a scar, hmm? Yes, from his nose to his chin. Well, thanks. Maybe I'll call you tomorrow. I hope you clear this thing up in a hurry. Well, so do I. I want to get my nerves untangled. I took the easy address first, grabbed a cab, and 30 minutes later I was walking down the steps of a shabby little dive on the east side of Greenwich Village. You want something, Mac? Yeah, a pound of egg noodles. Just sweep them up off the floor. Hey, uh, you know anyone around named Lenore? Sure, Lenore Brown. She comes in here about once a week, listens to the kid at the piano. Now, why would a classy dame like that go out with him? He don't play the piano so good. You ever see a guy with her? man with a scar from his nose to his chin? No, she always does a single. Oh, well, thanks. You've been swell. I walked out, got back in the cab, and marked off Greenwich Village in the little black book. The second address, down by the East River. The night was black, and the fog had rolled in, staked out a claim all the way to the Hudson. I stopped cold and looked down at two gleaming eyes like two pieces of polished glass shining in the glare of the dim street lamp. Steady, boy, steady. Steady. Hold it, Lucifer. Yeah. Yeah, hold it, Lucifer. He won't hurt you, mister. Unless I tell him to. Well, think about it for a while, will you? I'm a poor substitute for horse meat. What do you want? Do you know a Lenore Brown? You a cop? Shamus. Beat it, Lucifer. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, pal. I couldn't hold my breath much longer. You can come on up on the porch. You're looking for Lenore Brown, huh? Yeah, you know her? I met her. My wife works for her. Is your wife in? Yeah. Esther, come here. Some private dick wants to talk to you. She's Miss Brown's private maid. Yes? Uh, your husband tells me you work for Miss Brown. Yeah, what's she done? She got many friends. Man friends? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know a man with a scar? Sure, I know lots of them. What are you talking about, woman? I met someone who Miss Brown knows. What did you mean by that, mister? Look, I really don't know anybody with a scar now. You better beat it. Yeah, get moving. And I want to talk to you, woman. Get in there. Yes, yeah, honey. Honey. 
I knew she was going to get bruised, but he looked rough enough to cut my windpipe, and I wanted some place to pour my coffee down in the morning. So I got out of there fast and headed for the last address in the little black book. The place was on one of those narrow, dark streets that looked like the inside of a grave. The sign above the door read Tangy, so I pushed open the door and went in. If I didn't find the man with the scar here, I was out on two strikes. It was a little restaurant on the bottom floor of a two-story building. A quiet waiter slipped up and showed me to a booth. He shoved a menu in my hand and disappeared before I could ask him anything. The place was empty except for an old couple sitting near the door. The waiter said something to them and they looked quickly over at me and then they left in a hurry. The room was completely empty now. Even the waiter had disappeared. I looked up at a flight of stairs at the far end of the room. A pair of very healthy ankles came into view, and they were holding up a pair of legs that ran my blood pressure up to 190 again. I eased my gun out and held it under the table. She turned the corner and started down toward my booth like a loose snake in a rabbit pen. Mind if I sit down? Well, it's, uh, it's your party. Shame on you. Don't you know it's not nice to pilfer a lady's handbag? Now Lenore will have to spank. Looks like the last address paid off. If you're buying shrouds, it did. Where's the guy that young Wharton was supposed to have killed? Upstairs. But he's very unsociable. Hates long conversations. I only need a couple of lines. <laughs> he can't even do that. He likes to keep on breathing. The old man figures Arthur framed his son. He's not going to let your boyfriend out of Sing Sing until he finds the man with a scar. Think he can do it better than you did? I found him. Was it worth dying for? I don't know. I can tell you better after I talk to him. Mama's going to have to spank sooner than she expected. Come on in, boys. Well, 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 look who's here. Are Mama's two big idiots out collecting blood? Where are your buckets? He's bitter, Yuki. A present. You've met Yuki and Salvador before, haven't you? Yeah, on the end of a fist. They want to show you the town. I know the beat. Well, I'll bet you've never seen it from the bottom of the East River. No, but if you'll put on a bathing suit, I might buy the idea. It's too bad we'll never make the beach together. I'd like to show you the sights. Boys, you'd better help Mr. Diamond out of the booth. I think he's stuck. You know how it is. Boys like to keep moving. Sure. And so do I. I shot once and caught Yuki in the stomach, and I dumped the table over on Salvador. He grabbed like he was going to waltz with it and went down on his back. I didn't have to get up. I just shot him through the table. Lenore was out of the booth fast and running for the stairs. Look out, Tony! Tony, look out! I caught up with her at the foot of the stairs, and she started up. I saw him standing on the upper landing, scar and all. All meaning gun in his hand. He missed me, but nailed her halfway up. She spun around and fell all over me. With both of us down, he was in a good spot to finish the job, but my arm hit the lower post of the staircase and swung me right into line. I just rested my elbow on the banister and let him have it. You should have kept your nose up, mister. A bad landing washes you out. Tell me, did Wharton's son identify the man with the scar? Yeah, he was the one he thought he killed. Mm -hmm. But the old man's feeling pretty good. Yeah, just left. He's happier than Otis on payday. Mm. Who was the guy with the scar? A uh, cheap hood. Record. Name of Lucio. Mm. The girl in Alter had him hidden out in that place so he wouldn't be seen. And I... I, I don't think you're funny, Diamond. What's the matter, Otis? Yeah, what do you want, meathead? I looked it up. The three-toed variety. Uh oh what are you talking about? Oh, I uh, called him a sloth. Yeah, a sloth. You should see the picture in the dictionary. It's an animal. Well? It's funny looking with three toes on each foot. Well? And it's noted for its laziness. Okay, Lieutenant. Just forget it. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. 
What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, buy your Camels the handy, thrifty way by the carton. That way you always have Camels when you want them. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Camels deem it a privilege to send free cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans. This week's Camels go to Veterans Hospitals Topeka, Kansas, and Oakland, California. U.S. Army Percy Jones General Hospital, Battle Creek, Michigan. U.S. Naval Hospital, Portsmouth, Virginia. More than 194 million Camels have now been sent to servicemen, servicewomen, and veterans. Now, until next week, enjoy Camels. I always do. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Men, for pipe smoking pleasure, get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is rich and flavorsome. It's crimped cut for smooth, even burning, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Yes, P.A. is America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the early twilight, Broadway is dappled with beginning shadows. It's the time of the small shock. The springtime's day starts its long scream down into night. It's time clock time, the hour for going home again. Close the ledger, lock the store, figure the overtime, smile at the boss, and out into the street. Blink, then run. The subway waits for no man. Home again. End another day again. My day was just beginning, north on Broadway and to the east, Central Park around the 80s. I pushed through the crowd whose focus was a park bench that faced the street. All right, come on, come on, break it up there, let him through. And Sergeant Muggerman tells you why you're there. Right over here, Danny. Stand right there near the bench. I found the knife. I didn't pick it up. I ripped... Who's the boy? Paul, uh... Paul Gilbert. Yeah. I haven't been home from school yet. Oh, you'll go home in a squad car, Paul. I promised him with the siren, Danny. Yeah, with the siren. What happened, Paul? How did the knife get there? I saw the man take it out of his own back and throw it down. And then the man staggered away. Mm -hmm. Did I show you this, Danny? All this blood? Wherever he is, he's hurt real bad. I want you to think for a minute, Paul. What did this man look like? Tall, I guess. Yeah, 
I guess that's all. He was tall. Uh, most grown-ups are tall, aren't they, Paul? All of them, except for midgets. One more thing, Paul. Was there anyone with this man? Think hard. No, I don't think so. Well, you told me that The other a... man I saw wasn't with him. The other man in the hat just watched him. Then the man in the hat ran away. He wasn't with him. What did the man in the hat look like? He had a hat. That's all I know. I got scared. I ran. That's right, Danny. Paul ran right into Officer Curcio on the beat. Almost knocked him down. Curcio came back, saw the blood on the bench, the knife, phoned it in. Paul, did you know the man, the man with the knife? No. Uh Uh-uh. I usually don't come home from school this way. We had an after-school game with the 8B2 over there on the playground. This is the first game of the intramural. Squad car, Muggerman, for Paul, with a siren. Then the careful tracing, the sifting through the shadows of a city, the dust of a city, the hiding places of a city into which a wounded man must crawl and lie for a time and then wander in search of a kindlier place, a darker place, and leave behind him the trail of the wounded, the blood of his life. But the man who'd been stabbed had done none of these things. The hospitals told me that, the doctors, the fellow in the neat white jacket in the drugstore across from the park who, not having a wounded man, offered me a special on shaving cream. Then the legwork of the man on the beat, harvesting the crop of those who had been at the scene of the crime, sorting them, packaging them, parceling them out to me, one by one. Look, mister, how many rights do we have to give you guys? I was calling on my girl. I brought her a box of chocolate-covered peppermints. She was beginning to understand me. Well, we won't keep you long. Y- you don't understand, mister. I don't stick close to my little bird. She busts out of her cage. I've known her to do that when I pop out two minutes for a corner newspaper. You were in the park this afternoon, saw a man who was stabbed. Can you describe the man? I was never in no park where an unfortunate got stabbed. An officer took your name. You made him erase it, start all over again because he wasn't spelling it right. So you caught me in a lie. Can you describe the man who was hurt? Describe? Who got a chance to get close to him? Everybody pushing, shoving like it was a parade for a general. I'm lucky I got a peek at the top of his fleeing skull. Oh, that's all. Look, uh, I won't explain why I lied about not being in the park. Uh, my girl, the bird, thinks I work for a living. It's a little white lie I used to keep a cage. That's all. You can go. Then the man who is eager, whose eyes dart and pierce, who follows you as you move away from him, stays close to you, needs the lapel of your coat. I was real close to him. He had a knife in his back. He breathed in my face. I could tell you the color of his eyes, how close I was. Tell me. Blue eyes, washed out blue, and no tears in them, no tears at all. No remorse for the evil doing that had brought wrath upon him. Blue eyes. What color hair? Dirty. A dirty color. All matted. No. No, it was blonde and shining. There was a kind of light that shone about it. That's because he was dying. Dying in protest against all the wickedness that'll drown. Drown us all. A big man, a short man, a bird. What does it matter how he looked? I was close to him, I tell you. He reached out his hand to me, touched my hand, tears on my face. Help him out of your office. Motion a policeman over, watch him be gentle with the man, take him away. And then motion for the next one to come in. Realize, of course, that you're imposing on my time. Not that I mind. It could be a welcome relief from those spoiled monsters I simper and smile at and diaper. You're a nursemaid, Miss Cram, is that right? Call me governess and call me Virginia. Miss Cram doesn't sound like me at all, don't you think? You take the children to the park every day? From four to five thirty, except on rainy days. Hmm? On rainy days, the children and I stay at home and I'm permitted callers from four to five thirty. That's on rainy days. You told an officer you saw the man who was hurt. I was making conversation. I needed that to get those brats out of my hair. You didn't see him? I wouldn't have gone near him. But I can tell you who did see him, the looker. Who? The looker. All of us in the park know her. She sits in a window across the street on the fifth floor, watches every move we make every day. Sits there and watches. It makes you feel as if you're being spied on, you know what I mean? Fifth floor, in an apartment on 80th and 5th. Well, you can't miss her. Just stand out in the street for a while. Her eyes will bore right through you. But on a rainy day... I know, you're permitted callers. That's all, Miss Kerr. Yes? 
I'm Danny Clover, police. <laughs> we haven't done anything. I know. I don't even know who you are. There's no name card on your door. You want to come in and talk to us? All right. I'm George Mason. She's my... in the wheelchair. Diane's my wife. Uh, good evening, Miss Mason. Diane? Diane, dear. Diane, we've got a visitor. He said good evening to you. Say hello, Diane. This is Mr. Clover. He's from the police. Mr. Mason, there was some trouble earlier across the street from... Now, you talk to her, will you? I'm trying something. Maybe it'll do her some good, talking to her. No one ever does, you know. You just talk to her and I'll answer you. All right. There was a man stabbed across the street from you, Mrs. Mason, in the park. Yes, I heard about it when I came home. Have you found the man? No. Mrs. Mason... I understand that you sit by a window every day. That's right, that one. She sits there, watches. It's her pleasure. Today? Every day. Then she must have seen what happened. She must pretty, have... Uh... Pretty, pretty. What? What are you trying to say, Diane? Mm-hmm. Can't you see how it is? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. George? Yes. What is it? I saw a man today. I saw a knife today. Is there anything you can do? Can you talk to her? Diane. A man today. A knife today. Yes, well, can you tell me what the man looked like, sweetheart? Knife. Was he a big man? Was he a small man? Was he a nice man? Man. Did you like him? Try to erase from memory the eyes of the woman filled with the named terrors, the known terrors that dart and scurry, gnaw and nibble at the fleeting instance of serenity within her. And try to wash away in the city's night screaming the crooning of a tuneless song, and suddenly the known words, a man, a knife. And know that the eyes that absorb all movement, all shadow, all light on faces, and things that pass before them have seen nothing. Not the man who was stabbed, not the one who did the stabbing. And then the long walk to the darkened room, turn on the shaded light bulb and search the cupboards for sleep. And finally, it comes. In the morning, the scorching cup of coffee, the walk to headquarters, and the cheery greeting on the threshold from the cheery Sergeant Attaglia. Oh, welcome, Danny. Welcome to your abode away from your abode. Uh, good morning, Gino. Ah, the best. The sunniest, the bravest. Uh, not so early. Uh, Gino, all I've had is a cup of coffee. For which I am delighted. Huh? For which I am delighted. Come, I will escort you to your office, Danny. You will see there how I have taken the liberty to spread upon your desk a repast. <laughs> I shouldn't have done it, Gino. A repast consisting of a hot paper container of coffee and a half a dozen cinnamon bums. What a... The repast. Partake. Uh, looks good. How else should they look? The cinnamon bums were baked in the oven of Mrs. Tartaglia with her own two lily whites. Go ahead, partake. Munch, if you like. Mmm, delicious. Uh, thank Mrs. Tartaglia for me. Goes without saying. And now, to the events of the morning. <clears throat> uh, okay if I disturb while you munch? Mm, yeah. yeah. We of the department have discovered that this park bench upon which an alleged man was allegedly stabbed has been a lucky bench. Or unlucky, depending, of course, on the point of view of whom sat there. You'll explain it to me, aren't you, no? It goes without saying. The lucky part of the bench is that five weeks ago, a man found upon it, wrapped in a newspaper, $300. Turned it over to Lost and Found. So? So is that four weeks ago, same man turned into Lost and Found from the same bench, a like newspaper containing another 300 and we have not seen this pleasant, honest citizen since. Do you have his name? Oh, it goes with our... <clears throat> uh, Harry Forster, 1345 West 16th. Want I should keep the cinnamon buns hot for you, Danny? Oh, do that, Gino. You go ahead and do that. Please help me. 
Please come in and help me. What's the matter? My husband. No one will help me. I asked the neighbors. They said, call the police. Call an ambulance. Please, help. Where is he? You'll help. He's in our bedroom. I think he's... I think he's dying and no one would... No one... You're Mrs. Foster? Yes, Harry's wife. He came home last night and... And there was blood. He just looked at me like an animal and... There he is, mister. Help him. Please help him. Dead. No. No, you're wrong. He's been dead for a long time. He was asleep. Only asleep. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. On CBS this Sunday evening, Charlie McCarthy will play a tattoo artist for a group of sailors, while beautiful Ann Southern acts as his reluctant model. There'll be more fun with Eve Arden, Amos and Andy, Red Skelton, and Corliss Archer. Stay with CBS this Sunday, for these great comedy programs will be heard on most of these same stations. In the Maytime, the sun grins down and pats Broadway's cheek. Broadway loves it. The sunlit minutes are added to the ten-minute break for a cigarette. The walk is slower, the sway gentler. The windows are open wide, and the doors, too. And glints of sunlight are carried through long hallways on the sigh of a summer's wind, touching the lips of the girl at the typewriter, touching the hand of the man at the water cooler watching her, touching the steel of the file cabinets, warming them. And having made the tour, back onto Broadway and start all over again. But where I was, there was no warmth. Only a woman drawing a shawl tight around her shoulders and talking quietly to her dead. Harry, Harry, listen to me. You were right. We should have told them. We should have told them all about it. And you wouldn't be like this, and I would... Mrs. Foster, what should you have told us? What? What did you say? What should you and your husband have told us? About the money, nothing else. Money found on the park bench? Yes. You see, we should have told them, Harry... But he did, Mrs. Foster. He reported it. Turned it in. You don't understand... I knew no one would understand. Then maybe you can help me. Friday was always Harry's day off. From the factory out there. You can see it from here, see. On his day off, I'd pack him a little lunch and he'd kiss me goodbye. Walk up town to Central Park. He... Go on. He always went alone. He always sat on the same bench. Harry used to describe it to me. What he saw, people he talked to. Felt as if I'd been there with him. And one day he found money in a newspaper. And turned it in, like you said. The next week turned it in. But after that, I told him he didn't have to do that anymore. You mean he found more money? Is that what you're trying to tell me? What? You mean he found more money? For five weeks in a row. I told Harry he didn't have to turn it in anymore. I told him to go back. To be sure and keep going back. Every week. Yesterday, too. (laughs) And we'd be rich. No more of this. No more factory. Why didn't you call us when he came home hurt? Call a doctor? It would have spoiled it, ended it. The money, don't you see? I thought he'd live, and we... With that money... No. You couldn't. You couldn't see. Then she turned from me and walked over to the window, stared out of it. Across her shoulder, into the noon sunshine, I could see the factory emptying its lunchtime employees... The crowd breaking off its fragments, to the curb with the lunch pails, to the push carts for the ham on white and coffee. Then the other sound, the feet in the doorway, the entrance of the professionals, coroner, photographer, reporter. The man had been murdered. I left.
Then back again to Central Park and the park bench of the stabbing. Sit on it. A man named Harry Foster used to find money here, and he was killed. And a woman who had seen it happen, a woman who sat at a window every day. I looked up to the window. She wasn't there. I wondered why. I knew why. She was in the wheelchair. There was a man pushing it carefully down the steps. Can you scooch a little to the side, friend? Oh, need a hand? Uh, yeah, if you want. Ah, thanks. How are you feeling, Mrs. Mason? She ain't gonna answer you. I didn't know she left the house. Why should you even bother? Oh, I'm Danny Clover, police. Oh, hi, I'm Ben Taylor. Uh, got a you drive down the street. Only Mrs. Mason here, different. <laughs> kind of a take drive. Oh, I see. Just today? Oh, no, all the time. Uh, from one to three, uh, the element's willing. Uh, I take her for a ride. Sometimes here, sometimes ride. there. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, right away, Miss Mason. Uh, see you, Danny. Oh, wait a minute. How long have you been doing this, Ben? Right. Well, since her accident. Since at Coney last year. Hurt her back. Here and up here, her head. Right. Come on, right. Uh, I guess I better take her. I heard her cry like that before. I can't stand it. Sure. It's a nice day, Mrs. Mason. I hope you enjoy your ride. Oh, she will. She likes riding in the car. See you around, Danny. I watched Ben lift her gently out of the wheelchair, lift her into the back of the car, close the door, fold the chair, place it in the car trunk, then back and saying something to her. She looked up for an instant. Her eyes found me. Then she smiled and shaped a lost word with her lips. They were gone. And back at headquarters, the wall clock ticking off the hours of Harry Foster's death, ticking off the hours that his murderer came to a park bench, looked at it, smiled, walked away in the warm sun, ticked off the question of why money had been left there for Harry Foster to find week after week on Friday's twilight. And at four o'clock, the door opening slightly, and all you saw of the man was his cocked head. You Mr. Danny Clover? That's right. You want something? Only to know if you, Mr. Danny Clover, and to give you what I have in my pocket. They said I should give it to you, you being the interested party and all. Uh, what have you got in your pocket? This. An envelope. Stamped and everything. I found it. Well, give it to me. It's addressed to George Mason. Anybody can see that. That's the husband of that woman. The cripple. The one they call a looker in the papers. The one they think they saw that stabbing. <laughs> I did right bringing it to you. Huh? It's been opened. You open it? Don't lie to me. You opened it and then resealed it. All right, I opened it. I'm a normal kind of fellow with all the normal curiosities. First, I was going to mail it when I found it. But then I saw who was addressed to. I couldn't restrain myself. I'm like the proverbial cat, Mr. Clover. It could be I... trouble for you being like that. Not when you see what's in it. Not when you see what it says. It says, you've made a terrible mistake. That's all. Not another word. See? You can't do anything to me for just reading that. You just read it yourself. That's why I brought it to you. Because I'm a cooperative citizen. Now, where'd you find I, it? At Gwent's tomb. You know, I've been curious about that tomb for years now. Finally, I took time off to go to study it. Then I found a letter on the steps. And I never did get to really study Grant's tomb. Tough. You'll stick around, huh? Some of our boys want to have a long chat with you. They enjoy curious fellas. Sure, anything you say. I'm nothing if I'm not cooperative. Just nothing. I wouldn't say that, but you stick around, huh? <laughs> Hi, Ben. Well, hello, Danny. Hey, how do you like this, huh? I rigged up so when it's a sunny day, the telephone is on the outside of my shack. Inspiration, huh? Uh, fine. Who wants to be on the inside when outside it's sunny? <laughs> you car renting, Danny? I can give you rates. Oh, uh, just talk. <laughs> if you don't do business together, we never become enemies, huh? What's on your mind? Mrs. Mason. Ah, uh, yeah. Sad, huh? You know, if you set your mind to it and consider all she's been through, and then look at her, she's a pretty woman. I noticed. You said she was hurt in an accident at Coney Island, Ben. What, what kind of an accident? Uh, on the roller coaster. You know, one of them rides. Fell off. Right near the end of the ride. She stood up, fell. Was she with anyone? Uh, yeah, her husband. You want to know something? In spite of the heartbreak of having a wife like that, you know, Mr. Mason is one of the nicest guys I ever met. What about Mrs. Mason, Ben? 
Hmm? What about it? Can anyone ever talk to her, have a conversation with her? I talk to her. About what? Hmm. Things. You know, ain't it a pretty day, Mrs. Mason? Is there a draft on you, Mrs. Mason? I talk to her, but she just hums and sings. But, you know, I think she's getting better. Maybe I'm contributing. Where'd you go driving today? Um, Down Riverside Drive. You know, the river, Grant's tomb, the churches. Thanks a lot, Ben. Anytime, Danny, anytime at all. Hello, Mr. Clover. Good evening, Mr. Mason. We're we're delighted to see you. Please come in. Diane, it's Mr. Clover. Diane looks better, doesn't she, Mr. Clover? Yes, yes, she does. I brought you something, Mr. Mason. Here. Oh? A letter? It's addressed to you. Read it. I don't understand. Read it. Yes, it is. It's addressed to me, but it's been opened. That's right. Read it. All right. No. Note says you made a mistake, Mr. Mason. <laughs> Mrs. Mason, your husband might be electrocuted for a murder he committed. Leave her alone. I wasn't going to touch her. Cut it out, Mrs. Mason. What's the matter with you? Have you gone out of your mind, Clover? I said cut it out, Mrs. Mason. I told you leave her alone. All right, you've come here to accuse me of murder, but leave her alone. George. Don't don't worry about anything, dear. Get me a drink of water. What? What did you say? A drink of water, George. Cold water from the refrigerator. Diane. Darling, a drink of water. Do it. You won't be able to wait on me anymore. Mr. Clover is going to take you away from me. Talking like, like you know what you're saying. You do know what you're saying. What's happening? What's happening to us? It's already happened. It's all over. <laughs> Poor George. You paid off, didn't it, Mrs. Mason? Sitting at the window watching, watching for a man your husband could kill. Simple little man. He came and sat on the same bench every Friday. He got paid for a while. It was you. You wrote that first letter to Han. And this one. Made me pay blackmail to a man who didn't even know me, didn't know anything about me. It was so simple. Write a letter, put a stamp on it, drop it from the car. Someone picked up the first letter and mailed it. About five weeks ago, a letter with instructions in it. Why, yes. Leave money every Friday on the park bench. And the man who picked it up, Mr. Mason, you thought was a blackmailer, so you killed him. She's crazy. She really is. She's crazy. No, I'm not. I'm just a cripple, George. I can't move from this chair. Honest. But I'm not crazy. She's crazy. What did that first letter say, Mr. Mason? Well, that a man saw me push my wife off a ride at Coney Island. He demanded blackmail, but I didn't push, Diane. <laughs> Then why did you pay the money, darling? But you weren't going to let your husband alone, were you, Mrs. Mason? Even after he did what you wanted him to do, murder a man. Another letter, the one your husband's holding, telling him he killed the wrong man. It's not much to ask, is it? Wanting George to suffer? Look at me. You're an accessory, Mrs. Mason. Am I? What can you do to me? A cripple in a wheelchair. In a prison? Will that be different? Tell me how. I didn't push you, Diane. I didn't push you. You fell off that ride. You fell. Liar. Diane. You're a liar, George. Diane, will you listen to me? I made it up to you. I carried you. I waited on you. I, I went crazy that day. I hated you. I don't know why. I don't know. Oh, I know why. You're an evil woman. Evil. Poor George. You should have died. You should have. <laughs> Poor George. Poor
It's night on Broadway now. There's easy laughter, and a trumpet scurls its music into the grinning mob. It's top of the evening. Have another drink on me, kid, and let's set this dance out. It's a street gouged out of a scarlet dream. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as George Mason, Kathy Lewis as Diane Mason, and Virginia Gregg as Mrs. Foster. Others in the cast were Herb Vigran, Lou Krugman, and Johnny McGovern. Every Saturday night, Jan Murray takes a tip from Danny Clover and goes looking for people. Only Jan's beat is the United States. By coast-to-coast phone, he offers a grand in cold, hard cash if you can identify the phantom voice. So stay tuned now as Jan Murray and Sing It Again follow immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Night beat. This is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began on an elevated train and ended in eternity. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. The night is just about washed up. The sky is getting that tattletale gray around the edges. Another hour or so, three million alarm clocks will start yakking against the eardrums of Chicago's dear hearts and gentle people. A goodly number of said dear hearts and gentle people will stumble to the front door for their copy of the Morning Star. I'm wondering what they'll say when they read the opening sentence of the Night Beat story for today. The line that goes... This is a love story with the happiest ending I've ever heard. I guess they'll figure spring has got me in its perfume clutches, and more than likely I'll wind up around a bologna sandwich, and that'll be that. Only if they just keep reading, maybe they'll be in for a strange kind of surprise. It started a little after 10 o'clock last night. I just boarded an elevated train and was on my way to the loop. The train was pretty crowded, but I saw an empty seat up front, and I hurried for it. I started sitting down without looking. Anton, where have you been? Hmm? I beg your pardon? Oh, I've waited so long, Anton. The girl sitting next to me. I noticed her for the first time. About 20, maybe. And so beautiful, so delicately beautiful, it was like your eyes had hit the jackpot, and somehow the... The grinding elevator train suddenly sounded like a gypsy violin. Oh, Anton, you shouldn't have gone away. Look, I, I hate to tell you this, but I think you've got me mixed up. Oh, with... it's so good to hear you, to be near you, Anton, so good. Yeah, it's good to be near you too, kid. But... Won't, won't, won't ever go away again, will you? <laughs> I'd like to stay here forever. Oh, promise me, Anton. Promise me you'll never go away. 
beautiful as she was, it started giving me the creeps. If I'd been Anton, I'd have enjoyed it immensely, but being as how I was two other guys, I didn't see it. And also there was something about her eyes, a disturbing brightness. I didn't know what to do about it, and before I could decide... Lake Street Transfer! I reached my transfer station. I started getting up. Anton! No, don't go! Oh, lady, look, it's my station. Don't leave me again, Anton, please, no! Now, take it easy. Let go of me. What's wrong with you? This is my station. Anton... I can't let you leave me again. I won't. Well, you'll just have to, kiddo. Now let go. My son's on. Oh. No. She folded up like a little rag doll into a dead faint. I bent over her, picked up her arm to massage her wrist. It was like touching a hot stove. She was burning up with fever. Passengers in the car were crowding around. The conductor still hadn't given the signal for the train to leave the station. I picked the girl up in my arms, who was like lifting a ten-year-old kid. She must have weighed a fast 90 pounds. I carried her out of the train onto the platform. Someone called for an ambulance. She was still unconscious when the ambulance came. She looked so small and so lost and so alone. And, well, according to her, I was Anton, so the least Anton could do would be to sit beside her on the long ride to the hospital. She was still out cold when we reached County Hospital. They found her name and address inside her purse. Mrs. Marisha Nowak, 612 Larrabee Street. I waited around to see what was wrong with her. After almost an hour, they said I could go upstairs and talk to the doctor. Oh, Mr. Stone? Oh, yes. Doctor, I I want to see about that girl I brought in. Marisha Nowak? Yes. Relative of yours? Oh, no, no. I just met her tonight. Oh, I'm afraid we've got to contact some relative right away. Nothing you can do for her, huh? Do for her? Poor kid's been sick for years and waits till she's dying before she comes to a hospital. Well, it takes money to go to a hospital, Doc. Not here. Why didn't she come here? What's wrong with these people? Are they proud or stupid? Three years ago, maybe we could have done something for her, but now... Well, yeah, I'm... I don't know, Mr. Stone. I don't know. It's, it's completely frustrating. You study medicine, what good does it do? Sometimes life doesn't seem to make any sense. Since when is it supposed to make sense? <laughs> I sound like this is my first patient. Not very professional, I'm afraid. (laughs) But don't worry about it. It's human. Now, this girl keeps talking about her husband, Anton. Well, she was talking that way when I met her. Yes, he's supposed to take her away someplace to Mexico. She says where it's warm and she'll get well. What do they expect? Miracles? Oh, sure, miracles. Maybe Mexico was going to be her miracle. Do you have any idea how to contact her husband? Doesn't the girl know where he is? Doesn't seem to, even when she's not delirious. Got an address from her purse, a place over on Larrabee Street, north of Chicago Avenue. Yes, I know that neighborhood. Furnished rooms with kitchen privileges. Bring your own mousetraps, lovely. No phone listing. I was thinking of calling the police. Yeah. Trouble is, there's so little time. Well, how much time? I don't know. Could happen five minutes from now. Five hours. Well, uh... I'll tell you what, I'll drop by her address and see what I can find out. Doctor, she's conscious again. Rational, oh. she wants to talk to you. All right, nurse. Uh, care to see you, Mr. Stone? Yeah. The doc turned and walked into the room, and I... Well, I followed him. That's a nice promising beginning for a love story with a happy ending, hmm? Only when we got inside Marisha Noack's room, the joke was on me. There was no hearts and flowers. She was even more beautiful than before. <laughs> Her black hair spread out on the white pillow, her delicate face and the lovely eyes following us as we came into the room. No fear in those eyes. None at all. Just a sort of questioning. Doctor, have you found him yet? Not yet, Marisha. We're still trying. This is Mr. Stone. He's trying to help us locate your husband. Oh, I hope you find him. Poor Anton. He'll feel so bad if you don't find him in time. Of course he will. That's why the doctor would like you to tell me anything you can that might help us find him. But I told the doctor he went to find work, my Anton, so he could take me away where I could get well and could be a wife to him. Does it bother you to talk? Does it tire you? No. No, I like talking about him. And there's so little time. The doctor said you were planning on going to Mexico. To Las Flores. The little town of the flowers in Veracruz. My ring is from Mexico. See? Silver and turquoise. It's nice. We were married with two rings. Exactly alike. Silver and turquoise. You think Anton could have gone there to Mexico? No. No, he'd never have gone there without me. The 
little town of the flowers. Like we planned on our honeymoon. Just like it said in the travel folder. With thousands of blossoms on the water. Perfuming the air. But we went to a real hotel here in Chicago on our honeymoon. Anton insisted on it. Even though we couldn't afford it. It was in the winter and it was cold in Chicago like now. Icicles hung from the trees, breaking the branches. But in the room it was warm. And we had each other. Look out the window, Mauricia. You know, I've, I've never seen the lake from up high. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, Anton. I'm so happy, Anton. But wasn't it extravagant coming here to a hotel... I'd have been just as satisfied going straight to our room. On Larrabee Street? Nah, Marisha, not on our honeymoon. We'll have time enough for that. How could you possibly imagine anything beautiful from a furnished room on Larrabee oh, Street? Darling. But here, this is different. It's more than a hotel room in Chicago overlooking the lake. This is what we've dreamed of. Imagine it's Las Flores. Oh, yes. The little town of the flowers. Look out there, Marisha. That isn't snow, it's thick tropical foliage. And those aren't icicles hanging from the trees. They're blossoms, and the wind is warm and soft outside. Oh, you'll get well, Marisha. We don't need money, we can live for practically nothing. Fresh fruit growing on trees, all we can oh, eat. Oh, we will go there, Anton, we will. And I'll get well there. I'll be a wife to you, Anton. Just you wait and see. We didn't go to Mexico. And then Anton went away. And you haven't heard from him since? No. But I don't blame him. Why should a man stay with a wife who's sick? Oh, no, no, no. You, you said yourself you went away to earn money for your trip. Yes. Yes, that's it. But now if I could only see him once more, just once, to tell him not to feel badly, to be happy for what we had... If I could only tell him not to feel sorry. Because it was the same as if we really had been to us, Flores. Well, you better rest now. I'll... I'll try to find him. It's tough when they know they're going to die. It's not that they're scared. But suddenly there's something they feel they've got to do. And time is running out. That's how it was with Marisha Noick. She had to find her Anton to tell him it was okay about a little town of Mexico that neither one of them had ever seen or ever would see. How do you find a guy like that, and what was I doing looking for him? Oh, well. I took a cab back to the loop. I picked up my car and drove over to the Larrabee Street address. It was a rooming house, all right, and the poorest-looking one on the block. I rang the bell, and I waited. A middle-aged woman came to the door. What is it? Are you the manager? If you're looking for a room, I got no vacancy. Oh, no, no, I don't want a room. You have someone living here by the name of Noack? Yes, but she ain't home. She ain't been here all day. I know that. Uh, she's in the hospital. The hospital? Oh, the poor thing. I was worried about her. She's never been out late like this. Is her husband here, Anton Noack? Oh, I know. What? He ain't been here for a long time. Working someplace out of the city, I think. Well, do you have any idea where? I've got to find him. Mrs. Noack is... Well, they don't expect her to live. He's got to be notified. Oh, no. Oh, that poor little girl. For such a long time, she's been sick. Come on in, please. Maybe there's something in here written down. Or maybe Mr. Nowak's brother would know. His brother? Where does he live? Well, no, I don't know exactly. He's the one that's been sending Mrs. Nowak money to live on while her husband's been away. That was a beginning... We found an envelope from the brother in the girl's room, Paul Nowak. He lived on Clark Street in the Lincoln Park neighborhood. I drove over. There was a man coming down the steps as I got out of my car. I stopped him when he got to the sidewalk. I beg your pardon? Yes? I saw you coming out of that building. You wouldn't be Paul Nowak, would you? Why do you ask? Well, I'm from the Chicago Star. I'm trying to locate Anton Nowak. Well, I can't help you. I, I don't know anything about him. Excuse me, I'm late to work. Mr. Nowak! Huh. You are his brother, aren't you? Oh, yes, but I... Well, what's the matter with you? I, I don't know anything about him. He's... He's gone away someplace. 
to work. Look, fellow, I got to find her. Marisha's very sick. Marisha? She's in the hospital. Oh, I, I didn't know. I got to find your brother right away. I told you, I don't know where he is. My brother and I... Well, we don't see each other. I haven't seen him since he left. But he's written to you. He must have. You've been sending money to his wife. All right. It's none of your business, but I'll tell you. I had one letter from him. He asked me to do what I could for Marisha until he could send for her. Where was the letter from? Say where he was working? Some place in uh, Montreal. He, he didn't give any address. Uh, some uh, fur company like uh, Chicago Montreal Furs. Well, it doesn't sound like you're telling me the truth, Mr. Nowak, but I can't see why you'd want a thing like that on your conscience. I'm telling you the truth. Well, okay, but don't take it so hard. Oh, Marisha. That poor kid. Uh, I'll see you the first thing tomorrow. Well, you better make it tonight. I can't. I just can't. We're right in the middle of our tax work. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I see your point. Only thing is that uh, tomorrow she'll be dead. It's not true. The do doctors are notorious for saying things like that. I I, I don't believe it for a uh, minute. Would you believe it if you weren't in the middle of your tax work, Mr. Noy? Now, you have no right to talk to me like that. No right at all. No, I'll not. see you tomorrow, I tell you. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll... You get out of my way. Get out of my way and, and, and stay out of my life. Stay out of my life or you'll regret it, Mr. Stone. Now, what was that for? NBC is presenting Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. A love story with a happy ending. Yes, that's what the man said. Only right at the moment, if there was any happiness in the world, it was staying out of my sight. Almost midnight, and Marisha Nowak up at the hospital, hanging on to life by her fingernails until I could find her husband, Anton. Nothing to go on but the name Anton's brother had thrown at me, the Chicago Montreal Fur Company. I looked it up in the phone book. It was there, all right. I started dialing the number. I didn't imagine anybody be around this time of the night, but it was the only lead I had at the moment. There weren't too many moments left. All I could think about was what the doctor had said. Maybe she's got five hours. Five hours. No, oh, nobody's going to answer. Hello? Hello. Uh, this is a reporter on the Chicago Star. Oh, there's nobody here. All gone home. Now, uh, look, I'm trying to locate a man who's working for your company. There's nobody here. I'm cleaning woman. Uh, call tomorrow. No, 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 wait, please. Listen, I don't have any time. This is very important. Can you tell me how I can locate the manager of your company? The manager gone home at 5 o'clock. Uh, this is the cleaning woman. Oh, yes, yes, I understand that, but can you please tell me the manager's number? I've got to telephone him now. Oh, just a minute. I waited. Seemed like forever while she went for the number. Hello? Yeah, were you able to find it? Uh, George Swanson. Lake. Lakeview 42311. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, tell him I didn't give out the number only because it's an emergency. Yes, all right. I'll tell him. Thank you. Goodbye. L-A-4-2-3-1-1. Hello, Mr. Swanson. Yes? I'm sorry to trouble you, Mr. Swanson, but it's very important. My name is Stone. I'm a reporter on the Star. I'm trying to locate a man who works for your company, an Anton Nowak. Uh, 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 we have no one by that name working for what? us. Uh, wh wh what was that name? Anton Nowak. Never have had since I've been with the company. Of course, we're an old firm. May have been a way back. Oh, no. No, no. This would have been in the last year or so. No, sorry. Uh, would you have any way of knowing if he worked at your Montreal branch? We have no Montreal branch. Isn't your company the Chicago Montreal Fur Company? Yeah, that's right. We haven't had a branch in Montreal for years. That used to be our headquarters when the company first started, but we're strictly a Chicago firm now. Oh, I see. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry to trouble you. Oh, not at all. Oh, uh, if it's going to be printed in the papers, don't forget to mention our name. No, no, I won't. Goodbye, Mr. Swanson. Something was beginning to smell, and it wasn't just the west wind out of the stockyards. 
I checked the vital statistics on deaths. No Anton Noack since 44. Checked the police records for amnesia cases. In the central bonding company files, Paul Noack was listed as a night auditor with the Great Lakes Bank Reserve over on State Street. I drove around to State Street and rang the night bell of the Great Lakes Reserve. The watchman wouldn't let me in, but in a couple of minutes, Noack came out of the building alone. His face was white as he came toward me. Why did you come here? Well, your brother doesn't work for the Chicago Montreal Fur Company. I thought you'd want to know. No, I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything about him. Your own brother? You had no right to come here. No right, do you hear? This is my work. Well, sure, but I didn't think you'd mind. After all, you've got nothing to hide. Of course I have nothing to hide. They know me here. I'm, I'm respected. I have a position of trust. You, you had no right to come here and make trouble for me. It's taken me years to get where I am. All right, now, just take it easy. Nobody's interested in making trouble for you. But I am interested in finding Anton Nowak, and whether you like it or not, that's what I intend to do. Well, then find him. Find him, only stay away from me. Stay away from my work. I can't help you. I told you that. Now stay away from me. I didn't have time to twist his arm. As a last resort, I headed across town to police headquarters, Bureau of Missing Persons, and my old friend, Sergeant Adams. No, Randy, no, he's never been listed as a missing person. Somebody would have had to report him, his wife or a brother, you know, for us to have a record on him. Yes, yes, Adams, I know that, but the guy is missing. You say you checked the death records. That's right. How about hospital records? Well, there's nothing to go on and not enough time, Adams. I tell you, i got to find the fellow tonight, tomorrow, the latest. Yeah, yeah, date of disappearance, May 10th, 1948. Did you check the arrest records for that date? Nothing under no Uh Uh-huh, how about John Doe's? John Doe's? No, I never thought of that. Yeah, well, come on. It won't take much time. You never can tell. Yeah, it just might be something. Usually you find something on these John Doe's after you had them a while. FBI prints, pictures, or else they just break down and tell us where they are. Of course, if they're just John Doe drunks, <laughs> just a matter of sobering them up. Uh-huh. Right in here, Randy. Hi, Mac. Hello, Adams. Arrest records, 48 May 10th. Okay. You better make it May 11th, too. Uh, you the guy that phoned earlier? Yes, I phoned. Nothing under those names you asked about. Yeah, Mac, yeah, we want to have a look at the John Doe's. Here you are. Yeah. May 10th. A's, B's, C's, D. Day. Dalton, Denver, Dill, Doe. Doe, John Doe, drunk. John Doe, drunk. John Doe, drunk. Must have been kind of drunk out there, man. Here's one, John Doe, armed robbery. Let me see the file on this one, Mac. 192701. All right. You think there'd be any information in the file? Uh, you never can tell, Randy. Personal property slip sometimes has the information you can use. Here you are. One nine two seven zero oh, one. Mm. And though age twenty three, hair dark, eyes brown, height five ten three quarters, no identifying scars. Well, that uh, you know that mm. that age that age is right. It it could be no What do you do? Mm. Hold up. Hmm. Captured by the victim. Must have been new at the game. Let's look at what else you got, huh? Yeah, we'll have a look at the personal property list, stuff he had on him when he was booked. Ah. Brown suit, white shirt, blue striped tie, no hat, white handkerchief. What is this under jewelry? One only hand ring Indian. Silver and turquoise. What else? Cash, eight cents. Identification? No, no. That's about all. It... Oh, here's a note. <laughs> I guess he was trying to get away. One only travel folder on Mexico. I'd found him. Anton Nowak was John Doe, arrested for robbery May 10th, 1948, convicted and sentenced to Joliet for two to five years, still under the name of John Doe. It was beginning to fit together, sure. He didn't want her to know. That's why he hadn't written. That was the reason for the lie about the job in Montreal. He was afraid it would hurt her. And the prison record, that's why his brother wouldn't tell where he was, afraid that somehow Anton's crime would reflect on his own bank job. I jumped into my car and headed out Ogden Avenue towards Joliet over 30 miles away. It was the middle of the night. I had no idea what I could do when I got there. All I knew was I had to get there fast. Maybe he'd been released. Maybe I could talk the warden into letting him out with me under guard. Maybe I could put a call through to the hospital. He could at least talk to her on the phone. I didn't know. When I got to Joliet, the place was lit up like soldiers' field. The guard took me inside to the warden. He was dressed. He seemed to have been expecting me. Now, you're a little late, Stone. Doesn't anybody go to bed around here? Yeah, the rest of the boys have been and gone. The rest of what boys? The other papers. You mean they got here ahead of me? Yeah, why, of course. The break happened a couple of hours ago. A break? I thought there was something funny about all those lights and everybody being up at this time of the night. Isn't that why you're here? No, no, I came up to see a fellow. What happened? 
One of the men suddenly decided he wanted out. Grabbed a gun away from a guard and started blasting away. Had to shoot him to stop him. Not an organized break? No, he was alone. Can't understand it. Model prisoner. Coming up for parole in a month. And tonight he just blows up. Poor fellow. Uh, his name wouldn't be John Doe, would it? One of many. How did you know? Well, he might be the fellow who's coming up to see. Chicago number... 192701. Yeah. Sir, that's a shame. He's in a hospital cell down the hall. I see him. He's pretty bad off. I'd like to see him if you don't mind, Warden. Come on. Thank you. Funny about these John Doe's. Did you know him? No, no, I don't. I, I think I know his wife. Usually something pretty decent about them. Trying to protect their families, mostly. Can't hardly blame them, either. Oh, uh... Hello, Warden. A doctor, this is Mr. Stone. Mm -hmm. One of the Chicago papers. All right if we go in and talk to him for a minute? Well, I'm afraid it won't make much difference, Warden. Go ahead, Stone. Thank you. Hello, fella. Hi. I don't want to bother you, but I, I came up here tonight looking for a fellow named Anton Nowak. My name's John Doe. Yeah, this, uh... This Anton Noack, I never met him, but from what I hear, he's quite a guy. I wouldn't know. I had it from a girl named Marisha. His wife, I believe. She loved him quite a lot. By the way, that ring you were wearing, where'd you get that? I stole it. Really? Why would anyone steal a cheap little bit of silver and turquoise? I happen to like it. Uh-huh. I saw one like that on a girl once. Uh, it was a wedding ring. The girl liked it, too. This fellow Noack gave it to her, but then he got into some sort of a jam. He had to go away for a while. He didn't tell her anything about what happened. He was afraid it might have hurt her. Would have killed her? No. Would have made her unhappy, maybe. But she would have understood. She loved him an awful lot. She would have been glad he was squaring things up. She, uh, She loved him an awful lot. What do you want, mister? Well, like I said, I was just looking for a fella. Uh, just one question for the paper. I'm sorry I have to ask you, but... How did you happen to pick tonight to break out? Why didn't you wait for your release? I don't know. Something made me. Something kept telling me she needed me. Doctor, quick. Marisha. Flowers on the water. Beautiful in the sunlight. He's gone. Instinctively, I looked down at my watch. 2.35 in the morning. A nice lonely time to make your curtain call. 2.35 a.m. Fine little night I've been having. I really felt low. I telephoned the story into the paper and went back to the hospital. I wasn't going to be much help to Marisha Noack, but I promised to come back. The doctor was in the hall working over some reports at the night desk. He looked up when I stepped out of the elevator. Hello, Mr. Stone. Hello, Doc. I found our Anton all right. Hmm? A little too late, though. Uh, dead. Really? Wouldn't have made any difference. She, uh... Yeah? I'm making out the report now. Oh, great. Wasn't so bad, Stone. Wasn't bad at all. She was happy. I've never seen anyone so happy. What did she have to be happy about? Oh, who knows? But right at the last, this, this wonderful smile came across her face. I guess it was delirium. And she kept saying something like, flowers on the water. But how beautiful in the sunlight? Yes, that's what she said. How, how, how did... That you... report that you're making out, Doc, uh -huh. tell me. What was the time of death? Hmm? Tell me, Doc, please. Oh, it's, uh, 2.35 a.m. Why? 2.35 a.m. Yeah. So here I sit, watching the dawn creeping up on Chicago, tapping out 30 to my story for the night. A love story, no less. A very pessimistic fellow once wrote... When two people really love each other, there can never be a happy ending. Well, it could be. But then again, maybe that pessimistic fellow used one word too many. 
Maybe when two people really love each other, there can never be an ending. Oh, uh, who knows? You pay your money, it takes your choice. Copy, boy. Night Beat, a new dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is edited by Larry Miss and directed by Warren Lewis. Music is by Frank Worth. Others in tonight's cast were Joyce McCluskey, Vic Perrin, Jack Edwards, Jerry Hosner, Rena Craig, Larry Dobkin, and Charles Seal. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at the same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. There's more great action-packed entertainment for you throughout the week on NBC. Other mystery adventure programs include such popular shows as Dragnet, High Adventure, and Christopher London. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to join our good friend and host, Dr. Watson, as he waits for us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Well, are you all set for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, my boy, I'm all set, as you put it. I was looking over my notes on the case before you arrived, and I came across this. It played an extremely prominent part in tonight's story. Well, what is it, Dr. Watson? It looks like a dried leaf of some kind. In its younger days, Mr. Bell, it was a sprightly sprig of parsley. <laughs> oh, Dr. Watson, I know you have the habit of collecting odd mementos from your cases, but a sprig of parsley... And yet, my boy, this withered piece of greenery enables Sherlock Holmes to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. The strange death... Of Mrs. Abernethy. Well, this I've got to hear, but first of all... Oh, I know, Mr. Bell, I know. You have a message for our listeners. <laughs> Every man who wants to get to the top should realize how much neatly groomed hair adds to a man's appearance. And I'm sure he'll be interested in hearing how so many of America's most prosperous and successful men keep their hair looking so attractive. They use Kremel hair tonic. And it's easy to see why. Because Kremel contains precious hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. It keeps it in place longer, too. Yet Kremel never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Never leaves it feeling stiff as a board. Just make this test, men. After you apply Kremel, run your hand back over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no grief, grease comes off on your hand. Your hair always looks like a million and feels like a million when you use Kremel. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the mystery of the withered parsley and the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy? Well, Mr. Bell, at the time I'm talking about, this parsley, just like myself, was a great deal younger. Oh. <laughs> but to, to get on with my story... Holmes had just concluded his amazing investigation in the affair of the Reading Bicycle Pump murder, and we decided to stay for a few days in the nearby beautiful village of Pangbourne. The weather was surprisingly generous for an English summer, and on our second day, Holmes and I had gone for a stroll along the towpath of the River Thames. Holmes was in an extremely morose mood that day, I remember, as we walked back towards our hotel. Ah... Oh. The country's beautiful here, Holmes. Yes, I suppose it is. Oh, come, come. Look at the red and grey roofs of the cottages. And the farms peeping out through the trees over there. So peaceful and, and soothing. I'm afraid it has the reverse effect on me, Watson. 
That's the curse of having a mind like mine. Oh, how do you mean, Holmes? I observe everything with reference to my own special subject. You look at those scattered houses and are impressed by their peace and beauty. I look at them and think how easily crime may be committed there. Good Lord, who'd associate crime with a spot like that? It's my opinion, Watson, based on experience, that the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling countryside. What a morbid thought. The reason is obvious. The pressure of public opinion can do in the city what the law cannot accomplish. There's no lane so dark that the scream of a tortured child or the thud of a drunkard's blow does not obtain sympathy and help from some neighbor. But look at these lonely houses. Think of the deeds of hellish cruelty, the hidden wickedness, which may go on year in, year out in such places and no one the wiser. Upon my soul, Holmes, you're in a particularly depressing mood. Hello, hello, hello. Look at this fellow running towards us. Must be crazy. Imagine galloping along a towpath on a hot day like this. And from his expression, I think we may reasonably assume that he's not doing it for the exercise. Excuse me, Excuse me but if, is uh, one of you gentlemen Dr. Watson? Yes, sir, I am. And this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, how do you do, sir? Mr. Holmes, how do you do? Uh, my name is Gareth Abernetty. I heard that you were staying in the village. I went to your hotel and uh, they told me that you'd uh, gone for a walk in this direction. I presume you need a doctor's help. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Dr. Watson, I know you're on a holiday, oh, but... Oh, well, wanna... naturally, I'm at your service, sir. What, what is wrong? No, perhaps we could start walking back to the inn. Uh, my horse and trap are there, and uh, I'll tell you about it as we go. My, uh, my mother's just had a bad heart attack. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. live at Homeby Grange, a few miles out of the village. I'd, uh, I'd like to drive you out there at once, but Doctor. But surely if you live here, you must have a, a family doctor. Well, he's in London for a few days. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, uh, tell me, Mr. Abernethy, uh, what were the symptoms of your, your mother's heart attack? Well, she she said she was taking her usual nap before lunch. She started to go to sleep and uh, and suddenly woke up crying that she was she was going to die. Said her heart seemed to stop beating entirely for a few moments. Well, has she had these attacks before? Well, I can't tell you much about it. The family says that for her age, she's been in very good health. Uh, I've been abroad for a few years. In China, I observe, Mr. Abernethy. Yes. Yes, I went out there as a war correspondent covering the Boxer Rebellion. But uh, uh, how did you know? The fish that you have tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scale a delicate pink is quite peculiar to that country. That's amazing, Mr. Holmes. Oh, it's not so amazing as all that. It's just a certain facility for observation, sir. For instance, from what you told me of, of your mother's symptoms, I should say that her lips are bluish, that she runs out of breath when walking upstairs, and the veins in her cheeks... Are unusually pronounced. <laughs> I begin to think I've met a pair of magicians. Oh, why? Uh, but you're right, Doctor. <laughs> I see I put you on your metal, Watson. How did you deduce that? Elementary, my dear Holmes, the symptoms that Mr. Abernethy uh, described were typical of mitral constriction. I shall be delighted to examine your mother and do whatever I can for her. I'm very grateful, Doctor. You're in good hands, Mr. Abernethy. Well, Watson, I shall see you later, no doubt. This is one case in which I'm sure you need no help from me. Dr. Watson, I'm not much of a one for doctors. Stick out your tongue and give me a guinea. That's what most of them say. <clears throat> well, what's your verdict? Well, that there's nothing seriously wrong, Mrs. Abernethy. Just take these drops I'm giving you before each meal and you'll be well in no time. Uh, Lizzie? Yes, ma'am? You heard what the doctor said. Now try and stop your wool gathering long enough to see that I get those drops. Yes, sir. I won't forget. Ah, you'd forget your own name if the butcher's boy was to ring the bell, though, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. I mean, no. I'm... You can leave the room, Lizzie. Yes, sir. Oh, I think you should rest for a while, Mrs. Abernethy. Plenty of time for rest at my age, Doctor. Anyway, I want to talk to you privately. That's why I sent Lizzie out of the room. I want you to bring your friend Sherlock Holmes here to lunch tomorrow. Sherlock Holmes? But how did you know that... That, uh... that he was in the village? Uh, there's nothing new in the village or anywhere else going on here that I don't know about, Doctor. Now, will you bring him? I've got something very important to discuss with oh, him. Well, ma'am, I don't think of the oh. state of your heart that you... Oh, what was that filthy oh. medicine you gave me? Oh. It's made me sleepy. Well, that was its purpose, madam. Uh, my family think I'm going to die. They're waiting for it. 
hoping for it. Oh, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. You're not going to die, madam. We'll fool them, Doctor, won't we? We'll fool them. Uh, who is it? Now, 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 Mrs. Abernethy. I'll go to the door. Oh, Doctor, I came to see how Granny was getting along. I'm Rose Abernethy. Oh, I'm Dr. Watson. How do you do, my dear? Oh, who is it, Doctor? It's me, Granny. I came to see how you are. Take the doctor downstairs, Rose. Give him some tea and introduce him to the rest of the family. He's got bad news for them. I'm going to live. Uncle Gareth, will you introduce Dr. Watson, please? Of course, my dear Rose. And I appreciate your motive in giving me the privilege. A, a, a shy, retiring girl like yourself would hardly dare make such a descriptive introduction as I will. Uncle Gareth, you've been drinking again. Well, since I was the only member of this heartless Abernethy clan that had the initiative to go and get a doctor, I think I was entitled to a brandy or two. Oh, oh c come on, Watson. Uh, come and meet my noble brothers. They're here in the library, waiting like hopeful vultures for bad news about our dear mother's health. Oh, well, sir, I think perhaps some other time. Oh, no, 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 no. M might as well get it over with. I'm sorry, Dr. Watson. I didn't know Uncle had been drinking. Oh, that's quite all right, my dear child. Uh, uh, Dr. Watson, uh, let me introduce my brother, Ernest. How do you do? How are you, Dr. Watson? Uh, since the success of Oscar Wilde's recent comedy of manners, Ernest has been unbearable. I, I think he took its title too literally. I suppose you're referring to the importance of being Ernest. No, as you see, Doctor, my brother is a brilliant wit, <laughs> and Brandy sharpens his perceptions even more. He's been known to look launch a whole string of leaden epigrams in the course of one evening. Yes, and he's been known to do an honest day's work in his life, which is more than you can say, my dear Ernest. Darius, I'm sure Dr. Watson has no desire to listen to our dreary wranglings. Why not introduce him to John? I'm going to. Uh, Watson, uh, this is my other brother, John Abernethy. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Doctor? John is the respectable member of the family. He manages the estates here, and at least has the unique distinction of having worked for the money he gets from Mother. Shouldn't talk like this in front of a stranger, Gareth. Bad form, you know. Yes, Uncle Gareth. Dr. Watson's come here to tell us about Granny. Oh, and then let's hear the verdict. It means much more to us than you could possibly imagine, I can assure you. Well, I examined Mrs. Abernethy very thoroughly, considering her age. I'm glad to say that her condition is quite good. I've prescribed you to tell us for her, and she should pull through very nicely. In fact, uh, I see no reason why she shouldn't live to be a hundred. Oh, Uncle Ernest, that was one of our nicest wine glasses. <laughs> look at us, Watson. You give us the best possible news, and look at our faces. Don't you realize that this whole family is waiting for one thing? My mother's death? It was perfectly nauseating. I must say they sound like a peculiarly unattractive family. Well, except the granddaughter Rose, she's a sweet little thing. But the others are a bunch of good for nothing. Undoubtedly. And yet my reaction to what you've told me is one of intense curiosity. As I remarked earlier today, the quiet countryside beneath its external beauty cloaks some of the vilest happenings. Well, I admit the atmosphere in that household is vile, all right. And think of the potential tragedy smoldering there. A wealthy matriarch who controls the purse strings. Four relations living there and praying for one thing, her death. No, Watson, with such a setting, my curiosity is overpowering. Then you will call on her? If you think she's in good enough condition to see me. Attempts may have already been made on her well, life. Normally, I'd suggest postponing it for a day or two, but if you think that she's in danger, Quite. I feel... Watson, tomorrow we shall call upon the lady and see what can be done to help her. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Abernethy? Before we go into lunch, I should like to tell you why I asked you to come here today. And I want my family to know, too. Children, I want your attention. Oh, Mother, not another lecture, surely. No, Ernest, not a lecture. Merely a statement of fact. I have asked Mr. Sherlock Holmes here today because he is a detective. <laughs> a detective? What's the matter, Mother? Has someone pinched the family silver? Gareth, be quiet. Now, 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 please don't excite yourself, madam. Remember that heart of yours. Yes, Granny, do be careful. Oh, stop fussing over me, Rose, and sit down. Gareth, 
You mentioned the family silver. How did you know that's what I was going to speak about? Oh, Mother, I was only joking. Were you? Strange joke. Mr. Holmes, I discovered a few days ago that the Abernathy silver has been stolen piece by piece and replaced by imitation. How do you know, Mrs. Abernathy? I recently had occasion to have some of our silver knives repaired. The blades were loose in the handles. The London jeweler to whom I sent them reported that they were not the family silver, but plated imitations. I had him come down here and examine the rest of the set. They're frauds. I want you to find out who's responsible. I know it's one of these four children. That's ridiculous, Mother. Why suggest that one of us is responsible? Because I know your children too well. Personally, I think it's what you deserve, Mother. How dare you? I'm not dependent on you, Mother, but the others are. You've kept them dangling too long. Look at you, Rose. You're still young. Are you going to stay here another 20 years waiting for your grandmother to die? Get it. Leave her room. Now, now, please, Mrs. Abernethy. Lunch oh. is served, ma'am. Oh, go away. Oh, I love you. Quick, Watson. Oh, She's having doctor. another attack. Out of the room, everybody, please. Oh, Dr. Hill. Now, 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 don't worry, Mrs. Abernethy. Oh. You're going to be quite all right. Oh. <laughs> Are you feeling better, Mrs. Abernethy? Yes, Mr. Holmes, I am. That digitalis soon pulled you round, didn't it? You must remember not to take another dose until this evening. In the meanwhile, I think you'd better go and lie down. No, Doctor. I want to go into lunch. And afterwards, I have something else to tell you, Mr. Holmes. Something I don't intend the family to hear. And it's much more significant than stealing silver. Mrs. Abernethy... I think if you were to tell me your real problem now, simply and directly, a great deal of time and patience might be saved. After lunch, Mr. Holmes. Doctor, give me your arm. Excellent lunch, I must say. Hmm. And the conversation has had all the sparkle and gaiety of a funeral oration. Well, since you've entirely monopolized the conversation, Gareth, that's not very surprising. Mr. Mr. Stop the wrangling, you two. two. Got guests. Bad form, you know. Uh, Mr. Holmes, did you care for some more coffee? Thank you, Mrs. Abernethy. I'd like another cup. Uh, Granny, what's wrong? Your hand's shaking so. Uh, Doctor! Granny! Quick, Dr. Watson. Mrs. Abernethy. Ah. Don't be with Mother. Holmes. She's dead. No! Then I must assume a different mission than the one I came here to perform. I suggest that you all leave this room and that one of you sends a servant for the police. Murder has just been committed before our eyes. Murder? But Holmes, she died of a heart attack. When death is so intensely desired by four persons present? No, Watson. I'm afraid I can't assume a verdict of natural death. In proof... I suggest you notice the depth to which that parsley has sunk in the butter. I repeat, send for the police. Oh, now. Before we find out what the police discover, men, once you get bald, there's nothing you can do about it. But it's never too early to make the most of the hair you've got. That's why I urge you to try Kremel Hair Tonic. Kremel contains very special hair grooming ingredients which have never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. Kremel keeps the hair in place longer, always looking so neat and well-groomed, never greasy or sticky. But this highly specialized hair tonic does lots more than just keep the hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kremel helps stimulate circulation right in the surface of the scalp, leaving your scalp feeling so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, Kremel removes loose dandruff and has a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. And if your hair is dry and breaks and falls, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, more pliable. Men, I'm sure you'll enjoy the way Kremel always feels so clean on your scalp, looks so clean on your hair, and has such a clean odor. How it helps give you such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I begin to see what you mean about that withered sprig of parsley. 
But I still don't understand what it had to do with the death of the old lady. Well, more did I, Mr. Bell, at the time, but Sherlock Holmes soon explained it to me. As soon as the family had left the dining room and the police had been sent for, Holmes and I stood together in that room of death, examining the dining room table. Yes, Watson. I'm certain that she was poisoned before our eyes. But how, Holmes? You'll admit that in her condition a double dose of digitalis would have been fatal? Possibly, yes, but she didn't have an overdose. I gave her some before we came into lunch and told her not to take her usual dose at the table. And she didn't take it. Not consciously, Watson. But I'm convinced that she received another dose in her food. How? She didn't eat the roast lamb that the rest of us had. She simply had two lightly boiled eggs. She cracked them open herself. They couldn't have been poisoned. But she put butter in her eggs. Large quantities of butter. We all ate butter from the same dish, Holmes. True. But once again, I ask you to observe the significant fact. The depth to which the parsley has sunk in the butter. But the parsley hasn't sunk perceptibly at all. That, my dear Watson, is the significant fact. Oh, beg your pardon, sir. As you said, as all you thought something was wrong with the lunch. I'm the cook. Something was very wrong with the lunch, my good woman. Oh, I'm sorry. And I hear as how Mrs. Abernethy has been took with another of our spells. Yes, she has. Tell me, was this table laid for lunch at one o'clock? Yes, sir, it was. But you didn't come in till half an hour later. While Mrs. Abernethy's attack delayed us in the drawing room, did anyone come through the kitchen into this room? No, sir. Lizzie and me would have seen them if they had. And when you set the table, you placed this butter here? Yes, sir. As you see, it's garnished with parsley. Did you do that? No, sir, I didn't. That's funny. Who could have put that on there? Uh, Joe Holmes, uh, you, you're right. But the roast of lamb was, was garnished with parsley, wasn't it? Yes, sir, it was. Splendid. I'm much obliged to you. I hope the mistress finds better soon, sir. Watson, I'm going to take that butter to the village, chemist shop, and have it analyzed. While I'm doing that, I want you to conduct an experiment of your own. What do you want me to do? Obtain a fresh quantity of butter from the kitchen... Place a sprig of parsley on top of it and see how far in half an hour it sinks in. Ridiculous way of spending my time, I must say. Nevertheless, Watson, I think the experiment may give us the vital clue to the murder. Well, Holmes, and what did you find out at the chemist? It was as I suspected, Watson. The butter was thoroughly impregnated with digitalis. And yet we all ate some of it. True. It would not produce any effect on a normally healthy person. In the case of Mrs. Abernethy, however, two doses in quick succession were fatal. Great Scott. What was the result of your experiment, old chap? Well, in half an hour on a blazing hot day like this, parsley sinks quite noticeably into the butter. Therefore, it was placed there shortly before we came in late to lunch, not when the table was set. But what was the motive? The butter had been shaped by a mold. It was patterned on the top. The murderer used a hypodermic needle to inject the digitalis, and he had to hide the holes made by the needle. So he took the parsley from the roast and placed it on the butter. Who? Who had the opportunity? That's what we have to find out. Have the police arrived? Yes, there's a Sergeant Jenkins in charge. He's out there in the kitchen questioning the servants. Then let's join forces. A murderer's in this house, Watson. Between us, we've got to catch him. Mr. Holmes, I've questioned everybody. The cook, Martha, says nobody came in through the kitchen when lunch was waiting on the table. And yet we know somebody did, Sergeant. Well, perhaps they came through the window. I checked that too, sir. The gardener was working in the rhododendron bed outside. He said no one went in that way. And the only other entrance to the dining room was the door leading into the library. Oh, I checked on that one too, Mr. Holmes. Mr. John Abernethy and his brother Ernest were playing a game of chess there. They swore that no one went through that door. Well, it looks as if no one could have tampered with the butter. Whereas we know they did. Sergeant Jenkins, you've been very thorough in your examinations. But one of these witnesses is lying. We must talk to them again. Martha, when you said no one came through your kitchen and went into the dining room, you meant no member of the family, didn't you? That's right, sir. If it had been one of the other domestics, uh, Lizzie, for example, you wouldn't have noticed it? No, you mentioned it, sir. Lizzie did go in just before they came into lunch. Lizzie did, but... Did Quite, it... Watson. Sergeant, please ask Mr. Ernest Abernethy to step in here for a moment. Yes, Mr. Holmes, Lizzie did go through the library door, but I can't see that fact as of much importance. Uh, possibly you can't. And yet I assure you my question was not an idle one. 
Was Lizzie uh, carrying anything, do you recall? I really didn't notice. I'm afraid I find the problems of chess, uh, even with Brother John as an opponent, more interesting than the perambulations of the worthy Lizzie. Lizzie. Yes, sir? You did go into the room just before lunch? Yes, sir. I remember that I forgot to put the claret out. So would be room temperature. Mr. Ernest is most particular about that. Thank you, Lizzie. You may go. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, do you think she did it? Surely there's no doubt of it in your mind now, is there? Well, there is in mine, Mr. Holmes, and no mistake. And yet the case is solved, Sergeant. Let's go into the drawing room and I'll introduce you to our murderer. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you can all see now how the murder was committed. But by Lizzie? But that doesn't seem possible, Mr. Holmes. What motive would she have? Oh, I could understand her motive. Mother's been an absolute tyrant with her. I find it hard to believe that with her adult-pated mentality, she'd have the imagination to think of such a plot. Oh, no, Garrett. The man responsible for this murder is you. Uncle Garrett! Oh, this is ridiculous. I did not say the murderer. I said the man responsible. But Holmes, what on earth are you driving at? Gareth, by his example in finding a job and going abroad, caused one of his other relatives to become disgusted with the life of a parasite. That person decided to go beyond such petty devices as stealing silver and to turn to murder. An Abernethy? Commit murder? I say, really, a remarkably I mean, brilliant all, observation. Which one is it, Holmes? Surely that's obvious. Two witnesses, the cook and Ernest, at first swore no one had entered the dining room. Then, when I asked a question based on one of the elementary flaws of direct evidence, each admitted that Lizzie had entered. Lizzie herself admitted it, Mr. Holmes. Very true. She told us in detail how she had entered the dining room once. But the witnesses had her entering twice. The cook saw her come through the kitchen door, and you, Ernest, admitted that she had passed you through the library door. Someone else had realized that same flaw of evidence, that no employer really notices the actions of a servant. Someone else had entered that room in the maid's uniform. And who is the only suspect who could have done that? I your Rose Abernethy. Okay. The shy and retiring Rose? Yes, I killed Granny. When Dr. Watson said that Grandmother might live another 20 years, I saw that I'd never get away from here. Well, you're getting away from here now, miss. I'm taking you over to the station. I don't care. I'd be an old maid. That and I warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence I'm against glad you. I'm glad I killed What a shocking case. I'm glad we're headed back to our hotel and never have to see that Abernethy family again. We'll have to make a brief appearance at the trial of the girl, I'm afraid. I still find it hard to believe that quiet, shy little thing was capable of conceiving such a devilish murder. Solitude, unhappiness, and the companionship of an evil, maladjusted family and a tyrannical grandmother breed dark fancies, Watson. Mm -hmm. She dressed up in a maid's uniform, convinced that no one would give her a second glance. And then, having poisoned the butter, returned, changed her dress, and sat down at the luncheon table. Precisely. Well, Watson, this has been an unsavory case, but it points a moral. A moral that I hope you, as my self-appointed biographer, will profit by. Well, what moral is that? The extreme importance of observing details. Miss Abernetti would not now be on her way to a prison cell if I hadn't noticed one vital clue. The depth to which the parsley had sunk in the butter. Just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us something about next week's story. Girls, have you noticed how men can't help but admire the bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair? Then why not follow the advice of the famous Million Dollar Powers models? Girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers models wash their hair with cremel shampoo. This amazingly beautifying cremel shampoo actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and uncovers all its natural, radiant luster. Yes, and cremel shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy a bottle of cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Shampoo. 
Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week I think I'll tell you about the singular... Pardon me, it was the singular affair of the Coptic Compass. The Coptic Compass? Sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. Sherlock Holmes found it so, Mr. Bell. The adventure started one afternoon when Holmes and I, returning to our Baker Street rooms, found, lying in the middle of our floor, an unclothed corpse. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Six Napoleons. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the Coptic Compass. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.